One winter evening, something strange happened in a wooden hut in the middle of the forest. The young man's glass of red drink fell to the ground, and he began to cover his mouth with his hands. This poison does not allow manna to circulate through the blood vessels. The man standing opposite said that the poison would take full effect in a few minutes and added another type of poison especially for him. The victim asked the gentleman why he had done it. The man, in turn, listened with a serious expression. And a second later, he asked if the blonde, long-haired man really didn't understand. He said that the United Empire no longer needed his power. He added that wartime was over and that this force was only causing problems now. The man who said this was dressed in a beautiful military suit. The soldier reminded his interlocutor of the words he had said earlier. I will return to the village where I will live peacefully for the rest of my life, so as not to become the cause for the last time. The astonished blonde gentleman listened to these words with wide open eyes, and there was a red consistency around his mouth. That's why he said he wanted to wash the blood off his hands. And he also wants to live his life pretending that he doesn't exist. And he asked a clarifying question. Is it normal to be afraid of your own friend? After all, he is an eighth-level sorcerer. Any moment can destroy him and the Empire. For this reason, he has no right to keep such a monster alive. After saying these words, the man turned to face the door and began to walk slowly toward it, while his friend followed him. And as soon as he entered the room, fire appeared around the long-haired man, from which it would be difficult for him to escape. Then the gentleman put his right hand on his chest and said to himself with a slight grimace. However, the long-haired blonde pulled out a small sword from inside his jacket, which he always kept with him just in case. And, in his opinion, it was Ragnar who was more trusting, because every day he lived was filled with regret. Before the poison spreads completely, he will still be able to use magic for his own purposes. And this gesture could be his repentance but as soon as he pierced himself, bright red blood poured out of his mouth and down his beard. A few seconds later, a blue light began to appear around the man, and he said with the last of his strength, Ra, Hus, Ekiro. A strange large drawing appeared on the floor around the exhausted gentleman, which was also illuminated with blue light. However, having gained strength, the blonde raised his head high and shouted loudly, that's why we see the same gentleman standing in a cemetery a few years ago next to a grave he already knew, his head bowed down. And then he moved to the castle where he bowed to an older man with a long stick and a young soldier. After that, he became a grown man who grew long blonde hair and had his own personal cane. Suddenly, the young man quickly got out of bed and covered his mouth with his hand. However, he still did not fully understand what had happened, so he got to his feet and realized that the pain had disappeared and the wounds had gone with it. And at that very second, someone called out in a gentle voice to a boy named Ian, and he turned his head to see who it was. It turns out that she was a beautiful young woman with long, thick, wavy hair. But the appearance of this lady surprised the boy, because it was his mother, who had been dead for several years. And he immediately began to stroke his mother's hand, and the thought flashed through his mind that his plan had succeeded. However, there is another option that he died and met her in the afterlife. A few meters away, there was a small settlement where a group of people were talking. When the young man took a closer look, he noticed that the children were lining up one by one to be tested, and the soldiers of the army carefully controlled the crowd, indicating who should go through next. On the tent, the young man noticed an ivory-colored flag fluttering in the wind. At the age of 12, all children of the Green River Empire are tested. This procedure helps to identify the wizards who will become the pillars of imperial power. The second quality, mana of the heart, is responsible for the creation, circulation, and storage of mana. And then he realized that going back 30 years was too far. Still, he managed to use the magic of time which he spent his life studying, killing his enemies in the name of devotion, the price for which was death. However, once he got here, Everything will be different in this life. That's why you need to act to realize your plans. He approached one of the soldiers and told him that he was Ian Page from the village of Mogrian. The man smiled sweetly and mentioned that he was Vanessa's son. He told him he could come in, but not to bombard the sorcerer with questions. The gentleman who was conducting the test was already very tired, so he asked Knight Aaron if he had many more children. And at that very moment, a young man opened the white curtain to the room, apologized, and slowly entered. 
The inspecting man gathered himself and his emotions and showed the robot a smile and said hello. When the boy approached, the gentleman said that he was going to check his head, namely to send some mana to his head. A second later, he added that this was a standard procedure. Then the man asked the boy to turn his back. For a few seconds, the child froze, not knowing what to expect. Smiling sweetly, the gentleman told him to come back as soon as possible because he had a trace of mana in his brain. However, you also need to feel the mana in your heart. After all, just going to a magic academy is not enough. However, the young man interrupted this inspection by addressing the sorcerer and offering to show him something. A second later, he said he would demonstrate it first. A drop of water appeared on his other palm, and the sorcerer realized that the young man had used a double spell. The guy said that he actually started to do it recently. However, everyone was already on their feet, because what they had just seen in front of them was not something they had ever seen before. And the chief sorcerer, with wide open eyes and mouth, loudly asked, What? I immediately asked if the young man had ever practiced this before. The blonde answered quickly and clearly that he had never practiced it. The blonde man was already a little angry, and a blue light began to appear in his eyes. And now the sorcerer is going to use the magic of mind reading, and it helps to sense lies. So the man suggested that I think about it and answer again. A second later, he added that he, his family, and even his neighbors would lose their heads. However, the boy looked down and shook his head in a calm tone and replied that there was no point in lying. The sorcerer folded his arms over his chest after these words. It was very funny to hear these words from a child. Suddenly, a woman's voice was heard saying impatiently that the child had told the truth. All those present turned their heads to the curtain through which they could enter the room. A minute later, the young man angrily approached the curtain and pulled it aside to see his mother. A man grabbed her arm. She, in turn, began to shout loudly for him to stop because it was causing her a lot of pain. Then the gentleman smiled sweetly and emphasized that the lady had been a widow for seven years and had stopped pretending to be cheap because she didn't mind. The woman was surprised and said, What does he think he's doing? Because she still doesn't understand what he wants from her. Three men came out of the room at the noise. One mustached gentleman standing in the middle asked what was going on. The guard continued to hold the young lady by one shoulder and replied that it was nothing. The word low grade made the young man very angry, because no one has the right to call his mother that. However, one of the men came up to the boy and put his hand on his shoulder to calm him down a bit. Then the gentleman said that they found out that this boy had two qualities that a sorcerer needs. And an attack on this stratum of the people is punishable very severely. They will be charged with treason and punished without trial. When the guard realized what was about to happen, he quickly put his hands up and said, Oh, so he decided to act quickly. He fell on the ground in front of the young man and began to apologize, saying that he did not mean to and that there was a misunderstanding. However, the boy calmly said that why was the gentleman apologizing to him when he should be apologizing to his mother? The guard slowly raised his head and looked up and said, Oh. He realized that he had said a lot of bad words to this young lady. However, he had no other option, so he quickly knelt down and bowed his head down. The woman did not know what to do, so she turned her head to her son and said his name with a confused expression. However, the young man did not give any answer, but instead approached the accused and knelt down on one knee in front of him so that he would listen attentively and he began to say that he actually knew what people like him could think about people like his mother. And the blonde continued to say that the man should tell his friends everything he had heard, seen, and felt today in color. And after the boy blinked his eyes, the color of his pupils changed to blue, and he added that he would follow this gentleman in the future. Sweat began to appear on the guard's face from excitement, and all he could say was that he understood everything and thanked him for not being punished. Then the boy got to his feet and approached the gentleman who was checking for mana and sincerely thanked him for his help. The blonde man smiled sweetly and replied that the tower must protect its wizards no matter what it costs, because people should not be so impudent. After that, he turned to one of the other soldiers and asked him to make sure that the boy was okay and safe. The mustachioed man turned his head to the young man and his mother and asked if they agreed to take them to the hotel where their knights were staying. The boy and his mother looked at each other and agreed, because they had no other choice. Because unfortunately, they had nowhere to go back to. 
The blonde boy returned to the sorcerer and asked for permission to go to rest, because he was very tired and wanted to talk to his mother to calm her down. When the guests finally went to the resting place, they were gazed at by the inspector, who folded his arms across his chest and thought that this young man had a very good ability for such a young age. And he is simply sure that he will cause a lot of noise in the ivory tower. At this late hour, the security guard was returning home. He threw his jacket over one shoulder and was very upset. And he was also quite angry that the son of some cook was talking to him like that, because he was just a boy, and the gentleman was a grown man. How could he humiliate him like that in front of his mother? So he kept saying to himself that he would show this young man where the crayfish hide. And then the guard froze in place. He was quite frightened, because this had never happened to him before. A man's voice sounded behind him, saying that the gentleman was immobilized and emphasizing that magic was capable of even that. Slowly taking off his hood, the blonde reminded me that he had warned me that he would be watching the guard. A second later, he continued to say that today, this man was humiliated by the cook's boyfriend. And because of this, he decided to pour alcohol over his grief. Looking down from the bridge, the young man said that his entire past life was devoted to learning spells in the language of dragons. However, this turned out to be impossible, and his hands will never be cleaned of the blood of the victims. His only dream now is to protect his loved ones, and for this, he will do anything, even if new blood keeps getting his hands dirty. As the young man looked at the body of his victim floating in the river, he remembered his please don't forgive me. When he returned home, he sat down by the door and leaned his head against it, closing his eyes because he had a bad headache and felt as if he was going to break down. After a little rest, the young man decided to go inside, where he saw his mother sleeping peacefully on a small bed. And as he looked at her beautiful, calm face, he thought that after only a year of studying at the Magical Academy, he had been recognized as a first-class wizard. And it was in that year that the mother who stayed in the village became very ill and died. And she was never able to see her son who became a wizard. So he quietly walked closer to the bed and mentally promised himself that this time he would protect her, no matter what it took. He will also try to make her happier, because now it is not clear that she has ever enjoyed this life. And my mother will finally be able to live a long life, after all, the loss of loved ones that he suffered in his past life will not happen in this one. Then the events unfold in the capital of Trin River, which is called Trinverium. At this time, a mustachioed blonde man who was the emperor named Terry Trin River was sitting in the middle. The owner of the tower was a fifth-ranked sorcerer named Harrit Leon, and he held a stick in his hand and answered, Mana circulates through the vessels a person becomes a sorcerer when he understands how to control it at will. The man went on to emphasize that this is usually taught at the academy, and his current state corresponds to the first class, as it was with the first sorcerer. The mustachioed blonde man folded his arms across his chest with a serious expression and repeated the words, the first sorcerer, and asked whether this creature descended from dragons. This makes it difficult to believe the words of the people conducting the inspection. Therefore, you need to verify this personally. Because of this, he can say for sure that in any case, the boy's strength is dangerous. The mustachioed gentleman listened attentively and continued to sit. Suddenly, someone knocked lightly on the door, and the man invited the prince, who was also his son, to come inside. The boy was the heir to this empire. His name was Hayden Trin River. The gentleman replied that he had called and apologized that he had to wait a bit to meet him. The young man then put his right hand on the lump and asked with a confused expression, why he had come here. Then his father emphasized in a serious tone that the last time the boy had left the castle was five years ago. The young blonde was surprised and frightened by this decision. So he asked in shock, outside the castle? The man replied confidently that it would be so, but he would send two of his knights, 300 soldiers, and three third-class sorcerers with him. After listening attentively, the son froze for a few seconds and then asked who the young man was with his mouth wide open. And then the father realized that perhaps his son hadn't heard anything, so he immediately asked them to forget all of the above. However, the young man did not like this development and continued to hold his hand on his chest and said that the man could rely on him. When my father heard these words, he slowly began to rise to his feet, but for some reason he did not say a word for several minutes. 
Then he sat back down in his soft chair and said that the boy could start preparing for the trip because he would have to go north and it might take a while. When the sun left, the chief of the tower reappeared in the room and addressed his majesty and asked for the opportunity to leave as well. The gentleman looked down and replied that everyone knows that wizards do not like long journeys, so they will need to be convinced. The mustachioed man closed his eyes and calmly allowed his subordinate to leave and go to fulfill his task. So the gray-haired gentleman with the stick quickly left the room to go to his wards and try to fulfill the task he had been given. At the door, the man was met by his servant, who bowed slightly and asked if he was returning. At this time, morning came to the hotel where the sorcerer's boy and his mother were checked in. But despite this, the young man was already sitting on the edge of his bed, thinking that he would soon hear back from the tower and the castle. And then I remembered a picture of the inspector talking about his capabilities. And everything goes according to plan. Namely, the emperor is lining up sorcerers to put them in charge of the prince's follower. And the boy can join the emperor or the owner of the tower, or he can choose a third party. A lot of people from the ward that conducted the inspection had already gathered outside. The sorcerer was told that he could start doing what he had come here to do. After that, it was said that the imperial sorcerer Ian Page was being called upon to fulfill the emperor's order. But after stopping for a second, he repeated the word order to himself. Something about it made him uneasy and surprised. And they came unexpectedly quickly. So the young man had no choice but to open the door and see who it was that came to see him. It turned out that it was a black-haired gentleman who was conducting the inspection. He was holding a blue ball in his left hand and smiling sweetly. He emphasized that the young man had come out just in time. The blonde man did not understand why this was happening because in his head, he had envisioned a completely different scenario. Then he was ordered to get down on his right knee and raise his left hand to his heart. Then the man held out his blue orb, from which a voice spoke to Ian Page and asked him to listen to the order. I, the emperor, recognize Ian Page's talent and officially order his name to be added to the ivory tower's magical register. In addition to this, I invite you to visit the Imperial Castle and send a follower, Prince, to accompany Ian on my behalf. The other guards approached the inspector and asked if this was the whole order and if they had to escort the guy to the local castle. Therefore, one of the guards approached the young man and put his hand on his chest and told him that he was a captain of Mogrian's army and his name was Arnold, and they will leave as soon as the boy is ready to travel. The lord of the Mogrian province, whose name was Marcus Magrilli, looked ahead of him and announced that their guests had finally arrived. The man then turned his head to the right and addressed two people named Ravi and Margaret to get their attention, that a sorcerer should be treated with respect. At this time, Ian and his mother got out of the carriage that approached the castle. As the three guests approached the man who met them, the people reasoned that if the emperor himself was interested, then this young man had special powers. The gray-haired gentleman held out both hands and greeted his guests. The blonde young man stood there looking at everything for a few seconds. In the afternoon, one of the cleaners asked the other if she had seen the new guy at practice. He is an amazing talent, and he trains so hard on any vacation. I had to spend a lot of time a day using my powers to use magic. Today he was practicing a freezing spell, and as soon as he succeeded, a blue and white light appeared around him. After that, white ice and snow appeared around the boy. This time, everything turned out much better and faster. What the young man didn't like was that he could use magic to make some of this ice and snow disappear. After all, in his previous body, he could freeze an entire castle, not just one training field. These thoughts were interrupted by a mustachioed man who walked quickly toward him and called out to him, calling him Mr. Sorcerer, and when he came closer, he asked for help. The young man asked in surprise what exactly he could do to help. And then the confused man frightenedly said that the Lord had disappeared and no one could find him. This news surprised the blonde man himself. He opened his eyes and mouth wide and repeated the words, gone, gone. The man went on to say that the Lord had gone on a goblin hunt and had not returned. His bodyguards and Mr. Ravi had also disappeared. After listening carefully, the young man emphasized in his mind that it was still too early for this gentleman to die. I also remembered that the great Lord Marcus Mogrian would die at the hands of an assassin from a hostile country shortly before the First War of Unification. After these reflections, the young man took his right hand aside and asked in surprise why he was being asked to do this and not the sorcerer Marco. 
However, everyone knew that the Lord had loved hunting in his previous life, so it was unlikely that anything could have happened to him. Again, this was a bit of a surprise, because as a responsible sorcerer, he left the settlement to which he was introduced. And then the blonde realizes that a magician is usually allowed to leave a certain province only in rare cases. But he has the most important weapon, knowledge from the future, because he has already lived a similar life. So he only needs to choose to repeat it or change the course of events. However, he knows that he may lose his favor. However, they have no one else to turn to. And finally, he stopped in a confident pose with his hands down and said that he would find the Lord and put a lot of effort into saving him. After all, he needs to put everything back in its place. The young man came to the hotel to pack a few things to take with him on his search. Coming closer to her son, the young lady said that she had heard that he was going to find a lord. The woman went on to clarify whether it was too dangerous, because in her opinion, he was too young for such things. After saying these words, the son came up to his mother, took her hands and told her not to worry, because he would definitely return and they would continue to spend time together. Suddenly, this conversation was interrupted by a girl who quickly entered the room and apologized. The lady was very upset and asked us to find her brother and father with tears in her eyes. Then she folded her hands in prayer and added that if the young man succeeded, she would ask her father to give him money, land, and servants. So the guy decided not to listen to what this young lady was going to say and interrupted her speech, saying that he would find her family. However, he asked her to give him her ring, because in it, he could feel the mana that he might need during the search. The girl asked if she could help with the search. The guy answered that, of course. When he looked at the jewelry on his hand, he realized that it was quite familiar. It was Mogrian's wedding ring. It is a lower class artifact that increases the mana of the wearer. But then he asked how the Lord gave it to his daughter instead of his heir. And finally, she added that he shouldn't forget to return the ring because her father had entrusted it to her. Then the boy approached the guards and said that they could go in search of the Lord and his son. An hour later, the young man and his assistants found themselves in a dense forest. The head guard said that they had finally arrived, and they noticed that this is where the trail ended. The blonde asked if they had found the victims. The young man began to think. It was obvious because he bowed his head down and put his hand to his chin. Because of this, he had to find the Lord before it was too late and he began to use magic to summon the wolf spirit to help him. While the young man was using force, his assistant stood behind him, silently watching everything that was happening. But there were two craftsmen who were surprised and began to talk to each other to clarify, saying, Wolf? However, it was not a large adult wolf that appeared before them, but rather a small wolf cub. Everyone was surprised by who they saw in front of them. That's why the clearing was silent for a few seconds. And in the blonde man's mind, he thought that in his past life, this animal was bigger. And then the young man realized that his current supply of mana did not allow him to make larger sizes. When the animal began to move to the right, the sorcerer's assistants turned to him because they did not understand what they had to do. At this time, the blonde man is still in an unknown location. The goblin was attacking the man by swinging his weapon from a tree. It turns out that he attacked a lord who managed to defeat him and cut off his head with his sword. The gentleman stopped for a few seconds to rest, and then he realized that the goblins had a lot of them, and it was not clear what to do to win and stay alive. As the beasts watched the Lord, they became angrier and angrier. They realized that there were several dozen more of them, and so everyone wanted to fight at least a little. The Lord closed his eyes to avoid seeing these animals and said to himself that he was going to die anyway, so it didn't matter whether he fought to the end. So the man turned his head to his son and said that he would try to detain the attackers and that he, in turn, should return to the castle. The boy did not expect to hear such a request, and when he returned, he had to tell everyone that there were many goblins on Mount Mogrian, and it was very dangerous. However, the young man stood there like a stone because he did not want to leave his father alone. Because of this, he turned to his father to ask him again and tell him that it was a very bad idea, in his opinion, because to be left alone with these animals is to die in a few minutes. While the Lord was listening to this, one of the goblins quietly crept up behind him, and he had already made a swing. The son saw this and began to shout loudly to his father, telling him what was happening behind him. So the man quickly turned his head to assess the situation himself. After all, he was used to relying on himself in any battle or fight. However, for some reason, 
he did not run away to save himself. Instead, he froze in place, and a blue and white light began to appear around him. You could already see in the Lord's eyes that he had accepted the fact that he was going to die. But as soon as he noticed that everything around him had changed its color, he began to consider who could have done it. He wondered if someone had found them and if they would survive. A few meters from the battlefield, a blonde man walked slowly and confidently. He managed to find the right people and use the magic he had been practicing for weeks. This time, however, he did much better because there were large ice mountains near him. The young man turned back a little to see and assess the situation. And then the Lord realized that the boy who had arrived at their castle a few months earlier had come to save them. This surprised him because he had not expected to see this particular young man here. Further events unfold in the castle. A young lady was sitting on a chair by the bedside and quietly calling out to her father, who was lying unconscious in bed at the time. The man began to slowly get up, holding his head, which still hurt. He asked himself what happened. After all, he didn't really remember anything, especially how he got back to the castle. The daughter saw her father alive and began to cry, saying that Ian had saved them. She said that her father and Ravi had been unconscious for two days, and because of this, she was very worried. At that moment, a mustachioed gentleman came into the room and said that he was very happy that the master had finally regained consciousness, for everyone in the castle was in a state of excitement. The Lord made himself comfortable on the bed and asked what happened to the other participants. He was curious about what happened when the blonde sorcerer joined them. The aide bowed his head down and said that twelve soldiers and the knight Rothen had failed to return. After these words, the room fell silent because everyone felt sorry for the dead. Then the man asked where the sorcerer was, and the mustachioed gentleman said that he would bring him here in a moment. The young man was found on the training field and told that the Lord wanted to see him, but first he asked if the Lord was all right, and whether it was necessary to postpone their meeting until a little later so that he could rest and gain strength. The mustachioed gentleman, smiling sweetly, said that the Lord was alive and well. That's why he asked me to come to his bedroom to discuss certain details in private. The blonde froze for a few seconds as he was a little worried about what exactly would be discussed. After all, he was not yet ready to answer any uncomfortable questions. However, when the young man came to the Lord, he was already dressed in his usual clothes, and on his right side stood his son, whose left cheek was taped. The man invited the guest to come in. The guy asked them how they were feeling, smiling sweetly. He wanted to know that first, so he wouldn't start with something he didn't want to talk about. The Lord replied that it was all thanks to the sorcerer, so he would like to personally express his gratitude for their rescue. After all, he literally saved the present and future of the Mogrian family. He also cleared Mount Mogrian of goblins. Because of this, the Lord cannot ignore such an act. During these words, the man put his right hand on his heart to demonstrate the sincerity of his words. Then he reached for a small wooden box that was lying on the table and handed it to the blonde and asked him to open it. The young man began to do it slowly because he did not know what was inside. It turned out that it was a ring he had seen before. The Lord said that he had heard that the young man had felt the mana in Margaret's ring. It had been in their family for a long time, but he had no idea of its power. Then the man asked if it had helped him. The blonde answered that the ring added mana to its wearer, so he had to use it in the battle with the goblins. The Lord said with a serious expression that he was glad to hear that. He added that from now on this ring belonged to him, and the young man could consider it a badge of honor. And then the boy opened his eyes and mouth wide and asked, The insignia? He didn't fully understand what it meant and how it was supposed to help him. So the Lord added that from that day on, he proclaimed Ian Page a wizard and an eternal and permanent guest of the Mogrians. During these words, the blonde man carefully examined the ring in his hands. Then the man asked if the young man would accept his gift. The Lord lowered his head and looked down and waited for a few seconds for a response from his guest. He didn't want to interrupt the young man's thoughts, which were now raging in his head. However, without waiting for any response, he said that their family would always welcome him with honor and come to his aid in times of need. The young man raised his head high and listened attentively. 
His oath will be passed down from generation to generation as long as there are Mogrians north of the Emerald River. After these words, the man and his son bowed low to the blonde man. The next day, the sorcerer and several guards set off on a short journey, during which they had to walk part of the forest. One of them was constantly walking next to the blonde man. Suddenly, the young man stopped and turned to the captain and asked how far it was to Lloyd's village. The guard was not expecting such a question, so he thought about his answer for a few seconds. Then he smiled sweetly and said that there was not much left. They only had to go around a small mountain and then they would be there, so they had to hurry up. At that moment, the sorcerer had a memory of asking the Lord if there were any alchemists in the province who could make the elixir. The man replied that he knew that an alchemist named Ladio lived in the village of Lloyd in the north. He's from the capital, but he's come to collect special herbs, so you can visit him and ask him if he can do you a favor, namely develop an elixir that can help restore the missing mana. These reflections were interrupted by one of the guards, who shouted loudly and pointed forward, asking the sorcerer to look there, because something strange was happening there. And when they got a little closer, they saw that a large fire was going on in the village at the foot of the mountain. The smoke was quickly spreading around. The blonde man froze in place for a few seconds, surprised. He hadn't expected to see something like that. He was hoping that at least today everything would go smoothly and without incident. However, the guards were not at a loss and had already begun to take out their weapons. But they had to get an order from the sorcerer to use it, because they could not act on their own. At this time, a group of robbers was causing chaos in the settlement and frightening the locals. The leader of the bandits put an axe on his right shoulder and smilingly ordered his subordinates to deal with the rest of them because it was time to go on their way. Then the man smiled slyly and added that it was time to take the man they had come for to Lockwood. Another distinctive feature that distinguished this impudent man was that he had a black patch over his right eye. It turns out that the person they came for was a young man who was screaming loudly and resisting because he was being kidnapped. The frightened father shouted after his son, calling his name, namely Douglas. The man was upset that he could not do anything at the moment. However, the main thief managed to deliver a crushing blow to this gentleman. When he fell to the ground, he put his foot on him. Looking at his victim, the insolent man put his hand to the side and said to him that he had spoken too much. This is how he deserved this punishment. The boy tried his best to get out of the kidnapper's hands and run to his father's aid, but he was mostly annoyed. So he turned to face the young man and asked him if he needed to kill his father to finally shut his mouth. Immediately after saying these words, he raised the knife up and told his father that he would take his son to a better place and he could rest in peace. The young man began to cry loudly because he did not want his father to die like that. He deserved a better life than they had. However, Everything did not happen as expected. For some reason, it was the attacker who was pierced by some rather strange weapon. The rest of the hooligans began to fuss among themselves, saying, What happened? Where did this ice come from and what was that all about? And when they finally saw the blonde sorcerer approaching them, they decided that they needed to run in different directions. And the young man returned to his rock from where he could normally observe everything that was happening in the small settlement. Then he turned his attention to his right hand and realized that the ring really helped so he could use it more often. And it was with her help that he rose to the third grade level. At that time, the family approached the deceased, who was lying on the ground. However, this perfect silence around the guy was broken by his main assistant, who called him by name to get his attention. Then the blonde asked the captain if there were any wounded. The captain replied that thanks to him, they were all safe so there was no reason to worry. The young man turned his gaze slightly to the right and down and said briefly and clearly, good, and he froze, looking at something carefully. Then the question arose in his mind whether the man they tried to kill was still alive. Everyone was trying to bring him to life at the same time. Even his son was sitting next to him and asked his father to wake up. However, for several minutes, the man showed no signs of life. So the blonde man quietly came closer, put his hand on the young man's shoulder and asked for permission to examine his father. After receiving a positive answer, the sorcerer began to examine everything carefully, because every small element can be important. He also noticed that the gentleman had very light skin, as if there was no blood underneath. He also had gray strands in his hair, 
After a few minutes of careful examination, the sorcerer realized that there are some people who have mana only in their brains. This made the man look even worse. Because of this, the blonde man acted immediately and put two fingers of his left hand on the victim's scrap and a blue light appeared around them. The only way to relieve the pain is to remove the remnants of stagnant mana and introduce new mana. After that, all the wounds began to gradually disappear. Then the sorcerer got to his feet and began to walk slowly toward the exit, and a young man grabbed him by the back of his clothes and asked if his father would survive. With a sad expression on his face, the young man said that this improvement would only last for a certain period of time. After all, this action does not cure the disease completely. My son became very upset because this is how things turned out, because he had a little hope for good news. And at this time, the thought occurred to the sorcerer that the effect would not last long. So the man would have to choose an option, either to receive mana constantly or to die. The son was very upset by this development because he loves his father. However, the boy suddenly began to run quickly to the right, and his father's friend loudly asked where Douglas was going. When the blonde man heard the name, he repeated it to himself because it seemed familiar enough. It was as if he had already known a person with that name in the past. And a second later, I remembered that this name belonged to a very great and respected alchemist in history, who was a native of ordinary people. In his past life, the objects of his hatred were sorcerers. He is an alchemist who became addicted to manna because of a sorcerer and a magic flower that grows in the South. This flower is indeed endowed with the effect of neutralizing manna, but it is also a strong poison. Therefore, it must be used correctly. Because of this, the blonde used acceleration magic to catch up with the young man and talk to him seriously. Perhaps he would listen to him. When the sorcerer appeared in front of the young man, he was quite frightened because he did not expect anyone to follow him. The blonde man put both hands on his shoulders and said that there might still be bandits outside the village, so it was not safe at the moment. The dark-haired man began to cry again, saying that he could not just leave his father to die because he could find the flower. Then the sorcerer used the magic of putting him to sleep, because he simply could not bear to watch his son suffer while looking at his father. However, the son still hoped to find a flower that would help his father continue to live his carefree life. But he was already so tired from the excitement that he simply did not have the strength to go in search, so he fell into the arms of his interlocutor. He began to cry loudly, because he was unprepared for such a loss at such an early age. He still dreamed of spending a lot of time with his father. While the young man was resting quietly on the grass, the sorcerer looked at him and emphasized that despite his age, he still looked like Douglas from his past life. And then the boy realized that if he did not come to the village, Douglas's father would die and he would be captured. The sorcerer realizes that it was Douglas who created the poison that killed him. And he knew Ragnar's plan. Because of this, he wonders if he needs to get rid of this problem now but he realized that hasty decisions could backfire on him, so for the time being he would not use force against him. After all, he is so talented that he has risen from the bottom to the status of an imperial alchemist. That's why you need to lure him to your side. However, the question arose, where are the guarantees that he will not give it away? We could protect him from slavery. And then these thoughts were interrupted by a man's voice. It turns out that it was the blonde's chief assistant who rushed after him as soon as he started running, and he finally managed to find him. Then the man turned his head to the young man, who was lying quietly on the grass resting. The assistant asked what had happened to him. The sorcerer replied that the young man was acting recklessly, so he had to put him to sleep for a while because he might do something stupid. And the blonde man said, bending low, that since the guard had come, he would be tasked with taking this young man to the village because it was dangerous to stay here. For some reason, he started moving in a completely different direction. The assistant asked if he would not go with them. After all, he had come here for him. The sorcerer turned his slanting gaze to his companion and said with a serious expression that he had to go to a certain place so they could go without him. After everything happened, everyone returned home late in the evening. We started to rest because the day had been hard, both mentally and physically. A man approached the boy who was lying quietly on the bed resting and asked him in a calm tone if he was sleeping. It turns out that it was my father. He managed to recover. And he said that he was told that a sorcerer had appeared in the village and saved them. A minute later, he added that he also knew that they were up to something reckless. 
The young man continued to lie in the same position and said that the gentleman had promised that he would find the flower. When his father heard this, he was surprised and said that it was very dangerous because the robbers could still be around and harm him. Finally, the boy got up and shouted in hysterics what he needed to do because he was told that his dad would continue to be ill. The man was very upset by his son's reaction, but he realized that the boy did not want to lose his care so soon. This symbolizes that he loves him very much. Sobbing, the man said that he had been looking for this flower for over a year and had no luck. Therefore, this gentleman will not be able to find it either, so there is nothing to hope for. However, someone knocked quietly on their door so as not to scare them or wake them up because it was already very late for the guests. My father asked in a confident tone who was there. A blonde man dressed in a cloak stood outside the door and replied that he had been told they needed the rander flower. Hearing this, the man walked slowly to the door and carefully opened the wooden door to welcome such a late guest. As soon as the light fell on the sorcerer's face, he carefully began to remove his hood so that everyone present could see who had come. At the same time, he wished everyone a good evening. The boy told his father that it was the same sorcerer they had been talking about. The blonde man put the object on the table and said that his name was Ian Page. The building owner's attention was drawn to an object that appeared on his desk, so he immediately asked what it was. At the same time, my son suggested that this might be the flower he had been looking for for so long and could not find. He stood still for a few minutes to see at least something from a distance. The sorcerer looked at the table and said that he would give this flower to them, but in return, they had to answer him a question. Then he turned his attention to the owners of the house and asked how they knew about the effect of this flower. The man did not immediately answer. At first he said, well, and then he was silent for a few seconds as if searching for words. But on the second attempt, he also did not give a complete answer, only adding, I read about her and again he fell silent, as if afraid to tell the truth. Nevertheless, he gathered his strength and said that he had read about it in a reference book. After saying that, he immediately raised his head and looked at his interlocutor. Then he brought a book and said that his father had given it to him, and having opened the right page, he asked the blonde to look at what was written there. It said that this flower grows only in the south and can neutralize mana. It has twelve dark-colored petals. The green stems and leaves are poisonous. It wilts as soon as it is picked. After reading this, the blonde man asked if his father was also an alchemist. The man answered this question quickly, saying that alchemy was their family business. Then my dad folded his arms across his chest and leaned against the nearby wall, waiting to see what the guest would say next. And the blonde man looked up at his interlocutor and said that then the gentleman should know that for a sorcerer with two mana, he added that the poison of this flower is fatal. The father listened carefully to this statement. He said that he understood what the boy was talking about. He said that their family had never made elixirs that could harm living beings. And to prove it, he said he could put his hand on his heart. The son did not fully understand what these two adults were talking about. The sorcerer gave a short and clear I see to this information. And then he turned his gaze slowly to the right. Then he thanked me for the answer and took the flower in his hands and raised it high up. A small blue smoke began to appear around it. There was already a lot of blue smoke in the room. And the sorcerer turned his back on the owners and asked them for forgiveness. And when the ice broke, the gentleman had a wilted flower on his hand. And looking at it, he said that it was impossible to transport. He just wanted to preserve its shape by freezing it. The father was surprised by what he saw and asked how the man could have lied to them. The guest replied that he had proved to them that he could find the flower. Then I stretched out my hand to the owner and said that I was offering him a bet, which will be profitable for both him and them. And he began to tell him that he would give him manna so that he would stop depending on his illness. He would also find a way to use the flower in medicine. Instead, the man had to go to the capital with the sorcerer. Finally, the guest added that the gentleman should make elixirs that would help him gather the manna he needs to treat his mother. The man did not like this proposal very much, so he said that as far as he knew, the sorcerer could hire any alchemist. And he's not the best candidate. The blonde man said he needed an alchemist who would travel with him and make elixirs specifically for him. Then the sorcerer turned his gaze to the young man and said that his son ran to the forest without thinking about anything but his salvation. Therefore, he emphasized, 
that he was confident that the gentleman would be able to make the right decision for the good of his child. The homeowner asked if he could give the gentleman time to think about it. The blonde man said, of course. And so it turns out that in this life, Douglas did not lose his father, and I did not become a slave. Therefore, he would not allow his talent to fall into Ragnar's hands. The father approached his son and put his hand on his head, and he began to smile with satisfaction. A few hours later, it was morning, and the blonde man stood there silently looking at the village where he would spend the night. However, his idyll was interrupted by the voice of an assistant who came up behind him and called out to his master. So he turned around. The guard said that they had already completed all the preparations, and as soon as the sorcerer was ready, they could set off. Hearing these words, the gentleman was a little upset, because he had not yet received any response to his agreement. So he froze for a few seconds. He turned his attention to the house of the father and son he had saved yesterday. However, no one came out of that door. Then the blonde man lowered his head and gazed down a bit and said that the workers could start moving out a little bit. At the same time, the thought flashed through my mind that they hadn't dared. However, wooden doors slowly began to open in the building, and a father and son appeared through them. They seemed to be packing for a trip. The sorcerer froze in place, looking at them carefully, because he simply did not expect them to come out and give any answer at all. So he started walking toward them, asking if they had made a decision. The man replied that there was no point in refusing, because his life depended on the sorcerer. His son, on the other hand, was very happy that they would finally have a normal life, without constant fear for his father and his health. Approaching the blonde man with a sweet smile on his face, he emphasized that he had to keep his promise. Ian began to smile sincerely and answered that he would definitely fulfill everything he had promised earlier. The son went to his father and again asked the sorcerer a clarifying question. Could he really cure his father? The young man turned his gaze to the boy and began to smile sweetly at him. He thought about the answer for a few seconds. Then silence fell between them. And then he said in a calm tone that he promised to do so. He wouldn't have said that if he wasn't going to help. These words made the boy's smile burst into a smile. So he asked with a wide open mouth if he could call the blonde captain. The sorcerer was a little surprised by this question, but said that if he wanted to, he could, of course. He liked it even better that way. At this time, the sorcerer remembered an adult alchemist from his past life who was rude and once even told him to wash the blonde out of his eyes as soon as possible. Suddenly, this conversation was interrupted by the loud sound of hooves approaching them. The rider ordered the horse to slow down and stop. It was one of the sorcerer's assistants who told them that they had to hurry because they had to get home before dark. The blonde man asked if something had happened. Why did they have to rush? The guard replied that the prince had crossed the Kamas River. Upon hearing this information, the sorcerer was surprised that he was already so close to them, so they really needed to get on the road quickly. The assistant said that they had been informed about it in the morning. The sorcerer wondered why he was the last to know, but he did not analyze the situation and instead asked his subordinate if he would lend him his horse. The subordinate, in turn, asked if the gentleman knew how to ride it. As the blonde man approached the animal, he began to stroke its muzzle and said that he didn't quite understand it, but he thought they could get along. That's why I used the magic of taming, because you can't hope for a good case. You have to always be on the safe side, because there may not be another chance. Approaching the horse's ear, he told it in a calm tone that he needed to go to the castle of the province. And as he did so, his pupils glowed blue. The animal began to slowly sink down to the ground so that the man could climb up into the saddle to set off on his journey. When he finally took his seat, he turned to Captain Arnold and told him to remember to pick up Mr. Ledio. After all, he will be the first to leave, and therefore it is the main assistant who will be responsible for the safety and lives of these two people. At this time, the carriage in which the prince was traveling was slowly moving through the forest. The man was sitting in a closed carriage, and guards were riding around him on horseback. The prince was very sad and bored on such a long journey, so he was constantly trying to look out the window to entertain himself a little bit. And the memory of how his father once called him to his room and told him that he had a few more errands to run. He told him that the owner of the tower had recently been in very active communication with the fifth prince. The boy listened attentively to everything his father said. And since many aristocrats listened to him, 
It is very important that Havert takes the prince's side. The son did not yet understand where his father was going and what was required of him. It turns out that the fifth prince, Ragnar, is quite intelligent, so the man is simply sure that he will use Havert to get himself good allies. Then the father turned his head to his son and added that Ian Page should take his side. After all, he and his power would be very useful to their kingdom. Before the tower can accept anything, the young man has to win it over to his side and it will be useful to him in any situation. The prince did not like this idea very much, which made him even more upset again, because he did not want to follow his father's orders, but to manage his own life. After all, Ian is a sorcerer, but he looks like a child, so the young man did not understand what sense he would make. And in general, all wizards are subordinate to the ivory tower, so he would not go over to the prince's side. However, another question arose. Why did the owner of the tower choose Ragnar? The young man then said to himself with his hand over his face that when he became emperor, he would remove all those who ignored him. Suddenly, these thoughts were interrupted by a voice from the street who addressed his majesty to tell him something. It was the second captain of the Imperial Knights named Oliver Raywood who refused, saying that in his opinion, at least now it was necessary to send a message to Mogrian Castle. However, the blonde man propped his head up with his right hand and replied in a serious tone that they had already discussed this and his decision had not changed since then. The captain continued to insist on his point because people there needed to prepare for his arrival in order to meet him with dignity and receive him. However, the gentleman did not want to hear any of this, so he asked if the captain's family lived north of Morin. The subordinate answered briefly and clearly, Yes, that's right. Then the chief asked a question that clarified how much longer they had to travel, and the assistant answered that it would be about two days. Upon hearing this information, the gentleman smiled sweetly and said that since there was not much time left, the captain could send a message. Then he folded his arms across his chest and added that he would see how the guardians of the North and the shields of the Empire would meet such a distinguished person. The subordinate, who was standing by the door at the time and heard everything clearly, was quite surprised that the prince could so easily change his mind and plans. The next day, everyone in the castle was in a frenzy, because the prince's heiress would soon arrive. And his majesty was always giving orders and being the last one to make sure that not a single speck of dust was visible. The man had been so tired over the past day that he had a headache and sat down to think about why they hadn't informed him about the visit earlier, because he hadn't expected such a quick visit. However, he found the strength to go out into the corridor and noticed a butler there and asked him if the other families had arrived yet. The mustachioed gentleman replied that the McFadden and Raywoods would be here soon, and the rest of us were already here. His Majesty then asked if the sorcerer had returned and if there was any information about him at all. The butler shook his head and replied that unfortunately he could not hear anything. The boss was embarrassed by this answer, but it was time to go to the guests. And as soon as they got to the courtyard, one of the guards loudly called out to His Majesty and said that the prince had already arrived and was ready to meet him to greet him and a snow-white carriage was already passing along the small path with a rather important guest who needed to be properly met. When the carriage and crew finally stopped, the door slowly opened, and a blonde young man, who felt quite confident, got out of the carriage. At this moment, his majesty and his assistant were wondering where the sorcerer was. After all, they hoped he would arrive soon. This situation makes everyone a little upset, because they really need his presence here. After all, the prince did not just come to visit. Suddenly, however, the sound of hooves was heard from the right side, and His Majesty turned his head to see the one they had been waiting for. The blonde was very tired because he had not expected the journey to be so difficult, so he apologized for being late. When the sorcerer got down to the ground, the chief said that they were very happy to see him here. Since the emperor's order was addressed to him personally, the boy should stand in front of everyone. Having taken the right position, the blonde approached the two men who were already waiting to be met by someone. Then the prince looked down a little and clenched both hands into a fist and asked if it was Ian Page, because he was the reason they had come here. At that moment, the blonde man looked at the other man and emphasized to himself that he had not seen him so close for a very long time. Then the young man turned his gaze back and saw a group of people dressed in long, gray cloaks discussing something with each other. This piercing look was noticed by one of the girls who had short black hair. 
so she turned her head to see who was looking at her. It turns out that it was a young lady named Cecilia, who had quite nice features and green, big eyes. And she is also a spy for the Coldwood Empire. When their eyes met, the blonde man broke into a satisfied smile. A few minutes later, everyone moved to the castle to hold the meeting. The prince's aide closed his eyes and addressed him, but he reminded him to know his limits, because he had already drunk enough wine. The host told him that the only food here was drinks. Turning his gaze to the right, he said why he had come so far, for he did not even like the sorcerer. The assistant listened attentively in silence. This was his job, to accompany the prince everywhere and be his company, but sometimes he was so bored with everything that he wanted to go on a vacation as soon as possible. At this time, Cecilia leaned against the wall and sipped red wine, and then the thought flashed through her mind that the emperor's tasks were becoming increasingly strange. That's why she doesn't know why they are interested in the boy. A few days ago, she received two orders. The first was to check if the rumors about Ian were true, and if so, to kidnap him and his mother and bring him to Colwood. But she still doesn't know what's so special about him that he needs to be kidnapped. For some reason, however, she did not notice him in the hall. It was already very dark outside, and a large fire was lit in the middle of the backyard. It turns out that the blonde was at the training ground because he was not interested in what was happening inside. He had completely different interests. The black-haired young lady first decided to check what this young man is capable of before drawing any conclusions, so she will start right now. And with the easiest spell, the magic arrow, because you need to find out everything gradually so as not to harm or give away your intentions. However, it didn't work out, because the young man was able to use the magic of the shield in time to protect himself, and it turns out that he passed the first test successfully. The sorcerer turned his gaze to the lady and with a serious expression and a rude tone asked who she was and what she wanted from him. The black-haired woman smiled and replied that she was also a sorceress from the ivory tower. She added that she had come to say hello. The young man asked whether it was customary for them to greet others by attacking them from behind. After all, it's not fair to do that to another person. The young lady was surprised to hear such words, so she asked the boy to watch his tongue because she was older and he should show respect. However, the young man interrupted this speech by saying the young lady's name, Cecilia, which surprised the interlocutor because she thought he did not know her. The sorcerer continued. Cecilia Coldwater. The young lady froze in place with her mouth and eyes wide open, for she did not understand where he had gotten this information. So she asked who he was, and how did he know her name? The blonde man did not hesitate to ask a counter question about how she guessed. At this time, the thought flashed through his mind that he wouldn't know, because that's the name given to all spies of the Coldwood Empire. And he said out loud that he could name everyone who worked with her. He immediately began to say, Yol, the observer of Molten Stable, Robin, secretary to Emperor Ario, soldier of the Ninth Detachment. The woman did not understand what was happening now and the sorcerer continued to speak, and his next clarification was that he could name what they all had in common, because he even knew that. The black-haired girl tried not to show that she was very confused and nervous, because this boy had told her a lot of personal information. So she said in a calm tone that she didn't know how he knew so much, but he would be better off pretending that he didn't know anything. In her hand, she used the magic of fire, and a bright orange light began to appear around her which was spreading every minute, but the sorcerer quickly put it out. Again, this surprised the young lady because it had never happened before in her experience. Holding a small yellow ball glowing with white light in his palm, the young man said that he was the only one who knew about them. The black-haired girl began to smile, asking why he hadn't told someone else, and the thought flashed through her mind that he was not injured at all, and how could that be possible after she had used fire magic? The blonde man raised his right hand and added with a broad smile that he knew why they were looking for him and what they had to do. The sorceress froze in her tracks, for she had been closely watching all the actions of the interlocutor, for it was clear from his actions that he was up to something. And it was not in vain, because the sorcerer was able to use the magic of freezing with just one hand and send a small group of sharp arrows made of ice at the young lady. 
Then the sorcerer moved his hand a little forward, as if he were controlling his newly created weapon to demonstrate his strength and power. And the ice arrows really began to fly in the direction the blond man's hand was pointing. However, he had to use a lot of mana to do this. When the opponent saw this, she was confused for a second, because she had never had to fight such young men using her most effective weapon. So she began to use a mana barrier to protect herself from this weapon. She held it with both hands because the airflow was very strong. However, even the shield began to crack under the strain. But the sorceress did not lose hope that he would be able to save her. And the blonde decided to use fire magic to melt his opponent's shield and get her out of the protection to continue the battle. When everything was ready, the guy launched a fire blast right at the place where the witch was standing and everything around her glowed orange. And then the lady realized that she could not attack while she was holding the barrier. However, if she didn't move away now, she would simply die. And in just one second, the shield cracked and broke into many small particles that had been floating in the air for several seconds. And then they began to injure the sorceress, who stood in her place and tried to endure the pain that these particles were causing her. However, when the explosion occurred, the sorceress managed to dodge and was caught by an explosive wave of air that spread quite quickly. A few seconds later, the black-haired woman turned her head back to see what had happened. This gave her a chance to catch her breath and rest a bit. Then she fell to the ground and put her right hand on her stomach and grimaced at the pain that tore through her body. However, she was surprised that she was able to survive. But while I was lying there, I began to think that he must have used up all the mana to use the fireball and soon people will come here. However, he has no dirt on her and no one will believe the child's words. Because of this, she decided to recuperate first and then solve problems as they came. However, she was approached by a blonde man who said he could open her up, and all this right now. After saying these words, the guy began to smile slyly, as if he really had something for her. The black-haired woman began to smile to herself, wondering if it was true. After all, in her opinion, it was simply not possible. However, the young man added that there was evidence that the cold walkers themselves were not aware of. The black-haired woman became serious, and all she could say was, that's nonsense. And at that moment, many people came running to the training field, hearing the powerful explosion and running to the echo of the sound and dust that was still in the air. The prince's aide wanted to ask what was going on here, but he didn't have time because the black-haired fellow saw her and said her name and began to walk quickly toward her. He sat down next to her and began to help her up, asking what happened. There were many small wounds on her body. The young lady did not have time to answer, because the blonde man did it for her, saying that it was he who had done all this to her. All those present turned their heads to him, and the prince's assistant, with a serious expression and a rude tone, asked for an explanation because everyone present did not fully understand everything. So the guy has to explain why he did it. The sorcerer began to tell him that he had accidentally noticed the lady. She was talking to a man wearing a mask. The words she heard surprised the black-haired woman, and she said, What? with her mouth wide open. However, this did not prevent him from continuing his story. So he added that when they saw him, they tried to kill him. After listening carefully, the guard decided to clarify that the blonde man was only defending himself. The young man answered briefly and clearly, yes. Then the prince's assistant asked if he could prove his words. The sorcerer replied that they had checked each other's bodies, and these could be marks, so he had to examine them. The black-haired woman's comrades came to her defense and asked if the captain was crossing the border. Does he really distrust the wizards from the tower? But the man did not answer any of the questions, and instead slowly drew his sharp, large sword. And then he raised it to the faces of the two men, demonstrating that he was not going to listen to them at all. Therefore, he decided to make it clear that a follower of the king was here, and that an unpleasant incident had occurred in this place. Because of this, he needs to find out what really happened, and how it is connected to the wizards of the tower. The young lady's friend asked for a few minutes to heal her, though. However, the assistant was quite determined, so he said that they would be able to do this only after the inspection was completed. This procedure was carried out by two women who came with the prince, so they were asked if they had found anything. The young ladies shook their heads and sadly reported that they had not seen anything suspicious.
The sorcerers realized that they were right, so they immediately said that they had said exactly what they had said before, and it turned out that they were suspecting the wrong people, so they immediately began treatment. The assistant turned his gaze to the blonde man and asked him a question to find out if he had lied to him. The sorcerer closed his eyes and replied that he had no intention of doing so, because it would be of no use to him. Immediately after he said that, he began to walk slowly toward the black-haired woman who was still sitting on the ground covered in wounds. He went behind her back and put his hand on her neck and apologized for having to do this. The young lady began to resist a little. And turning her gaze back, she tried to see what this impudent boy, who had already done enough damage to her, was going to do. Everyone present froze in their seats because they were also curious about what the blonde was going to show them. A few seconds later, a blue mark of mana appeared where he touched it. Chornyava turned her gaze to her abuser and asked him what he was doing. What does he want from her? The guy didn't give any answer to her question, instead saying that he saw them running their hands around in that place, probably checking the tags. All cold walkers are sent to training camps where they are marked. Only the trainers know about it. Only after a year of interrogation did one of them crack and tell the secret. The prince's assistant turned his head to the other magicians and asked them if they knew what it could mean. What meaning does it have? The men replied that it was the first time they had seen it. Then the assistant asked Ian if he knew. The young man replied that he did not know either. This made the assistant think about the fact that no one knows the meaning of the mark, but it clearly means something important. So he ordered her to be treated first, and the interrogation would be arranged later. Chorniava was furious at this development, and her two friends had to prepare a mana maker. The men were also upset, because they were too sure of their rightness. Then the prince's assistant turned his head toward the blonde and addressed him by name, so that he would look at him. And when their eyes met, the dark man said that if it turned out that he was right, then he would definitely tell his majesty about it. The blonde stood silently and listened attentively, for this was important information to him. Just a few hours later, the man finally told the prince that the boy had defeated a third-grade sorcerer, and the prince was quite surprised. And at one point it was even funny because no one could believe it, because this had never happened in their lifetime. So the prince folded his arms across his chest and asked Oliver what his opinion of this blonde man was because it was important for him to hear this information. The assistant said that this guy was really different from all the sorcerers he had met before. His speech and behavior are not like those of ordinary commoners. After these words, the prince thought that he would need to meet in person to verify all of the above. So he asked Oliver to bring him. When the blonde man entered the room, he immediately bowed his head and looked down as a sign of respect and asked in a low voice if his majesty had called for him. At this time, the man was already standing by the wardrobe with his hands behind his back saying that he had been informed that the young man had managed to find a spy among the cold woods and had defeated her, even though she was a top-class sorceress. Finally, the gentleman added that he could say with certainty that it was a worthy victory. The blonde man closed his eyes and said that he was honored by the praise. Then the prince spread his arms to the sides and began to smile sweetly, saying that the sorcerer deserved a reward. So if he has a specific wish, he can voice it. And then the thought flashed through the young man's mind that the prince wanted to test how greedy the boy was, but he would fail. However, once they offered, he would not refuse. He began to say that if they allowed him to, he would like to see the ruins of the old ivory tower on his way out of the castle. Hearing this request, the gentleman was quite surprised, so he repeated the words, Ruins of an old tower? Why? What's interesting there? The young man replied that he had been told about him as a child so he wanted to see everything with his own eyes. The prince thought that the sorcerer could have asked for anything, but he asked for such a small thing. However, what can you expect from a child? So I decided to agree, because after all it was a wish from someone who had done a very good deed for him, so it would not be a pity to spend several hours traveling for it. However, the blonde asked for this for a reason, because under the ruins of the old tower, there is a dungeon where the a book with dragon spells. It is written in the dragon language, which played a key role in the study of temporal magic. This manuscript cannot be found anywhere else. In his past life, he found it shortly before his death and was never able to understand it completely. This time, however, he would have more time to learn a lot of new things. 
This made him happy, because the day and evening before had been quite stressful. The next day, the crew set off on a journey through a dense forest. The beautiful wooden carriage was accompanied by guards on horseback on all sides. The mother looked out the window with her mouth wide open and said that this was the first time they had ever gotten this far, and it was very beautiful. Then the woman turned her gaze to her son and asked him a clarifying question. Did he think it was also true? Or maybe he thought differently. However, the blonde man began to smile sincerely, saying that he also liked the fact that they would travel the world together in the future. The alchemist put his right hand over his heart and said that he would need to give Mrs. Page a tour. And he could do it, because he had lived in the capital for a long time. The young lady began to laugh loudly, covering her mouth with her hands. Finally, she could relax a little bit and have a normal rest and enjoy the moment. This reaction made my son a little angry, so he turned his head to the window to calm down a little. Suddenly, however, he heard a knock at the door. It turns out that it was the second vice captain of the Imperial Army named Paul who knocked, and he told Ian that they had already arrived at the place. So the sorcerer, as soon as the carriage stopped, began to get out, to see everything with his own eyes. Looking around, everything was just like in his past life. Paul went on to say that they would stay here for two days, and his majesty allowed Ian to move freely throughout the territory of the destroyed castle. After the words were said, the man began to smile sweetly because he was in a pretty good mood today and they went on a trip. However, first he decided to show everyone who came to the camp the place where they would stay, i.e., where they would be able to rest. The people listened attentively, and he began to follow the vice captain. A few minutes later, they arrived in a small village where they were greeted by a group of people who said with a sincere smile that it was a great honor to receive a follower. The prince was a little confused by these words, so he began to smile unnaturally, saying that he did not need to attach such importance to it. The sorcerer silently watched this situation from the sidelines, for he was curious about the kind of person this prince was and whether he had any weaknesses at all. And then the boy concluded that the gentleman was not behaving badly with ordinary people, so maybe he was actually a good person and not the one he wanted to appear to be. And a memory from my past life came to mind. Namely, when they met, the prince looked quite hostile and was always angry with everyone around him. There was no smile on his face and his eyebrows were drawn together. His eyes reflected orange light. Therefore, we could conclude that he was dissatisfied with his life. However, he may still have behaved like that because Ragnar was always with the sorcerer and not all the locals liked his behavior and confidence. He behaves differently with other people who do not belong to the family and aristocrats. He smiles sweetly, happily, and naturally carries on a conversation. He must have realized that the emperor wanted his son to become a follower. Suddenly, these thoughts were interrupted by the alchemist's son, who addressed the blonde as captain and asked when they would go to the ruins. The sorcerer asked in surprise what the young man wanted there. The boy ran his hand through his hair and said that he would like to see it too. The blonde was tired, so he closed his eyes and began to think that the basement would still appear at dawn, so he told the young man that they would go down together tomorrow. The boy was very happy to hear these words. He couldn't believe it, so he asked again, Shall we go together? Because he was clearly not expecting such an offer. Immediately after the positive answer, the young man's emotions exploded, and he began to rejoice loudly, smiling and thanking for the opportunity. Watching this conversation from the side, the alchemist said to the sorcerer's mother that Douglas must have made friends with Ian. Finally, his boy would have someone useful to spend time with. Then he turned his gaze to the beautiful young lady, and with his hands over his mouth, turned to Mrs. Page to say that he wanted to ask her a question. I immediately wondered if Ian had always acted like such an adult, since he was only 12 years old. At his age, other children think about completely different things. The blonde woman turned her gaze to her son and said, looking at him sweetly, that Ian had grown up very early because he had no other option. He is very intelligent and caring, just like his father. Although he doesn't say anything, the woman feels guilty that he has to try to replace his father. The interlocutor clarified, Does he look like his father? Was your husband a sorcerer? The gentleman was interested in learning more about the people he was traveling with. The mother tilted her head and looked down a little as painful memories came to mind and answered that no. Her Fran was an ordinary person, just like she was. After all, 
Even before Ian was born, the man went to work and disappeared. When five years passed, they got his things back. And she doesn't know why, but lately Ian has been... However, she didn't finish her sentence because she realized that she might say too much and then her son would be angry. So if he wants to tell me, he will. And she answered briefly, no. And the interlocutor did not ask because his conscience did not allow him to press on what the person did not want to talk about. It was a journey by wind and stars. After the war ended, he was able to escape the supervision of the emperor and the ivory tower and wandered around without meaning. And was it a mere coincidence that he came across the ruins of the old tower on his way? But it wasn't just that, he had to come here. And today, a young sorcerer stood on this spot. He stopped on the first step and looked carefully at everything around him because he had seen this place before. A few seconds later, he realized that nothing had changed at all since then. Therefore, what he came here for must be in its place. 300 years ago, a war took place here between the wizards of the tower and the followers of the dragons, the draconians. But some of the walls still managed to survive and withstand this battle. Dragons and gargoyles used black magic and had enough power to destroy an entire empire because they needed to eliminate their rivals. However, the high-ranking wizards of the tower had Mitchell Green River as the past ruler of the empire because he could not leave his comrades to their fate and they were able to subdue the will of the dragons and destroy the gargoyles to keep peace on their land. When the emperor led his empire to victory, he gave up his status and devoted himself entirely to his work in the tower. After a while, the old tower stopped being used because people lost interest in it. Therefore, the area became a ruin, which the boy was now looking at. Then he began to walk slowly to the place where he was supposed to be. And in his opinion, it had to be here. So he stood still for a few seconds. Then he touched one of the stones and began to observe what would happen after that, because it takes some time. It turned out that a staircase was supposed to appear, leading deep into the dungeon, into which he immediately began to descend without anyone noticing him. It was quite dark there, so the blonde man had to use the magic of light. After that, a small ball of blue light appeared in his hand. When the room finally became lighter, he saw a large statuette in front of him that looked like a gargoyle. It was quite creepy and inspired some fear. And the thought flashed through his mind that when he first saw this creature, he was very surprised because it looked completely different from what he had imagined. After all, this creature had a large mouth with many different sized teeth that could deliver a deadly bite. Who knew that a real gargoyle would be found in a godforsaken place 300 years after those events and that it could attack him now? And everything happened as expected. The creature pushed off the shelf it was sitting on and began to fly straight at the sorcerer who froze in place for a few seconds. But having mastered his feelings, the guy decided to quickly use a water balloon to stop the creature and prevent it from attacking him. The water balloon hit the gargoyle right in the stomach and threw it back. The creature did not expect to be stopped like that. Therefore, it began to scream loudly out of surprise. Then he hit one of the walls, and a large dent immediately formed in that place, and a cloud of dust rose. The blonde began to look at that place to see what was wrong with the creature. After all, in his past life, he got rid of it in one second. But with his current powers, he needs to work hard. That's why you need to think carefully about your steps. And while he was thinking about it, the gargoyle had already climbed out and began to look intently at his offender, who was now standing below and also looking at him. However, the creature was so angry about what the boy had done to it that it began to move quickly toward its offender. But the young man also had magic he could use in such a case, namely ice spears, which in a couple of seconds began to fly with the sharp side towards the creature. One of them even managed to pierce the creature in the stomach, which again allowed it to stop the offender in midair for a few seconds. However, the blonde decided not to wait that long and immediately used the magic of lightning, which began to appear immediately around his hand. A second later, he pointed this weapon in the direction of the gargoyle, and it began to burn, and a large fire of bright orange color appeared around it. Then the young man began to think about what he could do after defeating this giant, dangerous creature, which, in his opinion, was no longer showing any signs of life. A passage should immediately appear. So the young man began to look around carefully so as not to miss what he had just fought for. And in a second, two doors to an even deeper dungeon appeared in the stone ground on the boy's right side, into which the sorcerer must go next. 
When the young man saw this, he realized that everything was exactly the same as in his previous life. So it gave him great pleasure. To get down, the young man used the magic of an easy landing, because there were no stairs down, so he had to get out of the situation. In this room, there was a large concrete table with a book on it, on which light fell through the ceiling and illuminated everything around. The young man was very pleased to see her, because in this life they were able to meet much earlier and he would be able to apply her knowledge. The book looked very beautiful. Some of its parts were decorated with gold, which gave it great value in those difficult times for all people. When Ian came closer to the table, he calmly and quietly addressed his find and asked who had hidden it here, in this godforsaken place. Then the boy began to suggest who could have done it, and in his opinion it could have been the dragon or the first sorcerer because no one else could have done it. So he hopes that at least in this lifetime he will be able to analyze more recordings and thus understand her better. After all, they will have enough time. But when he carefully picked it up and opened the pages, what he saw surprised him. Inside were blank pages, and then he assumed that it was because he had been able to use it before. That is, he had used her knowledge in a previous life. Not fully understanding why he could not see the text in the book, the sorcerer closed it very loudly and began to think about what to do next. When he started to move toward the exit, he realized that it was good that he remembered the ones he had learned in his past life. He began to recite them in order to use at least one of them, and he was unable to use anything. The language of dragons depends entirely on mana, not on pronunciation, and it turns out that dragon spells can be used only once and then they disappear. And then the guy realized that since he would no longer be able to use the time machine, he would not be able to go back in time, and he expected to be able to go back and forth as much as he wanted, and this conclusion upset the sorcerer a bit because he had other plans. However, it is good that he learned about it now, and not when it would have been too late. But at this time, the passage of time will put much more pressure on him. The next day, everyone set out on the road and had to arrive in the capital after a certain period of time. Ian was informed about this by one of the guards. Immediately after these words, the carriage with the guards began to drive to the gates of the settlement, where large flags hanging at the very entrance symbolized the authorities in the area. When the sorcerer began to look at everything through the window, the thought flashed through his mind that he was finally tired of the journey. But from that moment on, he began to worry about how the meeting would go, how he would be received here and what conditions he would have to live and work in. He was also worried that if Cecilia escaped and united with other cold walkers, the Empire would immediately start hunting for him, and she will be the first to tell him that he knows about their existence. Therefore, she needs to be closely monitored at all times so that she cannot do anything like that. And this was starting to annoy him because he had enough problems without her, and now he would have to constantly deal with this young lady. But then something happened that made him stop his thoughts and look to the right in surprise at the scene of the incident that had attracted the attention of everyone present. Therefore, they all stopped in their tracks, not understanding what they should do next and why it was happening this way, because it should have been different. It turns out that a group of people dressed in long, dark cloaks appeared on the road. One of them stuck his hand out and ordered those who were moving to stop. The prince's black-haired assistant did not understand what was going on and what this gentleman wanted from them. After all, he was accompanying the main person, and an ordinary person cannot allow this to happen. However, when the man looked closely, he saw that their movement was obstructed by the owner of the tower. He stood quite confidently and was very serious. So the assistant quickly dismounted from his horse and asked the man why he was obstructing the king's follower. The gentleman replied that he had received such an order from his majesty. The guard was quite surprised to hear this information, as he did not understand why such a decision had been made. The owner of the tower said that the investigation into the case of the sorceress Cecilia was being transferred to the ivory tower, so right now it should be given to them. The black-haired young man emphasized that he could see that the Lord was in a hurry since he did not even allow them to enter the castle, and something must have changed during their absence. The sorcerer closed his eyes and clarified that he needed to deal with everything first and not put it in a box that would be forgotten and not dealt with properly. When the assistant passed by the gentleman, he quietly told him to relax, because they were taking the investigation seriously so he could be calm 
and immediately after these words, the young man turned to his colleagues and told them to hand the criminal over to the owner of the tower. But then they said that it was too early to call her that. It turns out that it was the owner who said this, emphasizing that as long as the guilt is unproven, she is still the witch of the tower. Because of this, she should be treated with a certain amount of respect. This made the black-haired man very angry, and in order not to do something he would later regret, he simply clenched his hands tightly into fists. The other guards also complained that they had brought her and guarded her all this time and that the wizards would investigate. So one of them turned to the captain and asked if this was legal, and whatever the order was, it was not fair. The blonde expected this development because they are not at all concerned about Cecilia's fate. They simply cannot bear the thought of a sorcerer being judged by ordinary people. They will lock her up in the deepest prison of the ivory tower, from which even she will not be able to escape. And then they will look for a way out of this situation to save their honor. The mother looked out the window and asked her son what was wrong. He replied that it was nothing important. So you don't have to worry about anything. Then he turned to face his window and folded his arms across his chest, saying that at least that was one less problem, and he doesn't have to think about what to do with this witch. A few minutes later, however, Ian was told that his majesty had said that before the young man could enter the castle, he needed to visit a place. When the boy came out near that place, he said with a wide open mouth, this is, but then the words were only in his head that this is the estate that Ragnar gave him in his past life when he became a fifth-grade sorcerer. The prince, who was nearby, asked if the young man liked it, and then, without waiting for an answer, he said that his father wanted to give this estate to the blonde. After hearing these words, the boy bowed low and said that his mercy knew no bounds. The prince told him not to make him laugh, because what kind of mercy is that? While the young man was bowing, he remembered that in his previous life he was 26 years old when he received the castle as a gift, and this time he was not even 14. And he said out loud that the estate was simply magnificent. The prince put his right hand to his beard and closed his eyes, saying that the sorcerer could leave his family and assistants here while they went to the castle together. The boy asked if it was necessary to meet with the emperor today, after all, he and his mother would like to have a quick look around. The prince said yes, but the meeting should still take place. When the woman and her son entered, the lady was amazed at the grandeur and beauty of it. Ian asked her how she felt, but without waiting for an answer, he said that this was now their new home. A memory flashed through his mind that in his past life, a woman had left this world long before he received the estate. The mother put her hand on her chest and said that an ordinary person could live here because, in her opinion, this place looked better than the imperial houses. No matter how great a magician the blonde boy became, he could not accept the fact that his mother was not around. That's why he happily said that the royal family used to use this estate. But now everything is different. He can give her anything he wants, and they will be able to spend more time together because he missed it so much. The young man caught up with his mother and looked her straight in the eye and asked her how she was doing. The woman paused for a few minutes, not knowing how to answer. And the boy was able to conclude that in this life, he would be able to see his mother happy. And these thoughts were interrupted by a lady who said that it was quite spacious and beautiful, but she was worried about whether she would be able to keep such a large house clean. But then something rather strange happened, which even surprised the young man himself. And he turned to his mother and said that from now on she would not have to touch the dirty dishes or clean them because they could afford it. And he finally left his place of residence because he had an important meeting to attend. Meanwhile, everyone in the imperial castle was also preparing for the meeting. The closer the blonde approached, the more touching it was for him because in his past life, he had never met the present emperor. After all, when he graduated from the academy and began to change the world, the disease had already taken him. However, he was constantly well spoken of because of his wisdom and political leadership. Walking behind the guard who accompanied him, the sorcerer looked at everything around him and thought that it would be good if he could get something good from his majesty. After all, he had heard so much about him that he was indeed a very great and wonderful person to follow. And then he wondered what the fifth prince of the empire was doing now. After all, he is most like his father, but unlike him, he does not understand such feelings as compassion and mercy. Ragnar is now his old friend and new enemy. 
However, he did not know what would happen when they met again. It is not clear yet. And while he was thinking about all this, he had already reached the door through which he needed to enter and meet his majesty. The guard who stood by the door began to open it slowly because it was very large, and secondly, it was too heavy for one person to open quickly. When the sorcerer was finally able to enter, he saw the chief sitting calmly on his throne, with his son standing next to him. The blonde man got down on one knee and with his head bowed down, quietly said that he was honored to meet his majesty. The chief told the boy to stand up in a serious tone. He began to say that Ian Page, a native of the South, was very young and had already achieved a lot. The blonde man got to his feet, looked down and replied that it was not so. His majesty said that he was telling it like it is. After all, in such a short period of time, he could hardly learn the etiquette of a nobleman. That's why he can be himself. The young man was very offended by the words, relax. You haven't had time to learn all the rules of etiquette yet. Ragnar also said these words to him during their first meeting. However, these reflections were interrupted by the boss, who said that the boy had come a very long way. Then the gentleman asked if the sorcerer liked the mansion, because he had chosen one of those used by his family. Meanwhile, the prince stood nearby and listened attentively. The guy began to smile sweetly, saying that he had never thought of such a house even in his wildest dreams, and at this point, of course, he had to lie. But his majesty did not understand what the guest meant, so he decided to ask if he liked it or not. The guy looked up at the other man and said that he certainly liked it, and that his mother was also very happy that they would live in such a beautiful place. Then his majesty asked if the sorcerer knew why he was here. Why did he send his follower after him? Why did he invite him to the estate? And why did he give him a house upon his arrival? While these questions were being asked, thoughts flashed through his mind. Should he answer directly? After all, straightforwardness was a quality he liked in Ragnar, and he probably got it from his father. But he realized that it's not time until he gets what he needs. So he will pretend to be an ordinary 12-year-old boy with simple thoughts and desires. And so I had to answer what a child would answer. He replied that perhaps it was because he was a talented sorcerer, because people were always saying that he was better at magic than anyone else. The chief folded his arms across his chest and said, You think? Is it because of your talent? And then the room fell silent as the young man had to think about these words and formulate his answer. The prince, who was still in the room, even thought about these words, but did not say a word. But it was at this moment that he turned to his father. And when he heard his son's voice, he turned his head to find out what he wanted. Then the man said that Ian was just a child. What could he possibly understand now? This surprised his majesty, because it was the first time he had ever seen a prince stand up for someone. After all, he does not have the kind of character to interfere in anything. Because of this, the boss decided to support his son's position, as it might give him some confidence in himself and his words. So he answered with a short and clear, that's right. The chief then said that he had invited the young man here because of his skills. The other sorcerers and knights who accompanied him were very surprised by his talent. He also served the state by catching a foreign spy, and all children are entitled to a reward for good deeds. So the gentleman asked what the boy wanted to get. The blonde began to think that the kindness of the current emperor knew no bounds. So here was his chance. But he said out loud that he had already thought about it. Then he emphasized in his head that he was a child now, and if he were older, he could ask for something more valuable. So he said out loud that he wanted to see everything here. His majesty was a little surprised by this, so he asked again, To see? The sorcerer added that he wanted to see the castle from the inside, how beautiful it was, and then share his impressions with his mother. The prince turned to his father again and said that on the way here, the young man had asked to see the ruins of the old tower. He added that all children are curious at a young age. The chief replied that if that was the case, he didn't mind and would make an order right away so that he could fulfill his wish in peace. Then one of his majesty's aides showed the boy the object, and the chief said that by showing this sign he would be able to pass through any room of the castle. The sorcerer could also ask the guards to show him where everything was. The young man picked up the card, which looked very beautiful and golden. Finally, his majesty asked if he had any other wishes. 
The young man looked down and smiled sweetly and replied that he had nothing more to dream about. But the chief smilingly said that for once, he would reward the sorcerer at his own discretion. After all, his wish seemed quite ordinary. And immediately after these words, he said one word, bring it in. And maids began to enter the room holding something in their hands. It turns out that it was a chest of gold. It was completely filled with gold coins. Then his majesty said that these maids who came in would go to the blonde manor. He emphasized that they had been working there for a long time, so there should be no problems. Hearing these words, the young man immediately began to think that now his mother would not have to worry about cleaning. He thanked his majesty for his generosity. After the meeting, the sorcerer went out into the corridor and slowly closed the door behind him and stopped for a few seconds to calm down. And to conclude that this gentleman is indeed a very great man. He also did not expect to receive sympathy in his direction. He had this feeling of being checked and suspected. That's why you need to be resilient. He also had to be on his guard when talking to anyone in the place, especially Ragnar. However, he remembered that he needed to take care of something because there was little time left. So he headed for the royal garden. When a guard stood in the way, the guy pulled out a sign and said that his majesty had told him to show it to him. Seeing this, the subordinate replied that he would show him around. Then, once inside, the young man decided that he would pretend to look at the local buildings. However, he was very happy to finally be in the royal sanctuary. After all, he loves this place very much because he spent a long period of time here in his past life. In some moments, he was happy. And no one else but the royal family has the right to come here, to the place where his ancestors rest. One day I will be here, but it is still a long way off. These words were spoken by Ragnar. The wizard decided to go down into one of the dungeons. However, he was a bit frightened by a strange and loud sound. It turns out that it was a security guard who was on duty that day. He found it so boring that he even fell asleep. But the young man decided to use the magic of sleep just in case, so that the man would not wake up and find him here. Then the boy used the magic of light, which spread around with the help of a ball hovering above his palm. And he was looking for something that was supposed to be near the grave of the first emperor. But for some reason, walking through the halls, the young man could not find what he was looking for. So he passed by the same place several times. Finally, he found a mushroom with a stone heart. There were several of them, and they turned out to be very useful to the sorcerer. Using an ice spear, he cut them off and began to hide them in his cloth bag. And what he had gained would be enough. Suddenly, he heard an unfamiliar voice say, What are you doing here at this hour? This scared the young man because he did not expect anyone to catch him here. It was also possible that the magic had not worked and the guard had woken up so he decided to quickly extinguish his light so as not to draw attention to himself once again. He decided to hide. When he was standing near one of the big columns, he heard two people talking about something, and they were in great humor. It turns out that he was a guy a little older than the sorcerer. He had brown hair. Walking down the stairs, he addressed the princess with a serious expression. Hearing these words, the blonde man repeated to himself, A princess? and he began to analyze that there were three princesses in the royal family, and of course not one of them was Ragnar. Then he heard the voice of a young lady, who said quietly that no one comes here, and it is quite quiet, and that she does not have prying ears. A second later, she added that she had come here because her duty as a princess required it. Then she turned to Mr. Kevin and said that he really wanted to test the sanctuary's security. And then the blonde realized from the voice that it was Haley Green River, who is the sister of the prince consort. So he turned his gaze to her to get a better look. But for some reason, the young man was very nervous because he was worried that someone would report it to the tower and then they would not be able to wash it off. Then the woman drew her eyebrows together and said angrily, doesn't the interlocutor know how dangerous the tower is? Then the young lady joyfully folded her hands in prayer and said that her relatives would understand, because she was doing this for the sake of her father and brother. The guy who came with her watched in silence, and looking down, he smiled slightly and agreed to continue to try to help the princess, because they had already come such a long way together. So turning to the lady, he asked her if she remembered the techniques they had learned last time. The woman quickly and clearly replied, Of course I remember. 
The young man asked her to start with the light. The woman said she would try it now, but first she would concentrate the mana, and literally a second later, she succeeded. When the sorcerer saw this, he was surprised that the princess had magic, and the princess asked her assistant why she had made such a small ball of light. The guy answered that she was still a beginner in this business. Hailey Trin River is a woman who has lived her life quietly, like a caged bird. She followed her brother, the successive prince, after Ragnar took the throne and executed him. In his past life, Ian did not know that the young lady was a witch. However, he does not understand why she hides it from everyone. It's not clear to the young man yet. However, the independent study of magic, as well as the concealment of magical skills, is punishable by law, and her sorcerer cannot help but know about it. Then the princess asked her assistant to teach her the magic of protecting a volcano or something else. However, the gentleman replied that it was a difficult spell for him as well. Suddenly, a strange sound caught the lady's attention and she froze in her tracks and listened. The boy did not understand what was happening, so he asked his majesty what had happened. At this time, the young lady's mind was racing with thoughts of what if they were noticed, then they would not get out of trouble. When the boy realized, he nervously said that they had to leave immediately. The princess smilingly asked her assistant to calm down. She added that only her family members can come here. After all, this place is considered sacred to them, so you don't have to worry so much. When the sorcerer had already left the room and was looking at her on the street, he realized that today he had witnessed a very unique situation. But no one could have known that the princess was a witch. Therefore, he needs to think carefully about what he has seen, because in this life it can benefit him. She probably hides her capabilities because she knows that the owner of the tower supports Ragnar, and there is simply no need to demonstrate to everyone what she is capable of. The sorcerer's trip to the sanctuary took a little longer than he had expected. And when he was finally leaving, he was approached by a guard who asked if he was finished. But it was for the best, because he found what he really wanted. Turning his head to his interlocutor and smiling sweetly, he answered, Yes, thank you. Immediately after his little trip, the young man decided to return to his new home. After all, his mother is waiting for him here, and he wants to spend as much time as possible with her. When he entered the room, he was greeted by the alchemist he had brought with him. So he went to him first. As Ian came closer, he asked where his mother and the others were. The man replied that Mrs. Paid was talking to her assistants, and Douglas was looking at the estate that would be his new home. The sorcerer heard this information and said that it was to their advantage. These words surprised the alchemist, who did not yet understand what Mr. Ian meant. Then the sorcerer asked his companion if they could talk. After receiving a positive answer, the young man closed the door behind him so that no one could hear their conversation. And when they were alone, the blonde man told the alchemist that he wanted him to prepare an elixir. He said these words with a serious expression on his face, which symbolized important intentions. The man listened attentively and asked what kind of elixir he should prepare. However, he still did not fully understand why the young man needed it. The sorcerer took out a bag in which he demonstrated mushrooms with a stone heart. They can paralyze a person and stop the heart. The gentleman listened to this information carefully. Then the gentleman asked if the sorcerer really wanted him to prepare a medicine from such a dangerous ingredient because it was poison and he didn't really want to be responsible for someone's death. But Ian asked if the gentleman knew about the magic of interrogation. Of course, the man did not know, so he remained silent for a few seconds, not knowing whether to tell the truth or lie. However, he recalled that he had been told about this when he was a teenager, so he replied that he knew what his interlocutor was talking about. But you could see the sadness on his face. So the blonde man went on to say that he needed an elixir that would help him bypass this magic. The alchemist was again surprised by this information, because he did not expect to receive such a request and he asked if the alchemist could do it. The man replied that he would first need to conduct certain experiments to obtain the final product. Ian replied that the better the better. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door and interrupted the conversation between the two men. The sorcerer turned his head toward the door to see who it was. Someone who was there said that Ian had received a letter from the ivory tower. So the young man quickly went to the door and opened it to read it. For a few seconds, the boy held the letter in his hands, and wondered whether he should open it right now or after meeting his mother, since they hadn't seen each other for almost a whole day. But I decided to read it anyway. 
The text was as follows. Newly arrived wizard Ian Page, we are also looking forward to meeting you. According to the rules, you are required to attend training at the tower. We fully recognize your talent for magic. Exactly one week from now, there will be an official meeting in the tower. Because you are the wizard of the tower, we hope you will attend. And when the alchemist heard the word weak, he became worried, because for him it was not enough time. So the sorcerer turned his head to his assistant and asked him if he could cope with the task he was facing. The man replied, a week at a time. He added that he would just stay awake and do his best. Ian was very pleased with these words and said that he was relying on the alchemist. And now a whole week has passed, and the sorcerer has already set out on his way to the Tower of the Elephant's Braid, where an official meeting will take place, which he must attend. As he rode in the carriage, he thought about how he should behave so as not to damage his reputation. After all, he still had a lot of work to do here. Then he took out a small flask and, looking at it, began to think about whether the effect of this elixir should last for two hours, and during this time he should be able to accomplish everything he had planned. Then he turned his gaze to the window and began to look at the road they were traveling to the tower, but his mind kept thinking about what he should do. A few minutes later, through the window, he saw that big, beautiful building that was only a little bit away, and there he would be met by people who needed to be treated properly. However, he realizes that this tower holds many memories from his past life, and sometimes he even misses the way he lived in the past. But he came back to her anyway, so everything in this life would be better than before. When he arrived at the main entrance, he was met by a man who addressed him as Mr. Ian Page. It turns out that it was a nice young lady. She had two braided hair and wore round, large glasses. With her arms folded in front of her, she greeted the guest affectionately. And then, with a sincere smile, she told the young man to follow her, because she would take him to the owner of the tower. After all, that was why she had been sent here. When they entered through the large door, the young lady turned to the guest and said that the first floor was called the Hall of Enlightenment. Then they stopped in the middle of the room and began to look at what they saw together. The young man tried to memorize everything. However, a second later, Ian realized that the years had not changed this place at all, and it was unlikely to change in the future. That's why everything here is very familiar to him. Suddenly, this awkward silence was interrupted by an assistant who asked the sorcerer if he could see a golden disc a few meters away. The blonde answered that he could see it. And after this answer, the girl said that it was mana lift, and with the help of it, wizards move between floors. And on it, high-ranking sorcerers climbed to the very top floor. And she invited the young man to try it, because that's where the owner of the tower would be waiting for him. And immediately this disc lit up, and Ian began to look around to show his surprise at the device, even though he had seen it before. As the sorcerer moved between floors, he took out the small flask to examine its contents again. After all, he didn't have much time left to take it. And just in the last seconds, he managed to drink the elixir. And having stopped on the top floor, the young man froze to feel those strange sensations after taking it. But his attention was also drawn to what was right in front of his face. And he was excited, so he still needed to control his emotions. It turns out that he is separated from the meeting by a large metal door. He needs to go through it and finally hold the meeting he had been preparing for for almost a week. Suddenly, the door slowly opened and a voice from inside addressed the guest by name and invited him to enter. So he began to walk cautiously. The owner of the tower sat in his luxurious chair and smiled sweetly, saying that he was very happy that the sorcerer had accepted their invitation to meet. Then the man pointed to a chair next to his desk and told Ian not to stand by the door and to come in and make himself comfortable and feel at home. He added that he understood that he was a little nervous. After all, as it turned out, there was a group of people in the room who were sitting on chairs and looking at the guest ambiguously. But there is no point in worrying about it. However, these words did not dispel those worries and anxious thoughts. On the contrary, it became even more frightening to somehow express myself. And then the chief said that all the wizards of the tower had undergone the same rite. As he sat down in his chair, the young man thought that the distrust of these people was noticeable. The gray-haired gentleman went on to say that they fully recognized Ian's talent, but he seemed rather unusual. This made them suspicious, 
After all, all sorcerers are much closer to each other than blood relatives. Therefore, there is no place for distrust among them. The boy put his hands on the circle and listened attentively. After these words, the young man with a naive expression asked the chief a question that read as follows. Are you going to interrogate me? He did this to demonstrate himself as a child. The man folded both his arms across his chest and replied that they really looked so scary. And he added that such barbaric methods were not their thing. But the boy would have to answer the questions. And immediately after that, he suggested that we start so that we could get it over with and have a normal conversation. Ian Page was born in 488 under the sign of the Red Goat. His father is a merchant, Fran Page, and his mother is a cook, Vanessa Page. And in the end, the question was asked, is all this true? The sorcerer answered that it was. The next question was asked by an older man with a gray mustache, and it read as follows. We are interested in the reason for your connections with the alchemist Lidio. Ian looked down and replied that his mother was sick and needed to take medicine all the time, and the Lord advised him to hire an alchemist to be with her all the time. The following question was asked, Why did you go to the ruins of the old tower? The boy turned his head to the person who asked and replied that he had seen these ruins in books and had been dreaming of seeing them with his own eyes. After that, the man who sat farthest away, folding his arms across his chest, asked in a serious tone whether the young man remembered the sorceress Cecilia. The young man answered briefly and clearly, Of course. Then the gentleman continued to say that he had noticed that she was dating someone, and when she saw him, she tried to kill him? And in the end, he asked if it was true. The blonde man replied that this was exactly what happened, and that at that moment, he thought he was going to die. The next question was asked by a woman who raised her right hand to his beard and asked if he had ever studied magic before. Ian replied that he had not. But then a logical question arose. How did the guy know how to use spells like the one that made him look like a fireball and a freezing explosion? After all, this is exactly the kind of knowledge that future magicians acquire while studying at the academy. And no one has ever managed to do it on their own. And finally, there was a clarification that they wanted to get a convincing answer to this question, but it didn't work out that way. Or it happened by accident. Or I don't understand how it happened. With a sad expression on his face, the young man confidently replied that he had been thinking about what he wanted, and it began to manifest itself not only in his thoughts. For example, fire in your palms. And so it was until one day it manifested, and it surprised him quite a bit. One of the adult sorcerers got angry because he did not like this answer, so he angrily began to shout that this was impossible and that it all looked like nonsense. And then the room fell silent. No one knew how to react. Everything seemed to be going according to plan, but there was still some tension. The chief put his head in his hands and thought that they had used the magic of interrogation. And because of this, they could not assume that the guy was lying to them. He went on to suggest that the first sorcerer, of whom legends tell, could have been disguised as a child, or this young man of the highest rank who could suppress the magic of interrogation. However, this is not possible because he is so young, so the man is very curious to know who this guy is and what he can offer them next. However, this uncomfortable silence was interrupted by a woman who abruptly rose to her feet and loudly said to stop this performance. The lady had bright red hair. Then she said that it was enough to ask stupid questions. She suggested that they finally ask what they were all here for. The other sorcerers began to calm the young lady, named Helen, reminding her that the owner of the tower was still present in the room. However, this had no effect on her. So she put her right hand to her side and came closer to the young man and asked him the question, Who are you anyway? After all, this question worries everyone present. A second later, she added that she had had enough of these lying answers. Is that why she suggested that the guy finally tell her who he is? Because her patience was running out. She also asked why the sorcerer was lying to them all. As the lady spoke, the blonde realized that she was the same as she had been in his past life. Helen was the youngest sorceress of the fourth rank before he appeared. She was nicknamed the Lady of Fire for her fiery temper. And in that life, he liked such character traits very much. After such an emotional speech, the guy with wide open eyes asked his interlocutor a question that clarified what she didn't know. 
With red-haired eyebrows, she asked in surprise, What? Because she did not understand what the young man meant. And he said that everything was written in the certificate. And he said, Ian Page, born in 1948, a red goat. And at the end, he asked if the young lady could read. After these words, the woman simply exploded, along with her emotions. She clenched her teeth, drew her eyebrows together, and her eyes turned red. So she asked if the guy was thinking of making fun of her. However, this fight was stopped by the boss, who was still sitting at his desk and watching this action. So when things were getting out of hand, he ordered them to stop. And immediately after that, he began to stare at their guest. And then, calling him by name, he said that he would ask him one last question. And he began to say that on the day of the inspection, he had a conflict with a soldier. The soldier did not behave properly with his mother. The man then reminded them that the gentleman's name was Jonathan and that he had been a bit arrogant toward them. The sorcerer showed that he did not yet understand what was going to be discussed. But the chief continued to say that the next day after the incident, the soldier died. Or to be more precise, he was found in the river. And during the examination of the body, traces of manna were found. And at the very end, the head of the tower asked if he could relate the incident to him. And then a blue light appeared in his eyes, which symbolized that he was getting tense. The young man lowered his head and looked down for a few seconds, and began to think that there was a reason why this man was appointed the head of the tower. After all, he could skillfully bring everyone to light. And he never relied on magic alone. He was always thinking critically and questioning everything. And he tried to understand everything to the end, rather than immediately accuse. An ordinary person would be confused if they were accused of murder. The thought flashed through his mind that if he remained calm, they would definitely start to suspect something. So he realized that since this was the last question, it might be time to get rid of the medication he had taken a few hours earlier. However, this decision had to be made. But then the question arose that he might have to answer what they wanted him to say. So he put his hand on his heart and answered that he knew nothing about it. This answer made all the sorcerers present rise to their feet, because they clearly did not expect this and needed to release their emotions at least somehow. Everyone was looking at the young man who was sitting facing the main tower, because it was by looking at him that he was supposed to answer the question. The gray-haired gentleman began to smile sweetly, saying that the boy's death had nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with the soldier's death. The young man answered briefly and clearly, Yes. After all, he had chosen this tactic, so he had no chance to retreat and had to stick to his appointed plan. So the chief looked down and said that it was good, because the young man could not have done something like that. He apologized for asking such a rude question, but he decided to admit that he had made up the fact that traces of manna were found on the body, because that was what was supposed to bring the guy to the cleaners, as if he had used his powers carelessly. And in fact, the soldier fell off the bridge and simply drowned, unable to get to his feet. The blonde tried to listen carefully to this information. He added that he understands that lying is bad, and he hopes for understanding, because every sorcerer present here has gone through this rite. Therefore, the chief assumes that the guest himself understands that his case is an exception for the ivory tower, and they know nothing about his power. That's why they need to fix this situation. They need to find out not only what they are capable of now, but also what they will be capable of in the future. Then the head of the tower began to tell him that right in front of the boy was a mana storehouse. And it is the main source of this building's power. Now its color is neutral, but the more mana he collects, the more blue it becomes. So the boss asked the young man to direct his mana there. Did Ian specify whether it was all of it? The owner of the tower said yes. After all, all the wizards present want to see everything, and to draw a certain conclusion for themselves because it's already taken a long time. The young man, approaching the balloon, remembered that the storehouse could be filled with manna to the third grade, and it would be better for him to fill it up to the second. After all, if he shows them as much as the sorcerers want to see, they will finally breathe a sigh of relief. However, it is not yet clear why he would do this. After all, he was an eighth-grade sorcerer, but his name will not remain in history, and they will not write wise leader or great leader next to him. Ian has always lived because the situation demanded it. 
So this time, he doesn't care about power, authority, or honor, because he doesn't need them. And standing next to the ball, he tried to gather all his mana and direct it into it. And gradually, the object changed its color from neutral to blue. And at that moment, he realized that magic was more precious to him than anything else. And there is no one stronger than him. That's why he is going to demonstrate it to everyone. In one second, the ball began to crack, because its frame could no longer withstand the influx of mana that Ian had sent into it. It just shattered into small pieces all over the room. All those present instinctively raised their hands to their faces to protect them. After all, such debris could easily injure them. They were also all quite surprised. After this incident, the young man leaned over the balloon and began to cough loudly, because he had to use a lot of his strength to do this. And given that he is still a child, this is a lot for him. The owner of the tower sat there for a few minutes with his mouth wide open because he hadn't expected to see such a level from such a young sorcerer either. And now he didn't know what to do next. After the dust settled, the other people present also froze in their seats and looked attentively at their guest with wide open mouths and eyes. Only the young lady with red hair was able to express her thoughts out loud. Namely, how is this even possible? After all, she thought he was a third-ranked sorcerer, but his level exceeded their expectations. During this time, he was able to regain some of his strength to strike a confident pose to show his best. When everyone had taken their seats, one of the men rose abruptly to his feet, slammed his fist on the table, and said that the rumors about Ian Page were true. On top of that, he was not a third, but a fourth-level sorcerer. Then he turned to the owner of the tower and said that he was the only one here who was no match for this young man. Then the sorcerer asked if everyone had seen Ian's face when he lied about killing Jonathan's soldier or whatever his name was. The gentleman was very outraged by the situation, so he turned to his friends in anger and asked them if they understood what this could mean. The ivory tower must lure him to their side and tame him before he turns into a real monster that can do a lot of damage. But he doesn't need to go to an academy and have his mana checked for five years in the provinces. The owner of the tower said he thought so too. She agrees that Ian should not enter the academy. After all, he will become a problem for other students who are just starting their way in this direction. Because if they are wizards of the highest class, they feel uncomfortable. So it's hard to imagine how they'll feel when they see all the possibilities of this young man. Then the gray-haired leader said that it didn't matter whether Ian Page killed that soldier or helped him die. That was not the problem. The main thing is that the magic of interrogation works, and they will always be able to find out whether he is lying or not. So the man thinks that he doesn't need to remind everyone how important it is to maintain the ivory tower's reputation because they can't fall face first into the mud. And everyone should also remember that the stronger their sorcerers are, the stronger the tower itself will be. Therefore, they all need to unite and combine their powers. Because of this, the head of the tower proposed that Ian Page be recognized as the 12th Arch Wizard and officially declared a 4th Class Wizard. Also, given his young age, he should receive individualized training from a higher class sorcerer. Finally, he asked if everyone agreed with this opinion. The people who were present during this speech all said yes. This made the gray-haired man very happy. So the man immediately asked who among those present was ready to start studying. At that moment, Ian did not expect to be recognized as an arch wizard so quickly and asked to come here again. Although he already had such assumptions in his head, even by his standards, everything happened too quickly. So before he could recover, he had to start working. And when he came to the ivory tower the next day, he stood there for a few seconds, looking at it in peace. However, he was greeted again by the young lady he had seen the first time he met her. The young man looked her straight in the eye and smiled sweetly and said that they had met again. And the lady, with her arms folded in front of her, replied that she had heard that he was recognized as a fourth-level sorcerer. Hearing these words, Ian began to smile, for he did not know how to react to such words. Then the young lady put her hands to her mouth and said with a little shudder, that the boy was simply incredible. After all, he is only 12 years old, and he is already an arch wizard. So she added that all the rumors about him were true. The blonde man asked the woman what those rumors were. The girl said that he might not have been informed yet, but she had been appointed his assistant for the next year. 
and finally, she added that she hoped they would get along. Ian told me that I shouldn't call him by his first name. After all, he is younger. When the assistant heard these words, she simply exploded with happiness because the young man, who was a fourth-level sorcerer, considered her older and more experienced. Since he thought so, she was obliged to give him a tour and show him around. A few hours later, the girl brought the boy to the building of the Magic Academy. Then she turned her gaze to her interlocutor and said that he would have studied with her, but with his incredible skills, he would need a personal mentor. As they walked, the young man thought that this was a very funny-looking personal mentor. He was probably going to brainwash him into taking the side of the tower, and he was sure that this was the intention of its owner. When they came to the place they needed, what they saw surprised the guy a little bit, and he froze in place and said with a wide open mouth, Oh. After all, he saw his friends from his past life standing in a group at that very moment, listening attentively to the teacher who was telling them some things about magic. Watching them, Ian said to himself that in his past life, he had stood next to them and gone through all the training just like they are now. And in a previous life, they were all killed by spies from Coldwood during the First Unification War. So I just didn't expect to see them alive and well again. After these thoughts, the young man smiled sweetly, because the thought crossed his mind that although there was a big gap between them now, they might still be able to talk. Then they began walking with the assistant again along the long, large corridors, and suddenly she stopped and pointed to the right at the door and said that his study room was there. A second later, she added that she used the magic of cleaning to make sure there was not a single speck of dust and that Ian could feel normal while studying. After these words, the girl carefully and slowly began to open the door inside so that they could go in and carefully examine everything with their sorcerer. As soon as he entered, he looked around and realized that this was the room. Then the assistant began to tell me that 300 years ago, when the new tower was founded, there were 24 wizards with levels from the fourth grade. Now there are much fewer of them, so most of the rooms are empty. The lady then smiled broadly and added with a kind expression that the owner of the tower had allowed Ian to use the room for his own practice. After saying this, the girl turned to the door and asked the sorcerer to wait a little while because she would go and bring his teacher. And as soon as the door closed behind the assistant, he began to think that it had been a long time since he had been here. And just now a small pile of memories from his past life came flooding back to him. Then he walked over to the large wooden table where he had been able to sit before, but not in such a respectable status as this time. After all, in this life, he got the room seven years earlier. Since he was recognized as an archwizard at such a young age, his path has now been revealed. This is why it is necessary to consolidate his influence in the tower during the next six years, because when he came here, the young man had already developed a certain plan of action. In a previous life, the tower completely sided with Ragnar. Therefore, he needs to strengthen his position before it happens again. And for this, he will need a lot of power to stop the owner of the tower and his influence on Ragnar. Ian has to subdue the influence of the tower, which was constantly on the case of its owner. And he must gain attention to himself in order to reach the level of the tower owner and even overcome him. And he can do this only by taking control of the tower. For now, he will just pretend to be a little boy. For now, he is too weak physically and too young. He won't even make it to the fifth grade. These thoughts were interrupted by the sound of feet entering the room through the large door. And then a woman's voice was heard saying, Hello? When Ian saw her, he was very surprised to see who it was. After all, he did not understand why the sorcerers sent her. It turns out that it was the same red-haired young lady who opened the door very strongly and sharply saying, Long time no see! After she said that, she began to smile sweetly because she realized that they would have to spend a lot of time together and that they needed a good atmosphere for that. But she still couldn't say little liar. And then she decided to say hello. But she hadn't had a chance to do that since she arrived. The young man still couldn't understand why she was sent. He had not expected to work with her. He decided to make her a little angry by asking her if she was the one who needed to collect the pieces of the mana storehouse. The woman replied that she thought he had become a little more impudent. Then the red-haired woman began to move toward her interlocutor, saying something that suggested that he knew most of the Academy's program. The young man listened to all these words very carefully. 
Then she began to list the etiquette, the history of the tower, the theory of magic, and everything that was taught at the academy. Even so, the tower owner decided to assign Ian a personal teacher, because it would be difficult for ordinary students to learn alongside the guy. After all, he already knows quite a bit about various kinds of magic. After that, the woman pointed her index finger forward, and a book began to move quickly toward her. She said, What good is it? Then the young lady threw the book aside, saying that books were not her thing. After all, in her opinion, this should be done by slightly older people. Then she tilted her head slightly forward toward the young man and put her hands to her sides and said that he had managed to catch Cecilia, because she proved herself well in the battle, and the girl had high hopes for her. If she hadn't turned out to be a spy, her skills as a sorceress would have surpassed many of the people here. But fortunately, Ian managed to figure out the traitor and even caught her himself. And this already inspires a lot of respect for him. Then the lady turned her back on the boy and said that since she was his teacher, she would try to teach him something. And she began to tell me that there are actually several types of sorcerers. The first type is warrior sorcerers. The second type is sorcerer's assistants and the third type is the researcher. Then the girl closed her eyes and added that the rest of the sorcerers were just excuses that could be ignored and not even paid attention to. Finally, she decided to ask the young man what species he thought she was. This question made him a little nervous. So he was silent for a few seconds and then quietly replied that his teacher was of the first type. Upon receiving this answer, the young lady began to smile and said that she was indeed the best of her kind. And no matter what anyone says or tries to prove her skills on a completely different level. And no one can argue with this because she has decided to do so herself, and it is beyond question. Then the lady began to move around her ward, looking intently into his face, and said in a mysterious tone that she had her own methods of teaching. So she said they should go elsewhere. She added that she would not take no for an answer. Ian listened attentively, but it took him a few seconds to think about the offer and make a decision. They moved to a place near a dense, beautiful forest, but it was fenced with a brick fence with large columns. When they found themselves in the center of the playground, the girl spread her arms to the sides and asked him happily if he had any idea what they were going to do. Without allowing her interlocutor to answer, the young lady said that she would teach him how to fight without a shadow of fear of death. In her opinion, this is a very important skill that needs to be taught right now. Ian continued to listen attentively. With a serious expression on his face, he watched all the actions of his mentor. At the same time, the thought ran through his mind that everything was going on as usual. Because she had shown signs of attention to him in her previous life, although he didn't need them at all then, but this time he decided to show her what he was capable of from the very beginning. Other students who were also present on the playground at that time, but at the other end, noticed these two, but did not yet understand who started this battle. And when they looked closely, they noticed Mr. Ian. One of them even asked if it was too dangerous to fight with Miss Helen. When the girl saw that they were being watched, she put her right hand to her side and smilingly said that enough spectators had already gathered so they could begin. A second later, she told the young man that he would have the first move, because if she did it first, it would look bad because she was a teacher after all. Ian slowly took off his cloak, which was fastened around his neck, and throwing it to the ground, he asked his now rival if she was sure she could handle it. The red-haired girl tilted her head to the side and asked sarcastically whether the guy was suggesting that she start worrying or what he meant. Upon hearing this answer, the young man said that he understood and that he would not give in, and he immediately stretched his right hand forward to use some magic. Then the young man closed his eyes to better concentrate on using the magic he needed right now for the first strike. After all, he could not lose this battle. The mentor also wasted no time in using the magic of fire, for a bright orange color was already flashing around her. And looking at her opponent, she said that she was advising him to create a shield to protect himself and conduct defense. And in my head at that time, thoughts were simply replacing each other at the speed of light. One of them was that whatever he was, she will destroy him anyway. After all, in her opinion, he definitely lied to them during the meeting where all the sorcerers arranged a certain interrogation. However, what she saw next surprised her, because Ian had used an ice block that completely covered his body and made it difficult to approach him. 
What she saw made the young lady freeze in her tracks and open her mouth wide because she clearly did not expect such a development. So she asked if he really decided to play a joke on her. Then the lady came closer to the opponent and tapped on the ice and asked why he chose the ice block out of all the techniques. And the next question was whether he was going to sit there until he used up all the mana. Ice block is one of the best spells in defense magic. However, its drawback is that the caster falls asleep and cannot use other techniques. Then the young lady spread her arms to the side and said that she did not yet understand what the sorcerer's plan was, but what she could demand from such a young boy. Immediately after these words, a strange sound attracted the young lady's attention and she instinctively began to look around to see what might be threatening her. The other students also froze in their seats in surprise because they had never heard anything like this before and it scared them because they didn't know what it could be. The red-haired woman suddenly froze in place as well because what she noticed next surprised her, so much so that she even opened her mouth wide because it was just really impossible. Or, to be more precise, how this young man was able to move in the ice block. Then a large, long green vegetation began to sprout around the rival, and she watched this for a few seconds. And she realized that this would cause her a lot of trouble. So, in a fit of emotion, she gritted her teeth and angrily said, Damn! Everyone who was even a few miles away could see this green vegetation. It was already taller than the building that had been constructed on the site. The woman tried to use the magic of fire to neutralize the vegetation because she believed that she had to defeat this arrogant young man. However, things were not so simple, and the woman angrily told them to burn and to stop appearing. After all, something was happening that she might lose. Therefore, it is necessary to find a way for her to at least survive and get out of the water. Meanwhile, the blonde man stood calmly in the ice protection, and the young lady began to think about how she could get it out of this ice block which completely protects it from any impact. But it is not yet clear how to approach a sorcerer who is not only able to move in a block, but also uses spells. She has never seen anything like this in her life. While the woman was thinking about all this, new vegetation appeared next to her and began to move directly toward her. And then she grabbed the witch by the throat and began to tighten her noose. And this did not allow the young lady to breathe normally. So she started coughing loudly because she didn't have enough oxygen. And when she saw the blonde man walking toward her, she looked down and said that she now understood why he was called the reincarnation of the first sorcerer. Then she decided to take control of herself and her emotions and said with a sweet smile that she was giving up and he had won. He could let her go now. Ian smiled back, but it was a sneering emotion. After which he said that he was still counting the minutes. It would be a shame to end the fight like that. The young lady asked, What? in surprise. To clarify the situation a bit, the red-haired young lady smiled nervously again and asked what he meant. After all, she had already lost. What more did he want? However, this did not affect the guy, and he looked at his opponent and slowly raised his right hand and began to use some magic, which controls the clouds and the wind. Seeing this, the woman quietly said, Stop. Liar. Ian? She really wanted it to stop and she could control her body normally. And when she saw that the guy did not hear her at all, she began to shout even louder, saying that this was just a training session. So she tried to order him to stop immediately. However, the sorcerer took a position in front of his opponent and stretched his right hand forward to call for lightning in order to strike the young lady with it and show who was the boss. Other sorcerers who were also on the training ground at the time but in a different corner. All of them were surprised to see the young man's next actions, as they had not expected such a development. As it turned out, the lightning struck the vegetation below, which was holding the woman's legs. She was very happy to be alive and unharmed. Then the young man came closer to the woman and crouched down to look her in the eye. The red-haired woman was already so frightened that she began to scream for him to stay away from her. However, the young man said in a sweet and calm tone, Ms. Helen, this calmed her down a bit, but she still felt a little nervous, not knowing what to expect from him. And did he continue, or did she think she had more to teach him? After all, he had already demonstrated his skills to the young lady, so she should think carefully about her answer. And because of this, there was silence between them for several minutes. 
because the woman did not know what she should say to her student, whom she had to teach something, and he took her and defeated her in a battle. At that moment, the young lady felt very ashamed of herself, so she put her head down and began to shake it slowly from side to side, symbolizing that she had nothing to give him. And after receiving this answer, the boy asked for permission to go to rest, and immediately after that he turned his back on his teacher and did so. The sorcerer disciples were still standing in the places where they had frozen a little earlier, and Ian was moving toward them, asking for forgiveness. He asked them to disperse, because he was very tired and wanted to go to rest as soon as possible, and they were blocking his way. Several days have passed since the incident, and an important meeting was planned in the ivory tower. The owner of the tower was already in a hurry to get there, but at the same time he was asking his assistant how Helena was doing, because they hadn't seen each other since the day he sent her to teach Ian. The young man sadly bowed his head and replied that it was very bad, because he had been refusing to eat for several days, and that's why he can't recover his strength. At that time, the thought flashed through the leader's mind that losing to a 12-year-old boy was a disgrace. After all, he had sent Helen to break the spirit of this boy so that he would come over to his side, but in the end, she herself was broken. Therefore, taming the young man will not be as easy as he thought, because he is clearly not a domestic dog who is ready to be chained, but a free wolf who likes to manage his life and actions on his own. The gray-haired gentleman said to his assistant that he would need a little more time. The assistant nodded silently in response because he was so upset that he could not get a word out. After a few minutes of this fast walking, the gentleman opened the door to one of the rooms where he was already waiting and, with his hand on his heart, bowed his head in apology for being a little late. It turned out that the man had come to see his majesty, who was dressed in a beautiful green jacket and beige pants. The gentleman leaned on the table and looked attentively at his guest, holding a book in his hands. His majesty replied that it was okay, because he wasn't expecting much and he had an appointment, so the tower master didn't have to worry about it. The young man then crossed his arms over his chest and asked the gentleman in a serious tone to tell him in detail about Ian Page, because this is quite an interesting person who appeared in their area. At that time, a meeting was taking place at the estate where the young sorcerer lived with his mother and the alchemist. The teenager approached his father and told him that he was ready to leave, to which he replied, let's go. After these words, they approached the blonde man and addressing him by his first name, the alchemist said that he was going to take his son to the academy. The young man was very happy because finally he would learn something new and not just sit at home and do nothing so he smilingly added that they would be back soon. Ian couldn't understand why the boy was so excited about learning, because there are few children left today who are so eager to learn new things. And then the sorcerer remembered that today was the first day of classes, but he couldn't understand how he could have forgotten that. Instead of wishing the young man good luck, he just remained silent. It turns out that Douglas was accepted into the highest ranks of the Alchemical Academy. So it's obvious that he has talent, but it needs to be properly developed to have a certain result in the future. Ian continued to read the book with his head back in his chair. He reasoned that studying was easy enough for him, because he had learned all the material long ago. So far, he had nothing to do with himself, and it was very bad and did not have a positive effect on his condition. He was bored and did not know what to do with himself. Since returning to the past, he hasn't had a moment to rest. Ragnar hasn't acted yet, but he won't be sitting still for long, and you need to be prepared for that. Therefore, ideally, you should train your body to increase your capabilities. The young man was thinking about this as he approached the mirror and looked at himself. But the next question immediately arose. Can he completely relax and do nothing? Suddenly, these thoughts were interrupted by a loud knock on the door. After the permission was granted, a maid came inside and brought an envelope on a tray and said that Mr. Ian had received an invitation from the castle, which he could examine for himself. When the sorcerer heard these words, he asked in surprise, An invitation? After all, he did not expect to be called back from those lands so soon. He also did not understand why and what had happened. So he decided to pick up the envelope to take a closer look at what was written there. For several seconds, he stood there looking at the paper in his hands, and then he realized that the seal on the envelope belonged to a follower of the prince, 
and this surprised him even more because it raised more questions than it answered. And on the same day, but in the late afternoon when the sun was already setting, Ian arrived at the estate for a meeting that was to take place for some reason at that particular time. When he got out of the carriage, the young man looked at the castle carefully and wondered why this gentleman had decided to invite him to this event, because in his opinion it looked very suspicious. After all, everyone knows that wizards who are not blood aristocrats are not allowed to enter the world. Therefore, it is not yet clear what this gentleman could have been thinking about when he made this offer. However, this was the first time that the prince took on the task of hosting a banquet. Previously, it had been the responsibility of his assistants and servants, who were well-versed in these matters. Ian also recalled that the king's follower in his past life did not organize social gatherings because he was not in close relations with the nobility. Due to his passive approach to life, he was never able to make his debut in the politics of the empire and was not recognized in the highest circles. But the fifth prince was his complete opposite because he loved to socialize. And this is how he was able to consolidate his position by taking power into his own hands. It turns out that the emperor was the only one who remained on the side of the consistent prince, and so the man was able to influence his son. Therefore, what is about to happen is a very important event in the life of the sorcerer. He had never attended such social events before. He thought that he could sit quietly for a few minutes and then go home. And when he handed his invitation to the guard, he bowed and invited him to enter. As soon as the door began to open slowly and the young wizard was able to enter, all the eyes of the people present were riveted on him. People tried to hide the curiosity with which they were looking at him, but they did it very poorly so you could see everything without looking closely. Seeing such a reaction, the young man realized that he felt out of place here, so he had to go home as soon as possible. Suddenly, one of the assistants loudly announced to the entire room in a serious tone that His Majesty the King's follower had arrived and would now enter the room to hold a meeting. And as soon as the last words were spoken, the door slowly began to open to the room through which the prince was to enter. All those present at that moment froze in a bow, showing their respect. It turned out that the man had gone out on the balcony so that he could see everyone from the moon. The gentleman was dressed in a blue and white suit. You could see the satisfaction and joy on his face. Then he smiled sweetly and thanked everyone who came here, because it was very important for him and above all for them. After all, important issues will be discussed today. He went on to say that, as everyone knew and saw, he was opening the banquet today in place of his father. The people who had come by invitation looked at his majesty carefully and listened to everything in detail. But a second later, he added that before they started the meeting, he wanted to introduce someone to them because he had the opportunity. Therefore, after the prince had spoken, he turned his head to the right and began to stare at Ian, who, like everyone else, stood silently and listened attentively. And he did not expect that so much attention would be drawn to his personality today. So he was a little confused when everyone in the room turned their gaze to him. Then his majesty spread his arms to the side and announced that this was his special guest, the fourth-class archmage of the ivory tower, a native of the northern province of Mogrian, Ian Page. The young man did not know how to react to so much attention, because he was not used to having so many people looking at him at the same time. Seeing this confusion, the prince again held his arms out to the side and shouted, asking Ian to stop and calm down a bit. After all, he was the reason why the meeting was organized. The guy sarcastically replied that he was surprised and very pleased. Then the young man closed his eyes to think things over, namely that the prince had organized this circus to show the nobility that he was on his side, and he is simply convinced that the emperor planned it. Then his majesty said that he had heard rumors about how well Ian had performed in the tower. He came and defeated a fourth-level sorcerer right off the bat, so you can only imagine how the locals felt. The prince went on to say that when he first saw him in Mogrian, he thought it would be difficult to work with him because he was very untidy. So it was at that moment that he was thinking about how to work with him. However, in the end, the blonde smiled sweetly, put his right hand on his side, and added that he was simply, nah, just advised by such an outstanding talent, and he decided to offer to move in with them. And then he said something that put everything in its place namely that his father had forced him to follow Ian 
but he was happy that it was the way it was, not otherwise. Then the prince turned his head to the right and said that he had one more person he would like to introduce today, since everyone is here. And holding out his right hand, he smilingly invited his guest to enter the hall. Ian watched him closely because he did not expect her to show up. After all, she had met him much later in her past life, so he was quite surprised, and you could see it in his expression. When the prince saw this, he turned to Ian and said that he wanted to introduce him to his younger sister, Hilary. The girl had blonde hair and was dressed in a blue long dress. The young lady smiled sincerely and said in a small voice that she was very pleased to meet such a young wizard. She went on to say that her name was Healy River. After all, there is a lot of talk about him in the imperial court, and it turns out that he is now a real celebrity. The young man smiled back and said that he was very pleased to hear that. Folding her hands in front of her, the lady added that she had come today only to say hello, but next time she would like to meet him for lunch and discuss his life in Mogrian. The young man replied that he was afraid that he would only be able to tell her boring stories about monsters and magic. Haley said that he was very interested in everything. After all, she is interested not only in magic, but also in the lives of other people on Earth. That is why she is so eager to talk to him. Finally, she said that she would send him an invitation in the near future, and she added that she hoped he would enjoy today's party. Ian replied that he was very grateful for the princess's attention. Immediately after these words, the young lady turned around and began to walk toward the exit with her brother, who decided to escort her out so that no one could approach her. The sorcerer froze in his tracks, for something had forced him to think it over right now and not put it off until later. However, the girl decided not to leave the feast, but to stay and talk to her friends. Meanwhile, Ian was thinking that Princess Hillary was not at all like the one he had seen in the sanctuary. Then the young man turned his gaze to the prince and emphasized that he was nervous, but still coping well with his duties. As long as no one was paying attention to him, the young man began to walk slowly toward the exit. So he decided to leave before he got even more bored here and to go home and talk to his mother. Then he went outside and held on to one of the large columns and breathed in the fresh air deeply because it was quite stuffy in the room. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to a man who was also standing on the street, quietly looking at something in the dark. This made the young man turn to the guest. I said, Night, Oliver. And the black-haired man slowly turned his head to the one who spoke to him. His expression said that he was upset about something. Seeing his new interlocutor, the knight said, Mr. Ian, in response. The sorcerer decided to come a little closer to continue the conversation. After taking a few steps, the young man said that the gentleman looked very nice in his tailcoat. The young man lowered his head and looked down and replied that His Majesty the Prince's successor had ordered him to wear a formal outfit today, because he also has to look normal. After these words, an awkward silence fell between the two men, and for a few seconds they just looked at each other. And the thought flashed through the sorcerer's mind that he had decided to go out on the terrace in vain. The black-haired gentleman decided to break the silence, so he said that he knew what the rumors were. Suddenly, Ian asked, Rumors? He wanted to provoke the other person to tell him what he knew, and it worked. Because the knight began to say that there were rumors about Helen being an arch-witch from the tower, and that he was able to defeat her in a single combat. And this surprised the young man a bit, because the prince also mentioned it. To be more precise, I heard a rumor about how great and skillful you were in the tower. So he said that even a knight knows, but he said that the affairs of the tower did not go beyond him. The black-haired man smiled sweetly and said that if knights could not get important information, then what would be the point of having them at all? Especially in this century, since it is at this time that the Green River Empire is being defended by sorcerers, the knights have turned into assistants and decorations that speak of their owner's status. The man went on to add that he was very surprised that Ian had managed to defeat not just a fourth-class sorceress, but Helen the Firebender herself, which few people could defeat before. And this sowed some doubts that the young man was really a little boy. And finally, the gentleman added that His Majesty trusted Ian enough to invite him to a banquet for dignitaries. Then the knight knelt down on his right knee and looked the sorcerer straight in the eye and asked him whose side he was on, because enough time had passed to choose. 
Without giving me the opportunity to give any answer, the black-haired man said that he did not care who he was or how he had acquired such a talent at such a young age. But he knows that the ivory tower supports the fifth prince. And it's important for him to find out who Ian favors now, because he has been here for quite some time and could assess the situation. And a second later, he added another question. Could he also be on the side of the tower? The young man, given the opportunity, replied that such questions took him by surprise. So he asked who would be able to answer them out of the blue. The black-haired man looked down at the floor and said that he was the chief knight of his majesty, and he had to know the answer now because it might be too late later. At this time, a memory flashed through Ian's mind that Oliver Raywood was a knight who defended the prince's follower to the last and gave his life for him. But out loud, the young man replied that he hadn't made a definite decision yet. However, the thought again flashed through my mind that the interlocutor might not be satisfied with the answer. So he continued to say that he could assure him that he would never take the side of the fifth knight. The knight was quite surprised to hear this answer, because for some reason he had thought it might be the opposite, and so he froze in his seat and opened his mouth wide. Having mastered himself and his emotions, he began to turn his head from side to side to see if anyone else was near them. Seeing this, Ian reassured the black-haired man by saying that he had used magic and no one had heard them. Then the sorcerer smiled sweetly and asked if this answer would suit the knight. The knight was still on one knee, but he smiled back and replied, it would be completely satisfactory. Finally, he thanked me for the conversation, but it didn't end there. The man immediately asked if he could ask for a favor. The blonde man was a bit alarmed. So he clarified what the other man had in mind. And the man said that before Ian chose a side, he wanted him to fight with him. After all, he needed to become a little stronger. These words calmed the boy down a bit, and he asked with a pleased expression if the knight really wanted to learn how to fight a sorcerer. A second later, he added that one day the same gentleman's sword might fight against him. The black-haired man listened carefully and said that he could not deny it. Upon receiving this answer, Ian began to laugh out loud, folding both arms across his chest and saying that the black man looked rather cruel in this case. But he still said that he would refuse such an offer above all else, because there was no benefit to him in it, because he likes any business to benefit both parties. Then the black-haired man raised his hands to his neck and began to slowly unbutton something and take it out. And when he held out his hands to Ian, he said that this chain, it was given to him by the Empress when he became His Majesty's personal knight. The sorcerer slowly looked down at the thing and began to examine it carefully. Then the black-haired man added that she told him that he was magical and helped to clear the mind of any bad thoughts. And at that moment, Ian remembered that this was indeed one of the lost imperial treasures. It belonged to the Empress, and in her past life, no one was able to find it. The knight said that he would give it to the sorcerer, because the chain could be of more use to him than to the black-haired man. Ian opened his eyes wide in surprise. And then he said that it was a gift from the deceased empress herself. Could he really say goodbye to it so easily? The man looked down again and said that she had asked him to protect her son. Then he added that training with Ian would help fulfill that request, so he was sure she would understand. An uncomfortable silence fell between the interlocutors again. After all, the sorcerer had to think it over thoroughly to draw a parallel between the pros and cons. So Ian said that if that was the case, he agreed to the offer, namely, to train with the knight. And saying these words, the young man took the chain. Suddenly, at that moment, a large and loud explosion occurred next to them, and everything around them lit up with a bright orange light. Then the two men turned their heads in the direction of the explosion. They did not realize that it had happened at all, so they froze in their seats for a few seconds. And when they saw what happened, they saw that the fire and dust were moving through the open door of the room. And then the knight realized that his boss was there in the middle. And because of this, he shouted, His Majesty! You could see the fright in his expression. So he quickly got to his feet and ran inside. As he began to look around, he again began to call out for His Majesty, for he had not yet seen him. A few seconds later, the dust settled, and the captain was called by the chief. He was covering his sister behind his back and asked, frightened, what had happened at the estate. However, the man did not answer this question yet, as he was more concerned about whether his majesty was injured, 
but the prince decided to reassure his assistant by saying that he was fine. Then the rest of the guards came running into the room frightened and nervous and asked the prince if he was okay. When they received the answer that everything was fine, they turned their heads to their captain and asked how he was. The man replied that he was fine, and he asked them to put it like the furnishings in the mansion. The young man began to report that an explosion had occurred on the territory of the estate, but the cause has not yet been established. But they have already sent a message via the emergency communication system and are waiting for confirmation from all posts. When Ian heard this answer, he began to wonder what kind of emergency call it was. And it turns out that this is a system that connects the soldier, the country, the estate, and the ivory tower. And in emergency situations, each post has to report the situation and urgently arrive at a certain meeting point. The guy put his head down and assumed that since the system was already up and running, all the wizards and soldiers should be here soon. And then a question arose in his mind. What if these disruptions were created for that purpose? So to prevent anything bad from happening, the sorcerer decided to use the magic of the barrier. Then the blonde man turned his head back and addressed his majesty and asked if he could support the barrier with his mana. The girl asked, wide-eyed with surprise, What? She hadn't expected anyone to know about her powers. But the blonde man said it was an emergency, so she had to give a clear answer. So the young lady slowly approached the sorcerer and said uncertainly that she had learned it, of course, but... But she did not have time to finish because she was interrupted by a young man who took it as a consent. He immediately turned in the opposite direction and began to move quickly in that direction. And the princess stared silently after him for several seconds. The boy approached the maids, who were also quite frightened by what was happening in the estate. The young man asked them to tell him what to do. Is there an assistant here named Isabel? The women listened attentively to the request. One of the maids answered with her head down. Yes. She also said that she wanted to visit the central mansion, which is why she came from another house. Hearing this information, the sorcerer quietly said that it was expected. And so they want to find Cecilia. The Cold Walkers plan to disrupt the Ivory Tower guards to get to Cecilia. They don't care about her life at all because they need information about it. Therefore, this cannot be allowed to happen. And he immediately began to think of a plan for his further actions. At this time, a secret person who was dressed in a black long cloak walked through the courtyard of the estate. And when she entered the prison where Cecilia was sitting, she said that she hadn't seen her for a long time and asked how she was living here. However, this person was unknown even to the sorceress, so she asked him calmly and indifferently, Who is he? And who let him in? And then the young man lowered his hood and said that he was Daniel. He went on to say that he was a little disappointed because he thought the young lady was more capable. And then the woman realized who it was. So she quickly ran to the bars and clutched them tightly and began to shout loudly for the guy to finally release her. However, he was not going to do it so quickly. The young man held his hands out to the side and said in a calm tone that he would certainly do it, but first he needed to clarify. And then Cecilia realized what the boy meant and immediately began to say quickly that she hadn't told them anything. But that boy, Ian Page, knew everything about the cold walkers and the orders they receive. The young man listened carefully and asked, Is this information accurate? Then the young lady raised her hand to her neck and added that the sorcerer even knew about the marks that she did not even know about. The young man folded his arms across his chest and said that almost all the cold walkers did not know about it and had only been told recently. So he asked what else she knew. Cecilia said that she hadn't learned anything else and asked if he could fire her. He didn't really want to do it right now, but he put his head down and said, Okay. Immediately after these words, the door to the cell opened, and the young lady began to smile joyfully because she would finally be free. But it did not happen as she thought it would. The man drew his sword and stabbed the girl. A lot of blood flew in different directions, and Cecilia fell to the ground coughing loudly. Finally, the young man said that the management had to think a lot about how to get into the tower and what to do with it. The girl held her cutthroat and listened to what her friend was telling her. Namely, that a third-class sorcerer had to be freed anyway. But they decided that they would not take her back alive, because she had already been here for quite a long time and they could no longer trust her. After the girl fell face down on the ground and showed no signs of life, the young man smiled and told her to sleep peacefully. 
However, in response, he heard you too, but for some reason in a man's voice. So the young man quickly drew his sword and swung it back because he thought that someone who could harm him was standing there. But he only sliced through the air. Then he decided to launch his knife and it stuck in the wall a few meters away from Ian's face, who was standing calmly watching all the actions of his opponent. In addition, he folded his arms across his chest to show his attitude toward him. When the guest calmed down a bit, he asked the sorcerer who he was, because he had never met him before. However, Ian was not going to answer this question, but instead turned his gaze to Cecilia and said, Did he kill her already? And then he thanked her, because that would be one less problem in his life. And while he was saying this, ice began to appear at the feet of his opponent. He was climbing higher and higher on the limb with every passing second. Then a blonde man began to move towards him, who addressed him by the name of Daniel and said that he was very lucky to meet him here. Then the sorcerer's eyes glowed with blue light, and he pulled his right hand back and said that he had long wanted to kill the young man with his own hands, but never had the chance. Daniel raised his hands in the air and asked them to wait, asking if it would be better to capture him alive, to be able to get some useful information later. But the thought flashed through the blonde's mind that it was now that he would be able to avenge all his friends. However, the opponent did not understand what kind of friends he was talking about. The sorcerer replied that it was still ten years away. The ice continued to rise all over his body and it had almost reached his face. And Ian continued to say that he had gone back in time and made a promise to himself. As soon as he noticed that the ice had already filled almost the entire body of the young man, he came closer to him and touched it with only one index finger, waiting for it to break and allow his opponent to breathe normally. However, these actions did not save his life, and he leaned against the wall with his head, or to be more precise, his forehead. Then a blonde man approached him, and he put his hand on his neck and searched for the seal of mana, which would prove to the people who would see it that this young man also did not come here with good intentions. Suddenly, he heard the voices of people behind him, moving down a long, large corridor straight toward the direction where some bad things had just happened. Because of this, the blond man froze in place to think about his story for them. When people approached and saw him, and the two bodies lying next to him, they stopped and stood there with bewildered expressions for a few seconds, processing what they saw. A man standing in the center turned to Ian Page with gritted teeth and asked what he was doing here and what had happened here in the first place. The young man stood among the two dead and clenched his hands into fists. On the man's body, traces of a certain seal could be seen on his neck, symbolizing that he had worked with Cecilia. After a few hours, the head of the tower arrived at the estate and was already in a meeting with his majesty, who banged his fist on the table and began to say that two people had already turned out to be spies. From the maid to the secretary, he asked how the magic tower could allow this to happen. However, without even allowing me to answer, he continued to ask questions about the fact that they had asked to transfer the investigation of Cecilia's identity to them, so why hadn't they checked anything? And he added angrily how he could trust the tower anymore. So he is forced to take away their right to investigate, because he had hoped for them, and everything did not go well and he ordered them to immediately pass on all the information they knew about the case to the royal guards, and he asked if they understood him. The chief of the tower shook his head sadly and replied that everything would be as his majesty ordered. Then the king began to hold his head because it was already aching from thinking about what had happened and what would happen, so he said that the wizards could leave because he had many things to do. Hearing these words, the tower's chief slowly bowed to show his respect. After that, the assistant loudly addressed Ian Page and invited him to come inside and bow before his majesty. When the man saw him, he said sadly that they had met again. His expression showed fatigue and disappointment. Ian slowly entered the room and took a seat right in front of the main man, carefully folded his hands in front of him and bowed down, looking down. The king got to his feet and said in a serious tone that thanks to the sorcerer's skills, they were once again able to protect the empire from spies. Because if not for him, important, secret information would have fallen into the hands of the wrong people. And the secrets of the imperial family became available to the public. Then the man sat down comfortably in his luxurious chair, 
and said that he would never leave the merits of faithful and responsible people unattended, so he wanted to reward him. At that moment, an assistant approached the guy with a large box, which he opened and offered to accept the gift. Inside was something beautiful and important. Namely, it was a robe belonging to the emperor's ancestor, Michael Green River. He was the only sorcerer of the imperial blood. Ian was very surprised by what he saw. The man went on to say that he shouldn't give it to non-members of the imperial family, but he decided that the sorcerer needed it now more than he would wait for some other opportunity. Therefore, the boy may believe that he has given it away for the rest of his life, or until he decides to give it up. After all, this is Michel's clothing, the first and last sorcerer of imperial blood. He is the hero who saved the empire, the man who rose to the rank of tower owner as a sign that his magical abilities were recognized. Then the emperor asked Ian to put it on. Because it was worn over his clothes, there was no need to change. The young man stood there for a few seconds and thought about the offer. And yet, he decided to try it on. So when he put it on, all those present began to carefully consider how he looked in this outfit. The mustachioed gentleman said that his smile was a little too big. But one day it would be just right. Sooner or later, that moment will come. Then the young man realized the properties of the clothes. Then the sorcerer smiled sweetly and said that in the near future, he could adjust what was not fitting properly. And he used some kind of magic to do it. After that, the clothes shrank a little and became just normal. People who were present during this were quite surprised. They did not understand how he could do this. After all, they are not familiar with such magic. The emperor put his head on his hand and put his foot on his leg and said that Ian's clothes look very nice, especially the color. Therefore, he was pleased that the boy decided to accept the gift. When he heard these words, the young man looked down and lowered his head, realizing that the attention of many people present was now focused on his person. He then bowed low and said that it was indeed a great honor to receive such a gift from his majesty. He hadn't even counted on it. After all this... The sorcerer decided that it was time for him to return home. So he went out into the courtyard of the estate to take a seat in the carriage and leave immediately. However, on his way, he met a princess who was walking around the grounds with her friends. When she saw the boy, she addressed him by name and asked him to listen to her. When he got a little closer to the young lady, he began to slowly lower himself to bow and greet the princess. However, the girl stopped him, saying that he shouldn't do that. Her facial expression showed that she was a little nervous. She was also moving her fingers quickly. So she looked around and said that she really needed to talk to him about one thing. Ian lowered his head and looked down and said guiltily that he had been tactless that night. He apologized for his behavior. The blonde woman sharply replied that it was not like that at all. And so Ian put his index finger to his mustache and said quietly that he would keep her secret from everyone until she wanted to tell him about it. She doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Hearing these words, the woman simply blossomed because it had been preventing her from living and sleeping normally for several days. Having said that, Ian began to walk slowly past his interlocutor, for he was quite tired and wanted to go home to rest and see his mother. Suddenly, he was called by name by the prince, who quietly came up behind him. A second later, he added that thanks to him, the imperial estate and the empire itself had been saved from destruction. He added that, as his father said, the sorcerer is a real hero for them, because no one else was able to help them on such a difficult journey. Suddenly, the young man said that he had forgotten to introduce himself, but perhaps Ian already knew about him, so it might not be necessary. When the sorcerer took a closer look, his eyes grew several times larger with surprise. The blonde man put his right hand on his heart and said with a big smile on his face that he was the fifth prince of the empire and his name is Ragnar Green River. And then the memory of how the prince himself had poisoned him in his past life came to him. He was also his best friend at the time, and now he's standing there calmly looking at him and doesn't realize that when they were experiencing bright moments. But the blonde man could not hide his emotions because these memories were very painful for him, because at that moment he experienced very tough emotions. Then the fifth prince smiled sweetly and put his hands behind his back and said that it might be too late, but he wanted to congratulate Ian on the recognition of the ivory tower. At this time, the thought flashed through the sorcerer's mind that he did not remember Ragnar as young as he was, 
The latter continued to say that he really wanted to express his personal gratitude for protecting the empire from spies. Then the gentleman moved his right hand forward and said that he wanted to invite the boy to dinner. Page thought about this invitation for a few minutes because it could change the course of further events. The prince could not wait long for an answer, so he asked what his interlocutor would say. After all, he still had many things planned for that day. And as soon as the sorcerer was about to answer, the princess came in ahead of him and told Ragnar that she and Mr. Ian already had plans. The prince closed his eyes with a sweet smile, because the sun was shining in them. And he asked if it would be possible to meet tomorrow, because he really wanted to talk to the boy in the near future. But the sorcerer lowered his head and looked down and addressed his majesty, and asked for forgiveness and refused because he had many things to do immediately. Ragnar, hearing this answer, said briefly and clearly, Well, that's understandable. The princess was very angry that everything was going to turn out this way. The reason was that she hadn't had a proper rest for several days. The gentleman then bowed to Ian and said that in that case he had to go to his scheduled meeting, where he was already waiting. Finally, he added that he was very glad to see the young man. The sorcerer continued to stand in his place, for he was simply shocked by Rangar's behavior, for he was used to a completely different attitude. As the prince and his assistants walked, the sorcerer watched him with the princess still standing by his side. She wanted to get a more accurate answer, and as soon as they left, these two were able to exhale and finally feel a little freer, because this gentleman made them tense up. A second later, this silence was broken by a young lady who addressed herself to Ian and said that she didn't really want to interfere, but her emotions got the better of her. The interlocutor replied that it was no big deal. And at that moment, the thought flashed through the sorcerer's mind that he and Ragnar had met two years earlier than in his previous life, and he was still hiding his intentions. But the blonde realized that he would ruin these plans before he had time to increase his influence in the empire, because the later it was done, the harder it would be. And then this fifth prince won't be able to make any headway, and Ian will only be happy to watch you fall into hell. And from that moment on, they are on opposite sides. And now five years have passed. These events take place in the same estate where they took place a few years ago. Everything is the same as it was. In one of the offices, one of the princes was sitting with his head on his right hand, looking intently at a red-bound book and saying that he really didn't understand anything. And I started to get angry. Why can't it be explained in a simple way? And who writes such heavy books in general? A librarian who was passing by at that moment said that these books were written by the first emperor. They list all the qualities necessary for the future emperor, and which he should master in the near future. This made him very upset because for him it was just a group of unrelated words. And then the man added that the prince needed to read all these books, more specifically about history, culture, economics, politics, and so on. Hearing this, he closed his eyes and replied, Ah, I don't know. He said that today was not a good day for reading. The librarian said in a serious tone that his majesty would be angry if he didn't read anything again this time but this did not affect the boy at all. Instead, he turned his head towards the vice captain and asked him if today was the last battle between the captain and Ian. The assistant turned his head to his boss and replied briefly and clearly, that's exactly what he said. After all, this is a very grand event for the empire. Hearing this answer, the prince said that he definitely needed to see it with his own eyes. He quickly got to his feet leaned on the table, and invited his assistant to go to the place of the fight. At this time, the training ground of the second detachment of the Imperial Knights was preparing for a very important battle that would be watched by a large number of people. The black-haired knight, holding his sword in his hands, took a deep breath and slowly exhaled, and then said quietly to himself that this was his last chance. And mistakes here are simply impossible to make, because they can be fatal and they can also cross out his entire life experience. But there was no way to give up. And while he was thinking about it, many sharp ice flows flew at him. As soon as he saw them, he began to run away from where he had just been standing. Then he stopped abruptly, and it happened in such a way that he even had to break with his feet on the sand. Having made such an abrupt stop, he turned his head and sighed to the attacker. When the knight saw him a few meters away amidst the rising dust cloud, 
he decided to run straight for him without hesitation, because he needed to demonstrate his courage at least somehow. In order to shorten the distance and get closer, he pushed off the ground and then from a sandy rock on the right side. After this stunt, he landed on one knee, leaning his sword on the ground to keep from falling. And this landing took place quite close to the opponent. Then he looked up to assess the situation, because he needed to understand how to proceed. And the knight realized that the sorcerer was preparing another attack. And that's exactly what happened. Ian used fire magic and created a big, fiery orange ball that was hard to get close to because it was too hot. So the black-haired boy had to stand there for a few seconds, doing nothing but staring at her, because he realized that he could not defeat her on his own. But after thinking about it for a long time, he decided to try, because doing nothing would only lower his authority. So he shouted, ah, and swung his sword. After the first strike, he thought he had managed to touch the ball, and he was very happy about that, because not everyone would have dared to do that. So the young man began to slowly use his sword to fight his way into the depths of this object because that was where his opponent was, who, as it turned out, was standing silently in the center with his hands down, watching calmly because at any moment he could use a new kind of magic. And the knight had to make a lot of effort to finally reach it. And as soon as he succeeded, he shouted, ah, again, while taking the last few steps. And then he put the sword to the opponent's chest and pressed a little on it so that he went inside. At this time, the blonde sorcerer did not try to prevent this. However, everything did not turn out as the boy had imagined. After all, in just one second, the sorcerer was standing behind the knight and stretched out his hand to tap him on the shoulder. And when the black-haired man realized this, he began to slowly turn his head back saying sadly that he had not been able to touch the sorcerer even for a split second. Hearing this, the sorcerer began to smile and move his hand back and forth. During these five years, he changed a lot, grew older and grew long blonde hair. He went on to say that the knight had managed to wound him right in the heart, and if it hadn't been for the illusion, he would have died long ago. So this is already a pretty good result. Then Ian came closer and shook hands with his opponent, and the latter thanked him for the training. The sorcerer replied that it was his payment for the chain he had received. The black-haired man began to smile sincerely, for he was pleased to be able to spend so much time in the company of this young man, and he said that he had gotten much more than that. Ian put his right hand to his chin and agreed, saying that the knight's skills were not the same as they were five years ago. He had even learned to survive his attacks, then the knight lowered his sword to the ground and asked in a serious tone if he could ask a question. The sorcerer said that of course he could. The black-haired man did not hesitate to ask what level the sorcerer had already reached. The man had not expected to receive such a question, so he was quite surprised because no one had ever asked him that before. And he answered with a sincere smile that he was actually not as big as it might seem at first glance. After all, he knows a lot of different magic that can be used in the East for his level. It turns out that he is a fifth grade master. And then a memory flashed through his mind that in his previous life he was able to reach the sixth grade only at the age of 26. And although the pace of development is excellent, he still did not manage to become a sixth grade wizard because of the speed of development of the body and the growth of the manna's heart, which cannot be increased. Therefore, at the moment, he has a fifth-grade education. However, he cannot give up hope of becoming stronger. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted by the prince, who said, Wow, this is the best sorcerer and the best knight in the empire. At these words, the two men turned their heads in the direction of the speaker. Ian saw their guest and said, His Majesty. And he, in turn, came closer and spread his arms to the side and said that he heard that they were having a battle today. The prince then folded his hands as if in prayer and asked if they would like to have breakfast together. That way, they could celebrate their and his unbridled desire to get better. The sorcerer looked down and apologized and said that today his training in the tower would end and he would be officially admitted to the duties of the arch sorcerer. Therefore, he needed to meet with the owner of the tower. The prince was very upset by these words because he had hoped to take a little time off from school in this way. With a sad expression on his face, he replied that he understood because they could not do anything about it. Then the blonde man put his right hand to his side and said that Ian could go and they would eat some other time. 
The young man bowed and replied that he would hope to see him soon. And when he took two steps to the right, he put his right hand on his heart and said, See you soon. And he immediately set off on his way to be on time for the solemn event. But he decided to use magic to move because it would be much faster. So he pushed off from the ground and rose in the air, hovering for a few seconds above the three figures looking down at him. He smiled sweetly at them and said that he would try to return soon. After all, he himself wanted to get this status as soon as possible and be able to freely use his powers whenever he needed to. The knight, the prince, and his assistant all watched Ian with their heads held high for a few seconds until he disappeared from their view. Still looking up, the blonde man said that thanks to the mantle his father had given the sorcerer, he could fly. And at some point he caught himself thinking that he was even envious somehow. Then the prince turned his head to the right and sharply turned to the captain, who quickly put his hand on his heart and bowed and waited for further instructions from the chief. The other man asked him if their training was over, because what could the man say about it? The black-haired man looked down and said that he had noticed two things. The first is that he could not touch Mr. Ian with all his will, and the difference in strength between them will only increase every year. The blonde stood silently and tried to listen carefully because this was very important information for him, and his captain continued to say that he could confirm with all certainty that he could definitely defeat the other sorcerers. Immediately after he said this, the young man smiled, for no matter how tired he was, he was enjoying it. And just a few minutes into his flight, Ian was already near the ivory tower. An hour later, he arrived exactly when he was supposed to. He slowly opened the door inside and cautiously entered. The one who was already there said happily, You've come just in time. I was just preparing for our meeting. Then the owner of the tower leaned on his desk and said that he kept thinking back to the day when he was told about the talented boy in the south and came to this tower to meet him. And the man, closing his eyes a little, added that it seems like very little time has passed, but he is already standing in front of him as a mature and courageous young man who has already achieved a lot. This means that he himself will grow even older. Ian was very amused by these words, so he smiled sweetly and replied that the owner of the tower still has to live and live. After a few minutes, the gentleman picked up a couple of sheets of paper and rewriting the text on them said that everything here was written perfectly, because he saw compliments and various praise. He added that the boy's appearance was a gift to the tower and the entire empire. Newly minted sorcerers try to follow his example because he is literally a walking instruction manual on how to be a perfect sorcerer. The young man really liked hearing such words in his direction, but he still asked me not to praise him and the capabilities he was capable of. The owner of the tower said that they would soon find out whether he was praising it or not. Today, as he knows, is the last day of school. An ordinary student at the academy would have a ceremony and then be sent to the village to take mana tests. However, his case is unique. The man asked him how he felt about spending this day talking to an old man. Ian smilingly replied that he would be honored. The mustachioed gentleman began to put his things on the table so that there would be no chaos when he returned. And as he did so, he said that he understood that this was the way to respond but he would still thank you for such kind words. Finally, the owner of the tower took out a plaque and handed it to the young man, congratulating him on being considered a real wizard from now on. He can show this sign to any corner of their empire, and everyone from soldiers to ordinary citizens will have to listen to him. In the future, this may come in handy often. Holding it tightly in his hands, the boy asked if his help as a full-fledged sorcerer was needed somewhere else. The chief, looking at him intently, answered him with a question. What do you think? Then he folded both limbs across his chest and said that they really do not have enough workers. After all, they had lost Halen, and there was no one to take over her duties. He added that he did not want to rush Ian, but he would be very grateful for any help. Ian looked at his interlocutor and said that he would try to help in any way he could. The main thing is to get some rest now because these trainings have tired him out. The mustachioed man said that he would accept any of his decisions because he was already the chief archmagician of the tower. However, he must remember that great expectations are placed on him. But since it was his first time, he could choose where he wanted to go. And the owner of the tower used magic to show a long list of places where help is needed.
Rodmir Province is the largest seaport in the empire. Benson Province is the largest iron producer in the empire. And the last place is Perak Province, where he conducted mana tests in his past life. Some sorcerer died on this mission, so he was sent to replace him. So he clearly said that he wanted to go to the province of Perak. Hearing this answer, the owner of the tower looked down and said that this province needed the help of a sorcerer the most. And a second later, he began to tell me that they had already sent two third-class sorcerers and imperial knights. But the problem remained unsolved. And it seems that the monsters of the great fields have taken the offensive. The man then held out a sheet and said that all the details were written here. Therefore, he can familiarize himself with them today and give his answer. After all, if he decided to refuse, he would have to find someone else. But Ian did not think long and study any information. He immediately answered that he would definitely go. When he returned home, it was time for dinner. And it was during this meal that he told his family that he was going to work in the province of Perak. And when the alchemist's son heard this, he stopped his meal and asked with wide eyes and mouth if he was sure he was going on his first mission to the province of Perak. He clarified that giant monsters were constantly raiding the land. Ian didn't like this reaction, so he banged the knife handle loudly. However, having mastered his emotions, he decided to put it on the table so as not to harm anyone. And then the question was raised by a mother who turned to her son and asked if it was really that dangerous. Ian turned his head to his mother and said in a calm tone that he thought things were not that bad. So a couple of months would be enough to sort everything out. The woman turned her gaze to the big table and asked with a sad expression if he would be going there in a week or a little later. And then she added that without him, this large estate would be completely quiet. The son smiled sweetly and said that he would try to return to her as soon as possible so that she would not be sad. The alchemist's son happily turned to the sorcerer, calling him captain, and asked if he wanted to see the elixir he had made himself before leaving. After all, he had tried very hard and might need it on the road. The father turned his head to the young man and addressed him by the name of Douglas and emphasized that he was already quite an adult, and maybe it's time to stop calling Mr. Ian Captain? However, the guy did not understand what the problem was. After all, the captain is the captain. But if it causes someone any inconvenience, then he can... He paused for a moment, and everyone was waiting eagerly to hear what the young man would say. So Ian picked up a glass of water and took a few sips. And then in one second, he said one single word. Brother? Everyone was surprised, to put it mildly, because none of them expected to hear such a statement. And while everyone was shocked and trying to collect their thoughts, the young man smiled broadly and said once again, Brother Ian! And at that moment, the thought crossed the sorcerer's mind that this young man had been a criminal in his past life. The mother clapped her hands joyfully and said with a big smile that Ian now had a younger brother and she had a younger son. Ian did not like his mother's reaction, so he said angrily, Mother! The alchemist realized this and said in surprise, Mrs. Page, what are you? Then the man turned his attention to his son and told him to call the sorcerer Mr. Ian. The boy emphasized that they had grown up together. The father was not convinced, however, and said that this did not give him the right to speak like that. The young man replied that he would be useful to his brother and to this estate. The woman began to smile loudly, saying that he was indeed useful, so she did not understand what the problem was. And after the words were said, the lady continued to laugh, and her son, who was sitting on the right side, did not understand what was going on here, and perhaps there was a moment that he missed. Then he quickly got to his feet and stood there smiling sweetly for a few seconds, until finally everyone switched to something else entirely, because this topic was uncomfortable for everyone. And thinking about everything in the world, Ian realized that such a life is not bad at all. After all, in his past life, he could only dream about it. Therefore, here, you need to use all the opportunities that are given to you. The next morning, the sorcerer was already standing in the courtyard wearing the cloak that his majesty had given him. Those who saw him off asked him if he was sure he was ready to go. Then the alchemist asked if he would go to the province of Perak right away. The sorcerer replied that he would first stop by to say goodbye to the owner of the tower, and then he would go to the province of Ledian. Then he told the alchemist that he remembered where he had placed all the mana traps. The man smiled and said that of course he remembered everything. 
Finally, the gentleman said that he was willing to give his life so that Ian's mother would be safe. The sorcerer looked down and said that he hoped they would be fine in his absence. Suddenly, I heard a man's voice shouting, Brother! loudly. When I got closer, I saw my father and Ian's reaction to this phrase, so I corrected myself and said, Ah, I mean the captain. And he immediately held out his hands with a small flask of liquid in them. And he said that Ian already had his father's elixir, which was the same, but he had made it in his own way. Then he turned his gaze to the side and suggested that he was thinking, that he will work much better than his father. That's why he suggests taking him with him. It was only because of this that Ian agreed to take this elixir with him. And after that, he decided that it was time to leave, because he had a long and difficult journey ahead of him. Although Douglas still needed to study for three years at the academy, his skills were recognized at the imperial level, and he was awarded the title of Imperial Alchemist. Holding the jar in his hands, Ian said that he was sure it would work well. Then the alchemist's son asked if he would fly to the province on his mantle. The blonde man replied that he would rather take a carriage, so as not to attract too much attention. Suddenly, the conversation was interrupted by the mother, who turned to Ian. The woman brought a small package, and handing it to him, she said that he should eat on the way, because she had prepared more to last longer. Then the young lady said that there was perishable food on top. The bottom was dried meat and dried vegetables, so he could keep them for later. And finally, she added that she also put his favorite bean pie. And after all this information, Ian looked at his mother and thanked her for her care. He would definitely eat everything. The woman began to take steps toward her son to hug him. Hugging him tightly, the woman asked her son to be very careful, then told him not to overwork and to eat well. Such tenderness on the part of his mother surprised the young man. He stood there for a few seconds, not knowing what to do at that moment. However, he pulled himself together and decided to hug her back. Then they held hands and stood looking intently into each other's eyes for a few seconds, because it was hard for them to let go of each other. And finally, Ian promised that he would be back soon, so she didn't have to worry. And as he approached the carriage, he turned to face his companions and said that it was time for him to go on his way, because he had already stayed here a little too long. He took his place in the wagon and began to travel, and his family and subordinates lined up in a single line to follow the sorcerer. As soon as they started to move, the young man started looking out the window because he needed to adjust himself to the fact that he would not be able to see them for a long period of time because he was so used to them all. He also reasoned that he had to believe that where he and his forces were not present, his mother would be safe. The woman was very sad at this point because she was also very used to him being around all the time. A large estate with good security, a beautiful city with a low crime rate, and mana traps that only Douglas, Mother, and Ledio can operate, so that should be enough to protect the house. Twenty-five years have passed since he set out on his difficult journey to Perrick Province. Then the events unfold in an area where monsters were running fast between two large rocks because they saw a target in front of them that they had to destroy immediately. And as it turned out, they targeted a town with a small number of people. They had been preparing for this attack for several days as each of them carried their own weapons, which they had made themselves. One of the men had blonde hair and was wearing metal armor. He raised his hand in the air and in a serious tone ordered his subordinates to bring him the heads of these monsters. And finally, he added that until they fulfill his order, they should not even dream of death. So everyone listened attentively to the task set before them. Suddenly, a young man on a horse rode up to the blonde man, who was very excited and scared. And as soon as he got down, he began to move quickly to the main one, reporting that they were attacked by a large group of orcs who were quite well armed. And they attacked from the rear. And they were not prepared for this and therefore do not know what to do. So they are waiting for his order on further actions. This information surprised the man because he was simply sure that they could not do it. And so he asked with his mouth wide open, What? He hadn't yet figured out how they had managed to outsmart and outmaneuver them. And having mastered his emotions, he began to move to the horse, turning his head to his subordinates and ordered the first and third squads to be here with the sorcerers, and the first one should follow him. Then he climbed on his horse and raised his sword up and said loudly that he needed to deal with the orcs immediately. Therefore, everyone should follow him. 
They may be strong, but these monsters move according to a certain long-established principle. For experienced soldiers, they will not cause any problems. But orcs can easily defeat beginners. The blonde man was very focused on how to attack his opponents in order to defeat them. After riding the horses for a few meters, the chief began to think about how they could not be late because this was not a situation in which this could be allowed. Suddenly, snow began to fall from the sky. He stopped in his tracks and looking at it, emphasized that it never snows in the north. Not only did he stop, but his entire army, which was following him at that moment, stopped. They all saw large ice rocks in front of them, which had not been there before. Then you could see how the monsters ended up in the middle of the ice peaks, and it was they who stopped them a little bit, and they stopped moving forward. And this made everyone who saw it stop and look at it carefully because this had never happened to them before. A blonde man sitting on his horse with his mouth wide open asked what had happened because even he did not understand what it was and how to act. The rest of the orcs were killed with arrows made of ice. They were all lying on the ground in one pile very close together. And their comrades were still standing next to them, but they were just frozen. And they could not perform their usual movements because they were frozen. Then the blonde gentleman and his subordinates noticed an unknown man in a blue cloak. As they approached him, they all drew their weapons, and the chief asked him to identify himself quickly. Without turning his head, the sorcerer said in a serious tone that he had heard that they needed help here. That's why he came here, because he could help. The soldiers did not fully understand these words, and because of this, they lowered their weapons and froze in their places because they needed time to think about it. So to clarify everything, the stranger took off his hood and showed his seal and said that he was Ian Page, the archwizard of the tower. The blonde man continued to stand there and asked Ian Page, because so far this information has not provided him with the amount of information he would like to receive in order to understand everything correctly. But when a few minutes passed, he remembered something and asked if he was the same Ian Page who came from the northern village of Mogrion. The chief then raised his right hand and said that he did not know he was so young. After all, they had heard rumors that the sorcerer had cleansed Mount Mogrian of monsters when he was a child. Then the blonde man extended his hand to greet him. He said that it was an honor to meet him. Ian replied with a sweet smile that it was also a great opportunity to meet the best soldier in the south, Kali and Perik. The host said that the guest must be a little tired from his journey, but he wanted to know if the sorcerer could spare some time for him. After all, they have something to discuss. So after this meeting, they moved to the settlement. The blonde man changed into ordinary clothes and leaned on the table with both hands and said in a serious tone that they had not expected the monsters to decide to return. And then he added that, to be more precise, they did not expect the orcs to return in such numbers. And he emphasized that the enemies were too fearless today. This makes it seem like there are serious changes in the vast fields. At this point, the sorcerer tried to listen to everything carefully because he needed to know as much information as possible. And the blonde man went on to say that if not, he thought Ian knew that they had sent a letter to both the manor and the tower. In the first, they asked to send reinforcements for the fight and necessary supplies. And in the second, they asked to send an archwizard. Because in this situation, only a sorcerer of the highest class would be able to help because he would have enough power. After a short pause, the blonde man said that the incredible wall of ice that had appeared out of nowhere was able to stop the monsters, and it could buy them time to make the right decision. And he began to tell them that they had been at war with the monsters for a long time. But the invasion continues. There is not enough food and soldiers are constantly lacking. So if the request was accepted, they would have the strength to continue fighting. However, it seems that the estate decided to ignore their request, and since Ian was sent to them, he already knows what to do next. After that, the sorcerer folded his arms across his chest and said that he understood them perfectly, and he said that the ice wall would last for ten days. And if the monsters don't decide to attack through the mountains, they can assume that they are safe. And during this time, Ian will visit the large fields. The chief clarified in surprise, by yourself. The archwizard calmly but seriously replied that it was necessary to find the source of the problems and deal with it as soon as possible. The blonde man began to laugh out loud, saying that the gentleman was too confident. 
After all, they had been in these lands for a long time, but they had not been able to determine where so many monsters came from. The only thing we managed to find out is that there are many types of orcs, and they are not at odds with each other. And sometimes they even make raids together, to kill people because they need this particular territory without any neighbors, because they believe that those who are not like them are all enemies who need to be destroyed in order to continue their peaceful life. Then the leader of the army showed a map and added that their attacks were not only on them, but also on the Colwood Empire to the east and the Roe Kingdom to the west. These states have very narrow and winding roads, so they suffered the least. Then the man showed me that there is a canyon of a big snake, and most often monsters attack Peric from there. But the strange thing is that a little further away is the kingdom of the Ajatun Aborigines, who do not interfere. So it seems that they are scared away from those lands. And then he suggested that the north is the very reason for such frequent and aggressive attacks on large fields. However, there is one thing their soldiers cannot get there, because of the constant raids on the canyon. At this time, Ian was thinking that this did not happen in his past life. Attacks, yes, but not on such a large scale. So he said, holding his chin, that he would send him straight to the Aboriginal kingdom. The blonde man said that he was led by a great shaman and he must know something. He asked if the sorcerer could talk to him. Ian smiled sincerely and said that of course he could do it. He would be there for a while anyway and would be able to find a few minutes for this request. Late in the evening, when there was not a single living soul in the yard, there were a lot of stars in the sky, and that made the whole place light. The sorcerer went out on the balcony and silently looked at the sky and thought about the vast fields. After all, he had already been there in his past life, and he needed to remember all his actions back then. Because some may be needed in this life to overcome so many monsters, and it was at this time that it was best to think. Then he remembered something and suggested that one of the things might still be here, namely, an artifact belonging to an aboriginal shaman. It is also popularly called the Stick of the Great Fields, and Ian was very fond of it. Three years ago, the Green River Empire, the Colwood Empire, and the Kingdom of Roe formed a coalition to destroy the orcs in the Great Fields. Due to the fact that it was there that a large number of them appeared, the states divided this territory among themselves. However, in his past life, the great shaman disappeared, and the natives all scattered around the world. That's why none of what is happening now happened before. Then the man, looking carefully into the distance, suggested that, of course, his return could have influenced the course of events, and so everything could have changed a little. And because of this, a new plan had to be thought out. It could also be the cause of unexplained attacks on the great fields. So early in the morning, Ian went outside the gates of the settlement and told the blonde soldier that in ten days, the ice wall would melt. Therefore, during this time, he needs to find out the source of the problem and deal with it. With, and finally he added that if he did not return. But before he could finish, he was interrupted by the leader of the army, who said that he would believe that Ian would return to them alive and unharmed, and wished him good luck. Immediately after this conversation, the sorcerer set off on a journey. He did so on foot, walking through dried fields with many dried yellow plants. After walking a few more meters, he realized that he would now find himself in the place where the aboriginal lands originated. Therefore, he had to be careful not to hurt himself. However, he found it unusual that it was too quiet for a place where a large group of people should live and spend time together outside all the time. However, as it turned out, he was alarmed by a completely different silence, namely that the North is teeming with monsters, and here there are none. He wondered why they were attacking Peric, and this region is avoided. And at that moment, he decided to find out, and after taking a few steps between the bushes, he came across a couple of men who quickly pointed their weapons at him and asked him who he was, and why did he come here? Ian slowly and carefully raised his hands, palms up to the natives, and replied in a calm tone that he was not an enemy, but a sorcerer from the Green River Empire. Then one of the tribal men looked down and asked in a serious tone how the guests knew their language. After all, it can only be learned by living with them. 
However, the sorcerer did not explain anything, but explained that he did not have time for that. He added that at the moment he was looking for a shaman, because it was to him that he had come here. The three natives put their weapons on the ground next to them and froze in their seats, mouths wide open asking, what? After all, the king of the shamans is a title that can be equated in importance with the title of tower owner. A shaman is a creature with the heart and mind of a mana, but despite this, he was not raised by a sorcerer. The shamans have their king at the top of the hierarchy. Ian decided to explain what he was doing and said that he was researching the monsters that were attacking the north. However, one of the natives was not convinced by his words and pointed his spear at him. The sorcerer decided to finish by saying that he was sure that their chief knew the reason. The man with the weapon said that Ian was already crossing all the boundaries. And who is he anyway, demanding to meet the king himself? And without waiting for an answer, the aborigine ordered the sorcerer to leave immediately. If he continued to talk nonsense, they would sacrifice him to the gods of the great fields. Ian was not happy about this development because he had already spent enough time explaining himself and they were still not understanding him, so he asked them if they thought he was listening to them. These words made the natives very angry, and one of them, waving his weapon, angrily shouted that they would now see how the guest on the verge of death would speak. And immediately after the words were spoken, the aborigine began to walk directly at Ian, pointing his spear directly at his opponent. When the sorcerer saw this, he immediately used the magic that gives ice spears, which simply appeared on the right side in one second and was ready to be used. And as soon as the two men met, they immediately began to fight with their weapons. It was only after the first blow that the end of the aboriginal man's weapon flew off and fell to the ground. He was shocked because this had never happened to him before. So he froze in place, looking at his weapon. And Ian did not miss the opportunity to say that their heads would be next. And pointing his ice sword at the natives, the sorcerer said that he needed to do without unnecessary noise. So he suggested that they simply take him to the king. But as soon as he finished speaking, a man in a long beige robe approached them. He asked Ian what he needed him for. All those present immediately turned their heads in the direction of the voice. For a few seconds, the sorcerer looked at the newcomer. He looked quite experienced. And judging by the caftan, the man is a king of shamans. And he said this assumption out loud to get at least some kind of answer to it. The gray-haired gentleman closed his eyes and quietly and calmly replied that the guest had emphasized everything correctly. At that moment, one could see that the shaman had certain patterns on his face in red. Ian went on to say in a sincere tone that he was very surprised that the shaman had come to him personally. After all, he had been trying to come to him for several minutes on his own. And he immediately began to say that the monsters were attacking three states that bordered theirs, which had never been attacked in all this time. And finally, he added that for some reason he thought the gentleman knew why this happened. The shaman replied that attacks are part of their existence. Therefore, they do not know what happened. Ian listened to everything carefully, but he was not fooled. So he said a little sharply, Lies! and the shaman's face changed abruptly. His expression became angry. At this time, the color of the sorcerer's eyes changed to blue, and he raised his eyebrows and said in a serious tone that he could not be fooled because he could feel everything. So he decided to prove himself and ordered that they tell him how things really are. The natives did not like this and angrily said in one voice, how dare you? However, the shaman showed them with his hand that everything was fine. And then the gray-haired, bearded man said in surprise that it was very strange, because his magic of lies did not work on the sorcerer from the Empire. It had never happened to him before. And looking carefully into Ian's eyes, the man agreed to tell everything, because he had no other option. He could not contradict a stronger man than he was. The shaman made a very serious and mysterious expression on his face, and looking down slowly began to tell me that many years ago there was a certain prediction that the great fields will be swallowed up by a sea of fire, and the golden lands would be stained with blood. The prophecy said that their tribe, who had lived on this land for thousands of years, would be destroyed and their people enslaved. They did not know what to do. After all, the beginning of the war would be an indicator of their end. There was no way out. Life returned to its usual course, and only prayer was the only hope that could delay the inevitable.
But one day, a woman came to the settlement. She handed them the stick forcefully and disappeared unnoticed. This fact made Ian think. And then the gray-haired gentleman continued that her last words were a warning that if a stranger appeared, then he must be killed immediately. And from that moment on, everything around turned orange. And the skeletons of dead people began to come out of the ground, which would create an attack. And then they all lined up in several rows next to each other. And when they were all ready to perform the task, the shaman asked for forgiveness. And then a second later, he added that today Ian's life would end. And at that moment, the shaman stood in front of everyone. And in his right hand, he held the same magic stick. And after looking closely at everything around him, the sorcerer realized what the whole point was, namely, that they were using black magic. But it had been banned 300 years ago and was considered extinct. And no one knew that it was alive and would find him here. So Ian decided to smile sweetly and, with his hands down, quietly apologized and said that his life was very precious to him. However, he would take the stick with the black magic. The shaman, holding on to the stick tightly, said in a confident tone that the sorcerer could have it if he could, of course. Ian raised his right hand in front of him and said that there was no other way. He also advised the man to look carefully with both eyes so as not to miss anything. At that time, a blue light began to appear around him. At this time, the blonde soldier went outside the settlement and looking at the mountain of ice began to think that something had happened. After all, ten days had passed since the sorcerer had left for the great fields, and very soon the ice wall would break and their lives would be in danger again. So he made a certain decision that had to be implemented immediately. The chief turned his head back and turned to his assistant named Adol. I asked him to tell everyone to go on alert. After that, he has to gather all the units, all the weapons and catapults. He also has to bring the guards who are on the mountain. The soldier listened attentively and, with his hand on his heart and his head down, said that he would do exactly as his superior ordered. In just 20 minutes, everyone had already taken their positions to defend themselves. The blonde man stood in front with his sword pointed at the ground. Looking ahead of him, he said that they needed to defend themselves for the safety of the province and its people. It is they who must become the strong shield that can protect their region at all costs, because if they do not, all those behind them will not be able to protect themselves. And as soon as the ice wall melted, the chief ordered to prepare catapults, because now the monsters could attack them, because they had not done so for quite a long time. As soon as he saw a strange shadow in the fog, he immediately began to shout loudly to his subordinates that they must get the catapults ready to launch on command. However, as soon as he took a closer look, he noticed that it was not an enemy at all, but a sorcerer who had been gone for about ten days was walking toward them with slow steps. Ian looked quite exhausted. He was moving around, holding on tightly to a cane, and leaning down, he began to cough loudly as if he lacked fresh air. The blonde soldier was quite surprised to see the sorcerer because he hadn't expected to see him here because he was prepared for an attack by monsters. When several soldiers approached the guest, he said loudly with all his might that no one should touch the stick. And as soon as he said this, he fell to the ground unconscious. A few hours later, the man woke up lying in bed completely naked. As soon as he opened his eyes, he asked himself where he was. Looking around, he realized that this was a local estate. However, when he tried to get up to sit down, he began to have a severe headache. Then he raised his eyebrows, but continued to hold his head, saying that he needed to immediately deal with the stick he had brought with him. While he was thinking, a lord came into the room in his festive clothes. He turned to Mr. Ian and asked him how he was feeling, and whether he needed anything. The boss froze near the door and began to carefully examine the guest to assess the situation and his condition. It was very important to him. Ian then asked how long he had been unconscious. The Lord replied that he had been in this state for three whole days. And it was so long that everyone was getting worried. So the blonde gentleman looked at his guest and asked him how he was feeling, because now it is most important that the sorcerer feels well. Otherwise, they will not continue to work. However, Ian began to get to his feet to go solve his problem. The Lord saw this and said that the doctor had said that the sorcerer needed to keep to bed rest. The guest put his head down and replied that he was fine. Then he began to look around and did not notice the river that belonged to him. 
so the man angrily drew his eyebrows together and asked where his stick was now. The Lord pointed to his right and said that he had asked their sorcerers to keep him in that chest. It is a kind of prison for it. That way no one can take advantage of it. Ian slowly walked closer and carefully examined the chest and said that it was quite inventive. He emphasized that they had done everything right so far. The blonde gentleman and his assistant stood behind and watched the sorcerer's actions. They did not understand why he did not want to follow the doctor's advice. So the Lord decided to remind Mr. Ian once again that he was advised to get more rest because his body and manna were completely exhausted. And if he had come a little later, he might have just, just died. At that moment, the sorcerer froze where he stood and, with his head down and his eyes looking down, listened attentively to all the words of the chief. Because how, not, how should he listen to the local elite? The blonde man went on to say that despite Ian's condition, he was still forced to ask what had almost killed him and what had happened in the great fields. The sorcerer decided not only to tell but also to demonstrate. So he took out a stick and pointed to it and said that it was the cause of all the troubles that had fallen on these lands. This stick was created by a black sorcerer and was used by shamans to scare away monsters who also wanted to attack their lands but did not do so because they were afraid for their lives. This information surprised the Lord, and he even opened his mouth wide and asked for a moment because he needed to process this information. After all, he thought that black wizards had disappeared 300 years ago. Ian looked at the stick and said that someone else had made it. It was definitely not a shaman, but he hadn't been able to find out who it was yet because he hadn't had enough mana to do so last time. Suddenly, the sorcerer began to say that when the shaman died, the black magic began to dissipate and the witches attacked the new owner of the stick. It was a kind of curse to cover their tracks. Hearing these words, the blonde man said that this was why the sorcerer was late. But if the stick is dangerous, why not just destroy it or leave it where it was found? And then Ian began to smile happily, saying that he liked her very much and hadn't decided what he was going to do with her yet, so he brought her here. To put it mildly, Rusyavi was shocked to hear this answer, because it was not a very good reason. A few seconds later, the sorcerer happily announced that the black magic had been destroyed. However, in just one second, a bright red light began to appear around Ian, and a sharp and sharp pain appeared in the side of his heart. He had never felt anything like it before. Then the man with wide open eyes raised his hand to his heart and began to cry out from the pain that was created in it. And because of this, he began to squirm a little, because he could not stand it normally. The Lord and his assistant were very scared, because just a minute ago everything was fine, and now they don't understand what is happening. So they started asking if Mr. Ian was okay. The sorcerer did not respond to the question, but instead continued to hold his heart, because it hurt him too much. You could tell by his expression. Then the man turned his head toward his comrades, and their figures became blurry, and the Lord was quite frightened. Then Ian began to worry about the heart of the manna, and then the thing he feared most happened. Blood began to come out of his mouth and a wound near the most important orin. This made the gentleman stand still and just stare blankly in front of him because he needed a certain amount of time to comprehend. However, he could not do this calmly because his throat began to scratch very much and to get rid of this unpleasant feeling, the man began to cough up blood loudly. The Lord nervously began to ask Ian what was wrong with him, because he wants to help him somehow, but he doesn't know how yet, and what actions should be taken in his direction. When he received no response, the blonde gentleman turned his head to his assistant and ordered him to bring a doctor who could help them immediately. However, Ian finally spoke up and said that there was no point in worrying so much because nothing terrible had happened. He had just shed his skin, in a sense. The Lord calmed down a bit because the guest really looked better than he had a few minutes earlier. So, after controlling his emotions a bit, he asked what it meant and how it was possible. Ian began to tell me that the heart of the mana was not yet big enough to hold the entire volume of his mana. He added that this sometimes happens. These words did not reassure the Lord, so he asked if the sorcerer was really all right. He answered with a short and clear, Yes. The guest then held his arms out to the side, palms up, and said that, as he thought, 
he needed to immediately upgrade his class, because he would not be able to continue working like this, because the amount of mana had increased too much. Then the Lord said that he was very happy because Ian was safe, but he still needed to be examined by a doctor. The sorcerer smiled sweetly and thanked him for his concern. After that, the blonde man calmed down a bit and said that since everything was fine, he needed to get down to the business that had accumulated. First, they will start with the fact that when the wizard went to the great fields, a parcel came from the magic tower, and they were asked to show Ian the ball, but he was unconscious. The Lord decided not to talk for a long time, but simply handed him the parcel. Looking at the ball, Ian wondered if it could really have been sent from the ivory tower, but these thoughts were interrupted by the Lord, who asked him to wait. But that was not all, for there was something else. So the man took out a letter from his inner pocket and handed it to the sorcerer, saying that he had delivered this letter from his majesty to the messenger, and there were orders to hand it over personally. Ian was very surprised to hear that it was sent through a messenger, and so he decided to ask again, Through a messenger? The Lord answered briefly and clearly, Yes! And this made the man think for a few seconds that his majesty had not sent the letter in a more modern and faster way, but in a long and proven way. What if there is information there that the tower should not know? So he decided to start with a message. To do this, the sorcerer picked up a blue ball and immediately unfolded the text. From the very beginning, it was written that the message was intended for the archwizard Ian Page. And then, the following content. Delivery was delayed so as not to interfere with the mission. Please understand this was the choice that had to be made. During your absence, something happened. Robbers broke into your house. To steal your inheritance, your family is under the protection of the tower. For some reason, Ian did not calm down, but rather became nervous, because the owner of the tower knew perfectly well that he would be worried about this. So he did not understand why he was sent this message. Then the sorcerer decided to read the letter that His Majesty had sent him. It read as follows. Dear Ian Page, if this letter has reached you, it means that luck is on my side and on the side of my son. With the blessing of the Goddess of Fortune, I would like to ask you a favor. Since you are now on a responsible mission, you probably don't know that soon a meeting will be held in the free city of Demeter to decide the fate of the lands that have been taken over by monsters. The last lines made Ian take his gaze off the page for a bit and look at it in front of him, because as a Tau, everything happens quickly, because the last time it happened was three years ago. Then the man turned his gaze back to the page and read the continuation. The meeting will be attended by the successive princes, namely the fifth Prince Ragnar, the head of the Magic Tower, and Captain Duncan. By the time you read this letter, they have most likely arrived in the Free City. And at this meeting, the crown prince has no support. Because of this, he went there very upset, because he does not have a person who could advise him or help him at all. And the last words in the letter were, Therefore I ask you to become my son's right hand and help him through this difficult journey. His Majesty wrote this message personally, which was not typical for him. The chief also promised that the sorcerer's family would be protected by his direct order. This information shocked the man even more because he did not know what to do with the previous information, and then something else surfaced. Then Ian closed his eyes to recall some moments from his past life, namely the negotiations in Demeter. This is the place where Ragnar's skills will be highly appreciated and where he will strengthen his position, and at a time when the consistent prince will be weakening. Ragnar will be able to prove himself as a great diplomat and force the land to be given over to the empire. After that, all the aristocrats will take his side, and the successive prince will be condemned for incompetence and almost rejected by the nobility. Then the sorcerer opened his eyes and began to assume that the events of the past and present had been planned by the owner of the tower. After all, he simply did not understand it at the time. Ian did not understand how long ago and why he had such thoughts. However, the invasion of monsters, the king of shamans receiving a stick with black magic from a secret sorceress. The negotiations, which began three years earlier than in his past life, are somehow connected to the owner of the ivory tower, and Ian is simply sure of it. And then the sorcerer covered his mouth for years because the invasion of his house by robbers was also a kind of warning to him. 
and from this he realized that the chief of the tower was only guessing. But it turns out he sees right through him. At that moment, Ian wanted to return to the capital and his family, and he didn't care about the emperor's request. However, something special has to happen, magic that is not described in books, magic that the owner of the tower does not even know about, and he can only defeat it by becoming a sixth-level sorcerer. So the blonde turned his head to the head of the town and addressed him in a serious tone. He still did not understand what was going on, and because of this, he was a little frightened, but he responded to the words, Yes, Mr. Ian, and he waited for the dialogue to continue. Then the sorcerer put his hands back and relaxed, smiled sweetly and asked if the man could fulfill his request. At this time, people were gathering in the free city of Demidera, which did not belong to any country because Ragnar had come to town and a meeting was to be held to discuss important issues. The blonde folded his arms across his chest and closed his eyes, asking the captain if it was really impossible to call Mr. Ian. After all, he really needs him now. The black-haired man standing next to him put his hands back and replied in a calm tone that the prince should be patient because not much time had passed. After a few seconds, he said that his majesty had sent the blonde to represent the empire. This chance could change his life dramatically. The prince looked down and said sadly that he really understood everything, but he was still a little scared because he had never done anything like this before. A second later, he added that the prince himself should know that various ambassadors, the owner of the tower, and of course Ragnar, who would not miss the opportunity to show off his person, would be here. After listening carefully, the blonde turned his head to the captain and said sadly that he had a bad feeling about it, and at such moments, Ian's support would be needed. At this time, the owner of the tower stood behind him, holding a stick in one hand and staring at the prince, saying to himself that the time had come. Then he turned his gaze to the right and continued to talk to himself, saying that he had been preparing for this day for a long time. And surely the boy is already hurrying to the imperial estate. He emphasized that he now understands what Ian Page is like. His family comes first, no matter what happens in politics. When it's all over, the new prince. But I didn't have time to think it through because something happened that no one expected. All those present looked up and began to examine something carefully. One man even asked what it was. The second gentleman began to point his index finger up the mountain, showing everyone that something was flying there. The older gentleman suggested that it might be a large bird. The blonde prince turned his head in the direction everyone else was looking and, squinting a little, began to peer carefully into the distance to find out what the unknown object was. And when, just a few seconds later, he realized that it was the one he had been waiting for, so he opened his mouth wide in surprise. Then he spoke the name of Ian out loud, and the sorcerer kept looking down at the people who had gathered and were looking at him with such curiosity. A few seconds later, he landed next to the blonde prince and his assistant and dropped to one knee, bowed his head, and apologized for being late. Finally, he looked up at the man and added the words, His Majesty, in a sincere tone. This symbolized that he was completely on his side and that the gentleman could count on his support. Ragnar stood by and was quite angry at this development because according to his plan, everything was supposed to happen completely differently. And the owner of the tower could barely contain all his emotions. A lot of thoughts were raging in his head that it was impossible because how could he neglect his family? At this time, no less important events were also taking place in the imperial estate of the Green River Empire, but not as exciting. The alchemist's son sat in a large, soft chair and closed his eyes and asked when the captain would return, because he missed him so much and wanted to demonstrate his new skills to him. Then he lay down on the couch face down and told his father that, because of the ban, he couldn't even go to the academy. He was bored at home. The alchemist folded his arms across his chest and asked his son to calm down because they should be grateful to be accepted at the estate. He is also very glad that thanks to the mana traps they managed to catch the robbers. Then the man moved his hand to his chin and added that he was sure that touching such devastating magic would have wiped them out right then and there. Noticing the worried expression on Lady Page's face, the alchemist asked her not to worry because they were safe now. After all, this is the imperial estate of his majesty, but in fact, with a sweet smile, he asked if there was a safer place than this. 
However, the young lady did not look anywhere, but instead sat with the same expression on her face and stared unblinkingly in front of her. When the man noticed this reaction, he began to wave his hands from side to side to somehow attract the woman's attention. But for some reason, she did not even react to this. But he was not upset and rubbed his temple with his right hand and said that a letter had come from the ivory tower. And it said that Mr. Ian would appear very soon and say the word, Tadam. As soon as the alchemist spoke his last words, a rather familiar voice to everyone present said the same commanded phrase, Tadam, am I a little late? The alchemist's son opened his mouth and eyes wide in surprise and began to slowly get out of bed, quickly processing the information that was entering his brain. However, as it turned out, he was not the only one who was so shocked, but also the mother and the alchemist who froze in their seats. Only after two or three minutes did the mother say her son's name, Ian, in a calm tone of voice. When everyone finally came to their senses, they came closer to the boy. The woman took her son by both hands and looked him straight in the eye, and the young man apologized for the trouble. A second later, he added that everything would be fine from now on because he was there to protect them. And as soon as he said this, he began to smile broadly. Last night at the castle in the province of Pierrick, at this time of day, it was very beautiful around because a large number of stars were shining in the sky, which gave the area a special flavor. At the time, Ian was in the company of the Lord and his assistant, and with all seriousness, he addressed the latter with one request. The blonde gentleman happily replied that he would be happy to do it. But first he needed to know what to do. So the sorcerer put his hand on his heart and asked to protect it, because he needed it now more than ever. The Lord was quite surprised because he certainly did not expect such a request because Ian himself had defended them from monsters a few days earlier. The blonde man went on to explain that he would use magic to put his body and mind into a state of sleep. If a problem arises, he should call a local sorcerer to send mana to his head, and only then will he be able to wake up. No one has ever been able to reach the sixth circle officially, so there are very, very few records of its possibility. Even in his past life, when he became a sixth circle sorcerer and developed further, he had to invent his own personal techniques or look for them in ancient books. He did not put off this ritual and began it right then and there. The man held out his hand and a blue light appeared around it, and a circle with certain patterns appeared on the ground. And just a few minutes later, Ian saw two people standing next to each other, dressed in long blue capes. But then it turned out that these two were holograms, and the real sorcerer had just fallen asleep and started to fall to the ground, but was caught by the surprised lord. He did not understand how this was possible. For a couple of minutes, he just stood there, hardly moving, just looking in front of him in order to understand at least something. At the same time, he was holding Ian unconscious in his arms, and opposite him stood his two identical figures, which were difficult to distinguish from their owner, puppetry. With sixth-class magic, it is possible to make the main body a controller, after which it will fall into a state of sleep and bring two puppets, which can not only move freely, but also cast magic at the level of the fifth grade. The Lord was still shocked by what had happened, and right at that moment one of the dolls addressed him and said that she relies on him. And as soon as she said that, she began to smile sincerely. It was quite difficult to understand where the real Ian was and where his puppets were. When the fifth prince saw the sorcerer next to him, he was overjoyed and happy. His joy made bright and beautiful flowers bloom around him. The chief went on to say, smiling sincerely, that he immediately felt calmer and thanked Ian for coming. The blonde man was glad to see that his appearance had relieved his majesty's anxiety. Suddenly, the owner of the tower began to walk slowly toward them, and when he was a few steps away, he said out loud that Mr. Ian had come to this ceremony. Then the older man stopped and put one hand behind his back and said that he had received a report on the successful completion of the mission in Perrick province. He added that the boy had done a good job. Ian looked down and replied in a calm tone that he had done it for the sake of the empire, because such work falls on the shoulders of an archmage and he was ready for any challenge. But the owner of the tower was more interested in something else, so he asked why Ian was here now because if he had recovered, he had to go back to the tower and take care of other urgent matters. However, perhaps the news of what happened to your family has not yet. 
However, the man did not have time to finish because he was interrupted by the sorcerer, who said that he had received a letter from the tower, but also from the emperor, and in it he asked to help the prince at tonight's dinner meeting. The gray-haired gentleman held his hands out to the side and asked if he could see the contents of the letter. Ian replied that, of course he could, and he handed him the scroll. The owner of the tower carefully opened it and began to slowly read each word so as not to miss anything, because he would not have another chance. When at the end he saw His Majesty's signature and seal, he began to think that he knew the king would accept something like this. But for Ian Page to bring his family and come here. And then the man rolled up the letter and said that it was indeed a letter from the king, but the sorcerer was not allowed here. The prince, who was standing nearby at the time, was seriously angry when he heard these words. So he began to shout out, What is this all about? Does the owner of the tower really want to disobey his majesty's order? The gray-haired gentleman reacted calmly to such emotions. So standing still, he addressed his excellency and explained that it was all about trust between the three countries. The number of official representatives and accompanying persons was previously discussed and approved and they cannot change anything at will. This raises the question of maintaining diplomatic relations. And he asked how the prince thinks their empire will look like if he suddenly brings an archmage of this level. And finally, he added that he hoped the prince himself understood how unwelcome the confusion was. The blonde man, in turn, raised his eyebrows angrily because he clearly did not like these words. But Ian realized that these words were very true. After all, these rules had been applied in his past life, so there was nothing surprising here. Now the three countries are in peaceful relations. But before, there were endless wars and skirmishes between them. However, in a new way, representatives of the country, his escorts and guards, take part in the meetings. We already have three arch wizards, including the owner of the tower. If we add another, the trust of the other participants will be undermined. Ian looked down and said that he fully understood what kind of diplomacy and trust we were talking about. And there is indeed a reason to be concerned. After hearing the words, the ivory tower's boss abruptly turned his back on the interlocutor and thanked him for his understanding. He said that the guy could return to the capital as soon as possible. It was a pity that it took so much time to get there. But the gray-haired man was very happy that they were able to sort everything out, and then Ian put his right hand on his chest and said that he would convey this to his majesty. But just in case, he asked a question, however, that if one of the archmagicians left, would he be able to join the meeting? Seeing the surprised expression of the chief tower, the sorcerer immediately began to explain that since this was a personal order of his majesty, there should be nothing wrong with the replacement. The elder gentleman said that it could be done, but they needed to find someone who would be willing to refuse. As soon as the gentleman finished his last sentence, one of the previously selected sorcerers took one step forward and raised his right hand up to indicate that he could give up his seat. All those present who heard this conversation were quite surprised by this development. So they froze in their seats with their mouths wide open. Even the blonde prince himself was equally shocked and could not even say a word, just stood there and silently watched what was happening. At this time, the owner of the tower turned his gaze to the man who expressed a desire to refuse and addressed him, named Ronan, asking if he understood. What he just said? The dark-haired gentleman raised his head high and stood there with a fixed expression for a few seconds to think over his answer. Ronan then put his right hand forward and replied that he was absolutely serious. After all, as representatives of the country, could they really disobey the king's order? Receiving no response, the man continued to say that he understood the importance of diplomatic relations. But as a citizen of the empire, he could not but fulfill his majesty's order. And his decision would help them fulfill two conditions at once. After all the words were said, Ronan turned to face the prince and bowed before him and asked him for permission to hand over his responsible mission to Mr. Ian Page. Hearing these words amused the blond man, and he began to smile happily, and then replied that he allowed such a replacement to be made. Finally, he thanked me for this decision in favor of the empire. And from now on, the man can return to the capital by his personal order. The prince would also give him a carriage. The black-haired sorcerer bowed once again and sincerely thanked him for everything. Before setting out on his journey, the sorcerer decided to ask Mr. Ian, 
He told him that he was now the representative of the delegation instead of him, so he had to take this job seriously. The sorcerer smiled sweetly and thanked him for his action, for it was the right thing to do at the time. The man replied that he was only fulfilling the king's order. The archwizard Ronan is one of those who can lure you to his side. He is known for his honesty and straightforwardness. He is also known for his neutral attitude towards both the ivory tower and the emperor. He is a simple sorcerer who has devoted his life to magic. At that moment, Ian thought that if he taught him a few magic tricks, he would gladly go over to his side. At the end of the conversation, Ronan bowed low to all the men present and said that he would be leaving for the estate right away. After all, as the owner of the tower said, archmagicians who are not officially on a diplomatic mission should not be here. The main gray-haired gentleman, holding his stick tightly, looked down and said that it was a pity, but that was the way it should be. Then the older man opened his eyes and began to think that Ian could only be a stupid prankster. But was he really marking the tower guard to take his place? The man was quite angry at these words, but the sorcerer was smiling happily because everything had been resolved because of what he needed. The owner of the tower squinted his eyes and said the name Ian Page in his mind. And he added that he had been working for a long time to ensure that the tower would gain power over all the affairs of the empire. And some young man who convinced himself that he could do this. He can't just take a moment and undo the efforts of the owner of the tower. While Ian stood in the company of the fifth prince and his aides and bodyguards, Ragnar, who had also come here to show off, watched him behind. The young man did not understand how the sorcerer managed to join this team, because the lineup had been approved long ago and he should not have been here. Demidera was indeed a free city, not affiliated with any of the three countries. In addition, they all understood its necessity and officially recognized it as neutral for many years. Then the 19th mayor of this town invited the guests inside. The man's name was Angel Neville. The prince immediately asked where the other members of the meeting were. The man replied that they were already in their suites for special guests. Then the gentleman pointed to the left and said that a large blonde mansion had been prepared for the ambassadors from the greater empire. And for his majesty the prince, a mansion was allocated a little to the right. After all, it is used by the noblest of their guests. After receiving this information, the prince folded his arms across his chest and turned to the owner of the tower and asked if they had anything scheduled for today. The gray-haired gentleman continued to hold on tightly to his stick and looked down and said that they had nothing planned for today so everyone could go to rest. This information made the blonde guy very happy. This could be seen in his expression, which was a wide smile. And then he held his hands out to the side and said that if that was the case, then everyone could really go to their rooms to rest because they had a lot of work to do in the coming days. However, he invited Ian with him because he wanted to discuss some important matters in private. The sorcerer bowed to show his obedience to the prince. And immediately after that, the men began to move to the right. The prince walked in front and Ian followed him. Ragnar watched them quietly. And as soon as they had moved far enough away, the young man turned his head back a little and addressed the owner of the tower who was still standing there. He said that they needed to have a serious talk, but not here, but in a safer place. So he invited the gray-haired man to his apartment because, in his opinion, no one would be able to hear them there. When they got inside, Ragnar immediately said that he would not ask to take responsibility for what had happened a few minutes ago. But the wizard, who is constantly hanging around his brother, is really annoying him. So they need to immediately address his presence in their lives. In general, he does not like everything that is happening now. The owner of the tower sadly looked down at the ground and replied that he fully understood what Ragnar meant. However, I told him not to worry because Ian Page is really a very good wizard. However, diplomatic skills will be needed here. Magic will not help him. Because of this... The gray-haired man is simply sure that the sorcerer will not be able to say a word, because he simply does not know what is said at important meetings. And a second later he added, What could such a young sorcerer possibly say? In a place where the great diplomats of the three countries are present. It will be just a decoration, exactly what they planned. And Ragnar will be able to become the main supporter of today's meeting. The prince closed his eyes in alarm and said with raised eyebrows that he understood this, but the feeling of anxiety still did not leave him and he did not understand how to get rid of it. 
After all, all his efforts to lure Ian to his side have failed. For some reason, this guy categorically does not want to take over their game, and it is still not clear why. And if left unchecked, he could become a great obstacle to Ragnar's future. Then the prince opened his eyes and looked at the owner of the tower and said that he hoped the man would deal with him. The man replied that of course he would, because everything would be done because of his majesty's wishes. At this time, in another room of the mansion, the fifth prince sat on a large, soft sofa and said with a wide smile that this was just a wonderful room to live in. Then he turned to his assistant and Ian and said that they were saying that Dimitri had a good nightlife. So we should go to a show. Then the gentleman continued to laugh out loud, saying that maybe he needed to buy new clothes for going out, because not all the locals might not like this one. So he decided to immediately ask the captain to call the servants. However, this request was interrupted by Ian, who addressed his majesty. And as soon as the young man heard this voice, he immediately asked what had happened. Not receiving an answer to the first question, he asked the next one about why the sorcerer was looking at him so angrily since he had not yet done anything wrong. Ian then asked the blonde prince, holding his head, if he understood why he had come here in the first place. After all, the gentleman was to speak at a meeting of the three countries as the official representative of the entire Green River Empire, and he finished his sentence by angrily shouting that they had not come here to have fun, and the prince needs to forget about the nightly festivities. The young man is quite surprised because he thinks they still have plenty of time. However, this did not convince the sorcerer, for he said that they would prepare, and they would start right away. The blonde man was very upset because he didn't like all these important things. The assistant turned his head in the opposite direction to avoid looking at this suffering because he was tired of watching such emotions. And just at that moment, Ian calmed down, held his hands to his sides and said in a calm tone that the prince, as the main representative of the delegation, would be given the right to speak first. If the blonde man says nothing, Ragnar will take away this right. The main man looked at the floor and said more seriously that he knew this because his father had already warned him when he was at home. The sorcerer decided to speak frankly about the fact that Ragnar was well prepared and could capture all the attention. So the man asked if the prince wanted that. The boy replied that of course he did not want that. But he continued to say that he did not know. International relations, army, division of territories, slavery, no one has ever taught him diplomacy, that's why he doesn't know much about it. Ian listened carefully to all these words because he could draw some conclusions for himself. Then the prince looked up at Ian and asked him if it would be better if he kept quiet than to say something stupid in front of important people. The sorcerer concluded that the prince simply wants to escape from reality because of his helplessness, and something needs to be done about it immediately. After all, we can't let things happen like this because it is the consistent prince who is the most important figure in defeating Ragnar. So Ian said out loud that the blonde prince should be the center of attention at the upcoming meeting. However, the boss still didn't understand how he was supposed to do it, because not only does he not understand anything about it, he is also very afraid of speaking in front of a large number of people. And then the sorcerer decided that he would give the consistent prince a chance and help him. Because of this, he said that his majesty had asked him to be a pillar of support for his son so that he could prove himself and achieve something, and so that the young man does not lose his position and does not give all his attention to the fifth prince. Therefore, Ian will provide all the necessary answers to the questions that will be discussed. Because of this, from this moment until the day of the meeting, the prince will definitely need to learn them because otherwise he will not be able to keep attention on himself for long. A week has passed, and it was time for the meeting. Ragnar and the owner of the tower walked into the hall, and the prince said that he had heard that his brother had not gone out for a week after he had entered his room. Then he turned his head to the left and asked me what he was doing so busy. After all, such behavior is not typical for him. The gray-haired sorcerer replied that he also found it strange, but the guards who were presented to the successive prince's apartment said that nothing strange was happening there. However, it is known that the young man sometimes walked through the garden with a very thoughtful expression on his face. Ragnar listened to everything and answered briefly and clearly. I see, 
So after this short conversation, the men decided to continue to the hall where the meeting was to take place. On their way, however, they met the prince's successor, who, together with his assistant and the sorcerer, also walked to the meeting place. Ragnar said good morning to his brother, who was too serious. And to get him a little bit more in the mood for conversation, the fifth prince moved his right hand forward and asked him how the night went. Was there anything that bothered you? The blonde continued to stand still and replied without changing his expression that everything was actually fine. Even in a way better than it sometimes is at home. Ragnar smiled broadly at this answer and said that it was very good. After all, not everyone can boast of such a vacation. Not knowing what to ask next, the fifth prince said that he would go to the meeting room first if no one objected because he was a little tired of standing. Taking a few steps past his brother, the boy said that they would meet soon. He was simply convinced that today he would be able to draw all the attention to himself and win the favor of important people from other countries. And when Ragnar passed Ian, he didn't even stop, but instead raised his head and nose high up the hill to demonstrate his confidence. Everyone who was present during this short conversation went in different directions, because everyone had their own plan of action that they tried to follow. Then Ian looked at the prince he was accompanying and noticed something he didn't really want to see. That's why I decided to contact him to talk to him a little bit, to say some reassuring words. Because the guy clearly needs it. And when he got to the front, he looked his interlocutor straight in the eye and said that the prince shouldn't worry because he had prepared very well over the past week. And a second later, he added that he was simply confident that the prince would be the main character of the evening. And if he needs help with anything, he can always count on him. These words gave the blonde man a lot of confidence. His mood even improved because he began to smile cautiously and a spark of courage appeared in his eyes. When everyone finally took their seats, a bearded man in a white suit came on stage and asked for permission to introduce himself. He is the 19th mayor of the free city of Demidera. His name is Engelo Neville. He immediately decided to inform them that the content of their meeting would be recorded. It could also be interrupted at his personal request so everyone should remember this. They are going to start this meeting right now, because there is no time to postpone it any longer. Everyone who was supposed to be present in the room froze in their seats and listened attentively to all the mayor's words, because these are the rules that must apply. When the boss speaks, everyone is silent. For some reason, Ragnar began to smile mysteriously. At the same time, the owner of the tower was standing behind him, and when he saw this sign, he looked down to show his agreement. And behind the consistent prince stood Ian with a serious expression on his face. Because this event demanded that he be so, because quite serious people had gathered here to solve important issues. Suddenly, one of the young men present raised his hand and said that, as everyone knows, the path to the great fields from their kingdom is thorny. This makes it difficult for them to engage in trade. These words were spoken by the heir to the duchy in the kingdom of Lo, Maxwell Venat. And in this regard, they would like to provide support with wizards and elite knights, not detachments of soldiers, money, not munitions. He added that the Colwood Empire had already agreed to support them. He then turned his gaze to the successive prince and said that if the Green River Empire disagreed, they could always reconsider and agree on a new one. At this time, Ian emphasized to himself that the meeting had begun with a discussion of military support. So he began to mentally order the blonde prince to answer in the way they had been preparing for. The young man was silent for a few seconds, as he needed to gather his strength to have the courage to say something out loud to such a large audience of people. Seeing this indecision, Ragnar coughed loudly and then said that he would speak for their consistent prince regarding supplies for the army. However, the blonde man replied in a serious tone that he would like to hear the opinion of their commander, named Dankin Marcus, first. And he pointed to the man with his hand. The gentleman who asked the question smiled sweetly and asked if the representative was not the fifth prince. And the successive prince said that an expert was present here right now. And this is a great opportunity to get his opinion. Ragnar was, to put it mildly, surprised by his brother's response because he had expected the boy to be silent all the time and for him to speak for him. However, the blonde man turned his head to the expert and addressed him by name, ignoring this. This demonstrated that the man could start a story, 
The mustachioed gentleman put his hands behind his back and said in a serious tone that he would try to explain everything briefly to everyone here in clear language. Ian closed his eyes and was pleased with this beginning. At this time, the man began to tell him that as far as supplies were concerned, the kingdom of Lo, and then the men began to offer their new ideas on how to solve this issue. The blonde prince was so engrossed in his story that he even got up from his seat and began to walk around, gesturing actively. Some members of the assembly resonated with these words and put their hands on their hearts and nodded their heads with a sincere smile as a sign of their agreement. And Rangar was furious that this is how it turned out, and he was the silent prince, not his brother, who just, for just today, conquered everyone with his story. And when the consistent prince finally finished his talk, he said that it was over so that everyone understood. These few minutes passed very quickly, because everyone was listening intently. One black-haired young man raised his hand and offered to speak directly, and he clarified that they want to divide the territories into three equal parts. But a new question arises whether anyone can guarantee their equality, and these words were spoken by the prince of the Colwood Empire, Hector Colwood. After all, resources and land are different on such a large territory. And why should some get something good and others get something bad? And he is simply sure that the losing side will try to win back other lands. This means that a war will break out between them all. And then Ian began to think that this was the most important topic at today's meeting. The division of the great fields lands among the three countries. Finally, the black-haired man folded his hands on the table and added that their empire was not interested in such a development. After a second, he explained his attitude to this, because they want to keep the truce for many more years. He suggested that if anyone had a better offer, they could tell him so they could come to an agreement without quarreling. After these words, Rangar slowly turned his head to the owner of the tower to see if he had any suggestions. The gray-haired man waved his head in the affirmative and was already preparing to tell. But he didn't have time, because the first to raise his hand was the consistent prince who said he had a pretty good solution. Everyone present was surprised because they did not expect such determination from such a quiet guy. So for a few seconds, everyone just remained silent without even blinking because none of them had a proper solution to this problem. And the blonde prince, happily rising to his feet, added that he would tell them everything and then they could discuss it together because it may be necessary to make some amendments. Ragnar didn't even have time to raise his hand properly. The young man froze with his mouth wide open as he was shocked by his brother's confidence, which he had never seen before. The bearded mayor of the town calmly said, adjusting his glasses, that he thought everyone present would like to learn about this wonderful method from His Majesty the Prince of the Empire of Green River. And then the consistent prince leaned on the table with both hands and began to tell us that a new method had been invented in the ivory tower and it allows you to learn about the resources that are hidden underground, and it will calculate their amount even on a large territory. Ragnar and the owner of the tower heard these words and turned their heads sharply and simultaneously in the direction of the blonde, because even they did not know this information, and the thought flashed through the gray-haired man's mind. How is this possible? One of the men present, holding the handles of the chair, asked if this was really true. The prince answered this question with a short and clear, of course, and then he said that everyone present had probably heard of the sorcerer standing next to him at least once. And turning his hand to the right, he said that the youngest arch-wizard of their empire, Ian Page, had personally invented the method. And then the tower owner realized that they had the same strategy, to use this magical method to his advantage. But the man wondered how this sorcerer could have guessed what would be the key topic of the entire meeting. At the same time, the prince was enthusiastically telling us that this way they would be able to create a resource map in which they would be able to mark the condition of the soil. And with its help, it will be possible to fairly distribute the territory between the countries. A second later, he added that he understood that the distribution could be approximate and not perfectly accurate. But he thinks that for several decades, all countries will focus on resource extraction. When he received no response, the consistent prince said that in his opinion, there was no better solution than his. Rangnar was terribly angry. Ian noticed this, and he was very pleased with the boy's behavior, because it meant only one thing. They had done everything right, 
The blonde man got to his feet and leaned on the table and said that they could call it quits. The black-haired assistant to the crown prince could not attend the meeting. So he stood against the wall next to the office and waited nervously with his arms folded across his chest, not knowing how things were going inside. And as soon as the meeting was over, the main blonde guy went outside and happily turned to the captain, who had been waiting for them for a very long time. The prince was smiling broadly because he was pleased with how everything went. And behind him was the sorcerer, no less happy. Walking to his assistant, the prince said that if he could see how he had won over everyone at the meeting today, it's also a pity that the guy couldn't see the pouty face of the tower owner. So he offered to tell him everything in detail during the walk, because they hadn't been able to enjoy the views of the city because of the preparations. And now they can notice. Then the guy turned his head to Ian and invited him to come along, because they might not get another chance to have fun. It took the sorcerer a few seconds to think about the proposal, and the man nodded his head in the affirmative. The prince in succession said, smiling loudly, that Ian would soon be of age, so he could already have a shot or two, and then he added that he would teach him how to do it properly. However, this conversation was interrupted by a rather familiar voice addressing his majesty. When the blonde turned in the direction of the voice, he saw his brother there. He was confidently walking towards him. You could see a satisfied expression on his face, but behind it was a great deal of disappointment and sadness. As Ragnar came closer, he put his right hand on his heart and bowed, saying that his majesty was simply magnificent today, and he learned a lot from him today. The crown prince was shocked by this reaction, to put it mildly, because they had not been close since childhood. The blonde man listened attentively folded his arms across his chest and laughed out loud, saying that he was glad he could help his brother. And while Ragnar was bowing, the successive prince said that the boy participated in such gatherings. So he advised the young man not to give up and continue in the same spirit. And if he needed advice, he could turn to him. Ragnar thanked his older brother with a sweet smile. And immediately after that, he quickly turned in the opposite direction and started walking. The three men stood there for a few seconds, looking calmly after the fifth prince. This silence was then interrupted by the prince of succession, who turned to Ian Page and told him that today was the best day. The assistant and the sorcerer smiled sincerely when they heard these words. Then the young man went over and hugged his assistants and said that it was time for them to go and have fun for the whole week of their suffering. When they arrived at the right place, the prince turned to the captain and invited him to join them, because it was enough to stand at attention. After all, everyone here is their own and there is no need to be so reserved. Then he turned his attention to Ian and reminded him that today he would learn how to drink. However, this fascinating monologue came to a halt because of what happened next. Namely, that Ian's hands began to glow with blue light, and all those who were nearby also turned their heads toward the light. No one fully understood what was happening now and the sorcerer decided to say that he thought it was his threshold, and even more light appeared around him. The prince in line froze in his tracks and asked with a wide open mouth, Threshold? What do you mean? The sorcerer looked down and apologized for what had happened, and he said that the prince would have to teach him to drink at the estate. However, the guy still did not understand what was going on. Ian assured him that he would explain everything in detail, but only at the estate and he quickly said, see you later. Everyone was shocked and froze on the spot. And just in one second, he disappeared without a trace in the air. Some men began to look around, searching for the sorcerer with their eyes. Only one owner of the tower understood. The gentleman held on to his cane and asked if the wizard had been an illusion all along. And if so, he was just playing with them here. Upon hearing this information, Ragnar froze in place with his mouth wide open from the shock he was experiencing. The gray-haired man could not understand how he had failed to recognize this deception. At this time in the free city, the Lord's servant came to the Lord and brought him a tray of food, because the man refused to go to the kitchen for lunch. A blonde man was sitting on a chair next to the bed and looked to the side and ordered the food to be placed on the table by the window. The servant asked with a sad expression that Mr. Ian was still unconscious. The blonde man looked at the sorcerer in a serious tone and answered in the affirmative. And all this has been going on for several days. The magic reduced his energy use and vitality. 
The Lord went on to add that he could actually see the sorcerer's body slowly returning to normal. Then I remembered how Ian had ordered that if there were any problems, they should send him a signal with mana to his head. So the blonde man began to slowly rise to his feet and closed his eyes and said to his assistant that it was probably time to call the sorcerer. However, right at that moment, the sorcerer opened his eyes a little and, without moving, quietly said that no one needed to be called. When the Lord heard this, he abruptly came to the bed and turned to Ian and asked him joyfully if he had finally woken up. The sorcerer finally opened his eyes normally and turned his head to the right side, smiled slightly and said, As you can see. Then the blonde gentleman leaned forward a little and asked how the sorcerer was feeling. And does he have any pain? However, the blonde man closed his eyes and replied without moving that he had not yet fully recovered and that he needed a little time to recuperate. After all, he has a very bad headache and can hardly move, and also his stomach. And then the Lord asked in surprise what was wrong with him. Because if a man is in pain, they will immediately call a doctor. Ian, however, assured him that he was not in pain, but simply hungry. The room fell silent for a few seconds as everyone needed to think it over, and also to develop a plan for further action. The next morning, Ian was standing in the central square, holding on tightly to his stick. Looking ahead, he thought that he might need to stay one night. The Lord approached him with his assistant and said that he understood that the sorcerer was busy, but they wanted to say goodbye to him properly by having a dinner. Ian smiled sweetly and replied that he had already received enough help, so all these celebrations might be unnecessary. After all, he is not a do-gooder but an ordinary arch-wizard, and any other sorcerer would have helped them as well as he did. But the blonde man put his right hand to the side and said that he did not think so. Otherwise, someone else in the same place would have just killed the monsters and returned to the tower. Then the man decided to tell them that he had initially doubted the sorcerer when they first met. After all, he believed that such a young sorcerer could help them solve the problems with the monster attacks. But the Lord was wrong. For in just ten days, John was able to accomplish what he and his men had been struggling with for a long time. And finally, he emphasized that the blonde man had a really special power that no one else had. Ian stood there quietly the whole time, listening intently. So the Lord smiled broadly and spread his arms to the side and suggested that before the sorcerer left, he would do something interesting. And then the sorcerer's expression changed a bit because he didn't understand what was coming next and whether he would like it at all. The blonde man decided to clear things up and said that he had heard that five years ago Ian had been granted the status of a permanent high-ranking guest in the province of Mogran. And then he offered to do the same in this free place. When the sorcerer heard this proposal, he was surprised to say that he did not think it would be easy. But the Lord replied that he should not worry because they could skip the formalities. So he offered to officially become an honored guest of the province of Perak. Then the blonde man smiled sincerely and said that this was not a simple thank you because they had a clear goal they wanted to achieve. And a second later, he added that such an attitude could probably please even a sixth-level archmage. Ian continued to stand in the same place, holding his stick tightly. Then the Lord put up both hands and smiled broadly to the sides and said that this was beneficial for both the province of Perak and Ian Page himself. The blonde began to smile and closed his eyes, saying that he did not think it was so easy to make such official and important statements at the level of the Empire. But if he thinks so... Then he opened his eyes and said with a pleased expression that he saw no reason to refuse. He was also very pleased to hold this title. The Lord, hearing these words, replied that he was also glad to hear such an answer. Therefore, he slowly turned to the right side where his assistant was standing and holding a sword. And he asked whether they could now enshrine their contract. That way they could be famous for thousands of years. And he assured Ian not to worry, because it would be over quickly. A second later, the Lord stuck the tip of his sword between the pebbles and holding the handle tightly, closed his eyes and said that the Perrick family would be ready to receive the arch-wizard Ian Page at any time. If he needed their help, they were always ready to provide it. The sorcerer smiled sincerely as he listened to all these words, for he was very pleased. And the blonde man kept saying that he swore on his name that these words would be passed down from generation to generation. After all, it is simply impossible to forget such things.
Then the Lord Lady restrained herself from laughing and said with her hand over her mouth that she still could not get used to such formalities, and if he could, he would simply say, The contract is signed. Congratulations. Ian also laughed at these words, but he did not hide it. And when he calmed down a bit, he thanked me for paying so much attention to him. The Lord asked Ian to give him advance notice of his visit so that they could show him the most interesting things in their area. And finally, he added that he hoped the wizard would enjoy it. The sorcerer said that he would do just that. But after he said that, a blue light began to appear around the man, and after a little while, he said, See you later. The Lord and his assistant froze in their seats and looked up to watch Ian climb up with the help of his cloak. After a few minutes of flying, the wizard landed on one of the deserts with many large stones. Looking into the distance, the man began to think that so much had happened in such a short period of time that it was hard to imagine. However, he summarized that he has achieved a lot, and this is a bigger accomplishment than in his previous life, so he is clearly on the right track. He even found a wand that belonged to an arch wizard filled with black magic that disappeared more than 300 years ago and when he returns to the capital, he will have to work hard to revive it. A couple of days later, the sorcerer returned home and was giving the messenger a letter to send. And at that time, a woman who was coming down the stairs noticed her husband and said, Ian. He turned his head to see who had said his name. He did not expect anyone to get up so early, not even the servants. When Ian saw the woman, he said in a sweet tone, Mother. He missed her very much, because in this life they had not been separated for such a long period of time. The woman furiously began to ask how her son could just disappear into thin air like that, and whether he even realized how worried she was. She was also very scared. When she came a little closer, the young lady opened her mouth in surprise and then tried to cover it with her hands, saying how much the guy had lost weight. He was skin and bones. She asked if the people in Parrot could not feed him normally in return for his help. Then the mother made a face and said with regret that her son had to suffer so much. How could he stand it all? Ian, holding his mother's hands, closed his eyes and replied in a calm tone that a lot had happened. He added that he was confident that he would soon gain the weight he had lost. Then he took one step back and began to slowly take something out of his inner coat pocket. And while doing so, he said that he had something for his mother. And just a second later, he demonstrated a magic sphere that uses mana for communication. He went on to say that he had asked a workshop on the way to the capital to make it. And now, when he is away, she will always be able to contact him. Finally, he apologized for making the woman worry. And he made a small promise that he would try to be there for me in the future. But sometimes there may be times when you need to be away for a few days. At that moment, the alchemist's son entered the room and seeing Ian shouted loudly, Captain! He immediately asked me what kind of magic it was. Without waiting for an answer, he began to say that he had learned a lot of new things at the academy, but this was the first time he had seen such magic. Coming closer, he asked how the sorcerer managed to be here, in the capital and in Dimer at the same time. Then he clarified whether it could be an illusion or a reflection. Ian listened attentively and said with a broad smile that he could not ask the young man one question at a time. After that, the man turned his gaze to the right and said with a sad expression that, to put it simply, so he was promoted to the sixth class, so now he can perform such spells. The guy with his mouth wide open asked in amazement if this was true, because if so, then it turns out that Ian is the most powerful sorcerer in the entire empire. The alchemist said that he had known that the boy was strong since their first meeting, but not to be so powerful. Ian smilingly replied that nothing had changed, so they could address him as before. The alchemist's son quickly replied, Aye, aye, Captain. He went on to say that he wanted to experiment with a new elixir tonight, so he invited the sorcerer to come along. The blonde apologized and said that maybe some other time. The young man asked why, and the sorcerer looked mysteriously ahead. He replied that he had been invited somewhere and that he had to go to that meeting. A few hours later, the man arrived at the specified location. When Ian looked around, he was judged by the situation that it somehow did not meet his expectations. So he even wondered if he had come to the right place. Suddenly, a blonde prince came out of the corner of his eye, held his arms out in the air and shouted, Ian, over here! Over, 
Then the young man began to say, I think the sorcerer had already guessed that today they were having a banquet in honor of Ian. The boy replied that for some reason he didn't like this beginning anymore. The sorcerer went on to say that he came in simple clothes. What a feast. After that, the boy entered the room where two guys were waiting for him and greeted him with joy. Then they invited Ian to sit down at the table and ask them for more appetizers and drinks. And then, right in front of the sorcerer's face, a large wooden glass of beer flew and landed on the table. A blonde prince brought it and set it down. He smiled broadly and congratulated the wizard on reaching the sixth grade. And he said that he had specially brought a special drink from the Imperial Stocks for the occasion. It is the best and most selective drink you will not taste anywhere else. So he immediately offered to try it. At that moment, Ian realized that he had never even touched alcohol in his past life. Ragnar was against it, because he thought that alcohol clouds the mind. But in this life, it is not on his side, so he took the glass in his hands and began to take the first sips. And the prince asked with interest, How is it for a guy? The blonde man put the wooden vessel on the table and wiped his lips and said, Not bad at all. The consistent prince said that he was the one who was very happy because the sorcerer liked it. The men at the other table raised their hands and addressed his majesty and asked him to tell them what had happened in Demidere. The young man abruptly rose to his feet and laughed loudly, saying that he would certainly do it now. He immediately went to the next table to satisfy his friend's need. Ian froze in his seat with his mouth wide open because he hadn't expected the banquet to go like this. Then a voice spoke to him, asking Mr. Ian if he could have another drink. When the sorcerer turned to the head of the speaker, there stood the prince's assistant, named Oliver. He was holding a bottle in his hands. As he filled the cup, the black-haired boy warned him that since it was his first time drinking, he had to be very careful, because if he gets drunk, he is afraid that the whole nightly squad may disappear at the will of his magic. Ian smiled sweetly and, holding on to his glass, replied that the boy was worrying about nothing. Then Ian turned his head to the next table and said that he hadn't realized that the consistent prince was so easy to talk to the other knights. He asked if this was normal. Oliver replied that all the local knights had sworn allegiance to the prince. That's why they are loyal to each other and that's why everything is good. The sorcerer rested his head on his hand, which was on the table, and looked thoughtfully in front of him and said quietly, Oath and trust. The prince's assistant was silent for a few minutes and just watched Mr. Ian's emotions in silence. And taking a single sip, Oliver said out loud that he now understood why the sorcerer had no friends. This conclusion surprised the blonde man, and the black-haired man added that he had guessed after their first meeting. And he decided to remind them of their first conversation five years ago in Mogrian, when Ian had caught the spy Cecilia. At that age, the boy was already a third-class wizard and had caught a dangerous criminal. But you could tell from his face that he didn't care at all. Ian had excellent control over his emotions. After all, his peers did not yet know how to behave so skillfully in society. A second later, Oliver added that you couldn't tell anything from the sorcerer's expression. It was as if he were a knight who had been trained for many years. Ian quieted down and looked away, thinking that this black-haired boy had also noticed that he was not behaving like other children. And the prince's assistant continued to say that it was then that he realized that Ian had a lot of secrets already at that age. And even if he tried very hard, he would hardly be able to make friends. In conclusion, Oliver smiled sincerely and emphasized that he sees through people. The sorcerer said that this could indeed be true, although it was not very pleasant to hear. A second later, he decided to be honest and say that he had a friend. But the end of their friendship was not pleasant. The black-haired boy raised the glass to his mouth to take a sip and said that it was very interesting to know what kind of friend Mr. Ian's friend was. However, he went on to say something else that he had realized during these five years of communication. The blonde man said that he was even a little scared to hear him say this, because he might say some unpleasant information about him again. But that didn't stop Oliver, and he said that when he talked to the sorcerer, he felt as if he was talking to an adult. Ian laughed out loud and said that the guy really sees through people. Then the sorcerer turned his head to the other man and said that, to be honest, he was already 48 years old, and he preserves his youth with magic. 
The prince's assistant froze in place with wide open eyes in shock upon hearing this information. However, Ian decided to say that it was a joke. And a second later, he added that he had said himself that it was difficult for him to get along with people, so he still hasn't learned to joke. Oliver looked at the other man mysteriously, as something in his words alarmed him. But then he smiled and replied that he was a generous captain of knights, so he would forgive Ian. It was already late at night, so the sorcerer decided to go outside for a bit to get some fresh air. Holding his head, he thought about what he thought he was drinking and he realized that even in his previous life, he had never drunk so much. Suddenly, someone spoke to him, and it made Ian freeze in his tracks. And when he turned his head to the right, he noticed the assistant captain sitting against the wall. So Ian asked the guy what he was doing here. The blonde guy smilingly replied that he was not really on a first-name basis with alcohol. He'll have one drink, and that's it. He added that he had just gone out to get some fresh air, and he asked why the sorcerer went outside. Ian also leaned against the wall next to him and folded his arms across his chest, saying that he also decided to get some air. He was not used to such evenings. The deputy captain of the knights is Paul Rance, and in his past life he was the best knight after Oliver. Although he is simply by birth, he is loyal to the crown and the empire. That is why he became close to the successive prince and captain. This awkward moment of silence was broken by a guy who asked the sorcerer if he had really tried alcohol for the first time today. He asked how it tasted. The sorcerer looked down at the ground and replied that it was not bad. He added that he would spend his evenings like this from time to time. The guy smilingly said that he was glad for it. He said that everyone was very grateful to Ian for his help, and the knights are only talking about him and they had not seen his majesty so happy for a long time, and all this thanks to the sorcerer. The blonde thanked them for such kind words, but he only pushes them in the back, and they all move forward together. However, the information that the prince is happy, he'll really take it as a compliment, because he's really pleased to hear it. Suddenly, the sorcerer's interlocutor froze without even blinking. Ian was alarmed and asked what was wrong. The young man replied that it was nothing, he just didn't think a sorcerer could smile like that. This conversation was interrupted by one of the knights who opened the door and addressed the deputy. He said that he had been wanted for several minutes. And to top it off, his majesty calls him, and he says that if he continues to run away from drinking, he will demote him. The blonde boy replied that this was too much. However, he started to get to his feet and apologized to Ian and told him that he had to go back. As the deputy and his friend walked inside, they discussed the fact that the prince would pour even more this time. And Ian, left alone, went to the edge of the railing and began to look into the distance and began to recall moments from his past life. And now, they are no longer a heavy burden on his shoulders. So he will finally be able to relax and live his life normally. After all, his election is completely different from what happened before. He sees a joyful and satisfied consistent prince who has been able to achieve great heights. Ragnar, on the other hand, was not the same as he used to be. He spent that evening alone standing by a large window and looking at the stars through it. The guy was upset and disappointed that he could not prove himself at the last meeting. And his majesty was sitting at his desk late at night, sorting through the documents he had received over the past few days. Ian reasoned that he could not know where his new decisions would lead him. However, there is one good thing in all this. Now his mother is living this period of life with him, and they can enjoy the moments together. Therefore, at this time, his goal is very simple, to protect the people close and dear to him. He doesn't want to be left alone, as he was in his previous life. And having had that experience, he doesn't really want to repeat it because I want to start a new life and live it with a pure heart, because it is simply impossible to do otherwise. So he began to smile sweetly as he looked out from the balcony, as a beautiful landscape stretched before him, complemented by the stars. However, he still had one game planned for Ragnar, so he decided not to put it on the back burner, but to start it right away. As it turned out, the fifth prince was not wasting his time either, and together with the owner of the tower, they figured out what they needed to do next. After all, they could not leave everything like this. The guy turned to face the other man and remembered how he had said earlier that this sorcerer needed to be removed before he became a nuisance, so now it is definitely necessary to do something. The gray-haired gentleman lowered his head and gazed down guiltily and said that the young man was indeed right. The prince asked, 
Is that all the owner of the tower has to say? After all, he himself asked to wait, promising to remove it. But this is what it led to, and what he is doing now is simply mind-boggling. And it turns out that in this situation he is their biggest problem, which needs to be dealt with immediately. The owner of the tower said that his words were a mistake. After all, he wanted to solve everything faster, but even so, they were late. No one could have known that the young man would be so cunning. Then the older gentleman said that he did not want to make any more excuses, but for the last time he wanted to ask to wait. After that, the room fell silent for a few seconds. This was so that the audience could think about it. After all, this time they are ready to introduce Helen, whom they have been preparing for just such an occasion. The fifth prince was surprised to see this young lady because it was she, the arch wizard who had been forced to hide for many years but he did not yet fully understand how she could help them and what they should expect. The woman began to slowly lift her large hood, through which red strands of hair were visible. She looked down and said that she was glad to meet us. However, when she kept looking up at his majesty, one could see that her pupils were red, and it scared the prince quite a bit. He even took a few steps back and put his hand forward, demonstrating that he did not want her to come any closer. The owner of the tower asked the boy not to be so scared, because she was just a novice who obeyed all kinds of orders. And I'm ready to do anything for his majesty. The blonde man put his hand to his lips and said, Is the owner of the tower really? However, he did not finish because the man understood everything. So he replied, Exactly. It is forbidden, the black wizard. And soon Ian Page himself will fall at their feet and beg for mercy. Therefore, the prince does not have to worry about the fact that something might go wrong in the future. After all, everything will happen exactly as he has planned it, and it cannot be otherwise. And the place of the successive prince will definitely be his. The next morning, the owner of the tower was already in his office, reviewing the documents he had just received. And in them, he read that Ian had already reached the sixth grade, and this made him very angry. That's why a purple light even appeared around him. It just didn't make sense to him how such a young guy could reach such heights so easily and at such a young age. The assistant slowly opened the door to the office and asked the landlord with a downcast look if he had called him. Then he looked up at the man and calmly waited for an answer. The gray-haired gentleman leaned on the table with both hands and tried to gather all his emotions and control himself in order to carry on a normal conversation. And just a few minutes later, the man smiled lightly and said, Oh, you're here, Marco. The young man immediately asked if something had happened. The gentleman replied that it was nothing serious. The owner of the tower went on to say that he remembers the first time he saw Mark, and that 20 years have passed since then. The gray-haired man emphasized that the boy was just a toddler then, just as he remembers it now. It turns out that the man found him wrapped in a small piece of cloth. He was spinning and reaching out to the gentleman. The sorcerer emphasized that he would never forget the joy he felt when he saw the boy. But then no one knew that he would turn out to be capable of magic and become an official sorcerer. So the gentleman said that he was proud of Mark. The young man smiled sincerely and said that it was all thanks to the wisdom of the tower owner himself. And to pay for at least part of your favor, he is ready to do anything. The gray-haired man said that the young man was like a son to him and that no payment was out of the question. But to be honest, the owner of the tower invited him because he had a request. He said that if Marco was not busy, could he come to his house tonight? The boy bowed and said that he could certainly do that. The next day, the tavern was visited again by someone who was not expected to be there because the employee who was wiping the glasses stood there for a few seconds with his mouth open. And when the man greeted him, he was shocked. However, as soon as the employee pulled himself together, he asked how it was possible that the ivory tower arch wizard Ian Page himself had come to them. The sorcerer took off his hood and asked if he really knew him. The man replied that of course he was telling the truth, because there was no one in their establishment who had not heard of him. The employee then bowed and thanked Ian for coming to such an unassuming place. However, he was still interested in why the arch wizard had come to them, so he asked to find out. The blonde replied that the guy should be serious because he was not going to do anything important here. He just came as a guest to buy some information. And immediately after these words, he put a bag of gold coins on the counter. When the guy saw this, he said that there were rumors that the wizards of the tower paid generously for their requests. 
So he looked up at Ian and asked him what kind of information he needed. The blonde man held his hands out to the side and replied that he would be happy to hear any information about black wizards. This made the guy think a bit, so he asked if they should know more about them than the locals in this institution. Ian closed his eyes and explained that his knowledge was superficial and he was actually looking for something else. Then he opened his eyes and said that information can be anything, but he would like to know what most people don't know. The employee of the institution said, smiling broadly, that he understood everything now. And he added that the sorcerer was very lucky, because they had been paying a lot of attention to this problem lately. So he put his hands on the counter and asked if Mr. Ian knew about the Order of the Dragons. It turns out that this Order of Dragons is one of the religious communities of the Empire. They worship dragons as if they were gods. It is not very popular or widespread but it has existed for several centuries. The history of the order began with a small group of rural believers. One tomb raider proclaimed himself the only descendant of dragons and began to convince everyone that he had special powers. Many people did not believe the criminal's words. However, over time, the small religious group began to grow. Now it is shrouded in secrecy because no one knows who is in charge, how many followers they have, or what their main goal is. This obscurity has given rise to many rumors, and even talk that they can bring the dead back to life. And finally, the young man said that he did not know whether dragon followers existed for sure. But one thing is clear from all the information and rumors, that there is a clear connection between the Order of the Dragons and Black Magic, and he emphasized that they assume that some representatives of the top of their empire are close to the Order. Because black magic requires not just mana, but human resources. Therefore, it turns out that those who can get them do their best. Because the community is closed, it is difficult to understand how to get in and to find out who is in the order as well. However, if they can really control people, it may not be difficult to brainwash someone from above in order to achieve personal goals. In the end, the employee said that this is all they know now. However, they could dig further and probably find something. And if so, he would send a letter to Ian. The hooded sorcerer said that at this point, he understood everything and hoped that the investigation would be successful. The young man waved his hand and happily thanked Mr. Ian and emphasized that he should be paid a decent wage. When the evening came, the blonde man did not go to rest, but instead sat at his desk and thought about this mysterious order of the dragon. He hadn't heard this name in his previous life. However, he couldn't help wondering how it could be, since this community had existed for several decades. Then the man turned his gaze to the stick standing next to the door, and the thought came to him that the king of the shamans. He performed black magic with a stick engraved with black symbols, and if black magic requires not only mana, however, this whole story raises a lot of questions to which he has no answer yet. But there is another suspicion that the owner of the tower may know about the connection between the great fields and black magic. Perhaps he himself has something to do with the Order of the Dragon. Everything has changed too much compared to his previous life, and this tires the sorcerer out, because he needs to unravel this tangle even more. And all this is not happening because of his return, but the world has actually been like this all along. The difference is too great, and it is beginning to increase over time. But is this all because of the use of the dragon language? Or could it be a side effect of going back in time? In any case, Ian feels as if he has opened a chest that shouldn't have been opened. It was easy to go forward with memories of his past life, but now he knows nothing, so you need to be prepared for anything. At that time, the owner of the tower apologized to Mark for calling him so late. Mark smilingly replied that he didn't see anything wrong with that. The young man asked a question that was supposed to find out what the man wanted to ask him. The owner of the tower snapped his fingers and decided not to drag it out for long, but to tell it like it is. The guy with his mouth wide open froze in place and waited to hear what they were going to say. Before telling me anything, the gray-haired gentleman warned me that other people should not know about it because this information should remain between the two of them. Then the gentleman got to his feet and turned toward the door and asked if the boy was ready to follow him. Marco didn't know what to expect, so he asked where they were going to go because it was dark outside. The owner of the tower took out a book with a red cover, and showing it to them, he said that it would show them the way. And just a few seconds later, a dark blue light began to appear around the book, and then a black tunnel. 
The guy was quite shocked to see this, so he turned to the owner and said that it was... But he didn't have time to finish because the gray-haired man interrupted him and asked what was going on. However, without waiting for an answer, he invited the young man to come closer, because they had to be close to each other to move. The elder sorcerer was the first to enter, and Marco followed. He did not hesitate for a second in his decision. It was very dark in the new place, so he didn't really understand where he was and what was around him. But the owner of the tower used magic to make light appear, and it was so bright that Marco covered his eyes to adjust a little. When a few seconds passed and he was able to look more or less, what he saw in front of him surprised him. For several seconds he stood almost motionless and looked around, because he had never seen anything like it before. It turned out that there were imprisoned people in small cages. They lowered their heads and looked down. And they did not respond to those who came to them. The boy said in surprise that these people. But again, before he could finish, the gray-haired man interrupted him and told him not to worry, because they were just ingredients. However, this did not calm Mark down. He began to shout loudly, asking what the man was talking about. What ingredients, people? You can't just do that in their world, because you can be punished for treating living beings in this way. Suddenly, Marco recognized one guy who was just exhausted and breathing slowly. It was a guy named Chris. The owner of the tower said in a serious tone that this young man had almost died because of witchcraft. It was a miracle that he was still alive. Like all the sorcerers here, they could have died during their work by accident or because of some great illness. The gray-haired man went on to say that sometimes they bring such people from other countries. They don't just bring sorcerers off the street, because they would have ended up in a terrible place and wasted their lives anyway. Sorcerers are not like that. They are beings who cannot even get a first-class degree and would suffer like this for the rest of their lives if it were not for them. Other stronger sorcerers could have destroyed them with indifference, so the older man thought he had saved them from disgrace. However, this did not calm Mark down, but rather worried him even more. Saivokali said that they are only ingredients that can serve to benefit the ivory tower. Then the man raised his stick up and a red light began to appear around him, and seeing the fright on the boy's face, the tower owner assured him that Mark would not be affected by their involvement. He added the word I promise at the end. After all, he is almost like a son to him, and he cannot treat him so lightly. After saying this, the gentleman smiled broadly to ease the situation. Suddenly, a strange sound of coughing from different people began to appear around him, and some unknown black veil was flying next to the guy. The guy tried to fight her off, but he was not successful. She kept circling him anyway. After a few minutes of this resistance, Marco got tired and fell to his knees because he could no longer stand. He also bowed his head down. The owner of the tower watched this calmly as if he knew that this was exactly what was supposed to happen. So he turned to the young man in a serious tone and asked him to get up. The guy immediately began to obey the order and slowly got to his feet, but his head was still down. The next thing the gray-haired gentleman asked was for Marco to look at him, and the young man fulfilled this order instantly, and there was something strange about it. When their eyes met, the man asked who he was, and the young man quickly replied that his interlocutor was the owner of the magic tower of the Green River Empire, and his name was Havard Leon. Then the older gentleman asked who the boy was, and he answered that his name was Marco, and he is a second-class sorcerer of the Ivory Tower. He is also the personal assistant to the owner Leon. After these words, the gray-haired man threw a small dagger on the ground in front of the boy and told him to cut off his little finger with it. The young man does not think twice about picking up a weapon and looking forward with a fascinated gaze cuts off one phalanx. The finger falls to the ground and blood splashes around. The owner of the tower is calmly watching the whole thing. Then the man looked down and said in a serious tone that only from that moment on he could call him his son. At this time, the other students studying to become sorcerers were discussing the fact that the owner of the tower had taken an indefinite vacation after all, he had a lot of work to do, and he was getting on in years. Another boy suggested that it might be because of Mr. Ian. After all, he is the youngest arch wizard who has already completed the sixth grade. It might hurt, mister. The girl spread her arms to the side and asked what would happen now. The other interlocutors clarified what she meant. 
The young lady began to tell me that the owner of the tower was on the side of the fifth prince, and Mr. Ian was for the successor prince. You can't have two important people on different sides. One of the boys said that they had no choice. You have to follow what the higher-ups say. At this time, Marco approached the large wooden door and stood still to catch his breath. A blonde man who was reading a book turned his head toward the knock and allowed the person to enter. When the young man entered the house, the sorcerer recognized Mr. Mark and greeted him sincerely and happily. The guy had a kind of glassy look in his eyes, so he clearly said that he had brought what he was asked for. After that, he went to the table and put the books on it. Ian watched and said that he had been looking for them for a long time. And that was why the young man helped him a lot. Then the sorcerer scribbled on a notebook and asked if the owner of the tower was sick, because he hadn't heard from him for a long time. Marco replied that it was not as serious as anyone could have imagined, so there is no reason to worry. Suddenly, the young man caught his arm in a book and cried out in pain. Ian heard this and asked what had happened to his hand. The young man replied that he had injured it when he was practicing magic. But it wasn't a serious injury, so he didn't have to worry. The sorcerer smiled sincerely and said that everything was clear now, and finally he wished him a speedy recovery. But in his mind, Ian thought that something was wrong, because he clearly feels that this Marco has become a different person than he was. After all, this young man usually behaved more freely with him. He has the same face and voice, but he is clearly building a wall between them. And this is after the owner of the tower has taken a vacation. So while the young man was next to him, the sorcerer decided to find out something, so he said out loud that he remembered some information. And he began to recall that he and Mark had met six years ago in the province of Mogran. And if it wasn't for his help during the fight against the goblins, there would have been a great disaster. The young man looked down and said that he did remember that moment, and very vividly. But the young man began to bow, saying that if nothing else was needed, he would go. But before he could finish, the sorcerer interrupted him by saying Mark's name. Ian began to slowly get to his feet and asked the boy to wait a while. He immediately began to emphasize that the boy had not actually been in the fight against the goblins, but he had helped him during the mana test. Marco replied that he was sorry that he didn't really remember everything. Ian had already picked up his magic wand. Then he started waving it in front of the guy's face, and he said the words, Great Excellent, and a blue light began to appear around me. And then a circle with various hieroglyphs appeared. It helped to apply a certain magic, which Mark had to resist, because she could have overpowered him in a heartbeat. Just a few seconds later, the young man began to cough loudly. Something was really tearing at his throat. After all this, he fell to his knees in front of Ian and put his head down, continuing to cough. The sorcerer knelt down on one knee next to him and asked if the boy had regained consciousness. The young man looked up and asked why him. The sorcerer leaned over to the boy and told him that he had been affected by black magic, so he used an anti-magic. Suddenly, the guy started shouting loudly in fright that he had to stop this tower owner because he was up to very terrible things. The sorcerer, sitting on one knee, calmly asked Mark to tell him what had happened. Finally, he clarified that the young man had to tell absolutely everything with all the little details. After this interesting and serious conversation, Ian visited the house where the owner of the tower was spending his vacation. The man took one sip and asked if the gentleman had come alone. The assistant replied that they hadn't noticed anyone with him, so he said that they could take him into the room. At that moment, the thought flashed through my mind that Ian had caught me on the hook. After all, he had purposely put black magic on Mark, because a sorcerer like Ian can easily recognize it. That's why everything is ready. And even if he runs out of ingredients, it's worth it to get a sixth grade wizard. But there will always be new ingredients. After a couple of minutes, the door to the room began to open slowly. The owner of the tower noticed this and said that he had not expected a visit from the sorcerer. After all, the sixth grade arch wizard himself is a personal figure. What an honor. Ian bowed and said that he had been told that the owner of the tower was ill, so he had to come and express his condolences. He added that he hoped the gentleman would recover quickly. The gray-haired man thanked him for his words and invited him to sit down. When the sorcerer sat down on the sofa opposite the tower owner, a cup of tea was brought to him, and in between, silence fell between them for a few seconds. However, the sorcerer decided to break it, saying that Marco was feeling unwell. 
The gray-haired gentleman said he was afraid that he might have been infected. The blonde man took a second sip and said that he didn't think so, and he began to tell me that he was constantly worried about this young man. After all, he was very respectful and fully committed to his work. The man went on to say that he had once heard an incredible story from him about how the owner of the tower had a secret laboratory in his country house, where he conducts inhuman experiments with black magic. The older gentleman began to laugh out loud, saying that black magic could not possibly exist. Marco was insane, so it was definitely not possible. Ian emphasized with a serious expression that he thought the young man had been subjected to a black magic spell and as if the person who put it on him was the person he called the owner of the tower and considered his father. The blonde man said that Marco had asked him to stop this crazy old man. The gray-haired man said out loud that he did not understand what the gentleman was talking about. After all, he actually has a portal to the laboratory. It is created by an artifact that he received by accident, and it's very convenient for the old man. However, a laboratory with black magic is some kind of nonsense. Then the owner of the tower got to his feet and said that if Ian wanted to, he could go with him and see what they had just talked about. Because if he doesn't trust him, he can verify this personally, as they say with their own eyes. It took the sorcerer a few seconds to think it over, because there was no way to make a mistake. But Ian decided to check it out to be sure. The owner of the tower turned his head to the interlocutor and asked him in a serious tone to follow him. The gentleman said that as the chief among the sorcerers, he could not allow rumors about the use of black magic to spread. First, they approached a wall with a bright red curtain hanging on it. The gray-haired gentleman slowly pushed it aside and looked closely inside. And then he told Ian that this was where the portal was. When they looked at him, he looked exactly the same as he did in Mark's presence. Then the older gentleman took out a book with a red cover and said that this was the power of his artifacts, and if you use the magic from this book, then anyone can use the magic of portals, which is available to the eighth grade. These words made the sorcerer think for a few seconds. But not for long, because the owner of the tower approached this hole and invited his guest along, and they began to move through the dark place one by one. As they walked, the blonde man reflected on the fact that in his past life, Havert Leon was considered one of the best owners of the Ivory Tower. He is a great sorcerer who initiated the unification of the continents. He is honest and dedicated to his work. It was this gentleman who brought Ragnar to the imperial throne, and he was able to significantly increase the influence of the Ivory Tower on what was happening in the country. Since he had been on their side in that life, he must have respected the owner of the tower as well. Suddenly they stopped, and the man in front of them turned to Ian. And looking at the stick that was standing next to the wall and glowing with red light, he said that he too had once dreamed of becoming a hero. I wanted to save this empire on my own. I wanted to help the poor and those in need. But over time I realized something. That you can't change everything with your strength. And the power that can make him a hero is not what he imagined it to be. After these words, a black veil began to fly around, as if looking for some kind of prey. And it turned out to be Ian. The boy was frightened and began to examine all his body parts because this black evil spun around them. And just in an instant, it became too difficult for the sorcerer to breathe. He grabbed himself by the throat and began to cough loudly. And the owner of the tower began to say that he had the power to make many sorcerers work under him. To save this empire from extinction, he is called the Power. Then the older gentleman smiled broadly, and saying Ian Page's name, told the young man that he would definitely be part of this ritual. At that time, the young man was trying to figure out what kind of magic he should use to free himself and further protect himself. The owner of the tower said that under his guidance, the sorcerer would help this country and its people. A young guy like him and an old man like him. This is what it takes to become heroes. Ian tried his best to resist the influence of this magic. However, the gray-haired man did not give up halfway either, so he ordered the sorcerer to get up in a serious tone, and the young man did not resist and began to fulfill the task assigned to him. His expression was quite calm and emotionless. When the owner of the tower saw that the boy was obeying his orders, he began to laugh out loud with pleasure. In his opinion, everything turned out to be very easy to do, and not because he had already thought of it, 
So after a few moments of joy, the gentleman stretched his hand forward and asked Ian to answer the question of who the person across from him was. The sorcerer replied that he was the owner of the tower, whose name was Havert Leon, and this man is also a complete psycho. After saying these words, the young man tilted his head to the left and began to smile sarcastically. Then Ian did what he had wanted to do for a long time, but had been holding back. Namely, he struck a blow to this self-confident gray-haired gentleman. The man fell and hit the wall. After landing, he began to cough loudly because saliva got into his airways. When the owner of the tower came to, he could not understand how the young man managed to resist the magic. It was simply not possible. He could not recall that this had ever happened before. During this time, Ian took a few steps forward to get closer and look into his interlocutor's eyes. Then the sorcerer reminded the gray-haired man that he hadn't said that he didn't know black magic at all. I'm lying about that. And since he hasn't started fifth grade, he doesn't know that their strengths are different. And even with black magic, a fifth grader is still a fifth grader. Then the sorcerer sat down and asked if he really thought that Ian would come here unprepared. The young man smiled and said that such stupid mistakes should not be made by the owner of the tower, so he was in no hurry. The gray-haired gentleman was quite angry that everything did not happen as he had planned. But the sorcerer didn't want things to drag on for too long either, so he stretched out his hand to the main man's face. And he used magic to drain the magic. After all, he simply cannot do otherwise. After this little procedure, Ian asked the man to rest because he would not be able to move at first due to the mana flow. Age also takes its toll. Recovery takes a lot of time. The owner of the tower raised his right hand with the last of his strength and called Ian a bastard. When Ian used the magic of light, a few minutes later, the door opened to one of the vaults where a large amount of treasure was hidden. Looking carefully around, the young man smiled broadly and said that this was the kind of fortune a modest and decent tower owner could make. Then he turned his head to the man and asked him why he had so much money, since he had nowhere to spend it. It turns out that he had simply enjoyed collecting all these jewelry all his life. Then the sorcerer asked if the gentleman had ever thought about sharing at least a little with the Empire, or was he hoping to take everything with him to the next world? Ian stood in one position for a couple of seconds. At that moment, he was thinking carefully about something, and it required a lot of concentration. After that, he immediately returned to the cages where the prisoners were sitting and began to slowly walk toward them with his ball of light. As he came closer, he began to carefully examine the people there. For him, this was an important problem to solve. He emphasized to himself that they are in a terrible condition. However, some of them are still breathing, and that is very good. So he quietly asked them to wait a little longer because he was going to help them escape from here and finally get proper treatment. And then this monologue was interrupted by the owner of the tower, who asked if Ian really thought that Marco was the only one. But it is not so. He has many assistants who do their job properly. However, this did not surprise the sorcerer at all, for he had long been aware of the possibility of this. So he calmly continued to stand there and wait for the sequel. Therefore, the sorcerer does not need to pretend because they are definitely on their way, and they will not stop without his signal. From the very beginning, the gray-haired man wanted them to pay attention to two very important points in his opinion, and then the man was interrupted by Ian, who spoke them himself. Namely, the first was his family, and the second was an attack on the prince. So the owner of the tower leaned against the wall and asked if the young man wanted to make a deal that could be beneficial to both of them. His condition is very simple, namely, you just need to forget what happened today. After all, the young man has no evidence other than this portal, and they will believe the owner of the tower, not him, if he decides to tell, of course, even if he does not yet understand the consequences of his actions. But it's better not to cross the line when dealing with a gray-haired man, so it would be hard for him to imagine how he could regret it. However, Ian closed his eyes and refused the offer. The gray-haired gentleman no longer knew how to intimidate the young man, so he angrily said that he was going to kill the sorcerer's mother and the crown prince. Ian held his hands out to the side and said, Let him try it. The older man was out of his mind from the rage that had seized him, so he quickly got to his feet and asked wide-eyed, What? Instead, the sorcerer put one hand on his belt and the other down and smiling sweetly repeated, Try it!
At this time, at Ian's estate, an alchemist approached his mother, who was sitting on the terrace admiring the view, and immediately addressed her by name. Walking towards the woman, the man said that the wind was very cold today, and she should be careful not to get sick, and it would be good if she went inside. That way, she can defend herself for sure, because in her condition, she doesn't need any surprises. Mrs. Page looked down sadly and said that Ian had not returned yet, and for some reason she could not contact him even through the bullet. This is very disturbing and makes her worry, because he always warned her if he was going to be late, but this time he didn't say anything. The alchemist smiled and said that Ian was a respectable sixth-class archmage. Therefore, the most hated scoundrels would throw themselves at his feet to beg for forgiveness, and because of that, you don't have to worry about him so much anymore. The young lady didn't like the last line very much, so she nervously emphasized that for her he was still a boy. The man did not understand this reaction, because the young lady was too absorbed in her worries and could not control her condition properly. Therefore, in order not to further disturb and nervous her, the gentleman bowed low, placing his right hand on his heart and apologized for his words. He then emphasized that he had a child himself but for some reason he tried to downplay the importance of her feelings. Finally, I apologized again because I felt guilty for saying something wrong. The lady turned her gaze to the right and said that everything was actually fine, and she began to tell me that she constantly thinks about the unbearable burden Ian is carrying. He does not rely on anyone, but confidently goes forward alone, and she is so sorry that he has to suffer so much. She wants to share this state with her son, but all she can do is wait for him in this place every time. The interlocutor asked Lady Page not to say such words anymore, because the reason why Ian was able to reach such heights lies in his family, so there is no need to devalue all his achievements. The alchemist went on to say that he had once been poisoned by manna, and he was able to survive only thanks to his son. That's why we need a family. Then the man said, that does Lady Page think she is not useful? yet she constantly gives the person she is talking to a sense of inner peace. And always there for you. You can always come back to you. This is what made Ian who he is today. And because of this, his mother is a great merit here. And at the end of his monologue, the man looked down and said in a calm tone that if the lady wanted, he could stay with her for a while, until her son comes home. Together, they can spend this time in a better way than just sitting alone and thinking about stupid things. Lady Page turned her gaze to the alchemist and smiled sincerely in response, because these words were very important to her. As they settled into their seats, the woman emphasized that the sky was clear and quiet today, and then she added that there are usually a lot of guards here, but for some reason today. She didn't have time to finish because the other person's expression changed dramatically. He became agitated because these words alarmed him too much. He got to his feet abruptly and quickly and ordered the young lady to go inside the house because something was happening for a reason. Suddenly, the alchemist came closer to the railing of the terrace, and I looked into the bushes and asked a loud question to find out who was there. As it turned out, there were two men standing there dressed in long green raincoats, and they were surprised that anyone noticed them at all. When the man saw that these people were moving directly towards them, he decided to shout loudly again and order them to stop in their places. However, after a few seconds, the man noticed that these uninvited guests did not listen to him, so he began to worry a little about it. After all, if they cross the line in front of their house, something can happen that will harm everyone around them. And just in one second, a bright orange light appeared around them, and immediately after that, the alchemist hugged Lady Page and said they needed to go downstairs. This bright light began to appear around the estate, and it was so bright that even the residents who lived nearby and did not understand what it was. After all, what is this all about? Why did thunder and lightning appear in the middle of such a clear day? The black-haired assistant asked the blonde prince if he was all right. The man emphasized that he had also seen it. So until we find out what it is, we need to go back to the estate because it is safer there. The prince turned his gaze to his assistant and asked if they really needed to go back, since nothing had happened. It was very difficult to ask my father for permission to leave the estate and secretly observe the lives of ordinary people. That's why he can't just come back. Then the prince turned his head to the captain and said he had one question. The man said that he could ask him right now. 
and the prince asked the assistant if he could teach him fencing. After all, he might need it in the future. The captain froze in his tracks and asked in surprise, Fencing? He had not expected to hear such a request. The blonde man held his hands out to the side and emphasized that these were the most basic things. How hard could it be to do? At least show him some basic stances. He also wants to learn how to draw a sword in a cool way. When the assistant began to pull out his weapon, the chief held up his hands and said that not now, of course, but a little later. But as it turned out, it was not a drill. Instead, the black-haired man asked the prince to stand behind him. After that, the man turned to the second detachment of Imperial Knights and ordered them to move to defend his majesty. The blonde man did not yet realize what was happening. With a serious expression on his face, the captain began to look around, saying, Show yourself! Come on, show yourself! A few seconds later, a figure in a dark, long cloak appeared in front of them. The man tried to see who was hiding under the clothes. And when he did, he recognized the beautiful stranger. The young lady slowly took off her hood, and under it he could see her bright hair color. It turns out that it was the Ivory Tower's arch-witch, named Helen. The captain pointed his sword in her direction and said that he thought she had disappeared several years ago, and he asked what she was doing here. An awkward silence fell between them for a couple of minutes, although the man was still standing there waiting for the answer to his question because it was important for him to get it. However, the young lady began to slowly take steps forward. The gentleman ordered her to stop and first explain what she was doing here. The woman stopped in her tracks and, holding tightly to her magic wand, began to look at her interlocutor carefully, pondering her answer. Literally a second later, she began to say in a serious tone that anyone who interfered with her would be killed. She said this with no emotional expression. At first, the captain was a little confused and frightened by these words, but later he regained control of himself because in his status, one cannot lose control of oneself like that. So the first thing he decided to do was to immediately deal with this uninvited guest. He attacked her with his sword. However, the young lady managed to deflect the blow with her magic wand. And when the gentleman got a little closer, he noticed that the red-haired girl had a damaged right eye. And as soon as they separated by a few steps, the black-haired man began to prepare for a new attack because he was not going to stand silently on the sidelines and wait for something. Helen landed on her right knee and began to look closely at her opponent to study his behavior in order to know how to continue the fight. However, she decided to do things a little differently, and with a wave of her stick, the young lady used the magic of a fiery explosion. And as soon as it began to manifest, the young lady directed it directly at her opponent. The latter froze in his tracks, but he regained his composure and did not let fear overcome him, so he raised his sword up to defend himself. And when this fire approached him, he began to swing his sword from side to side, because in his opinion, this is the only way to survive and not burn. And while he was doing this, a safe corridor was formed where he was standing, which was not exposed to fire that could cause damage. The red-haired woman did not expect this to happen, so she began to think quickly about what she needed to do next. While she was doing this, the captain came close to her, and he was already swinging his sword to strike another blow that might be successful. However, the young lady was able to repel it with her magic wand. She was quite skillful with it and could use it in any situation. Therefore, one could see from her expression that this was a rather familiar situation for her and that there was nothing unusual about it. However, the captain did not give up. He kept trying to use some new technique. So this time he decided to jump on the opponent and stab her with his sword. When the red-haired woman noticed this, she quickly brought her right hand forward and used the magic of a mana barrier, which would not allow her to be harmed. As expected, the sword simply bounced back as soon as it touched the barrier, and the black-haired gentleman landed on one knee. And as he looked around, he was curious about the fact that he could finally see the mana barrier with his own eyes. And he had previously hoped to practice with Mr. Ian to resist him, but until that happens, he will have hoped that he can handle this sword. After all, he cannot use his mana properly because he is a half-breed who has only the heart of mana, but it is also in his blood. So she will help him cope with this uninvited guest, and he simply does not have the option of giving up, because he was going to show this impudent man the full power of a half-breed. After these words, the gentleman first dropped to his right knee and swung his sword. When the sword flew past, it was clear from the redhead's face 
that it had managed to pierce this defense. This was something the woman had not expected. So she froze in place with her eyes wide open because he had helped her defend herself before. And there were no such mishaps. And the captain did not miss the opportunity to draw his sword hand back again to deliver a crushing blow. And it was successful. The man managed to pierce the lady's left forearm. But the woman did not expect him to do this to her. So she grabbed the blade of the weapon with the last of her strength. She began to cough loudly and tried to get it out of her body. However, the captain assured her that he was not going to kill her. After all, he needed to find out who the traitor was who had ordered the assassination of his majesty. Finally, he added that she could only pray for a quick death. At this time, events in the basement began to develop in a completely different direction, and the owner of the tower was surprised to hear him say, What? The owner of the tower then asked Ian in a sarcastic tone what he could do, and if he was capable of something worthy, then let him demonstrate it. The sorcerer did not take this statement seriously, so he smiled sweetly and said that, unlike some people, his words could be trusted. Because over the past five years, he had established connections with many people. However, the man did not stop and continued to try to throw the young man off balance, so he sarcastically said, Even so, you'll never... However, he did not have time to finish because the blonde man interrupted him with his loud laughter. And as soon as he calmed down, he said, Does the gentleman think that Ian has been doing nothing all this time? After all, when they were in Demidere, it was this old man who sent unknown guests to his estate. He added that it would not happen again. What the owner of the tower saw next alarmed him. And Ian just said that those who had been sent had probably already fallen into the mana paste or even left their world. And with his hands to the side, he said that he had nothing to ask of the gray-haired man. Because he will be judged to the fullest extent of the law anyway, after all, for his actions, he deserves to die, just like all the people who work for him. Then the blonde closed his eyes and smiled broadly and said loudly that he would take care of it personally. And he will also observe the ivory tower for which he killed his body and soul. The owner of the tower sat silently listening with a frightened expression on his face. Then Ian took a few steps toward his interlocutor and stretched out his hand to him, saying that he hadn't really intended to go that far. As it turned out, he put his hand on the gray-haired man's head and stood there quietly for several seconds. And then he said that the owner should worry about the reputation of the tower. Ian understands why the old man likes the fifth prince, not the successive one. After all, he himself once thought that this gentleman should become the ruler. But the tower owner made a big mistake when he decided to attack the sorcerer's family. After that, a bright blue light began to appear around him, and the blonde man said that everyone should be punished for their actions. At that time, his majesty was sitting on his throne in the mansion and was saying that the harms of the tower's owner, Javert Léon, had become known to the public. He had forgotten his duty and was fascinated by black magic. He used the bodies and souls of innocent people and sorcerers for his horrific experiments. Then the man banged his fist on the table and said that even death would not wash away all his sins. He cannot be forgiven or understood. Therefore, the punishment will remain unchanged, and no one can appeal against it. Because of this, from this moment on, Javerleon will lose all his merits, titles, and be sentenced to death. And it will, of course, be carried out in public. Havert will go down in the history of the Empire as a terrible criminal. If his followers or relatives are found, then we will have to get rid of them immediately. All those who knew about his crimes will also be punished. His Majesty emphasized that they would find the sorcerers who also practiced black magic, and he will personally sentence those involved in this story. No one will be able to escape the investigation and punishment. So the man calls on the aristocrats to help him. His Majesty went on to say that he was sure that the tower would find the owner's assistants who did not realize the consequences, and so he orders them to stop using black magic and surrender voluntarily. The only exception will be the Archwitch Helena because she had attempted to kill the prince, and she would face a different fate. Despite the fact that she was following the orders of the tower owner and also did not understand her actions. However, we cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that she was tempted by the life of a consistent prince. Therefore, he sentenced the witch Helena to life imprisonment in a local prison in his name, where she will be constantly monitored.
Then the gentleman put his right hand forward and added that what happened was terrible, of course, but this situation helped to shed light on two heroes of their empire. After all, their deeds deserve special attention. These are Ian Page and Knight Oliver. As I was saying all these words, I was already walking slowly down the hall straight to the main one, because that was what the protocol required. His Majesty, with a serious expression on his face, asked the young man to come a little closer, because for some reason he was standing too far away. When he complied, the man began to say that the captain of the Second Knight's squad was Oliver Raywood. The young man bowed low. The chief went on to say that the captain was a real talisman for their empire. After all, he not only saved the prince's loyalty, but also proved to everyone that people are capable of going beyond their capabilities. And after this act, he will become an example not only for the empire, but for the whole world. The young man listened to all these words with his eyes downcast, and it is understood that His Majesty will not leave his deeds and services to the state without due attention, and immediately the man began to slowly rise to his feet. Therefore, the knight of the second squad, Oliver Raywood, is awarded the right to control every knight of the empire and give them orders. He also receives the title Lord of Swords. Everyone who was present during this announcement opened their mouths wide. They clearly hadn't expected it to happen today. Seeing this reaction, His Majesty said that this title had been missing for a long time, so finally it was found. After all, for hundreds of years he could not earn it, because magic had obscured the greatness of their brave knight's deeds. But Oliver Raywood managed to show the importance of this title. Therefore, he is the only one who deserves it now because that is how he proved his loyalty to the imperial family and the state. Everyone listened attentively to his majesty's speech, and finally he added that he hoped it would continue to be so. The blonde prince smiled sweetly because he was pleased to have such a person by his side, and this title of Lord of Swords really suits Oliver. Then the main man took out a sword, which he demonstratively showed to everyone because he had to hand it over to the new owner. But first, a man must bend the knee before his majesty because this is required by the statute for such events. And just a few seconds later, the captain got down on one knee and bowed his head before his majesty. As soon as silence fell in the hall, the gentleman began to say the words in a calm tone. In the name of the first strait of the Emerald River, I officially order the title of Lord of Swords to be transferred to Knight Oliver Raywood. The young man continued to stand in the same position, listening intently. The gentleman then asked if Oliver was ready to accept the title, which had been searching for its owner for hundreds of years. The boy replied that he swore by his title and name that he would lay down his life to defend the empire. After all, he had already devoted his entire life to it. A few hours after the event, the other son came to his majesty and angrily began to say that he did not understand the reason for such a sentence. He did not understand how it was possible to execute the imperial owner of the tower, so he began to ask his father to think again because this could be a serious blow to their empire. Because the owner of the tower is a fifth-class archwizard, and his execution cannot be worse than that of other similar sorcerers. According to the prince, this will not solve the problem at all. On the contrary, it will create even more new and more complex ones, which they will have to deal with. And as soon as the punishment takes place, all the neighboring countries will know about it especially Colwood, which has long been waiting for an opportunity to expand its borders. They will quickly finish with the great fields and attack the empire. And when the strongest sorcerer is punished, the country will be in complete chaos. And there's no need to guess. It's the perfect time to attack. His Majesty looked down and replied that Haver Leon was no longer the strongest sorcerer. Because at the moment, he is Ian Page, who was the first to graduate from the sixth grade. Therefore, he can take the place of the tower owner, and this shows that there really is no problem, and they can do everything as they had planned before. He went on to add that this is a good chance to raise the tower's rating and reputation on the continent. It's been a long time since they've been so proud of something, and if the opportunity arose, it's worth taking it. The father asked his son if he was wrong. The young man sadly replied that of course he was right, after all, Ian Page would be able to bring a lot of new things to the tower. However, the current owner of the tower has the strength and experience that has been proven over the years. And if he were to team up with Ian, the tower's heyday would be much faster. And that's not all. 
If you put a young and talented sorcerer with an experienced and older one, the two of them can become the best versions of themselves. They will also constantly monitor each other. This means that this responsibility will fall off the shoulders of the imperial estate. And so the guy asked if it wasn't beneficial for them. His majesty put his hands behind his back and looked down and replied that his son's words were really reasonable and they can be thought about. The prince began to smile sincerely, because he was glad that his father had decided to listen to him and his advice. But it didn't happen that way. His majesty emphasized that the owner of the tower used black magic and conducted experiments on people, although it can hardly be called an experiment. After all, the ingredients for his experiments were the sorcerers he was supposed to protect and the soldiers who had done nothing wrong. He was ready to sacrifice them for the sake of his experiments. And it turns out that this is a very serious crime, because the pursuit of the target clouded his eyes, and he simply did not realize what he was doing to innocent people, for he was ready to kill countless pure souls for the sake of the power he wanted, and he wanted to use Ian Page by trying to lure him to his side with the help of black magic. These words made the prince very angry. He clenched his hands into fists to control himself. He said that the owner of the tower was an important representative of the empire, and he agreed that the gentleman was wrong, but black magic could be good for the empire. It could be a powerful weapon for their defense. And if he needs ingredients for this, he can simply use criminals. That way they can at least do something useful. My father was also angry at the words, but he could not help but say loudly that this was Ragnar's problem. The young man was surprised by his father's reaction. After all, they had never had such conflicts before that could have escalated to harsh tones. His majesty added that this is why he would never choose Ragnar as his follower, because this is not the way to think when the future of an entire empire is at stake. Because black magic is pure evil that pollutes the soul of the one who uses it and the rest of the world. It was not for nothing that the founder, Michael Green River, tried to make it disappear from their land. It was simply impossible to forget. The father said that he knew exactly what his son was thinking, because he had long ago figured out his character and ambitions. The young man is capable of many things. However, the man raised his eyebrows and emphasized that the young man did not have the most important thing and he knew what it was. All this time he has been able to hide this gap in himself. But at the right moment he lacks it, precisely because of what is happening right now. Therefore, a young man must first understand himself and only then give some advice on how to run an empire. After all, the most important thing in politics is the pursuit of justice and its realization, after all, the ruler of the whole country must constantly remember that justice works for everyone equally. And if he thinks that some people can become expendable, then that's the end of everything. Hearing these words, the son began to laugh out loud. This surprised his father. But after a few minutes, when he was able to calm down, he replied that this was not true. After all, there is no reason why his majesty should not choose him as his follower. And he asked if the gentleman thought that he did not know the truth. Without waiting for an answer, he began to tell himself that his older brother, who had received all the love and care of his father, and he is a son who was born only to maintain his influence among the aristocrats. And again he clarified, didn't he? However, he added in the end that this was the difference. The father was very angry at these words, so he just got angry and shouted the name of his son, who was standing in front of him. However, the young man remained calm. He asked with a sweet smile if his father knew why he was trying so hard to get praise from him at least once. Isn't it so hard to pay attention to him at least once? He has needed it so much since he was a child. Then he remembered how he had once watched his father play with his older brother from the corner of his room. And again I asked him if it was so hard to love and spend time with him as if he were a prince in waiting. Doesn't he deserve to be treated like that? Ragnar then suggested that his majesty might have agreed to let the tower owner go if his older brother had asked. The man simply could not control himself properly, so he raised his right hand up to hit his son without restraint, to make him come to his senses. Having done this, he froze in his tracks. His son turned his head to the side. After all, the blow was quite good considering his majesty's venerable age. The father raised his hand again and watched his son's reaction carefully. The latter, in turn, instinctively moved away. When his majesty saw this, he let out a small laugh. He had expected such a reaction, but not such a sharp one. 
After that, the gentleman quickly turned in the opposite direction and, clenching his hand into fists, began to walk, calling his son, Durnum! Ragnar continued to stand in the same place. He spent a few minutes with his head down, sadly, thinking about everything that had just happened. When the gray-haired man left the room, he met an assistant named Domphil on his way and ordered him to stay near Ragnar's estate at all times. He also told the guard not to let him out of there, and the gentleman should not allow his son to contact or meet anyone. The subordinate slowly lowered his head down and signaled his agreement. After all, he can't really disobey his boss's orders. Several days have passed since that conversation. Ragnar spent them in his mansion, barely speaking. Suddenly someone knocked on the door, and when he asked who it was, he was told that the archwizard Ian Page had arrived. The young man was surprised because he did not expect them to meet so soon. The prince came close to the door and said that he did not want to see him, so the servants can tell him that he can go away. However, immediately after these words, the door to the room opened, and through it came the sorcerer, who decided to say hello right away. There was a pause between them for a few seconds, as they needed to get used to each other's presence. The prince decided to interrupt this awkward pause. He scrunched up his face and raised his eyebrows and asked if this visit was by order of the emperor. Ian replied that he had come to check whether the prince was under the influence of black magic, which could have been used by Javert Leon. He hoped that the young man would not mind. Ragnar began to shout loudly that the owner of the tower would be punished today, and for some reason they wanted to check him out today. It looked suspicious. Ian was upset and asked how he could be treated with such disrespect. After all, this was just a routine inspection of the entire imperial family and castle staff, nothing more. So he asked Ragnar not to be so angry, because there was no good reason for it. The prince was silent for a few seconds, thinking about what he had heard. Then he closed his eyes and put his head down. The decision he had to make was not easy for him. So he grabbed the back of the chair and slowly lowered himself onto it. After making himself comfortable, he said in a calm tone that the sorcerer should do his work as quickly as possible. Ian came closer and said that it would not take long, so the prince might not even notice when it was over. He also warned that Ragnar may feel nauseous or dizzy, and these are just signs that the boy is fine, so there is no need to worry about it. And literally after the words were spoken, the sorcerer used the magic of the Great Cancel. A large blue circle with various hieroglyphs appeared in front of them. A few minutes after the magic was performed, the prince began to cough loudly. Something was stuck in his throat, forcing him to push it out. Ian stopped and asked if the prince was okay, because it is important that everything is fine during this procedure. Ragnar put his head down and folded his hands together, saying that it was a very unpleasant feeling because he had imagined everything differently. The sorcerer went on to say that he found no traces of black magic. He added that if the boy was really that sick, he should rest until he felt better. Then Ian put his hand on his heart and bowed his head down, saying that they were done and thanked them for their cooperation. And as soon as the sorcerer turned to face the door to go outside, Ragnar said in a calm tone that he had one question, what he wanted to ask right now. Ian froze in his tracks, not expecting the prince to ask anything else. There was an awkward pause between them. The sorcerer was waiting for a question, and the prince was trying to formulate it correctly in his head so that he could say it out loud. Finally, the young man broke the silence and asked why Ian decided to serve his brother. What attracted him to him? After all, the sorcerer is a rather intelligent person, and he should understand better than anyone else what... His brother is clearly not suitable for the role of emperor of the country, for he must know that many aristocratic families are also against him. This question made the sorcerer think about his answer. Because in this case, you need to think carefully about your answer. And then Ian replied that he did not serve the crown prince. The room fell silent again, because the prince had not expected to receive such an answer. Ragnar opened his eyes and mouth wide in surprise, and so his confusion could be seen in his expression. He slowly got to his feet and asked what the sorcerer was talking about, but Ian said that he had to go and wished the prince a good rest. And immediately after these words, the blonde quickly walked out the door to get a little control over himself and his feelings that could shake his respect. Then the young man noticed that one of his hands began to shake, he didn't like this phenomenon very much because it could be harmful in the future. 
and the thought flashed through his mind that he was not serving Hayden Green River because in his past life he had sworn allegiance to him, only to one person, and that was Rangar, who let him down in the end and simply broke his agreement by making him drink poison. Therefore, having mastered his emotions, the man clenched his hand into a fist and began to walk quickly down the long corridor to go home. A few hours after this meeting, it was very dark outside, but there were many small stars in the sky trying to shine brightly. At this time, an assistant knocked on the prince's room, who slowly opened the door and began to carefully examine what was happening inside. When he went inside, he saw that many things and furniture were lying around the room, and the prince was sitting on one chair which was next to a large window. And then Ragnar asked whether the owner of the tower had already been executed. The assistant closed his eyes and said yes, and it happened this afternoon. All this action took place in public, on the main square of Green River. Many people came to see how it all happened. Having heard all these facts, the prince, without turning his face to the interlocutor, replied briefly and clearly, I see. A second later, he told his assistant that he was free to go. Ragnar himself looked very tired. A gray-haired gentleman with a serious expression advised the prince not to be so upset because what had happened could not be reversed. These words made the blond man laugh, so he began to laugh out loud, asking if he was going to get hurt. Suddenly, the assistant began to walk slowly toward Ragnar and, approaching his small desk, bent down a little and put down a small bundle of papers. When the prince saw it, he was surprised and asked what it was. After all, he did not expect to receive something like this because he had no one to give it to. The gray-haired assistant put one hand on his heart and bowed his head down and said that the gentleman should read the contents of the letter himself. For a few seconds, the blonde thought about whether I could be there, whether he even needed to know, or whether he could do nothing with this information. However, he decided that since it had been brought to him and put on his desk, he simply had to read what it said, what it would be about. When he unfolded the sheets, he began to smile broadly, because there were the words, We still have a chance written on them. The next morning, Ian came to see the emperor and told him that right now, all the survivors of Javert Leon's secret laboratory are being treated in a safe place. They are also analyzing the readings of those who are in better condition or are regaining their memory. They also managed to return many stolen treasures to the state treasury, and this will bring great benefits to all local residents. People who were in close contact with the owner of the tower are being tested for the influence of black magic. However, no traces have been found so far. The emperor, taking one sip of hot tea, praised Ian in a serious tone for doing such a large amount of work in such a short period of time. The elder then put the cup down on the table and said that he had no idea that Havert was so crazy. After all, the emperor bears a great responsibility for not suspecting him earlier. The sorcerer said to himself that he hadn't been able to sense it before either, because the owner of the tower had a good reputation and everyone's respect. After all, no one could know that behind that smiling face was a tyrant. So Ian said that he would tell the boss about the results of the black magic test and the subsequent investigation. Then the emperor folded both hands over his chest and looked down and said that he would like to discuss one more question with John if he did not mind. The sorcerer closed his eyes and replied that he was certainly ready to discuss anything the chief wanted because that was why he was here. And then the gray-haired gentleman asked a rather uncomfortable question, namely, what does Ian think about the crown prince? What is his opinion? When the sorcerer heard this, he opened his eyes wide because he clearly did not expect the interlocutor to ask a question of this kind, so he decided to say that he did not understand the emperor's question. After all, he did not know how to answer such a question correctly. However, the older gentleman said in a serious tone that he could see that the young man had actually understood everything well. There was an awkward pause between them. After a few minutes, the blonde decided to answer honestly, so he said that he could not swear allegiance to the prince's successor. A gray-haired gentleman with wide eyes asked in surprise why the gentleman could not swear. What is the problem? What is wrong? The sorcerer did not give a definite answer, but instead said that he would do everything so that his majesty could safely take his rightful place on the throne. He added that in the future he would always help him to become a worthy ruler for his people.
And then the emperor put his right hand to his beard and said in a reasoning voice that it was impossible for a sorcerer to swear allegiance to a successive prince, but instead he was ready to support him to the end. But then the gentleman slowly leaned over to the table with a cup of his tea on it and said that was enough for now. As soon as the head brought the cup to his mouth, someone knocked softly on the door. The man took one sip and said that the visitor could come in. And then two young servants entered the room, carefully carrying a long wooden box. They were on their way to see John and the emperor. Then the gray-haired gentleman looked at her and said that the sorcerer could take her away. After all, there is a stick in the middle after Havert. He added that the young man probably knows how difficult it is to choose a new owner of a tower. And even though it is clear to everyone who should take this place, there are still many different nuances. The owner of the tower is usually chosen by the imperial family. After these words, the emperor waved to another aide who was standing outside the door. Then the boss said that in this situation, he decided to dispense with formalities and appoint a new one as soon as possible. Therefore, from now on, this stick belongs to Ian. One day, the emperor would have another request for him. The sorcerer smiled sincerely and said that the man could say what he wanted. So the gentleman said with a serious expression and a rude tone that he was sure that Ragnar, his son, would not abandon his plans, even though he had lost a serious accomplice. He added that he knew better than anyone how much greed was in his heart. Because if Rangar takes the throne, many innocent people will die. Ian listened in silence and at the same time thought about all the words he had heard. He had not expected to receive such information from his father. Then the chief began to rise to his feet and bowed low to his interlocutor, saying that he had made his son like this. And it is because of this that he will hate his father until his death, because he was not prepared to not become the emperor of the country. And in the end, the man asked Ian if he could try to stop the boy and direct him to the right path instead. The sorcerer went to the wooden box, took a magic wand, and knelt down on one knee in front of the emperor, bowed his head down, and said that his majesty's will was very much fulfilled. The chief said in a serious tone that he was hoping for him, who from this moment on is considered the owner of the ivory tower. Immediately after the meeting with the emperor, Ian went to the tower to learn more about his new workplace. When he opened the door to the office, a voice invited Ian Page to come inside. At the entrance, he stood there for a few minutes, looking around. And the voice continued to say that he, too, had once wanted to become a hero and save their empire from the evil that had been spreading here for many years. The voice also wanted to be a sorcerer who could help many souls avoid running away. He could control many people with his powers, and he could give the empire and its people a happy life. And many would call it power. The last word stuck in Ian's memory and he began to think carefully about its meaning. Next, I remember the last moment of the meeting with Ragnar. He was kneeling in front of his friend. And then the sorcerer realized that the prince wanted to protect everyone so badly that he just actually had decided to kill his best assistant, the one who was always ready to help. But he doesn't want to become a hero anymore. After all, he has only one desire, and that is to kill Rangar Green River. Ian wants the prince to die a horrible and dishonorable death so that his name will be remembered by everyone who lives now and will live in the future, because he lives and works so hard for revenge. At the time, Ragnar was sitting in his mansion, folding his hands together and thinking very carefully about something. He also needed to develop a new plan for his future actions. After all, he cannot act on the existing ones because he no longer has one element of it, and without it, he will not be able to do everything properly. The next morning, Ian met with the prince-in-waiting, who, as soon as he saw him, began to smile broadly and address the other man as the owner of the tower. Chaklin emphasized that he had not yet been officially appointed. Therefore, such an appeal is now inappropriate. The prince held his hands out to the side and said that they could at least communicate with each other in this way. Then the blonde man began to say that who would have known that the little boy he had first met six years ago? He will take such a big position. The guy said these words with a sincere smile on his face because he did not know how to be insincere about his friends. Then the young man put his right hand on his head and said that he was very pleased to see his personal growth. Ian looked down at the successive prince and said that he was busy conducting tests for black magic. He checked him first, so if there are no complaints, then he has to leave because he has a lot to do. The prince said that he was very sorry that this happened because he came here to meet with Ian. 
Then the blonde sat down in a chair and put his head on the back and asked if he was sure he was okay. After all, he had a headache and his eyes were going dark. The sorcerer looked at his interlocutor and said that the gentleman was actually fine, so there was no reason to worry. It turns out that his suspicions did not escape the prince. The chance that the owner of the tower used magic on a successive prince is quite high, for it is very easy for Ragnar to reach the heights. If you manipulate his main opponent by making him look stupid, someone who is not very good at important matters, although the naked eye can see that this guy is not far off, and if you use magic, you can make him look stupid. And then the prince asked whether Haley would be the next to be tested. Ian calmly replied that it would be in that order. After that, the prince mysteriously turned his gaze to the right and said that he would like to tell him something before he met with Haley. But a second later, he said that she had been thinking and talking about Ian a lot lately. The sorcerer asked in surprise, About me? The blonde began to smile broadly, answering that the young lady was interested in how he was doing, what he was interested in, and what his favorite food was. Ian could not understand what was going on. So he asked her why she was doing this. Because this had never happened to him before. The prince sat down a little and said that even he did not know what to say, despite how close they were. After these words, the young man came to the door and asked Ian to tell the girl how they would meet. After all, she would be happy to have even a little information. When the prince left, the sorcerer stood in his seat for a few minutes, for this information had to be carefully considered. And then the thought flashed through his mind that everyone who is here now is growing very quickly, and he simply cannot keep up with their development. The prince is now an adult. His character has become better, and he is confidently moving forward with his knowledge and skills. So he thought he could make a decent... Before he could finish his thought, however, someone knocked loudly on the door and he quickly said that the visitor could come in. It turns out that it was a cute blonde girl. She folded her arms in front of me and smiled sweetly and sincerely, saying that they hadn't seen Mr. Ian for a long time. The man immediately turned to his majesty and asked her how she had been doing all this time. The lady replied that everything was going great thanks to Ian. The man smiled sweetly and said that he was glad to hear it. Then he moved his hand to the right side and invited his guest to sit down. The girl approached the chair opposite the sorcerer with slow steps and sat down comfortably and waited for what would happen next. Suddenly, she decided to use magic as well and spoke a single word quietly, Silas. A turquoise light began to appear around her. Ian froze in his tracks and began to carefully consider what was happening in the room. He hadn't expected the young lady to do such a thing. He went on to emphasize, with wide-eyed amazement, that it was a second-class magic that blocks various sounds. He immediately asked the young lady if she had already reached the second grade. The girl began to look around nervously and say uncertainly that, to be honest, so she has already reached the third grade, and she was informed about this by her teacher, who has been working with her for quite a long time. Ian decided that the young lady should be congratulated on this achievement, and emphasized that she was a great person to have achieved this. After that, the man put his right hand on his side and smiled a little and asked what she wanted to tell him since she had used silence magic. The girl folded her hands in her lap and turned to Mr. Ian and asked him what she should do. What should she do? After all, soon she would not be able to hide her abilities. Ian did not understand what the young lady meant, why she was so worried. So he asked her to explain in more detail what she meant. The guest looked down and began to move her eyes from side to side, as she did not know where to start her story. When the sorcerer saw this confusion, he decided to help her and said that he could just ask her questions to make it easier for her. And without getting her consent, Ian immediately asked why she was hiding the fact that she was a witch from everyone and that she has certain abilities. The girl was very nervous about this, even clutching her dress nervously. After a few seconds, she hesitantly replied that it was her father's order. At the age of 12, Kevin conducted a mana test. It went pretty quickly because he was already experienced in this field. And when he realized that I was a witch, he immediately turned to her father to tell him the news. After all, it was up to him to decide what to do about it. So he first told the emperor before telling the owner of the tower. The young lady was present during this conversation. The gentleman who conducted the test said that whoever becomes a sorcerer must renounce all titles and desires and become a servant of the ivory tower. 
and this rule also applies to princesses and princes. Unfortunately, there are no exceptions, so the emperor had to make a drastic decision. Because he wanted his daughter to remain a princess, not to become a sorceress who had to obey everyone and help, because she would have no other right. Therefore, Kevin, on the orders of the emperor, concealed the truth that the girl had a talent for magic, and since then she has continued to live her life as before. However, one day she realized that the magic inside her was breaking out, and she couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then Ian emphasized that it was as if she had been studying it all along, and now she came to him for some advice. Kevin is one of the many followers of the crown prince from the sorcerer's past life, so the young lady was lucky in this case. These memories were interrupted by a young lady who said that she had just wanted to help her brother because he did not have proper support. But these are different times now. Her brother has support in the form of Sir Oliver and Mr. Ian, who are very helpful in his future business. And the prince finally got on the right track. This monologue was interrupted by the sorcerer, who decided to ask her what was going on, as if she simply had no goal. The interlocutor lowered her head and began to pick at her dress again saying that she was afraid of becoming an obstacle for her brother because she had been studying magic in secret. The man began to slowly walk closer to the princess, and as soon as he got closer, he emphasized that everything was simple. Ian then got down on one knee and advised the young lady to just live her life the way she wanted to live it, and that would be enough. After all, she needs to live for herself, not for the sake of the imperial estate and her brother, because she might miss a lot of interesting things in this life. The girl looked down at her hands and sadly replied that she didn't know how to do it. How to live for oneself. What do they need to do for this? And then the sorcerer emphasized that no one is born with this knowledge. It is acquired throughout their lives through various experiences. But if one lives only for the sake of others, it turns out that one will live their life, not one's own, which should be filled with its own colors. After all, over time, a young lady can simply lose herself and get stuck in emptiness and constant worry. Therefore, she must make a choice for herself and decide what is important to her. He added that he was simply confident that she would be able to find her own way of life. After listening carefully, the interlocutor turned her gaze to the sorcerer and addressed him by name, asking if he had found his way of life. This question put the man in an uncomfortable position because he clearly did not expect to hear this in his address. This could be seen in his expression, which was wide-eyed. He even froze for a few minutes because he knew what to say. But he decided to tell the truth, so he said he didn't know. He went on to say that he may have crossed the line in his statements. He apologized for that. The young lady said that she did not notice anything wrong with their conversation. She added that he was just the first person who dared to tell her that. After all, no one thinks about their own lives, everyone lives someone else's. And she constantly lived with the idea that her life was the life of a princess of an empire. That's why she didn't even consider other options. She then smiled broadly and thanked Mr. Ian for giving her a little confidence. From now on, she will think more carefully about her life. The sorcerer liked these words, so he smiled sincerely in response, because he was pleased to hear this in his direction. After that, he began to rise to his feet saying that if she continued to study magic, whatever path she chose, she would definitely be useful. If she was able to improve herself in such a short period of time, then she has a great future ahead of her. Finally, the young lady said that she would like to ask him for something. The man stood silently in his seat because he no longer knew what to expect from this interlocutor, so he was a little nervous. The young lady began to nervously look through her dress again and, speaking Mr. Ian's name quietly, asked if he could teach her magic. This question really surprised the man because he clearly did not expect such a request, so he froze in place without even blinking. Having regained control of her feelings, the sorcerer emphasized that Mr. Kevin was her mentor now. The girl added that Kevin told her that he could no longer teach her anything new. Ian decided to refuse so he began to apologize to the princess. However, the girl understood it from the first words. So she folded her hands as if in prayer and closed her eyes and asked the man to become her mentor once again. It took the sorcerer a few minutes to think it over. After all, he doesn't have time for this by choice. But now he had to weigh the pros and cons, because she definitely has a certain talent. After all, not everyone manages to reach the third grade with such little opportunity. The last witch of the imperial blood was Michelle Green River, 
and she was in the fifth grade. Another advantage is that very few people know that she is a sorceress. If she becomes a higher-level sorceress, he will definitely need it in the future. So Ian decided to accept the offer. Hearing his words of agreement, the girl asked him with wide eyes if it was true. However, the wizard lowered his head a little and added that he had one condition that they both had to fulfill. And then the sorcerer said that if he needed her help, she would have to help him at any time and with anything. The princess smiled broadly and replied that since he agreed to help her, she would be happy to help him with whatever he asked. Ian emphasized that this was a very serious statement, and he does not understand how he deserved such an attitude from the imperial princess herself. The young lady's face changed a lot. She became joyful and smiled often. She said that she just, no, uh, just believed him, because she has no grounds that could destroy her trust in him, as it was with many of her comrades in the past. So she thanked him for the fact that they were able to talk about such important matters in such a calm way, and no one will know about it. Ian went on to say that they would discuss the time and place of the lessons a little later. Then he asked if he could give her a test. The young lady said yes. A few minutes later, the sorcerer said that there were no traces of black magic. Therefore, the young lady could get up. He went on to warn her that she might feel dizzy, so she should be careful. As soon as she got to her feet, she felt strange symptoms. She almost fell, but Ian managed to catch her with one hand. After a few seconds, he asked if the princess was okay, or maybe she needed to call her assistant for help. Holding tightly to the hand of her rescuer, the young lady began to smile sincerely, saying that she did not need to call anyone because she was fine. So, after a little bit of control over her feelings, she began to walk slowly to the exit. She couldn't stay here too long without anyone getting suspicious. And then the man remembered something and decided to finally inform his majesty, who had not yet left. And he began to say that usually, after working in the tower, he goes home and reads books, studying magic in the lab. Recently, alchemy has attracted his attention thanks to Douglas, who lives with him. He went on to say that he didn't have a favorite dish, but he couldn't eat anything too spicy. The young lady froze in place listening to all this information. After all, she did not understand what he had just said and why she needed it at all. Ian smiled sweetly and said that his majesty had asked me to answer these questions when the princess came to visit. When the girl heard the last sentence, she was very nervous because she did not expect her brother to be able to say such things. The young lady did not know how to react. Tears appeared in her eyes from frustration and awkwardness of the situation. The princess quickly turned to face the door and grabbed her dress in front of her and began to walk to the exit, wishing Mr. Ian a good day. When the girl was going out into the corridor, she closed the door to her room too loudly. Seeing this reaction, the sorcerer began to wonder if he had said something wrong. The news of what happened to the fifth-class wizard and owner of the tower, Havert Leon, quickly spread throughout the empire. The ruler Terry Green River personally warned everyone about the dangers of using black magic and asked them to report all suspicious cases. The newly appointed young owner of the tower, Ian Page, investigated the events, which were linked to black magic, to calm the population, which was furious. In the history of the empire, the name of Zavert Leon will be associated only with the terrible deeds that were committed against people. Many aristocrats support Ian and the successive prince. Many people stopped communicating with Ragnar and sided with the tower owner and his people. One morning, as usual, Ian was drinking tea in the living room when he noticed a tray with a large number of envelopes on the table in front of him. He asked what they were. The alchemist, who was sitting on a nearby couch, said that it was an invitation to a party. The sorcerer said that they hadn't completed all the checks yet. Why do people neglect their safety so much? The interlocutor asked if the gentleman would not read them. The sorcerer replied that he was not going to go there anyway, so there was no point in reading them. The alchemist unwrapped a few and asked Ian if he could look at a few of them. The guy asked what could be in them. Nothing important. However, I decided to take one, and it contained a proposal for a pause. This surprised him so much that the entire contents of the tea flew out of his mouth. Count Gerard offers Ian to marry his eldest daughter, who is 12 years old. The alchemist began to laugh, saying that the sorcerer was now an adult, so it is not surprising that such proposals come. The alchemist went on to say that he thinks there will be even more such offers, because Ian is the youngest owner of the tower. The sorcerer held his head and said that the aristocrats just wanted to use him to elevate themselves in society. 
But what is even more surprising to him is that they are willing to give up their young daughters for this. The young man can hardly believe it. The other man looked down and agreed with the sorcerer's words. After all, a young man must find the most worthy companion for life. The alchemist collected all the letters from the table and said that he would reply to all of them with a rejection. Ian thanked him for his service, and then the young man realized that he had been busy for such a long period of time and had not been able to thank his assistant properly. The alchemist smiled sweetly, but he did not understand why Ian was so grateful to him. So he sat quietly and waited for the conversation to continue. Then the boy lowered his head and gazed down and turned to Ledian and thanked him for protecting his mother. After that, there was a pause between them. The man did not know how to react to such words, because he had never heard them from Ian before. Then he began to run his hand over his head and smiled broadly and said that if you think about it like that, it was the mana traps that saved them. He added that he did not promise to protect his mother at the cost of his life. After all, he has someone to live for and someone to raise. However, John decided to help the Savior anyway. He asked who the sorcerer was who had put mana in his body and who had poisoned him. The man did not answer anything yet, so the sorcerer decided to clarify whether the gentleman could remember his name or appearance. Perhaps there were some distinctive features that caught his eye. A second later, the sorcerer added that he promised to find the offender and punish him to the fullest extent for what he had done because this situation could not be ignored. And then the alchemist replied that he didn't remember anything because it was late at night. And he began to tell me that in his youth he had studied alchemy in the capital, which meant that there were many sorcerers who could hate him. The man went on to say that he really felt disgusted with the perpetrator and wanted to just, just kill him at that moment. He was also very scared at the thought of leaving Douglas alone. After all, he is already growing up without a mother, and now he may be left without another loved one. Then the man looked down and added that he had been on the verge of death many times because of mana poisoning. But now that he has met Ian, he is confident that his life is not in danger. He emphasized that he wants to focus on his son's future, not on hatred and revenge. And finally, he added that he would remember the sorcerer's words. Ian thought for a few seconds because he hadn't expected to receive such an answer either. Then the young man began to slowly get to his feet and said Ledian's name and said that he had never seen his father's face. Before he was born, he had disappeared without a trace, and no one knew whether he was alive or not. But thanks to their life together, he finally realized how it should be. And if his father had been around, his life would have been the same. The alchemist was surprised to hear this in his direction, so he just sat silently on the couch, and the guy kept saying that it was no wonder why Douglas had such an active and cheerful character, and his mother was able to recover only thanks to the alchemist's elixirs. Then he closed his eyes and added that he would be away for a long time in the future, and turning to face the interlocutor, he smiled sweetly and said that he hoped the gentleman would continue to take care of her. The man smiled and replied that he would certainly continue to do so. After all, this is his home now. Suddenly, the sorcerer folded his arms across his chest and said some strange phrase like, I think he will appear soon. The interlocutor did not understand what the man meant. But just a second later, the door behind him opened sharply and Douglas burst into the room, loudly addressing Ian and calling him captain. Then he stopped on the spot took a small flask out of his pocket, and said that he had finally finished the elixir for mana poisoning from Landiora flowers. And without looking at who was in the room, he began to say that he had to be given back immediately. However, I didn't have time because I saw my father, who decided to get up from the couch. The man was quite surprised by what he had just heard from his son. After all, he did not know that he was working on such a drug. So with his mouth wide open, he asked about the treatment for mana poisoning. Then he turned to Ian and asked what was going on here. The sorcerer folded his arms across his chest and began to explain that he had found the recipe in the tower owner's library. To create an antidote from the flowers of Landiora, you need to use a higher level of time-stopping magic. It is good that it also works on plants. Hearing these words, the father began to walk toward his son. When he came closer, he could not hold back his tears and wiping them away, he could barely thank the guy for what he had done. After that, the son decided to hug his father to calm him down a bit. After all, he needed it. 
because all the events that have been happening lately have shaken everyone's nervous system a little bit. Douglas then turned to the captain, saying that he would become an alchemist who would create elixirs against serious diseases. I want no one else in their immediate family to suffer. Ian was very happy to hear these words because this is not just a dream. A dream that the young man will need to pursue with determination. After that, the guy turned to face the sorcerer and smiled broadly, thanking him for the opportunity to live in good conditions and still have the opportunity to develop. Then Ian has memories from his past life, where he once found himself in a dark dungeon and a voice whispered to him that he was the only one left. The world in which humans and draconians exist will soon close its doors. The man was told this information by a guy who held a magic wand in his right hand and had short, wavy blonde hair. The young man then emphasized that the draconians had brought chaos and destruction to the world. And the price for this act will be very high. And he will have to pay for the sins of his race for the rest of his life, because at least one person has to go through this because there is no other way. Then the blonde man cut his arm and stretched it forward so that the blood would flow to the ground. At this point, he said that the gentleman was forbidden to leave this place until his death. A few minutes later, a bright orange circle with various hieroglyphics appeared next to them, symbolizing the use of magic. Late in the evening, something strange happened at Ragnar's estate. He was dressed in a festive outfit, and looking around the room, he said, Indeed, it looks like this. The letter he received yesterday said he would be expected, but he didn't think he would see it. Walking around his guest, he put his hands behind his back and asked in a serious tone how to get out of here, because he didn't understand anything yet. The wizards that Ian Page has put here are watching this place from the outside, so the question is, will they be able to get in unnoticed? The young man who came to the prince with his eyes closed replied that there was no need to worry because the clan leader was much stronger than the owner of the tower. Ragnar asked in surprise, clan leader? This did not help him at all, but rather made him think even more carefully. The guest, holding the book in his hands, turned his head to the prince and said that it was better for him to see everything with his own eyes. He opened the book and began to turn the pages quickly, and he began to form a portal with a blue, bright light. Rangar, watching everything that was happening, asked in fright, What is this? And why did it appear here now? The blonde man held his hand to the new formation and said in a serious tone that it was a portal leading outside the capital. The prince clarified, A portal! However, the guest did not answer, but instead went inside and stretched his hand out to invite the prince to come along. The young man was in no hurry, so a few minutes later another hand appeared from the portal, and in it was a gray-haired gentleman who addressed his majesty and asked him to take his hand. When Ragnar saw who was inside, he was equally surprised, for it was Sir Domphil, whom he had known for a long time. It was only because of him that he decided to try to move using this portal. So in a few minutes, they found themselves in some kind of forest. After taking a few steps, the prince turned his head to the other man and asked him how this was possible. The gray-haired gentleman told the boy not to be so surprised. The young man then asked a clarifying question about whether Javert did not know such magic. The man answered this question with a question, saying that he really thought that Javert Leon was able to achieve the position of tower owner on his own. Then the gentleman started pacing around, saying that despite the power he had gained, Haver was only thinking about benefiting himself. He added that it was even good that this weak link was eliminated without their participation. All this information was not fully understood by Ragnar. He spent several minutes trying to put all the facts together to get a coherent picture, but he was unsuccessful. After that, the gray-haired gentleman began to say that many things belonged to the elect, and Ragnar was one of them. However, he could make a choice that even the ruler could not make. The young man asked again in surprise, Choice? It was all new to him. The older man lowered his head and looked down, saying that their leader believed that Ragnar could make a good emperor of this country a person who will easily get rid of old laws and destroy confused, stupid people. This person will bring new rules to this country. And he emphasized that the prince has blood that is suitable for opening new paths, and their leader has been waiting for his arrival for a long time. Ragnar still didn't understand what the hell was going on. After all, how could anyone be stronger than Ian Page and Havert Leon? As he walked behind his companion, 
He reflected on the fact that he had heard that there was a sect that did not obey the imperial religion. But he hadn't realized that the owner of the tower and the captain of the imperial tower were members of it. And they probably want to change the state religion and need a representative of the governing authorities. And then the thought flashed through his mind that this was a good chance for him. Therefore, he needs to use it and become stronger. And for this, he is ready to go to any lengths to get the throne that is rightfully his. After a few meters, they stopped, and the gray-haired man said that they had arrived. They stood there for a few minutes, and the prince looked at the mansion they had reached. He had never seen anything like it before. Then the conductor pointed to the right and said with a slight smile that the guy could go inside. When they entered, Ragnar was still walking behind. Looking around, he asked, What kind of place was this? The man replied that the Dragonians used to live here. Three hundred years ago, the owner of the tower sealed this place and made it disappear. Because back then, it was causing a lot of trouble for the locals. It was only recently that people managed to find him again. Suddenly, the prince stopped in his tracks and asked in a serious tone what he was doing here. For a couple of minutes, the interlocutor stood silently with his back to him. He needed this time to think of a good answer. However, he never gave it because in an instant, several people in Burgundy, long cloaks appeared in front of them. They had hoods on their heads that covered their faces. When they saw the prince in front of them, they simultaneously bowed to him and greeted him as his majesty. They stood there for several minutes. Another interesting sign was that they all stood with their eyes closed and their right hand was placed over their hearts. Ragnar looked around and was surprised to see so many people in this place. He thought there would be much fewer people here. When the boy looked closely, he saw aristocrats whom he had known personally for years. This made him smile slightly. A gray-haired gentleman with his head bent down said that he was there to create a new world. He called the best representatives of this country. The prince turned his head to his interlocutor and emphasized that he had forgotten the main thing. After all, no one had explained to him why all this was necessary and why he was here. The guide said in a calm tone that everything would soon become clear. Then they came to a large wooden door and the gray-haired man said that their leader was inside. After these words, the door began to slowly open, and Ragnar was trying to imagine this unknown leader of a strange country. And when he saw him, he was quite surprised. You could see it in his expression, namely his eyes and mouth, which were wide open. As it turned out, there was a man with long blonde hair standing in the middle of the room. But his main distinguishing feature was that he had wings. The gentleman stood with his hands behind his back and his chin raised high. You could also see that there were many different orange characters on the ground around him. When the rest of the people present saw him, they quickly fell to their knees, folded their hands as if in prayer, and greeted the last descendant of the dragon. When the prince heard these words, he began to look at the people, who made some strange gestures when they saw this gentleman. It was only now that he realized that this was the local leader whom everyone respected so much. However, it is not yet clear why. Ragnar decided to bow down as well. At the same time, the chief turned to him and said that he probably knew who he was and why he was called here. So the blonde man decided to tell his name. He said that he was Avantus, the last draconian on earth. Upon hearing this information, the prince froze, for the thought flashed through his mind that these creatures had not died out more than 300 years ago. After all, these dragonians have strong black magic. He does look like them from the stories. But I wonder why he is called the last descendant. The leader looked at the expression on his guest's face and smiled sweetly and said that the young man looked quite confused. So I decided to clarify the situation a bit, and he confirmed that they really did die out more than 300 years ago because of humans, and no one survived except him. Then the gentleman said that Ragnar's ancestor, Mitchell Green River, had used his magic and sealed him in this place for many years, and ever since then, he had been waiting to meet a normal government official. After all, the blood of Mitchell Green River's descendant, which flows in the prince's veins, is needed for the leader to break this terrible magic. Ragnar listened carefully and asked if it would be easier to kill him, because he still doesn't understand why it is necessary to make a deal with him. The leader said that the guy was thinking too narrowly. After all, if he is made a ruler, he will benefit more. The man then held his hands out to the side and said that he wanted to break the old laws and explore the new world. Therefore, this deal is perfect for both him and Ragnar.
and all for the sake of human peace and the Dragonians. The blonde man said this with a broad smile, for the idea gave him pleasure. The prince began to slowly get to his feet, and said that it looked like they were just trying to use him. And if he refuses, will they just kill him? After all, they must have options for replacing him. The leader emphasized that he was not going to kill him, because if he refused, they would simply erase his memory, and he would not remember anything. But he chose him precisely because he would definitely not turn down the opportunity. The young man listened attentively because he had to make a decision. He then clenched his hand tightly into a fist and asked the interlocutor to promise that he would be made emperor and not be betrayed in the future. The blonde man smiled broadly and promised to fulfill this agreement. Then the gentleman who had brought him here approached the prince. The boy took a small dagger from his hand and cut his palm with it. As the blood dripped to the ground, he loudly said that he agreed to the deal when a few drops fell on the magic circle that was located around the leader. He began to glow brightly. It took several minutes for something to happen. All those present stood and waited in silence. Then this pause was broken by a blonde man who opened his mouth wide and began to laugh loudly throughout the room. The man simply could not stop. Then he calmed down a bit and thanked the prince. The latter, in turn, was not very pleased with this reaction. A red cape appeared next to the leader. Putting it on, he emphasized that it was better to dress in modern fashion. After that, the man quickly approached his new friend and, looking at him, said that he saw his face was full of fear. The leader leaned over to the prince's right ear and told him once again that there was no point in worrying so much because he was not going to kill him. A few seconds later, he added that he was even thinking about the possibility that they would become good friends, who will help each other. Then the man turned to the exit and continued to smile, saying that it was finally time for him to leave the room. It was time to go outside for the first time in such a long time. Ragnar remained standing silently in the same place. He did not even turn to look in the wake. At that time, the princess was sitting in her mansion, wondering with a sad expression why the one she was waiting for did not come to her. She even assumed that maybe he had already forgotten. She was speaking to the assistant who was combing her hair, and the lady decided to calm him down, so she turned to Her Majesty and said that the gentleman was probably busy looking for black magic, that's all. These words made the princess think about what her husband could really be doing, because he had so many responsibilities in the empire. Suddenly, these thoughts were interrupted by two maids who simply burst into the room, loudly opening the door and simultaneously addressing Her Majesty. The princess and her assistant did not understand what was happening, so they asked what had happened and why the ladies were screaming so loudly. The maids clenched their hands into fists and joyfully announced that the time had finally come, and the one whom everyone, especially the princess, had been waiting for, had arrived. They kept saying nervously that he was finally here, and he came in a suit, not a raincoat. And finally, they finally said that Ian Page had arrived. While the princess was trying to digest all the information she had received, and almost without moving, she repeated, Mr. Ian has come? After that, there was a pause in the room. Everyone was trying to understand the girl's reaction, and she, in turn, did not understand what to do. And when she finally realized what was happening, the princess began to ask the girls, frightened, to help her clean up. Just a few minutes later, the young lady was standing in front of a large, beautiful door. She was dressed smartly. Before entering the room, the girl had to close her eyes and take a deep breath, because she was very nervous. After that, she turned to her assistants and asked if her hair was in order. Was there anything sticking out? One of them replied in a serious tone that the young lady shouldn't worry so much, because she looked very charming today. Hearing these words, the girl gathered her thoughts and said that she was leaving. The assistants all wished her good luck. When the princess entered the room, Ian began to rise from his chair to his feet, because that is how one should meet the honorable people of the empire, especially girls. As the young lady approached, she saw the man put his right hand on his heart and say that it had been a long time since he had seen Her Majesty. When the young lady saw this picture, she just froze in her tracks because she was quite surprised by what was happening. Then the princess turned her gaze to the left and sadly said that she had already thought he had forgotten about her. The sorcerer bowed a little and smiled sincerely and apologized to the princess. 
He explained that he had a lot of work to do and needed to do it immediately. The girl folded her arms in front of her and said that it was nothing. Then she thanked him for taking the time to come. When the girl saw her interlocutor, she said that the suit suited him very well. The man thanked her in return. And immediately after that, he said that first they needed to move to a place that was suitable for training. After all, there are a lot of prying eyes in the estate. Therefore, rumors about their meetings can spread, because it's a public place. The young man smiled sweetly and said he would help her move with him. But for that, she needed to take his hand. The princess immediately agreed to this proposal, because she had been waiting for them to meet for so long, so she could not miss this opportunity. She was even more pleased that they would be holding hands. Eeyore said that this way they would be able to use teleportation, and that made her even more excited. Immediately afterward, the princess came closer to take her interlocutor's hand. Before applying the magic, the sorcerer warned that the girl might feel a little dizzy, but that was normal in this situation. So as soon as they held hands, the gentleman asked her not to let go until he said so. A few seconds later, a gentle blue light began to appear around them. It took only two minutes and they found themselves in a very beautiful meadow with bright green, thick grass. When the young lady looked around, she was surprised that she was familiar with the area, but she had never come here on her own because the Imperial family was not allowed to do so. Seeing the surprise on the girl's face, Ian smilingly confirmed that these are the mountains that are located around the capital, and people don't come here often. Looking off into the distance, he began to explain that he had chosen it because a sixth-class sorcerer's teleportation has a limited range, and here it is, free and quiet, and it's perfect for a wizard to practice. The girl continued to stand in silence, not moving, looking into the distance. Therefore, it is not clear whether she was listening to the word spoken. Noticing this, the sorcerer stopped and turned to the princess with a serious expression. He didn't understand what had attracted her attention so much. And then, when the man began to walk toward her, the girl told him that today was the first time she had ever left the castle. Then she turned her head to her mentor and said with a big smile that she thought she could only visit the outside in her dreams. But when she took Ian's hand, her dream became a reality in a second. After these words, they stood silently and looked at each other because they were very touching words. Suddenly, the guy wanted to say something, but he didn't dare. Instead, he continued to stand there with his mouth slightly open. At that moment, he remembered a woman sitting alone in a large armchair, looking out the window, looking at something. You could tell by her expression that she was not happy with her situation and was generally unhappy with everything. However, Ian did not upset himself with such nonsense and began to smile broadly so that the young lady would not suspect anything. The girl began to smile sweetly in response, and she was also very pleased that she had finally been able to visit such a beautiful place. The wizard finally broke this strange pause and said that magic is indeed very amazing, especially if you use it correctly. Then the princess folded her arms in front of her and said something that sounded like he had seen her practicing in the temple of borrowing. The guy replied that he was looking around at the time and decided to go inside, and when he saw her coming, he decided to hide. The young lady asked him again how he did it, because there should be security and protection there. The sorcerer said that he was just very curious. The princess laughed and said that she understood, because when she was a child, she and her brother had also gone to forbidden places. Then the young lady moved her hands back and said that she would try to turn a blind eye to this illegal entry and the temple territory, given that he had turned a blind eye to her study of magic. And at the end of her sentence, she clarified that they now had something in common. Ian closed his eyes, smiled, and answered with a short yes. After that, the lady said that in ten days there would be a reception in honor of her brother's birthday. So she asked if the sorcerer would come to it. The guy looked away and said that he had already received an invitation, but he didn't know whether he would go. Suddenly, the princess stopped and asked why, because her brother would be very upset. Ian began to say that only the noblest people should be present at the prince's birthday party. Even though he is now the owner of the tower, he is still considered a commoner. Therefore, his appearance there could cause a stir. In addition, he is well aware that the connections that the previous owner of the tower has built up over the years of his service are not easy to break. Until the successive prince consolidates his position in the eyes of society, 
until he successfully assumes the right to the throne, he needs to go about his business. The girl was very upset by these words. So she put her head down and looked at something on the ground and said, I see. Then she clenched her hands into fists and said that she should also try harder as a princess so that no one could say a word against her brother. And of course, she would continue to study magic. She thanked him for his help and asked if she could call Ian teacher when they were alone. The guy smiled sweetly and said that of course he could call her that if she was comfortable with it. For the evening, in a secret place, Ragnar met with the leader of the people who would make him emperor. At the end of his story, he said that this was the plan he had developed. The Dragonian listened attentively and with a serious expression clarified that before dealing with Ian, it was necessary to remove the consistent prince. Ragnar said that this is exactly how it should be. Because many aristocrats and influential people are now watching Paige's actions closely, and although he is a powerful sorcerer, he is still quite young. He has neither experience nor title, so in the eyes of the aristocrats, he is now a nobody, and many are already unhappy that he was appointed to this position. However, if the consistent prince falls away, no one will support Ian Page, and they will easily get rid of him. After listening to everything, the gray-haired assistant suggested inviting someone to his office to help implement the plan. The prince looked at the person who spoke to him and replied that he had not yet decided who it could be. The older gentleman put his hand on his heart and asked if Ragnar would like to confide in him in this case because he knew someone who could solve this issue. The prince agreed to this proposal, and he entrusted Mr. Domfils with the task of resolving this issue. The man decided not to delay, but instead quickly went out to the room to go fulfill the task he had been assigned. Holding on to his chair, the leader said in a calm tone that it was time for him to act. However, this sentence was interrupted by the prince who addressed Mr. Avantis. He said that he was, although he wanted to ask him one question. Ragnar was even a little worried because he didn't know how the other man would react. However, he nevertheless made up his mind and said, is he strong enough to change everything in their empire without him? After all, he is simply sure that the master has many other people who could play his role in this matter. And he asked why the choice of leader fell on him. The blonde looked down and said that he needed to find someone. The prince raised his eyebrows in anger and asked, who exactly? After all, he still did not understand the end, what was happening here. The leader put his foot down and said that this someone was the last creature of his kind. And it is a golden dragon that controls time. For the Dragonians, this is a very important ally. When he heard this, the guy asked with a wide open mouth that this was not a fairy tale. The blonde man began to explain that no matter what people think, dragons still exist but they can't see them because they live in places inaccessible to people. However, when the new truth and chaos begin to come into this world, the dragon will definitely show itself. The word chaos was very much in Ragnar's ears, so he decided to clarify what the meaning of this word was in this situation. The leader closed his eyes and said one single word, war. The prince expressed his assumption that the Dragonian war that happened 300 years ago was done to summon the golden dragon. The blonde answered with just one word. That's right. But this man decided to lend a hand not to them, but to the people. So the leader said that it was foolish to think that Mitchell Green River alone could destroy the dragon and the Drachnians. The prince continued to speak his mind, namely that there is no mention of them across the continent. And he added that they were taught because Mitchell Green River was able to deal with them, thanks to the magic he developed in the tower. Then the leader put his foot down and said that this person was constantly wiping his tracks and disappearing as if nothing had happened. However, the Dragonians, who have dragon blood in you, clearly feel that dragons are alive. Ragnar summarized that the blonde man wanted to make him emperor and then start a war. The man smiled broadly and confirmed that this was the plan for now. He assured the prince that it would not bring any trouble. And the prince immediately asked the question, wasn't it the unification of the three continents that his dead relatives wanted? And if the war starts, he will appear here and bring chaos. Therefore, it is imperative to find him, and it must be done as soon as possible. Ragnar asked a perfectly logical question, namely, what would happen after they found him? However, the leader did not like it very much, so he closed his eyes and said that their conversation had dragged on a bit and he had other tasks to perform. 
and immediately after saying that he began to rise to his feet. However, in the end, he asked the prince to take care of himself, because they would face difficult times ahead. But when he looked up and looked directly into the eyes of his interlocutor, the leader said that he was confident that their plans would coincide. The next morning, a meeting was held in the room where the vice captain's office was located. He was quite surprised to be informed of the information from his superiors. The assistant put his hands behind his back and said that the vice captain was waiting in the office of the captain of the first detachment of the Imperial Knights. The boy got up from his desk and began to wonder why he had been called by this terrible Sir Domphil. After all, he hadn't caused any problems. Walking past the assistant, the young man tapped him on the shoulder and smiling sweetly said that he would certainly go to the meeting and thanked him for passing on the request. After the gentleman left the room, the assistant continued to stand silently in the same place. He did not even turn to look after his boss. When the vice captain approached the door, he stopped. His excitement was overwhelming and he could not think straight because of it. When he finally got ready, he knocked on the door, and Sir Domphil, who was signing papers at the time, said that whoever came could go inside. Once inside, the young man stopped a few steps from the door and asked if the gentleman had called him to come in. The man confirmed and said that he was Sir Paul Rance. As the young man approached, the captain began to say that he had heard that Helena was under the influence of black magic when she attacked the prince. But after that incident, security was tightened and no similar incidents occurred. The vice captain put his hands behind his back and replied in a serious tone that everything was under control. A second later, he added that they had tightened security and increased the personal guard of the imperial family. The captain looked down and emphasized that this should have been done earlier. After all, they are the future of their country. The chief then said that he had already spoken to Captain Oliver, but this was the first time he had spoken to Sir Paul, and he emphasized that the guy had been a vice captain for a very long time. Is that why the man is worried and does the boyfriend hold a grudge against him? The guy was a little surprised to hear that it was out of the question, because he was happy with his position. The gray-haired gentleman closed his eyes and said that he was very happy to hear this. He had already imagined a much worse scenario. Then the boss put his hands behind his back and slowly walked toward the interlocutor and said that his colleagues said that he was the best after Captain Oliver in terms of skills. It is simply amazing, and such abilities should be recognized by the ruler and the crown prince and Captain Oliver himself. The guy turned out to be surprisingly smart, so he thought it over and said that he still had a lot to learn. The gray-haired gentleman said that there was no need to be so modest. After all, the young man had achieved this title thanks to his constant work on himself and his skills. The captain went on to say that when Sir Oliver offered him, a commoner and an orphan, to be made vice-captain of the Second Knight's squad, the Lord thought that Oliver had gone mad. Because he did not understand how such important matters as the protection of the imperial family could be entrusted to an ordinary person from the street, a man who had never even done this before. Also, Appointing an ordinary Christian to such a high position is the biggest nonsense he could ever hear in his long life. The guy did not realize that this was happening at all. After all, he was living a quiet life and nothing heralded any changes in his life. Then the captain said that today it would be the end of it. And behind him appeared the leader, the last of the Dragonians. When the vice captain saw him, he quickly grabbed his sword and asked a frightened question to find out who he was and what was going on here. But then he realized that he could not make a single movement. This scared him, because he had never experienced anything like this before. It turns out that this guest used some kind of magic. It quickly spread through the room and affected the vice captain. So everything happened because of what the captain had planned. And while this nonsense was going on, the captain, with a serious expression on his face, said menacingly that the boy would become a victim in the name of the new empire. A few hours later, the consistent prince had sword training. This activity tires him out a bit because he has to make a lot of effort. One of his assistants was training him. He was very good at his job as a teacher. After the first approach, the black-haired young man said that the prince was almost doing everything right. But he needs to try to control his position and the speed of his attacks. The blonde man simply did not have the strength to continue training, so he turned to the captain and asked him to stop, to rest and recuperate for at least a second. 
However, at this last minute, the teacher knocked the sword out of the prince's hands, and he was left without a weapon to defend himself. So the black-haired young man smiled sweetly and said that he was done for the day. His majesty put his hands to his sides and thanked him for the training. After that, he immediately sat down on the green grass and rested, saying why he was so bad at fencing, and why is it so difficult for him? The captain came closer and said that this was not true. After all, the gentleman is more talented than any other person. However, to become skilled, you need to practice constantly. He added that the prince is picking up faster and faster than Ian, the owner of the tower. After all, he had been studying fencing with the captain for five years. Then the black-haired man added that Ian was a great sorcerer, and it was true, but he was no knight. Finally, the young man asked to keep this information a secret. The blonde began to laugh out loud, saying that it turns out Ian is not perfect in everything. After a few minutes of laughter, the prince stopped laughing and said that it turned out that he could also surpass Ian in something. It remained to be seen what that might be. Then his majesty raised his right hand, clenched into a fist, and said that he would train even better, and he would do so until he was better than Oliver. Suddenly, the prince's attention was drawn to the figure of a man standing not far from him. He tried to see who was watching him. It turned out to be the vice captain. He was under a large tree that completely protected him from the sun. The man stood silently with his head down and looked at something. After the meeting with his boss, he changed his behavior a lot. He became completely different than he was before. The prince noticed the changes and turned to Oliver and asked him if he knew what had happened to the vice captain. After all, he was acting strangely. The blonde man also noticed that he hasn't been talking to him lately, and in general, he walks around as if he's down in the dumps. The assistant said that he had noticed this as well, so he asked the guy if he was okay. He replied that nothing had happened. His majesty continued to look in the direction of the vice captain and said that perhaps he should ask again. Perhaps this time he would want to tell us. So I told the captain not to be shy and not to be too harsh. After all, it was his job as a leader. After these words, the black-haired man went to the boy. The prince waited for some news. Because you can't let a person destroy himself from the inside like that. We need to help as much as we can. And it can be important even for the empire. On the same day, the birthday of the successive prince was celebrated in the evening. Everyone had already gathered, and the servants were busy making the final preparations. Oliver came to his majesty's room dressed in festive clothes. He told him that the reception was about to begin and that he should be ready to go, because everyone would be waiting for him. The prince was also already dressed in his smart suit. Adjusting one of his gloves, he said that he already knew, and in a few minutes he would be ready to go and he closed his eyes and said that he is constantly nervous at such events. After all, Ian's words about how he has to create a good reputation with his words come to mind, and he was sorry that the wizard would not be there because he was too busy. The captain decided to calm the prince down a bit and said that he was in charge today, so there is no need to worry so much. And he emphasized that it is the aristocrats who should be worried when they look at the prince, not vice versa. That's why they need to get ready immediately to show their best. Suddenly, this conversation was interrupted by a woman's voice, which joyfully addressed her brother. The men turned their heads and looked in the direction of the voice. It turned out that it was Haley, the prince's sister. The young lady was dressed in a beautiful long blue dress, and she had a beautiful hairstyle on her head. You could see a joyful expression on her face. When she came closer, her brother said that the lady was just incredible today. Then Haley said that she had dressed up a little for the prince's birthday. The blonde man put his hands to his sides and smiled broadly, saying that it was a pity that Ian could not be present today because he was too busy. But if he came, he could see the princess in such a beautiful dress. The girl became a little nervous and asked what her brother was getting at. What does he mean by that? But then she came closer and asked him in her ear why he was telling everyone that she had asked about Ian. After all, it makes her a little uncomfortable. However, without waiting for an answer, she decided to wish her brother a happy birthday. And she added that she was really proud of the fact that he was trying so hard to do so much for himself and for the empire. And finally, making a bow, she told him not to worry if someone said something bad about him. She would just, she would just personally destroy him. 
These words made my brother laugh a little, but he thanked Hela anyway. She was able to distract him a bit from what was coming in a few minutes. Then they stood in a single line, and the prince offered his sister his hand and suggested that they go to the reception hall together. That way he would be less embarrassed and she would be able to support him at any moment. When they were at the door, one of the guards turned to the people in the room and told them to greet Crown Prince Hayton Green River and Princess Haley Green River. Immediately after these words were spoken, all those present put their hands to their hearts and bowed low. After all, this is how the charter requires that members of the imperial family be greeted. The brother and sister slowly entered the hall, smiling sincerely. They had no way to show their excitement, and the people would never suspect it. The orchestra, which was also present at the celebration, began to play calm, slow music, and everyone quietly watched what was happening in the hall. When the prince passed by certain groups of people, they said they were very happy to see him, and others wished him a happy birthday. The blonde smiled sweetly and thanked everyone, saying that he hoped everyone would enjoy this reception. Haley silently watched her brother and was pleased with his behavior. At this time, the captain tried to observe the behavior of the vice captain because he was also present at the celebration. Again, he had a strange expression and behavior. Chornyavi could not understand what could have caused such a drastic change. After all, no such events had occurred in the empire that could have had such an impact. Then one of the guards noticed that his superiors were paying close attention to him. But he didn't understand why because he seemed to do everything because he had to. And then one of the chiefs angrily turned to him and asked why he was standing there silent because it was time to announce the new member of the imperial family who was ready to come out. The young man began to worry that he had become so dumb. So he even stammered a little, telling everyone present that his majesty had arrived. The people were shocked, to put it mildly. Therefore, everyone froze in their seats and began to cover their mouths with their hands to hide their surprise. The prince turned his head toward the running of another guest and said the word, Father, with his mouth wide open, for he had not expected to see him either. After recovering from the shock, he began to walk toward him, saying that he did not know he was coming. The elder man, holding his hands out to the side, emphasized that this was a reception in honor of his son's birthday, and it is a father's duty to visit his child. Then the man smiled sincerely and said that he was very proud of his son and what he is doing for their family now. The guy was amused by these words. He smiled sweetly in return. It had been a long time since he had heard his father say such words, especially in public. Then his majesty and the crown prince approached one of the tables, and the older man said that he could see that many people had gathered here today to welcome his son. And he began to say that after a heavy rain, the earth constantly becomes stronger. So he hopes that after all the troubles, their empire will flourish. And as a father, he is very pleased to watch his child grow up. And he hopes that everyone present will appreciate the achievements of the consistent prince. Then his majesty plunged into his memories and began to tell us that when the prince was about five years old, he ran after his father while walking in the garden. When the man asked why the boy was doing this, he replied, smiling broadly, that he would go wherever his majesty told him to go. And even though these were just words, at that moment the man felt that he could provide his son with reliable support and show him the worthy path that the prince would have to take. But it was so long ago. But it feels like it all happened yesterday. The gentleman even closed his eyes for a few seconds. The emperor then turned his head to his son and emphasized that he had followed him patiently and persistently, and that deserves a lot of respect. The gentleman went on to thank them for their trust, and added that he really believed that the prince would be able to go through this journey, no matter how difficult it was. After that, his majesty took a vessel of wine and told everyone present to do the same, and they drank to their empire and to their prince, and to the happy future that awaits them in the near future. All the guests present happily raised their glasses and drank the contents to the bottom. The emperor took a drink himself, tilting his glass, he once again congratulated his son on his birthday and smiled slightly. The prince began to smile sweetly in response. After all, all the words brought him great joy and comfort, and he needed them now more than ever. However, suddenly my father began to cough loudly after taking just one sip. Later, he dropped the glass on the floor and began to cough up blood. 
My son was just dumbfounded by what he saw. He did not understand what had happened. The young man was shocked that his surprisingly healthy father was not looking so good. All the guests present were equally shocked. They all froze in their seats with their mouths wide open. They had never expected this to happen. The princess had the same reaction as her brother. She stood silently holding her drink. However, her expression showed fright and incomprehension. At this time, Oliver was the only one who was able to react in any way. So he quickly got up from his seat and began to walk toward his majesty. I called out to him loudly. However, the man was already on both knees on the floor and continued to cough up blood. The son, watching all this, dropped his glass out of excitement. After that, the reception ended immediately, and the prince moved to his room and sat alone on the sofa, trying to think about everything carefully. He could remember all the details, all the little things that caught his attention at the time, but he didn't attach any importance to it. He still did not understand who could have done this. Suddenly, a knock on the door broke the silence. It said that the captain of the second detachment of the Imperial Knights, Oliver Raywood, was asking to see him. The boy immediately jumped to his feet and said that he agreed to do so. So without waiting for the door to be opened by the assistants, he began to move toward it. And just as he opened it in front of his face, he saw the captain who was about to enter on his own. When Oliver came into the room and closed the door behind him, the prince immediately asked how his father was feeling and what had happened to him. The black-haired captain looked down and sadly reported that a fatal outcome had been avoided, but the emperor was still in critical condition. Instead, all the doctors and alchemists are trying to... However, before he could finish, he was interrupted by the prince, who angrily asked if they had found the person who tried to kill his father. The captain did not expect such a strong reaction. It took him a few seconds to think about it and formulate his answer. Because of this, he first looked down and said that they had caught the criminal at the scene of the crime, and he immediately confessed to what he had done. After these words, the prince grabbed the black-haired man's shirt and pulled on it, asking who did it. Who dared to attempt the life of the emperor himself? The captain was trying to figure out whether he should tell the guy this information, or whether it was better to keep it secret for his own safety. However, he decided it was better to report it and be honest with his boss. When the prince heard the name, he was too shocked to believe it. So he asked, What? Why? A few days later, at one of the meetings, one of the men spoke up and angrily questioned how the vice captain of the second night squad could have done this. After all, he had been considered one of the captain's closest associates and the most consistent prince for several years. So he asked how His Majesty and Sir Oliver Raywood could not recognize such a dangerous criminal. Another gentleman said more calmly that he was sure the boy had not acted alone. That's why we need to find everyone who could have been involved immediately. A man in a green jacket folded his arms across his chest and said that Paul Rance was known to have bitten off his tongue during interrogation, so now he would not tell them anything. Another member of the assembly spoke next, and he emphasized that this criminal was an orphan from the northern regions, and this is very close to the Colwood Empire. So the man said that no one should forget that six years ago there was an explosion on the estate. Then it turned out that the Wizard of the Ivory Tower the maid from the castle, and the secretary of the estate were spies. They were constantly snooping around for information and reporting back to their superiors. A few seconds later, the young man added that even if this rascal could earn a title and rank at such a young age, however, we should not forget his ambiguous background and dismiss the possibility that he could also be a spy for the Colwoods. The gentleman sitting opposite emphasized that they had not found a seal on the criminal during the search. The angry man asked, What are they talking about a seal now? After all, he was trying to poison his majesty, and he told them nothing about his accomplices or motives. And based on everything, they needed to better understand his background. Therefore, he should be immediately removed from the position of vice captain of the second imperial detachment, and to execute him for trying to take the emperor's life. The other members of the meeting began to agree with this proposal. And Ian, who at that time was sitting in the most honorable place, tried to think everything over carefully and weigh the pros and cons, and then make a final and irrevocable verdict. However, the meeting ended without anyone solving anything. The wizard was so tired of all these problems that he decided to take a short walk in the forest. However, he didn't manage to do so very well because someone called him from behind. 
When he turned to face the person who was addressing him, he noticed a captain in front of him who was wearing a long brown cloak. Coming a little closer to Ian, the captain took off his hood and holding onto his cloak with both hands asked how Paul was feeling. The sorcerer closed his eyes and said that during one of the meetings, all the people present mistook him for a spy of the Colwoods. The captain was very angry at this conclusion. He raised his eyebrows and began to shout angrily that this was nonsense and that Paul could not possibly be a spy. Ian reacted more calmly to this. He said in a normal tone that he thought so too. After all, he had seen with his own eyes that the vice captain was ready to give his life for the prince's loyalty. The young man did his job very well despite his background. He was also a wonderful and loyal knight. Therefore, he could not have come to this decision on his own. Ian turned his gaze to the right and emphasized that this is how he knows Paul Rance, not how you are describing him now. That is why this request needs to be resolved immediately. However, he went on to emphasize that the members of the assembly had already passed a verdict, and even he himself could not justify him for what had happened. After all, he continues to be silent, so it is not yet clear to them why he did it and who was his accomplice. And finally, he added that he really wants to know why this happened. After that, Ian asked the captain a question to find out how his majesty was feeling and if he needed any help. The black-haired guy looked down and said that the prince had locked himself in his room, not eating or drinking, and he probably blames himself for what happened. After hearing the news, the sorcerer could only reply with the word, I see. Instead, many different thoughts were raging in his head about the situation. The captain went on to say that Ian probably already knew that all the knights of the second squad were banned from leaving the capital, and they will all soon be interrogated one by one. As a squad captain, he cannot take any liberties. However, in this situation, he can only ask Ian for help. So he asked the sorcerer to finally tell the truth, because everyone should know about it, and it is also difficult for him to solve these problems now. The blonde man said that they had found no lies in the vice captain's words, nor had they found any traces of influence. He was going to jail tonight and Ian would try to visit him there. And immediately after this meeting, he will visit Sir Oliver to tell him all the details and information he has received. The black-haired young man with a sad expression replied that he understood. He turned around and started walking back home to wait for his guest. At the end of that day, a very heavy downpour began. It created a kind of depressed mood. Therefore, one of the prison guards sat down on the floor and dozed off at his post and did not keep watch normally. Because of this, Ian managed to get into the cell where Paul was being held unnoticed. When he approached the bars, he stood silently for several minutes, looking at the man inside. It was painful for him to see how he was mocked. Because this situation is quite ambiguous and everyone has already made a rather radical decision. The vice captain was stripped to the waist. He was sitting on the cold cement floor with his head down. His hands were tied at the top, and traces of beatings could be seen on his body. When he felt that someone was approaching him, he lifted his head up a little and could only half open his right eye. The other was just so swollen that it would not open. Then Ian asked if the man recognized him. After that, there was a pause in the room. It took a lot of effort for the man to answer. However, not a single word was spoken. So the sorcerer began to say himself that he would never have believed that Paul would dare to attack his majesty. Then he added that the vice captain himself knew very well that he was not a spy. So why did all this happen? What was the benefit of this act? And for whom? After all, he had pledged to defend his majesty to the end, so it is not yet clear why the boy did this. So Ian came closer to the prisoner and put his right hand on his head and said that he would now try to revise the man's memories with the help of magic. But first he has to allow it. Because without the permission of failure, it is impossible to see everything completely as it was. And just a few minutes later, the sorcerer saw Paul standing in elegant clothes in a not-so-familiar room. And he has a dialogue with the captain, who, with his hands behind his back, was explaining something very intently to the young man. Then a gentleman appears behind the main man. But Ian had never seen him before in this world. The man had long blonde hair and a serious expression. However, then magic was used. It directly affected the vice captain himself, who stood calmly and did not resist. At the same time, the captain's expression showed that he understood everything perfectly well, and that he was clearly not under the influence of magic. And then Ian realized that Paul did not move of his own free will. 
certain people made him do it. And for this purpose, someone put dark magic on him. And it turns out that Sir Oliver was right that this guy could not perform such a task of his own free will. Then in these memoirs, a clear reflection of Paul appeared. And he said with his head down that he was too naive and too trusting. Because all the people around him seemed so sincere that it was simply impossible to recognize who could do evil. Because of this, you had to be a little careful, because the most terrible enemies are closest and you can simply ignore them. Ian was very shocked that the vice captain was speaking to him so freely. This had never happened before when he had used this magic. Then the silhouette of a young man smiled broadly and said that he had been waiting for Mr. Ian to come to him, and he was holding on to meet him. The sorcerer turned his gaze to the side and began to fuss a little and nervously asked the boy to wait a little while until he removed the spell. However, Paul came up to him and grabbed him by the arm and asked him how his majesty was feeling. However, Ian did not answer the question, but instead said that thanks to the vice captain's memories, he would be able to prove his innocence. But to do so, they need to find the person who decided to do it. And then Paul gritted his teeth, put his head down sadly, and said quietly that it would simply not be possible to do so. But even if he succeeds, he will still not be innocent. After all, it was he who poisoned the emperor's wine. And because of that, he will have to be punished. The sorcerer was a little angry at this pessimistic attitude, so he raised his voice and said that he could not give up, because if he did, the boy would be remembered as a potential assassin of the emperor. The boy shook his head from side to side and replied that he did not care. After all, he had sworn to protect the imperial family, therefore it was impossible to simply forget about what had happened. Paul went on to suggest that if a criminal goes against his majesty, it means that he is also going against the successive prince. And the situation with the vice captain may be just the beginning. And to his great regret, it may not be the end. That's why he doesn't want to be a danger to the crown anymore. After listening carefully, Ian asked the following question. What is this young man trying to do now? However, the vice captain did not answer the question, but instead asked if Ian could tell his majesty and Captain Oliver. His apologies and gratitude. Immediately after these words, Paul smiled broadly. And finally, he added that it was the last thing he could do to protect his majesty. Then the boy began to walk directly toward the sorcerer, asking him to protect the prince. And as he got closer, Paul stretched his arms forward, and he pushed Ian back hard, the sorcerer was, to put it mildly, shocked by what had happened. At the same time, the young man was standing in the same place, smiling sweetly to himself. After all, he knew that a consistent prince could definitely bring light to this empire. When Ian returned to prison, it took him a few seconds to come to his senses. Then he turned his attention to Paul's body, which still didn't look good, and he was still hung by his arms. In order not to waste precious time, the sorcerer decided to use the magic of undo, and he waited a few seconds for something to change. However, after nothing happened, the man realized that the magic had not worked, and this made him very worried and nervous. The boy frantically asked the vice captain to hold on a little longer because he was about to break the spell, and the guy will no longer need to suffer like this because he is really not guilty of anything. However, the vice captain showed no signs. He did not respond to Ian's voice. He just stayed in the same position and did not make any movements. The sorcerer noticed this and knelt down in front of the boy. At that time, Sir Oliver lit a lamp in his mansion and waited anxiously for Ian. A black-haired guy was sitting on a small sofa in front of a desk with a light on it, and next to him was his sword. In his mind, he was running through various solutions to the problem that was now looming over their empire. However, these thoughts were interrupted by a strange knocking sound he heard from the courtyard. So he quickly jumped to his feet, picked up his sword, and began to look around. However, a voice that sounded through the door at that time calmed the guy down, telling him that it was Ian Page who had come to see him. The captain quickly went to the front door and opened it. He saw Mr. Ian, dressed in a long blue cloak, standing in the rain, waiting for someone to open the door. However, he did not put a hood over his head, and all the water ran down his face. You could see the sadness and disappointment in his expression. When he entered the room, he stopped near the door. The sorcerer put his head down and stood silently. Instead, the captain began to ask if the man had been able to meet with Paul and asked him to tell him how he was feeling. 
The captain just didn't stop for a second. He went on and on asking questions. However, Ian, with his head bowed, began to say sadly that Sir Paul Rance, he died today in a prison cell. Upon hearing this information, the black-haired gentleman froze in place with a shocked expression and a wide-open mouth. The man did not expect this to be the outcome of this situation, because in his mind, everything was different. Then he sadly drew his eyebrows together and asked, What? When Oliver finally came to fully understand what had happened, he almost fainted from the fact that he could not do anything in this situation. In order to stay on his feet, he had to go to the table and lean on it with one hand. At that time, his head began to hurt too much. A few minutes later, the captain began to recall that he and Paul had met in the north at an orphanage run by the Raywood family. He was always a good child who looked out for others. Since he was very young, he liked to take care of others, and he also had a very good heart. That's why Oliver's father immediately recognized the boy's talent for fencing. And it was from that very moment that they both trained. And that's how their childhood was spent. Then the captain leaned his head on his hand and said that this young man was his best friend, who constantly supported him and confidently went forward. Because of this, he did not deserve to die like this. At this point, Ian decided to announce that he had managed to see the vice captain's memories before he died. Because they have certain facts that can help them. These words caught the attention of the black-haired boy. He broke away from his memories. He looked at the sorcerer carefully to get a detailed answer. Then he came a few steps closer and asked if the man had learned anything. Ian began to tell him that a couple of days ago he had been found by the captain of the first night squad, Sir Domphil. Someone together with this man used black magic on the vice captain. It is not yet known why they did it, and who the man was, because the sorcerer had never seen him before. Sir Oliver was surprised to hear that Sir Dom Philip was involved, and that there might still be black magic in the Empire, which everyone is trying so hard to exterminate by all possible means. Then the black-haired boy asked the question about finding out who it was. The sorcerer said that he did not know, but all he remembered was a man with long hair and a pale face. The thought flashed through my mind that even in his past life, the sorcerer had never met this gentleman. Therefore, I had to work hard to find out everything about him and what he was up to. But what they do know for sure is that Sir Domphil is involved in this case, as is an unknown high-class sorcerer. Did the captain specify how high-class? Ian said that he tried to use purification magic on the vice-captain, but it didn't work, although this has never happened in his practice. And a second later, he added that the sorcerer was higher than Ian in level. And this could bring them a lot of trouble, because it is not yet known how to deal with him. However, the sorcerer has one guess who the gentleman might be, but he is not sure. And it is not known whether someone else is helping them or not. Therefore, a more detailed investigation is needed. The captain was very nervous about this, so he began to shout loudly that how dangerous was this unknown person if his magic was greater than Ian's? And if he falls under the influence of his black magic, then this empire will definitely come to an end. The sorcerer did not react to the words and reaction of his interlocutor because he realized that these were just emotions that needed to be released outside. So he began to slowly take something out of his inner pocket. And when he did so, a chain with a small purple stone appeared in his palm. The man showed this jewel to Sir Oliver. Seeing him, the captain calmed down a bit and said in a more or less calm tone that he had given this chain to Ian six years ago after one of his training sessions. The sorcerer said that, according to Oliver, it had belonged to the Empress at the time and was imbued with a head-clearing magic. However, everything is not as simple as it seems at first glance. After all, there is a very expensive and valuable stone in this chain called the Eye of the Dragon, and it can protect against the effects of black magic, which goes beyond the eighth grade. Sir Oliver said, smiling, that it was clear that this thing was very amazing, and if the sorcerer keeps it to himself, it's black magic. However, he did not have time to finish, because the interlocutor began to shake his head from side to side, without confirming these words. The man was still upset by what he had seen today. The black-haired gentleman froze in place, his mouth wide open, not understanding what this gesture meant, and what they should do next to prevent things from getting even worse. Ian went on to say that not many people know about such ancient magic, and now it's just the two of them. For others, it's just an ordinary piece of jewelry that everyone wears now.
The sorcerer took a few steps toward the interlocutor and asked him if he could promise not to tell anyone what Ian would tell him next. The black-haired man did not yet understand what they would be talking about, but he still promised to fulfill this agreement, because they had no other option at the moment. And then Ian began to tell in detail what had come to his mind, and the captain listened attentively because from now on they were allies who would fight this evil, because no one else can do it. And if someone does find out, it could be life-threatening, because the Empire is facing quite difficult times. Some of the facts surprised the black-haired gentleman. They had to think carefully about all their steps, so as not to make a mistake and suffer any further losses. That evening, the downpour simply did not stop. Everything around was turned into a bath of water and mud. In one of the mansions, a few windows still had lights on at this late hour. It turns out that this was the mansion where Rangnar lived. He was sitting on one of his sofas in his room, reading the news that Paul Rance had died in prison. Next, Sir Dom Phil entered the room. He hid his hands behind his back and also learned of the news. There was an awkward pause between the two men, which lasted only a few minutes. The prince turned his head in the opposite direction and replied that he understood. After all, they are just starting their business, and this does not affect the course of their plan. After a few minutes of silence, Sir Domphil said that he had managed to find out that one mouse had been in the deceased's cell. It could have sniffed out something for itself. That's why the captain of the first squad of knights thinks that the gentleman managed to find out that black magic was cast on the fields. Rangar replied that this was definitely the case. That's why they can't do anything about it. After all, Ian Page doesn't know about the Draconian yet. Then he can only suspect and try not to fall under the influence of black magic. And even though Haver, with his fifth grade, could not influence Ian, who is sixth grade, Mr. Avantis is a much greater sorcerer. And by human standards, he's an eighth grade wizard. Of course, his powers have not yet been restored, but even in this state, he is stronger than Ian. The sorcerer must have realized this by now, that there is someone stronger than him. Domphil looked down and asked Ragnar if he was afraid that the gentleman would run away with his tail between his legs. What would they have to do then? The prince put his foot on his leg and took one sip of tea and began to smile broadly, saying that this gentleman was not such a man. After all, his path was too difficult to retreat. However, a minute later, the blonde man said that he did not know what the man might really be thinking, because he always looks quite mysterious and it is simply impossible to understand his intentions. And six years ago, as soon as he came to the estate, he sided with the prince's crown. But he said that he does not serve him so it is not yet known what his plans are for the future. Looking at his reflection in the cup of tea, Ragnar said that he felt that this sorcerer was hiding a lot, and that he knows much more about him than he can imagine. The guy went on to add that he sometimes has the feeling that they have known each other for a long time. But one of them remembers it well, and the other has no memories left in his head. After these assumptions, the prince put his cup on the table and, holding his chin, began to look at one corner of the room, saying that for now they would just watch Ian. The next morning, the sorcerer was already at his workplace, giving orders to his subordinates. He asked one of them to send a letter to Lord Pyrrhic in the West, and he had to do it as soon as possible. He asked the other about the letter to Lord Mogrian. The subordinate, bowing slightly, replied that he had received a report that it would arrive soon. He had sent a reliable messenger who could be trusted. After listening carefully to this answer, Ian said that at this point he understood everything. However, his mind was racing with different thoughts about what he needed to do next to investigate. Then Ian handed the same piece of paper to the same assistant and asked him to take it. It turned out that it was a pass issued in the name of a member of the Merchants Guild. He added that the gentleman could disguise himself as a merchant and leave the capital. Finally, he asked if the gentleman understood what the sorcerer meant. When all the things are packed, at sunset they will have to gather all the maids and his mother and go to Mogrian's estate in the north. By this time, the Lord would have received a message from Ian, and he would be happy to receive them for a while. The assistant listened to everything and said that he understood all the instructions. After that, the mother entered the room with slow steps, very upset and confused by the decision her son had made and that they would have to part again. The sorcerer did not like this decision himself, but for the moment, it was the best one, because he wouldn't have to worry about his family being so close to the enemy. 
However, the woman wanted to find out more about what was going on and why they all had to leave their home so suddenly and go to an unknown place and for what purpose. The sorcerer was already upset that he had to make such a decision, and now his mother was asking such questions. However, he decided to clarify the situation a little and said that the capital was in danger. He said that he had already sent a letter to the province of Mogriana and that the Lord would help them. The woman would not like this decision, so she drew her eyebrows together and angrily began to say that how could she leave without him, because if he stays, then she will also stay. The sorcerer had to come closer to his mother, take her by both hands, and looking her in the eye said that she shouldn't worry so much because he was an adult. And besides, he is a sorcerer who can protect himself from any enemy. So there is no point in worrying so much. You need to calmly fulfill the request of your son, who will be worried about his family. However, these words did not really calm the woman down. She was still very upset that she would have to leave. Therefore, she emphasized that the boy was only, actually, 18 years old, and he was her only son. Then she asked why the boyfriend was always doing something strange. After all, she simply can't stand to watch him put himself in danger anymore. Ian simply could not stand the pressure. So he shouted loudly to his mother. He already had a lot of problems in his head that needed to be solved, and now she was pushing him around instead of silently fulfilling his request. Only then did the lady calm down. She stopped talking incessantly and just stood there with her eyes and mouth wide open because her son had never raised his voice to her. After that, he controlled his emotions and in a calmer voice asked his mother to trust him because he was doing all this for a reason. Then he came even closer to his mother, took her shoulders with both hands and explained that if something went wrong, they could get hurt. And that was the last thing he wanted in this outcome. Tears began to form in the woman's eyes, because somewhere deep inside she knew what she had to do because of what her son was asking her to do, but her mind said that she could not leave him alone. After this conversation, the alchemist entered the room and Ian addressed him by name and said that he would rely on him. Therefore, he should protect his mother as best he could. And then he added that if he suddenly asked where his mother was, she should never answer, because it could do them all a lot of harm. And he said that as soon as the time was right, he would send a letter to Lord Mogrian himself, informing him that all the trouble was over and he could return home. The alchemist listened and said that he would do his best. Suddenly, the alchemist's son interrupted the conversation and, putting his hand on his heart, turned to the captain as he called Ian and said that he would stay with him. Then the young man smiled sweetly and said that he did not know what was really going on. But he might be useful at some point and he asked the sorcerer how his right hand was. Ian smiled back and thanked Douglas for his bravery and for offering his help, but it was more dangerous than he thought, so he should leave. Finally, he added that he did not want the boy to fall into the hands of this stranger. After all, it is not yet known what he might be capable of. When everyone finally gathered in the hall, the sorcerer came to the center and said that when everyone left the estate, he would erase part of his memory so that he would forget where he was sending them. Then he said that they should remember what he asked them to do and where he sent them. He hopes for their cooperation, because if things don't go according to plan, there could be very bad consequences. All of them bowed to their master as a sign of their obedience, but at the same time, they did not understand what would happen to them and whether they would ever be able to return. At this time, Ian's mother was also very upset and confused about what was coming. But there was an alchemist standing next to her who gently put his arm around her shoulders. When everyone finally left the room and began to go to the places the sorcerer told them to go, Ian was left alone in the room and stood in one place for several minutes. He himself was very sad that this is how things were going to turn out, that he would again be forced to live a certain period of his life without his family. So in order not to make himself even more sad, he turned his gaze to the small brown box on his desk. It turned out that inside it was a chain. He carefully picked it up and put it in his right pants pocket because it could be useful, and in his left pocket, he had a drink and a small flask. A few hours later, when the estate was completely empty, a servant came to the prince and said that the crown prince was spending all his time in the castle, and according to his personal maids, he was not feeling well. His majesty received proper treatment and is now in stable condition, but still unconscious. And even if he wakes up, 
he will have to deal with the many consequences of the poisoning. Ragnar said, rubbing his beard, that the emperor had been holding on for too long, and if his father got better, it could spoil their plan. Domphil was also present in the room, and when he heard this suggestion, he said that he would ask one of the alchemists for help. After all, in this situation, they need to take certain measures, because if they don't, the consequences can be very dire, and then they will have to deal with it even more. And many aristocrats doubt Prince Hayden. They believe that in such critical situations as this, he will not be able to adequately take over the reins of government. The Second Knight's squad is being interrogated. Sir Oliver Raywood is personally overseeing this. The leader, hearing this news, said that everything is going smoothly. So they can just wait until the throne comes to Ragnar. The prince thought that it looked rather strange that Ian Page was not using anything. He would hardly just wait. So he must have already planned something. Suddenly, this conversation was interrupted by a voice addressing his majesty, or rather Ragnar. Everyone turned their heads sharply in the direction of the voice. After all, they did not expect anyone to appear here now. Domphil was a little angry because he had warned everyone before the meeting not to be disturbed. But anyway, in order not to waste any more time on the showdown, he asked what news he had brought. And then the young man without taking off the hood of his burgundy cloak, said that Ian Page was now heading towards the imperial estate. Everyone present was very surprised by this news. They did not expect this man to act so quickly. And they need to immediately take certain actions that they will need to take. Ragnar stood with his eyes closed for a few minutes, thinking about everything, and then said that it was better to end the discussion for today and for everyone to go to their hiding places, because it would be better if he did not see them together. Then the prince turned to Mr. Avantis and asked him to erase the traces of his presence here and leave as soon as possible, because it would be better at this moment. The blonde man, holding the chair rail with both hands, calmly agreed to do it because they really didn't need any new problems right now. At this time, Ian was approaching the door of the room with slow but steady steps. He needed to get as much information as possible during this meeting. One of the guards standing at the entrance addressed his majesty and informed him that Ian Page had arrived. Rashnar replied that the man could go inside. As soon as the guest entered, the prince looked at him and said that they had not seen each other for a long time. However, he wondered why the gentleman decided to visit him without any warning. After all, such a respectable person as the owner of the tower, Ian Page, always gave advance notice of his visits. You could see by the sorcerer's face that he was very irritated and could barely keep it together. Ragnar went on to emphasize that they met today for the first time since Havert's execution, as there was no occasion for it. So the guy continued his speech and added that he was sure the gentleman knew that a lot of terrible things had happened during that time. Then the prince closed his eyes, made a grimace, and said that he couldn't even believe that his father had to go through such a thing. He was also very annoyed that they found the culprit too late. A second later, the mood changed, and the guy said that he was very curious why Ian came to him in such a difficult time. The sorcerer raised his eyebrows and replied that he was very interested in what Ragnar was going to do next. After all, it might coincide with his plans. The prince replied that he did not understand what he was talking about. Ian walked over to the other man and said that Paul Rance had fallen under the influence of dark magic and it was all because of Ragnar's meeting with the captain of the first detachment of the royal knights, Domphil. The sorcerer went on to say that he knew that the leader of the Order of the Dragons was involved in this case, and all this time Ragnar was personally with them. As the sorcerer approached him, he said that he understood what the fifth prince was planning to do, something very terrible to the empire and the imperial family. After listening attentively, the young man put his hands to his sides and said with a wide smile that it was all nonsense. And Ian doesn't even have any proof. After all, if Paul Rance was under the influence of black magic, doesn't the sorcerer need to find out who cast it and deal with them? When he received no answer, the young man said that he had never heard of this order of the dragon. Therefore, the sorcerer had nothing to do here. He had just wasted his time. Then the prince said that how could he unite with them if all his premises were controlled by the ivory tower? And because of his father's condition, he never left the castle at all. And as the owner of the tower, he should know this better than anyone. Because of this, Ian immediately turned to the prince and asked if he could use magic to detect lies. 
Without waiting for an answer, the sorcerer began to walk toward the interlocutor again, saying that it was already clear that the boy's words were not true. For he knew exactly about the Order of the Dragon, and he personally knows a sorcerer who is a master of black magic, and he is the leader of the Order. Hearing this assumption, the prince clarified that the sorcerer had really come to this conclusion. Ian did not understand what the boy meant, so he stood silently and waited for him to continue. Ragnar folded his arms across his chest and began to laugh loudly throughout the room, saying that the sorcerer was dumber than he thought. Then the prince approached the sorcerer's eyes and asked him a question about what the man would do next. Did he think the prince would be afraid and run away? The next question was whether Ian Page had any proof of what he was saying, or is it just empty talk? Then the young man smiled slyly and said that the culprit of his father's poisoning was dead and the sorcerer was even able to assure himself of this involvement. Paul Rance is dead, and this is how he paid for his sins. And it looks very strange that Ian came to the prince with his accusations. And at the end of his speech, the guy addressed Ian Page by name and said that he had lost, but he still had a choice. Therefore, the boy then turned to Mr. Evantus, who very quickly appeared in the room after his name was called. Feeling the presence of another gentleman, Ian quickly turned his head back to see who had joined them. And when the sorcerer managed to see him properly, he realized that this was the man he had seen in Paul's memories. While Ian was looking at him, the leader began to smile broadly because he was really enjoying it. That this is how everyone looks at him who sees him for the first time. However, not everything will end as smoothly as it began. The Dragonian had already used black magic on Ian to catch him. And he spoke to the boy, telling him that his coming here had made their task a hundred times easier. Then the gentleman began to move toward the sorcerer, saying that he had noticed that the man had been wearing this cloak for a long time. And as he approached him, he said that he never thought he would see it again. And then Ian realized that this man was a follower of dragons, a dragonian. He wanted something from the Empire. Then the leader turned to the prince and asked if he wanted to make this gentleman his pawn. Ragnar did not hesitate to answer, so he said that they might need this sorcerer. The blonde man said he understood, so he used a little stronger magic to tie up the prisoner as best he could. And just a second later, the black spell dissolved into thin air, and Ian stood silently with his head down. Looking at the sorcerer, the prince asked the leader if everything was over or if there was still something to happen. The man replied that it was over. Ragnar emphasized that nothing had changed outwardly. The leader smilingly said that the ally looks like someone who suspects something. Therefore, to demonstrate his point, the Dragonian addressed Ian Page in a very serious tone and with a stony expression. He asked the man to kill himself. When the prince heard these words, he was surprised and asked why, and why should the prince obey such an order? And when he saw that the sorcerer had gotten a thin, sharp ice cube from somewhere and was already pointing it at his throat, he began to shout loudly for everyone to stop and wait. After these words, nothing changed. So the prince shouted the word, stop, loudly. At that moment, he was overwhelmed with excitement. And only after this word did Ian stop and stand still. And everyone in the room did the same. However, the sorcerer had already managed to pierce his neck with the thin, sharp tip of the ice pick and blood began to flow. Ragnar's face began to drip with excitement, and when he saw that his words had worked, he smiled a little and said that it was enough. Therefore, the leader closed his eyes and said that the prince could now use Ian as he pleased, and when he pleased. Immediately after saying these words, the man turned to the front door and, stepping toward it, told Ragnar that he was going to rest, and in one second he disappeared and the prince and the sorcerer were left alone. After all, a young man needs to get used to such a companion. There was an awkward pause of several minutes between them. Ian stood in one place, and Ragnar looked at him because he was very curious to see how it worked. So then he addressed Ian by name, while the man stood with his eyes down and head down, and he asked the man who the real owner was. This question was of great concern to the young man, the sorcerer began to slowly kneel down on his right knee, saying that the highest son of the empire was the fifth prince, Ragnar Greenriver. Hearing these words, the guy began to smile broadly with joy that simply overwhelmed him. After all, everything happened because he wanted it to. 
Then one of the servants entered the room, bowed low, and addressed the master, saying that he should start preparing for today's meeting. There was no time to put it off any longer. The blonde gentleman threw his head back and emphasized that he hadn't noticed that the time had come. After all, this was a ceremony in honor of Ian's appointment as owner of the tower. After that, the guy put both hands to his face and rubbed his eyes, saying that the guests shouldn't see him like that, because they might realize that it was not easy for him. The prince, who had recovered a bit, asked his assistant to help him with his clothes today, because in his condition he would not be able to do it himself, because he could not think about it. Within a few hours, guests began to gather at the estate. Those who entered the main hall grouped together in groups of several and discussed all the news that had happened recently. In one of these groups, a young man said that this was the first ceremony to be held by the new owner of the tower. A girl added that she had heard that the crown prince and the fifth prince would also be here today. In another group of two older and more respected men, there was a conversation about the need to talk about the topic that everyone was so concerned about. However, the interlocutor could not understand what the conversation was about. And then the gentleman added that they had to figure out who would take the throne next. A woman who was standing nearby added that she thought that Ian would support the crown prince. After all, they say that he has long since chosen his side. Suddenly, one blonde gentleman began to turn his head from side to side with his arms folded over his chest. His face showed the seriousness of his intentions and the words he was going to say. He then turned his attention to his interlocutors and said that Mr. Ian had recently visited the Fifth Prince and that the visit had been very long. And during it, many important things could be discussed. When everyone began to look at him in surprise, the man held his hands out to the side and emphasized that so much had happened recently. And during this crown, the prince did not show himself in the best light. While everyone was gathering in the main room, the successive prince had already dressed in his best clothes and was walking toward the people on his way to meet Ian. So he had to stop for a couple of minutes in his seat. Ian didn't notice him at the moment, because he was walking into the hall. He thought he was late and would be the last to arrive, but suddenly he heard someone calling his name behind him. He stopped and slowly turned his head. When he turned around, he noticed a blonde prince walking quickly toward him saying that they hadn't seen each other for a long time and immediately asking how Ian was doing. What did he do during this period of time? After all, a lot of time had passed since their last meeting, and he emphasized that he was very sorry that everything had happened, and as the prince approached him, he put his hand out to greet him. However, Ian pushed his hand away from him too sharply and rudely. The crown prince did not understand why his friend did this to him, because so far, this is the only person with whom he has become so friendly. This reaction confused the blonde boy, who stood in one position with his eyes low and his mouth wide open, wondering why this reaction had occurred. Then he turned his gaze to his friend and nervously repeated his name, Ian. It sounded like he was asking, Why are you doing this to me? What was the reason for this attitude? And then Ian decided not to wait for the continuation, but to take the initiative himself and put his right hand on his heart, bowed low and apologized, saying that after the ceremony he had some business to attend to. However, this did not really calm the blonde young man down. He looked in a confused way and scratched behind his ear, saying that he understood everything. But in his mind he was still thinking about what had happened so he asked if they could meet some other time. However, the sorcerer did not have time to give any answer because someone behind him addressed him as the owner of the tower, and the man turned his head back in response. It turned out that it was one of the estate's employees who had already opened the door and pointed to the inside of the room and invited the man to enter as everyone was waiting for him. Ian slowly turned completely toward the door and began to walk hurriedly toward the door and an awkward silence fell in the room, in which the prince-in-waiting was left standing alone. He stood silently and looked after his friend, who didn't even want to meet him normally and have a conversation as he had before, and he didn't know what to do to restore the previous attitude. The blonde boy was very sad that this was the way things were going, and at that time he began to think about what could have caused this development of events because nothing seemed to have happened abruptly. In a matter of seconds, Ian was already out to his guests and addressing them and thanking them for being here. 
Today is a very important day for him and he is glad that they share it with him. And he began to emphasize that their empire is now undergoing many trials. Because of the threat to the life of their emperor, he cannot fully assume all the possibilities of ruling. So the time has come to make a very important decision. And probably everyone has already guessed what Ian is talking about. That's why the people present were a little tense and wary. Because this is a rather serious matter and the future of the empire depends on it. Then the tower owner looked down and added that they needed to get stronger. After all, their enemies are waiting for the right moment to attack. But at the same time, many ordinary people are afraid of the outbreak of war. When the Empire is in such a terrible situation, an important decision needs to be made about who will become the next ruler and take on all the responsibilities and make important and useful decisions. Then Ian turned his gaze to the people in the room and said that this person must be worthy of this place because they don't need anyone else here because they are already at a disadvantage. A second later, he added that they needed a strong man who could restore the prosperity of their empire. And he would settle the problems with the three neighbors who were just waiting to attack and take over their lands. The person who will return the Green River Empire to the pedestal of history must also take this position, and it must also be a person who has the right to wear the crown by birthright and human factors. And at the end of his speech, the man emphasized that he is the owner of the ivory tower, Ian Page. And right now, he wants to support the fifth prince, Ragnar Green River, as a potential ruler of this empire. Everyone present was shocked, to put it mildly, by what he said, because none of them expected to hear this particular candidate, because they were sure that he would support a completely different side, namely, the crown prince. This statement surprised even the most consistent prince. This could be seen in his reaction. He looked up sharply at Ian and opened his eyes and mouth wide. The young man also thought that the sorcerer would support him. But Ragnar's reaction showed that for some reason he was not surprised that his name was called. He folded his arms across his chest and began to smile slyly because he knew what this could mean for him. Then the consistent prince abruptly jumped to his feet and stomped his foot loudly and addressed Ian, demanding that he explain his decision. And why is he behaving this way now and why has his attitude toward him changed so much? Without waiting for an answer, the blonde boy ran up to the sorcerer and grabbed his cloak and began to shake him, demanding to explain everything. He did not expect his former friend to do this to him. The young prince could not understand why they did this to him and why. He was so angry that he was out of his mind. No matter how hard he tried to control his emotions, he could not do so. But Ian still hadn't said a word. He just looked silently into the eyes of his interlocutor, who continued to rub him while holding his cloak and all those present watched what was happening around them. The prince's emotions overwhelmed him, so he swung and clenched his right hand into a fist and hit Ian right in the face with it, and it was so hard and unexpected that the victim took a few steps back to stay on his feet. However, he failed to do so and kept falling to the floor, but the prince was already being held by two guards who were simultaneously trying to calm him down and asking him to leave the room so as not to cause further trouble. At this time, a red mark from the blow had already appeared on one of Ian's cheeks. As he rubbed it, he looked at the prince, who still hadn't calmed down. His aides tried to take him out to calm him down, but there was no way the blonde man could do that. The longer he looked at Ian, the more anger he felt at the way he had treated him at such an important event. After that, everyone went home and the prince went to his room, where he took off his clothes and lay down on his bed to rest a bit and think about everything in a calm state. Staring at the ceiling with a blank stare, the man could not understand why everything had happened this way. After all, the Empire already had a lot of problems, and now this was added to the mix. The blonde man did not understand what to do next. Suddenly, someone's black shadow appeared on the balcony, approaching the room. The prince looked up to see who it was and what this person wanted from him. After all, he wanted to be alone so badly. The silhouette came closer to the door and quietly addressed his majesty, saying that he was Oliver and asked him to open the door so that he could go inside. The consistent prince hearing these words stood up abruptly and was surprised that the captain had come to him. After all, he clearly did not expect to see him here. Plus, it was still unknown what he wanted at such a late hour. So he opened the door and immediately asked what the man was doing here. Shouldn't he be at home on probation? 
Having asked these questions, the blonde gentleman immediately wanted to hear the answer. Instead, Oliver quickly entered the room and paced around the perimeter, saying that he didn't have time to explain, because the prince had to get ready immediately, dress warmly, because they had to leave. The consistent prince froze in his tracks at the words he heard and asked what the captain was talking about, where did he need to go and why. But Oliver opened the door to the closet and told them that there was a secret exit through which they would leave the mansion without being seen by the guards. Therefore, they must leave immediately to avoid any problems. The man went on to explain that this exit was made for emergency situations, exactly like the one that happened at the meeting today. As he handed over the blue cloak, Oliver added that the knights of the second imperial detachment were already waiting for the prince. While the blonde was shocked by what was happening, the captain had to put his cloak on him and tie it on top. At this time, the prince repeated the words, knights of the second squad, out loud. So far, he did not understand what was happening. After that, Oliver slowly got down on one knee and stretched out his right hand to the prince and told him that they needed to leave and it should be done as soon as possible. The prince still could not understand what was going on and whether he should accept the offer. After all, his situation was not the best, and he needed to make the best decisions. He stood there silently for a few minutes, trying to think things through. But no matter how hard he tried, he was not very good at it at this late hour after such an exhausting day. So all he had to do was accept the offer. A few hours later, he and Oliver were walking through the forest in long, dark cloaks so that no one could recognize them. When they came to one of the glades, people addressed the blonde man, calling him Majesty. And this made him stand still again with his mouth wide open in amazement, for he simply could not believe his eyes. It turned out that they were people from the second squad of knights who were holding beautiful horses next to them. One young man who was standing a little ahead of them happily emphasized that they were waiting for them, and so he offered to come closer. The consistent prince, lowering his hood from his head, was still looking at the people who met him in surprise. He didn't believe that anyone would still support him after what had happened. Having recovered a little and mastered his emotions, the prince turned his head to the captain and asked him what was going on, and why are all these people here now? What are they here for? Oliver, with a serious expression on his face, said that the estate and the capital are now very dangerous, and that is why they all moved here to save their lives and plan their further actions. The captain went on to say that they were going to transfer the crown prince to Pierre's province for his safety. The blonde was shocked by the new information, because he had not yet recovered from the previous one, when a new trouble knocked on the door. Having processed the information, the prince asked if it would really be the province of Pierrick. After all, it seems to him that it was in this place that Ian Page became a sorcerer. Therefore, a logical question arises. What would he do there? And why did they choose this particular place? Olivier decided not to waste time talking, so he said that he would explain everything on the way. He asked his majesty to follow him. But even this did not fully convince the prince, so he held his hands out to the sides and stopped everyone asked them to wait, and said that if they went against the order and abandoned their actions, they could be seriously punished. And because of this, they could be accused of treason and even executed. This course of events was clearly not to the prince's liking, as he was afraid that innocent people might suffer because of it. The captain decided to calm his majesty down again and asked him who had given the order. This question baffled the prince, for he could not understand what it was all about. Instead, Oliver replied that they were knights of the consistent prince, and they follow only his orders. Therefore, they have no business following the orders of a man to whom they are in no way related. The captain went on to say that they were not going to do anything that would harm the prince and his father. After all, the purpose of their lives is to protect them from all the evil that will come their way, and they will fight for them to the very end. At these words, the knights knelt down on one knee and pressed their hands to their hearts, bowing their heads down. Oliver then asked that they be given the opportunity to demonstrate their loyalty. After all, he would never know about it if he did not give them a chance. The consistent prince listened attentively. These words touched him a little bit, because everything that had happened to him over the past few days was just terrible. He had never felt like this in his life, especially when his father is in this situation. 
but during these days he received so much different information that he did not have time to think about each of them. And because of this, he could not rest properly, and so his head hurt. The prince held it for a few minutes and looked down to relax his muscles. Then he agreed to all the proposals. But he asked them to tell him everything in detail and explain what was going on here. After all, he would not be able to figure it out on his own, no matter how much he wanted to. The captain was very pleased that his majesty agreed to his request, and he realized that he would do anything to save him and keep him safe. In the morning, everything started as usual at the estate. Everyone went about their duties and no one noticed anything strange. However, a few hours later, the head of security entered Ragnar's room and addressed him, saying that they had a problem that no one could have foreseen. The appointed chief looked at the guard and asked him what had happened. The guard quickly replied that the successive prince had disappeared at dawn and that a second group of knights had fled with him. Ragnar did not like the news and was even a little angry. This could be seen in the way he drew his eyebrows together. Then the man asked if they had already found out where the fugitives might be. The officer put his hands behind his back and said in a serious tone that all they knew so far was that the fugitives had gone east. But they are still investigating to find out more information about their whereabouts. And then he added that if the Lord wanted, he could send a detachment after them, which would have time to catch up with them. Ragnar folded his arms across his chest and said that there was no need. After all, he already knew that these people were heading to the province of Pierik. The road there is dangerous and hides many monsters. They can easily overcome it with Captain Oliver and the second group of knights. That's why they need to be left alone. Then Ragnar turned his gaze to Ian and said that this cunning sorcerer knew they could cast black magic on him and hid this woman somewhere but for a long time they have not been able to find out where she is. At this point, Ian stood quietly and looked at everyone present with a blank stare. Lately, he had not been like himself in the past. He would never have kept silent in such a situation. And the appointee realized that Avantis's magic had worked. And it turns out that Ian had erased his memories earlier, so that they would not recognize themselves through him. The assistant couldn't understand why the gentleman would want to have a tower owner because she was just an ordinary woman who was of very little use. So he didn't see any point in looking for her when they had so many problems. Ragnar looked down and said that this woman was Ian's weak point, and it is very strange that he knew that black magic would be cast on him and came anyway, and it's not all for nothing, he probably has something else in store for them. And that is why it is necessary to find Ms. Vanessa so that she can tell us what her son is up to. The assistant listened attentively, put his hand on his heart and bowed slightly, saying that he would immediately take care of this issue so that there would be one less problem. After that, the room fell silent. No one said a word for several minutes. Everyone was deep in thought, frozen in their comfortable positions. Suddenly, a smile broke out in Ragnar's voice. He turned his gaze to the sorcerer, who had been giving him trouble lately for making this decision earlier. Because of this, he can't stop worrying that everything is going so smoothly. And he asked Ian Page out loud what he was up to. Why did he come here? What does he want to get? A few hours later, the prince in succession and the second group of knights arrived in the province of Pierrick, where they began to lay out their belongings to take a little rest from such a long journey. However, the prince could not realize that he had escaped from the estate and now had to take care of himself. But it was for moments like this that Oliver was always with him, keeping his spirits up and encouraging him. The two newly arrived men were joined on the right side by two young men who, while still walking, decided to find out if the guests were okay and if they needed anything. The prince smiled sincerely and replied that they were doing well, and then apologized for the unexpected visit. He added that he would never forget their kindness and the way they were received here. One of the locals put his hand over his heart and closed his eyes, saying that he was honored to have such distinguished guests, and he would try to continue to receive them well. Then the man opened his eyes and with a serious expression began to tell me that he was very surprised when he received the letter from Mr. Ian. He did not expect to be able to help such an important person. The man also emphasized that what happened to the emperor was simply terrible, but later added that he hoped for the best. Hearing these words about his father, the prince was a little upset that he could not help his family member in this case. 
The two local men then bowed and informed him that at Ian Page's request, they would be working with the Crown Prince from now on. And so he need not worry because their safety would be given maximum attention. Immediately after the words were spoken, the two turned around and began walking in the opposite direction. And the Prince and Oliver remained in the same place, calmly watching their new allies. As soon as they had moved a sufficient distance away, the prince, smiling sweetly, emphasized that Lord Pierrick was a very good man. He has a very open and loyal soul, which is very difficult to find in their world. Then the blond man turned his gaze to the captain and asked him if they were related in any way, and the young man immediately replied that he was his very distant uncle, and it was he who taught him fencing in his childhood. After listening to all this carefully, the consistent prince turned his gaze forward and said that Ian was a very good planner, because he had thought of everything, even to the smallest detail. The next thing the blonde man asked Oliver was whether Ian had really been subjected to black magic. After all, it's just hard to believe that such a powerful man could so easily submit to such bad people. Without waiting for an answer, the young man continued to talk about whether the sorcerer had simply decided to go over to the side of the fifth prince, whom he had hated until recently. A few minutes later, the blonde man began to recall that since childhood, Ragnar had been better than him at everything. Then he emphasized that he was sorry to admit it, but it was true. Oliver had no choice but to listen silently to everything the prince said, and only then speak out on a particular issue that he could cover from his point of view. After thinking it over, Oliver said that this is simply not possible so they don't need to worry about that right now, but instead need to think about what they need to do right now. And he began to tell me that about six years ago, Mr. Ian had told him something during a regular training session, and it was very important and valuable information. And so he said that he would never in his life take the side of the fifth prince. He will do everything possible and impossible to never work with this man. So the captain, smiling broadly, asked the prince to trust the sorcerer. After all, he had thought of everything, and in order for everything to come true, time had to pass. One rainy evening, Ian came to Oliver and told him what he had guessed. The captain didn't believe him at first, so he asked him to tell him everything again, to make it clearer. And then the sorcerer repeated that when he met Ragnar, he would cast black magic on him. And the prince-in-waiting will try to stop him from going there, so he is the one who must not know about it. Oliver did not like this plan and shouted angrily that it was very dangerous and the man might not return from this meeting. But they really needed him, so they shouldn't do it. Ian, on the other hand, was surprisingly calm, and so he said in a quiet tone that Ragnar would not kill him right away because he needed him alive to carry out his dirty plans. Then Ian put his hand on his heart and said that as the owner of the tower and a sixth-level sorcerer, he is respected by everyone and can influence politics and diplomacy in this way. And Ragnar definitely wants to use this for his own purposes. Then the man added that, of course, he would not want to fall under the influence of this person again. But this is the only way he can find out what this person is up to and make certain decisions to stop him in time. So the sorcerer asked that as soon as he betrayed the consistent prince, Oliver would have to send him to Lord Pyrrhic, and he would warn him in a letter beforehand. The captain began to think that they would need a sorcerer who could cast a spell on Ian. But there is no wizard in the capital whom they can trust. Ian smiled sincerely and said that there was indeed one such wizard. And Ragnar will never be able to think of him in his life. He is a very loyal and faithful sorcerer who will definitely be able to help. At this time, the daughter of the chief of the empire was sitting by his bedside, sadly reflecting on what had been happening to their family lately. She didn't like it at all, because she couldn't do anything about it on her own. After the poisoning, my father still lay unconscious in his bed. All the talented doctors in the capital came to try to help him, but it had no effect. And the man continued to lie in the same position for more than a week. While the daughter was sitting next to him, she began to tell her father that Mr. Ian had sided with the fifth prince and that the successor prince had to leave the estate to save his life and Ragnar was already preparing to take over the throne and dethrone his brother. The girl was very upset by this development, but there was nothing she could do. The young lady began to cry out of powerlessness, and at the same time thought about what she could do to resolve the issue, and who could she trust in the capital? Who would not betray her? 
At that moment, she remembered when she came to Ian for help, and he seemed like a very good person, so she could not believe that those words could be a lie. It pains her to admit it, but even at such a time she wants to believe this person. And this upset her even more, so she began to cry even more and harder. After a few minutes, she looked up at her father and said to him that now was the time to wake up. After all, he had to help her understand what was happening around her. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. The girl wiped her tears and asked who it was. And the assistant said that it was Kevin. And the young lady allowed him to come inside. When the boy entered the room, the princess was already waiting for him near the door. She folded her arms in front of her and asked him what was wrong. Why did he come here? Is there really any news from the consistent prince? The assistant was a little confused by the number of questions. So he did not know whether he should answer them or just report the information he had come to her with. And I decided to do what I had originally planned, and that's why he asked if they could talk in private, because what he was going to tell them was quite secret. As soon as they moved to another room where there was no one else, the girl began to look at Kevin as if to say, come on, tell me something quickly. And the guy was still looking around to make sure there was no one else here. And when he realized this, he carefully took a small brown box out of his pocket and handed it to the princess, asking her to take it because it should belong to her. The young lady put her hands on the front and looked at the box and asked the assistant a question to find out what it was and who sent it to her. And why does she need this thing? Kevin again asked the princess to take the item and told her that a few days ago the owner of the tower had asked him to give the box to her as soon as strange things started happening in the estate. As soon as she took the thing in her hands, she asked in surprise whether Mr. Ian had given it to her. But the assistant quickly put his index finger to his mustache to demonstrate that no one should know about it. After all, this should remain a secret. No one should know what just happened and that she has this thing. Ian Page himself asked for this. Then Kevin put his right hand over his heart and bowed and told the princess that he had to go. Because no one would notice them together, so that there would be no questions about it later. Immediately after the words were spoken, the young man quickly turned around and began to walk to the exit, while the princess remained standing in the same place, looking in Kevin's wake. Although he gave her enough information, she still could not understand what was going on. She needed a little time to comprehend. So she still stood there holding the box. Then the princess went to her room and sat down at the table and began to carefully open the box that Ian had given her. She was very curious to see what was inside. As soon as she opened it, she saw that there was a pendant, a small flask with some purple liquid, and a small note at the very bottom. The first thing the girl did was to get a fox, because it could explain what was happening up to now. The note was indeed addressed to the princess, and even here he emphasized that she was probably quite surprised. And since she received this letter, it means that black magic had already been cast on it. The letter goes on to say that he wrote to the young lady to ask for help, which only she can provide because he trusts her in this matter the most. This is followed by an explanation that the captain of the Second Knight Squad, Paul Rance, was also under the influence of black magic when he poisoned the emperor and the people behind it call themselves the Dragon Association. Their leader is one very powerful sorcerer who can control many people using his power. The fifth prince joined this group of people in order to take the throne for himself. Therefore, it is necessary to prove the guilt of this prince and the sect. Because if everything is left as it is, the empire will face the worst possible outcome. And it was in order to find out everything that Ian decided to become a toy in Ragnar's hands and it was in order to save many people that he decided to get involved in this scheme himself. Ian goes on to write that this pendant was given to him by someone else. It contains a spell that is more than eighth grade and can remove black magic. The princess will need to hang it on the sorcerer to dispel the effect of the black magic. Then there was an explanation that the box also contained an elixir made from the Landiora flower. Taking out this small flask, the young lady began to examine it carefully. And then I read that this elixir destroys mana in the human body. Therefore, it is very dangerous for sorcerers, and in some cases it can even lead to death. That's why Ian wrote that if the elixir didn't work, the princess should use it to kill him. After all, he can bring a lot of trouble in this state. After carefully examining the contents of the box, she went out into the hallway to go outside and get some fresh air. On her way, however, she met Ragnar, 
whom she hadn't seen for a long time with Ian walking behind. Stopping a few steps away from each other, the princess asked her brother if he was going to visit his father, or if he was just taking a walk around the estate. Ragnar replied that it was his father as well. He is also no longer in custody, and because of this he must behave like a worthy son, who is worried about the condition and health of his family. After listening carefully, the girl looked down and sadly replied, I see. She didn't know what to say in such cases. Then the girl turned her gaze to the owner of the tower and looked him up and down and said that she hadn't seen him for a long time either. She emphasized that he had changed a bit since then, so I asked him if he was doing well. He didn't look very well. Ian first bowed to show his friendliness and that he was noticed here as well. However, the princess never heard a word in response, although she was really looking forward to it. And yet, for several minutes she stood there and looked intently at the interlocutors. And without waiting for an answer, she turned to Ragnar and asked him if she could talk to Ian for a while while her brother was visiting his father. The prince turned his gaze to the sorcerer and, even without suspecting anything, allowed this conversation to take place. After all, what could his sister do that could harm him? So finally he turned to the owner of the tower and said that as soon as the man finished his business, the prince would be waiting for him in his estate. And immediately after saying these words, he began to walk calmly to the exit. Ian and the princess remained standing in the same place, waiting for Ragnar to move away from them. A few minutes later, the princess turned to the owner of the tower and asked him to follow her. After all, they would not be having a conversation in the corridor where someone could hear. Then the young lady turned around and approached the door of one of the rooms. The sorcerer, who had no idea what was about to happen, followed her slowly and cautiously. When they entered the room, they stood silently for a few minutes looking at each other. None of them knew how to start a conversation. The princess decided to start everything first. So she first looked down and said that she missed him. Even though she knew that he would not share these feelings with her, the girl then asked him if he remembered his request. However, the man was still standing and did not understand what the girl meant by saying such things. Then the princess took a chain out of her pocket and showed it to the sorcerer, saying that she had come to return it to him and asked him to come closer so that she could put it on him. The man took a few steps in front of her without hesitation or question and bent down so that she could put the chain around her neck. The young lady began to dress her carefully because she did not want to harm her friend in any way, who is not in the best condition now. As soon as the princess finished doing this, she froze in place and waited for what would happen because she didn't know how it was going to work how she would see if something had changed. For the first few minutes, there were no changes in the sorcerer's behavior or appearance. And so the princess began to think that the chain must have lost its power. Suddenly, the fireplace inside lit up with a bright blue light, and by the look on Ian's face, one could tell that something was happening to him. He began to writhe in pain. The princess, who was watching all this, was seriously frightened, because she could not even imagine that this was how it was going to happen. Then the sorcerer fell down on the stake and began to cough loudly, and during one of these loud coughs, blood came out of his mouth, and it just didn't end. It seemed to grow. Out of fear, the princess covered her mouth with both hands. She couldn't help herself and couldn't call anyone for help either, because it had to remain a secret. Having mastered her emotions a little, the young lady knelt down before the sorcerer and asked him if he was all right and how she could help him to alleviate his suffering. At first, Ian didn't say anything but continued to cough while holding his neck and looking down. This went on for several minutes, and then he was coughing less and less, and when it seemed to be over, he was able to raise his head and look at his interlocutor to look him in the eye. And when he saw the princess in front of him, he was a little surprised. The young lady, on the contrary, was happy to be able to help her friend. She quickly moved to him, hugged him tightly, and began to say his name loudly. Ian, Ian. She just didn't expect things to turn out so well for them. Instead, the sorcerer, standing in the arms of the princess, could not understand why she was so upset. And why did she have such emotions at that moment? Then the young lady began to cry bitterly, asking her husband how he could have written her such a letter. Could she kill him? And then Ian realized why the princess had such a reaction. So he pushed her away a little and looked her in the eye and said that he knew he could trust his life to her. 
The princess hit the sorcerer and began to shout loudly and angrily, asking how he could do such a stupid thing. Since he didn't know for sure whether the chain would work, Ian looked down and replied that sometimes stupid things are the only right thing to do when there are no other options. In some cases, they can give life, which can be much better than it was before. Then the owner of the tower put his hand to the young lady's face to wipe away her tears and thanked her for believing him. After all, if not for her, terrible things could have happened. The man was overjoyed because he would now be able to do many useful things. The princess then began to wipe away her tears herself, saying that she was very happy that Ian was able to return. But she needs to get some rest because she has experienced too many emotions. So she slowly got to her feet to go to her room. But finally, she said that she had many questions for the sorcerer. I immediately asked if he had managed to find out anything. The tower owner replied that he had. He emphasized that he had not thought that this dragon association was such a large sect. Javert Leon held a rather high position, and many aristocrats with high titles are members of this community. And they all share the same opinion. Dom Philip Moret, who has served as captain of the First Imperial Knights for many decades, also became an active member of this association. Hearing this information, the princess covered her mouth with her hands because she would never in her life have thought that a man like Sir Domphil could betray the Empire by joining some strange community. Ian went on to say that the head of this community is a draconian who, as everyone thought, died 300 years ago. But in fact, he is alive and doing bad things in this world. Now he exists in human form and is an eighth-grade archmage. When they met face to face, Ian did not even expect that he had so much power. The owner of the tower then said that Mitchell Green River was able to seal the monster, but the fifth prince freed him and began to use him for his own purposes. The princess was shocked by what she heard. After all, she could not even imagine that Ragnar could get involved in such terrible things. And now much grief awaits the empire. Ian said that he thought that the fifth prince had been planning this for a very long time. After all, their goal is not only the throne and the emperor's seat. They want to start a war and conquer an entire continent. In these few days, the entire estate is under Ragnar's influence, and the consistent prince is not the only one in danger. That's why he asked not to trust anyone and to protect his father. After listening attentively, the young lady asked what the owner of the tower was going to do. What are his next steps? How will he save himself? Ian replied that he planned to stay with the fifth prince, and would continue to pretend to be under the influence of black magic. The princess was frightened by this plan. After all, it could harm her husband. The sorcerer explained that he needed to find the spell that Mitchell Green River had used to seal the draconian. And he could not find it in the library of the ivory tower, but he might be able to do it in the mansion. The princess began to think about where such papers could be stored. After all, she was constantly reading various literature that was in the estate, and perhaps she had seen it before. And then, in a matter of seconds, she remembered something and turned to Mr. Ian and said that she could show him something, but they needed to go somewhere else. Without asking anything, the wizard simply followed the young lady in silence. After all, who else but she could help him find the spell in this large estate? When they entered her room, the lady took out a large case and put it on the table. Opening it, she stood silently over it and looked at something carefully. Then she pulled out a book with a red cover and handed it to Ian. On this book was a golden ladybug. The sorcerer did not understand what it was at first, so he asked a question to clarify. The princess replied that it was a treasure that her father had given her. It's a book by Mitchell Green River, who was the first emperor to use magic, and it turns out that this book is his diary, which he kept during his lifetime. Ian did not expect to have such a valuable thing in his year. But then the young lady said that the book had a protection spell on it that no one had managed to break yet. Therefore, it is not yet known for certain what exactly is inside. The girl then said that they knew from the story that Mitchell Green River was a fifth-level sorcerer. However, the seal on the book belongs to a higher level than the story says. Therefore, perhaps it is Ian who will be able to break the spell and find out what exactly is inside. The sorcerer, holding the book in his hands, replied that he would try to do so as soon as possible. And in a matter of seconds, the man suggested that if he dropped his mana into the book and tried to cast a spell at the same time, something good might come of it. 
However, when Ian looked closely at the seal on the cover of the book, he noticed an inscription in the dragon language, and this made him freeze in one position. As it turned out, he was able to read this phrase out loud, and the book immediately opened. When the princess noticed this, she came closer to see the contents of the book with her own eyes. In order to examine it closely, they both went to the table and put the book on the table and realized that it was indeed the diary of their ancestors, because the first page had the date of the end of the war with the dragons written on it. Reading the next sentence, Ian's mouth dropped open in surprise, because what he read was both surprising and thought-provoking. After all, in this sentence, he met the name Fran, and it was painfully familiar to him. It turned out that this name belonged to his father, and the sentence said that Fran had found him that night, and he said that they would not see each other again. After all, the circumstances are such that these meetings can lead to great consequences that will later bring much grief to the Empire. The story goes on to say that the gentleman swore to protect their agreement for the rest of his life. That's why the sorcerer decided to leave his last words in dragon language. Ian decided to read this phrase again. And as soon as he said the last word, something strange began to happen around him. And it was not yet clear where it would lead. In a matter of seconds, the entire room turned into a black and white picture, with only one wizard remaining a bright color. Even the princess was colored black and white. The owner of the tower began to look around, because he did not yet understand what had happened, and he was trying to figure out what he should do next. But when he began to watch the princess, she did not move, but instead froze in the same position as before. At first, he decided to speak to her in case she would answer. Without receiving any response, the man looked around the room again and noticed that the clock had stopped. However, this did not mean anything to him yet. The next thing that caught Ian's attention was that a bright yellow light was shining through a small crack in the door. For several minutes, the man just stared at it. And then he decided that he needed to take a closer look at what was behind the door. So he walked over with quick steps and, holding the handle, began to open it. As soon as he opened the door and stepped outside, he began to look around again, because he was not familiar with the area. And so he said out loud, Where is this place? The owner of the tower did not understand what he needed to do now. Where should he go to get there? Although everything around him was so bright and beautiful, it was so alien and unknown. Taking a few steps forward, the sorcerer saw a man sitting on large stones in front of him, dressed in a long brown cloak with his eyes fixed on the ground in front of him. At first, Ian began to wonder who it could be. After all, the silhouette was unclear. Then he decided to come a little closer to talk to the gentleman. He didn't know how to address the person sitting on the stones, so he first apologized for disturbing his peace. For several minutes, the figure did not move and did not show any signs of life. However, later the man began to slowly turn in the direction of the sound. So far, only a quarter of his face and long blonde hair were visible. Ian did not hesitate and immediately decided to ask the gentleman questions about where they were and who he was. And why was he here? The man who was sitting on the stones returned his face to its previous position and said that this is a storehouse of time, a place in non-space. Out of all that was said, the phrase time vault caught the sorcerer's attention. So he repeated it out loud and waited for his interlocutor to explain what he had said in more detail. The man in the cloak said that it was difficult to explain it all in human terms. But to put it simply, this place contains all the time from all the worlds where Ian lives. This information again raised many questions for the sorcerer, and he decided to ask them right away. So he asked if the gentleman really knew him. The next step was to find out who the man was. The interlocutor first decided to answer the question of who he was. He began to say that he did have a beautiful name among people, which he would like to continue to use. So looking into the distance, the man said that he was the first sorcerer to be called the Golden Dragon. The owner of the tower stood in his seat and listened attentively so as not to miss a single word. After receiving this information, Ian began to think that the Golden Dragon was the Lord of Time from the legends he knew. After all, everyone was always talking about this creature with admiration. But the first sorcerer is the person who first learned to control magic and then the owner of the tower suggested that these two beings could be the same object. And so Ian decided to ask if the man he was talking to knew Mitchell. Without turning his head, 
The man replied that he could not even think that this man could make such a big mistake and save the life of this draconian. The gentleman went on to say that he really did not understand why Mitchell decided to take pity on him. After all, he had brought so much trouble and grief to the Empire. This creature simply did not deserve to live. However, human emotions are too difficult and can easily change. That's probably why the sorcerer did what he did to this creature. It turns out that he could not turn on a cold understanding of the situation at that moment. Suddenly, this story was stopped by Ian, who asked me to stop and explain what the gentleman was talking about, and to say how Mitchell Green River is connected to him because so far nothing is clear. The other man turned his head a little to the wizard and said with a sweet smile that they were very closely related. After all, it was he who gave Mitchell the power to defeat the Draconian. The owner of the tower then said that if all this was true, he wanted to ask one more question. And he immediately asked why the gentleman did not deal with the Draconians himself, but entrusted this matter to Mitchell. The blonde gentleman listened attentively to the question, and at first lowered his head and gazed down and began to slowly tell me that a long time ago, people had already suffered from black magic. After all, the dragon's power lies in the force that compels others to obey, and black magic was created to control this power, and you could harm yourself with it without realizing it. And it turns out that this black magic is very unstable and dangerous. After all, it destroyed people's souls, and led to an imbalance in the world. And this endless catastrophe kept happening again and again. The man went on to explain that even though he had seen terrible things, he could not intervene because dragons cannot interfere in human affairs. This rule was established at the birth of the world. So the gentleman went on to say that he did not want to sit back and watch all this horror, because all this chaos began because of the power of dragons, who did not even realize the consequences and he decided to interfere in the course of human history and thus broke the rule. And in a matter of seconds, Ian assumed that the person he was talking to could give people magic because they could fight the black. The man agreed with this assumption, but emphasized that it was not enough. After all, people needed a hero who could protect them from future disasters. And that's why the master gave his power to a man. And here it all becomes clear that this person who received the first magic is Mitchell Greenrier. The hooded man continued to say that this man was very kind and sincere, and in addition, he had imperial blood, and he cared about his people first and foremost. And it turns out that Mitchell put his life on the line to be destroyed by black magic. However, only one of his mistakes put an end to all his hard work, and that is why people are not perfect. Then the gentleman began to tell me that after interfering with the human world, he lost his memory. Therefore, he could not finish what he had started. Although he lost his memory, he still continued to travel around the world of people, and we can say that it was a rather short period of his long existence, but it will be remembered for a long time. The man went on to say that it could be considered a very short period of his long existence, but it turned out to be memorable and full of life. Then the interlocutor slowly began to remove the hood from his head and added that once he had met a beautiful girl named Vanessa. Hearing this name, the tower owner opened his mouth wide and froze in place, and the gentleman continued to tell me that she was kind and beautiful, and the time he spent with her was the best of his life, and she gave him something very important. After that, the man began to slowly turn to face Ian, saying that he missed him very much and finally called him his son with a sweet and sincere smile. However, the sorcerer was not convinced by these words, but rather enraged. So he gritted his teeth and angrily told the gentleman not to talk nonsense, because his father had died long ago. The blonde man began to explain that Fran Page had indeed died, but his soul remained here, having lost its physical shell. He added that all this time he had been waiting to meet Ian. The owner of the tower could hardly contain himself from anger. He clenched his fist and shouted that the gentleman was the last one to wait for the meeting. He immediately asked why he had left. After all, it was so hard for his mother to endure. It was painful for the gentleman to hear that his beloved was suffering so much, so he closed his eyes and calmly said that some goals are bigger than life and arise suddenly when decisions need to be made urgently. The blonde man went on to explain that over time, his memory began to return, and he realized what he had to do. Ian tried to listen to all this information carefully. When the man saw this, he said that he needed to destroy all the black magic in the world. 
Then he looked down and said that he wanted to protect the place where Vanessa and her son live. And that is why he had to leave his family. The man went on to say that his son had also had a hard time in this life, and he only wanted him to be able to experience true happiness now. Ian didn't want to talk about it at all, so he gritted his teeth and said that this was not what he had come to talk about. He said that he had come in search of power to destroy the Draconian. The blonde man looked at Ian carefully and told him that this power was already inside him. Before he left them, he had put all his power into him. Hearing this information, the owner of the tower was quite surprised. So he decided to clarify and said, The authorities? The father confidently and clearly answered yes. And then I asked my son a question about his thinking that he could understand and use the dragon language only because he was an archmage. This question really made Ian think about how it really happened, that he suddenly began to understand the dragon language and use it fluently. Why, at the time of its use, did the thought of how he might know her not even occur to him? After all, he had never met her in his life. The blonde man began to walk slowly with his bare feet toward his son with his arm outstretched, saying that he needed to awaken this power, but first he wanted to test it. In a second, an orange light began to appear around Ian, and he himself began to fall into a deep sleep that he could not control. But through the dream, he heard the phrase, the life you want but can't imagine. A few minutes later, the owner of the tower opened his eyes and found himself sitting under a large tree, leaning against it. When he began to look around, he found that he was sitting on a soft bedspread. His legs were covered with a light cape, and there was a large, loose pillow behind him. Then he began to slowly get to his feet, wondering where he was now. After all, just a few minutes ago, he was talking to Fran. While he was talking, the young man began to put away the things that were around him. But suddenly he heard a child's voice nearby, so he went to follow it. And when he came to a clearing, he noticed a little girl playing with a young blonde lady. The woman slowly turned her head back and noticed Ian standing there, silently watching them. And all she could say at first was this little phrase, ah. Then she got to her feet and began to walk toward the owner of the tower, saying, here comes their dormouse. At this time, the sorcerer could not understand what was going on here. As soon as the young lady came to Ian's side, she began to fix his bangs, saying that they rarely go on a picnic as a family, and he managed to fall asleep. She then asked if her husband thought he was taking on too much work. Without waiting for an answer, she said that she would tell her brother not to put so much pressure on her husband. The sorcerer has not yet realized what role he plays here, so I will address the woman as Her Majesty. Later, after calming down a bit, the young lady looked Ian straight in the eye and emphasized that he hadn't treated her like a princess for a long time. However, the owner of the tower still could not understand what was going on. So he asked again, how long ago? But the woman didn't hear him, because she turned back and called the little girl, telling her to run quickly to them, because her daddy had woken up. At first, the girl was sitting and looking at something in the grass. At the same time, she pretended not to hear anyone. But when she realized that her mother had said that her daddy had woken up, the girl quickly turned her head to them and began to smile joyfully and broadly. And after that, she began to run quickly to Ian with her arms wide open for a hug. And while she was running, she called out loudly to the sorcerer, calling him daddy. As soon as she got close to the man, she grabbed both his legs and began to cling to them tightly because she loved spending time with her dad so much. The owner of the tower looked down and asked a question to find out what was going on. But as it turned out, he said it all in his head. So a woman standing next to him put her hands behind her back and asked him why he was standing like that. Without waiting for an answer, she said that he could hug his daughter. At the same time, the girl continued to hug Ian's legs, looking at his face. It was only after this request that he decided to extend his arms to the young lady who had long been waiting for such a gesture from a man, so she was very pleased. When he brought her to his body, the girl gently leaned against him, putting her head on his right shoulder. These words brought tears to the owner's eyes. After all, he is now in a place where his dream is coming true, which is unlikely to happen in real life. They continued to stand in this position for a certain period of time because he was also so pleased to hug the little girl who called him daddy so tenderly. Then the illusion gradually began to dissipate, but Ian did not realize it yet. 
so he continued to stand in a position as if he were holding someone small in his arms, holding them tightly to him. It took him a few minutes to realize that everything had disappeared and that he was now next to Fran, although at first he was still looking at his hands. A blonde gentleman who was standing nearby asked Ian what his son saw in this illusion. You could tell that he was very moved by it. Then the owner of the tower came to his senses and said that he was holding a little girl who had the same color of eyes and hair as him, and she was very sweet. Immediately after that, the image of that little beautiful young lady came to mind. Her look was so childishly naive that it simply could not melt your heart. Then Ian said out loud that when they hugged, it seemed to him that her weight, her body, and her laughter, to fill in something very important in it. But so far he hadn't realized what it was, so he asked his father a question to find out if he knew anything. The blonde man listened attentively, closed his eyes slowly, and calmly and quietly replied that it was love. After all, it is one's own children who can heal those wounds that bleed. Then the father began to walk toward his son to awaken the power of the dragon in him. He added that he hoped that thanks to it, he would be able to do more than his father. And during this ritual, Fran Page's memories were passed on to Ian. As long as his figure was still in this world, the father added that he would always support his son and always love him because he had dreamed of him. The man said these words with a wide and sincere smile on his face. During this meeting, one could understand that he was a very kind man who sacrificed himself for his family. While Ian was moving into his world, he saw a picture of his pregnant mother sitting on the edge of the bed and his father kneeling in front of her, leaning against her tummy, listening intently. When the tower owner returned to his world, he was still shocked by what he had experienced. After all, he had wanted to find his father for so long, and when he did, they were forced to part ways. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his heart, and he instinctively ouched and put his hand on the spot. As soon as the princess noticed this, she immediately began to ask if he was okay. At this time, tears began to appear in the man's eyes, and he continued to stand in the same position looking at one point. The young lady did not know how she could help her friend, but in a few minutes Ian regained control of his feelings and, wiping away a few tears, said that nothing bad had happened, just something had gotten into his eye. When the man noticed that the text in the book was missing, he turned his head to the princess and asked her if she remembered what was written here. The young lady replied that she did not remember, and then she added that the page was blank, so even if she had wanted to remember, she would not have been able to. Immediately after that, she began to look at her interlocutor carefully. He continued to look at the book and answered with a short and clear, I see. At the same time, a large pile of thoughts was raging in his head that needed to be organized. But he was prevented from doing so by the princess, who immediately asked him if he had found a way to destroy the draconian. Ian replied that he knew the best way to do it. This news made the princess very happy, so she grabbed Ian's hand and said that this was a good thing. After all, someone has to save their empire from destruction. The owner of the tower blushed a little at this gesture, for in his dreams he saw that it was his wife who had given birth to a beautiful daughter who looked like him. So in one second he told the princess that he had to return to Ragnar so that he would not suspect anything. He asked her to keep an eye on his majesty. When the owner of the tower began to walk to the exit, the princess sadly asked if she could help him in any way because she could not sit idly by. Ian smiled sweetly and said that the most important thing now was his majesty's safety and that he would be fine. He would go and make the necessary preparations and return right away. The princess continued to hold the sorcerer's hand because she did not want to let him go, so finally she said that he must come back. As soon as Ian found himself in a long corridor, he began to walk confidently toward the exit, with an assistant walking behind him, asking him to think carefully about his decisions. After all, the man argued that even if the war ended, there would still be conflicts on the continent despite the unification. The Empire needs an eighth-grade hero. This did not stop the magician, and he continued to move in the direction he was going. So the assistant continued to say that the gentleman, as the owner of the tower, had many more things to do, and he could not just leave it all behind. And even that didn't work. That's why the assistant decided to say the last thing that his majesty did not allow him to do it. It was only after this phrase that Ian stopped in his tracks. Then he turned his head to his interlocutor, 
and angrily raised his eyebrows and replied that even without this consent, he would still leave the estate. And he said that Mr. Ronan was ready to take over all the responsibilities of the tower's owner. The assistant was very angry with this information. After all, they were counting on his help, and not such a careless attitude to their duties to the people. Ian said menacingly that he did not consider himself a hero of the country, and besides, he is not an eighth-grade wizard, so he is free to leave this place without any obstacles. And finally, Ian said loudly and seriously that he was a monster. After that, he looked into the eyes of his interlocutor for a few seconds, demonstrating the seriousness of his intentions. The assistant could not say anything after that, so all he could do was stand in his place and silently watch Ian head for the exit. A few minutes later, the owner of the tower knocked on the door of the fifth prince, and as soon as he saw him, he immediately allowed him to enter the room so they could talk. The prince was sitting on his throne, holding a white sheet of paper, and told Ian that he had already read his letter and that he did not like the idea. Then the prince propped his face up with his right hand, and I started looking at the letter again, and then I asked Ian why he had decided to leave so suddenly because everything seemed to be fine and there was no reason for it. The owner of the tower was in no hurry to answer this question, so the prince said that if he needed to rest, he could do so for several months or several years. The gentleman then added that he understood better than anyone how difficult it was for the sorcerer to unite the entire continent, and he would agree to anything to make him feel good, and as long as Ronan can actually take his post. The prince went on to say that they need to prepare a new generation that could take on important tasks. Therefore, he should rest and return to his post. Ian knelt down and addressed his majesty and said that he would not return. He had already made up his mind and nothing could change his mind. Because, in his opinion, he should help the empire more by doing so, and even his further stay here could be the beginning of misfortune, so the best option is to leave this place. And he wants to leave his position and return to his homeland. He wants to stop using magic and live a quiet and peaceful life. However, the prince jumped to his feet and did not agree to this so easily. After all, Ian has done more for this country than anyone else. So I asked my interlocutor if he shouldn't be proud of that. After all, many people in his position would have taken advantage of these opportunities. So the prince descended from his throne and came closer to the sorcerer and angrily told him to stop talking nonsense and just get some rest and return to his duties. The owner of the tower looked up at the interlocutor sadly and emphasized that his hands were covered in blood, and because of this he cannot forget about it, and he can't consider it stupid. The prince drew his eyebrows together. He didn't like those memories either, and he emphasized that they were only forced sacrifices. The sorcerer agreed with these words, but also clarified that these victims were caused by his hands, and he can't accept it normally anymore and experience these feelings again and again in this place. He did not want to go on living with the feeling that he had taken the lives of many people. So he bent down and asked the master to let him atone for his sins. The prince asked if Ian really thought he could leave him so easily at a time when he had made him emperor. After all, the two of them were supposed to rule this empire, that everything was fine here. Then the chief began to circle around the sorcerer, emphasizing that they had spent so much time together. He asked if Ian was really his friend why he had made such a terrible decision now. The owner of the tower continued to kneel with his head down, because the guilt of what he had done was not allowing him to live in peace. He just, he just wanted to get rid of it by leaving this cursed place. At that moment, the prince began to return to his throne, saying that he did not expect his friend to decide to reject everything that was between them and leave him so easily. All the sorcerer could say was that he was very sorry that everything was happening this way but he simply cannot stand the remorse that gnaws at him every second of the day. At one of the meetings, the other members of the group learned about Ian's decision, and they said that the Callwoods and other empires were ready to attack them at any time, and their situation would be very bad if any of them found out that Ian had abandoned them. The other men suggested that the sorcerer might be able to help the last of the dukes. After all, he has the power to seize even the throne of the fifth prince, if he so desires. The people support him, and most of them think that he is the only one who deserves to be emperor. And the very existence of this sorcerer is the possibility of the prince's destruction. Therefore, the final decision they came to at this meeting was that if Ian Page was not on their side, he should die. After all, this way he would pose the greatest threat to the emperor.
It turns out that the prince had dreamed about this meeting and woke up abruptly in a cold sweat, breathing deeply. After all, he was so worried about the tower owner's decision that he could no longer sleep properly. It took the man several minutes to catch his breath because the dream had made him even more tired and frightened instead of relaxed. All these thoughts gave him a headache, and he instinctively put his right hand to it to rub it, as if this gesture would make it hurt less. This did not help, so the prince called for an assistant who was on duty at his door, in case his majesty needed something in the middle of the night. The man asked him to call the imperial alchemist, Douglas Hammond. When the alchemist arrived, he immediately asked the gentleman how the new medicine was working for him. And did he still have problems sleeping? The prince, holding a cup of tea, said that he felt even worse, and that he needed stronger medicine. The doctor told him that the medicine he was taking was made from an addictive plant. That's why his health can deteriorate with frequent use. And then the alchemist said that treatment is only a temporary solution. To get rid of this problem, you need to look at its root, and then develop a plan to alleviate the symptoms. The tired prince raised his eyebrows and asked, The root of the problem? He had never heard this term before in his life, and he did not know how to act in such situations. The alchemist, seeing the misunderstanding on the man's face, calmly decided to explain that the root of the problem was the reason why he could not sleep well at night. When the prince heard this, he finally realized what was going on. So he looked down at his hands and said that he didn't think he could deal with it on his own. And because of this, he began to tell me that he was afraid of a friend who had long ago abandoned him. He is also afraid that he might take over his empire. The alchemist listened carefully and calmly expressed his opinion on the situation, and he said that this comrade should be killed so that he would not be afraid of anything. The prince clarified, how can you kill a friend? But the interlocutor did not give up and asked how one could be so afraid of a loved one. After all, it doesn't look normal at all. Holding his head, which was still hurting, the gentleman said that this man was an eighth-grade sorcerer. Therefore, he was not easy to defeat and it is unlikely that all the sorcerers could have defeated him by now. And in the end, the prince asked the alchemist what he should do in this case. The man answered quickly and clearly enough that there was definitely a way. As soon as the prince heard these words, he stopped holding his head and turned his gaze to the interlocutor, waiting for him to explain his words further. And then the alchemist said that he could prepare a special poison that would quickly spread throughout the body and kill the opponent in a few seconds. After these words, the room fell silent. At this time, in a small wooden house in the middle of the forest, the windows were shining brightly, orange light from the fireplace, and outside it was snowing white, fluffy snow. Inside, a wizard sat next to the fireplace and read a fascinating book. He was wearing glasses because, despite his young age, he could no longer see as well as his peers. This activity was interrupted by a sudden knock on the door. The man had to take off his glasses and ask who was there at such a late hour. He didn't seem to be expecting any guests. When he received no answer, the sorcerer was forced to get to his feet and open the front door himself. When he did, he saw a man he had hoped to never see again in his life. So for a few seconds, he stood there with his mouth and eyes wide open. And it turned out that he demonstrated with his whole appearance that he was quite surprised. It turns out that his former friend and part-time prince was standing right in front of him. He was smiling sweetly as if they had never stopped talking. Seeing Ian's strange reaction, his majesty decided to be the first to speak. So he said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time and asked if he could come inside. However, the sorcerer first asked the prince how he was, and they were still standing on the threshold while it was snowing outside, which was melting quickly so everything around them was wet. His majesty looked down and did not answer the question but emphasized that Ian had said that even after he left, they would see each other occasionally. And so he emphasized that he did not come as an emperor, but as a friend. And as a token of his visit, he brought a bottle of red wine to spend the evening talking. Ian did not yet see any bad intentions, so he pointed inside the house, saying that he was always glad to see the prince. When his majesty sat down in the chair next to the fireplace, the sorcerer brought them a glass to pour the wine. Walking to the guest, Ian emphasized that the prince did not usually drink, so he asked if anything had happened. The blonde man, pouring the drink into the glasses, smiled sarcastically and replied that sometimes it's not bad to skip a drink like that. After all, he was wondering how his friend was doing. 
As soon as the emperor poured the drink, he took one glass in his hands and handed it to John, who also hardly ever drank alcohol, so he was surprised by this offer, but he decided not to refuse the offer. He took a glass and sat down on another chair by the fireplace. And then the prince put his foot up and told the sorcerer to tell him how he was doing here, because he looked better than he had in the capital. Ian smiled sweetly and looked down and said that he spent all his free time traveling around the United Territories of the Empire. And he really enjoyed it. During these travels, the sorcerer managed to get to know the lives of ordinary people. He made many good friends who brought him a lot of useful information. Taking his first sip, Ian said that now he had settled in his native land and had learned a lot. As it turned out, he knew nothing but magic. And he said that after the winter, when the snow melts, he plans to work in the field. The emperor listened attentively and said with a broad smile that the life of the hero of the Great War had become so quiet and peaceful. It was strange for a man to hear that. But the most important thing is that Ian feels happy. Then the prince began to tell us that after the sorcerer left, many things happened. Then he began to say that Duke Banada's daughter from the kingdom of Ro would become the bride of the successive prince. And through this marriage, he plans to make the kingdom of Ro their ally. However, the emperor did not pay attention to this, but continued to talk about how his son, who was so young, had already become such a grown man and would soon be married. So now he is beginning to understand his father a little bit. The ivory tower is not at the height of its glory now, as it was under Ian. But new rules are being created there to exist peacefully under the leadership of the ruling family. And it was already evident that the recovery from the war was going much faster than they thought. As he spoke, the sorcerer had already fallen to the ground and began to writhe in pain, which pierced his entire body. However, the emperor put his foot in his mouth and happily continued to say that everything was going well, and their empire is now experiencing its best days, although they did not even expect this. And only after that did the prince open his eyes wide and say that all that was left was to get rid of Ian, who decided to leave them in their time of need. So he went on to tell the sorcerer that the poison in the wine was poisoning the magic inside him, and that is why he had a lust in his mouth that was hard to stop. Then the guest got to his feet and walked close to the sorcerer, saying that the effect would last only a few minutes. But in Ian's case, they had to use several poisons at once. Finally, the sorcerer felt a little relieved and immediately took the opportunity to ask why his friend had done this to him. Why did he choose to destroy him in such a treacherous way? And the prince calmly and quickly replied that it was as if Ian himself did not know that the empire would no longer need his power and so it was decided to destroy him before it was too late. And to make things clearer, the emperor explained that in the past, it had been useful for them to keep such a force close to them. But in the future, its mere existence could only make it worse. So the guest looked the sorcerer straight in the eyes and said that this was probably why he had returned to his homeland. He realized that something bad could happen to him. Ian also looked into the eyes of his interlocutor and was shocked that for all he had done for the empire and personally for the emperor, he had been treated like this, not allowing him to live out his last days in peace and quiet. The emperor asked the sorcerer if he didn't know what was really scaring him, and that's why he hasn't been sleeping well lately and feels bad during the day. Because it should not be that a friend cowers in fear while looking at a sorcerer. This is no longer the norm, and that's why something needs to be done. Ian looked at him with a look that did not understand what was going on. So the emperor added that he would forever remain an eighth-grade archmage who could steal his empire, and so he simply could not let such a monster live. When Ian finally came to realize this, tears came to his eyes and he addressed the emperor, calling him his dear friend. The prince continued to look at Ian and asked him never to forgive him for anything. And so they looked at each other for several minutes. It was as if they were saying goodbye. Immediately after saying these words, the emperor turned around and began to walk toward the exit. He did not even look at the sorcerer's condition. He did not want to do this, because this decision was very difficult for him. After all, Ian had been his good friend for a very long time. When his majesty was outside, he asked his assistant to burn everything here and he accomplished his task in a few minutes. 
The entire building was in flames of bright orange fire. It would be impossible to get out of it. It was only when the emperor was able to get to a safe distance that he stopped and turned his head to the burning building. His gaze was empty and emotionless. However, he could not take his eyes off the flames. And at that moment, memories of the sorcerer came to mind. But these thoughts were interrupted by an assistant who said that they had already finished everything here and that the chief could get into the carriage. However, the emperor was in no hurry to leave this place. He continued to stand and look at the burning house. And this surprised the aide because what he saw next, he definitely did not expect to see. His majesty had two thin streams of tears, but there were no emotions on his face. This made it clear that this decision was very difficult for him and that it was causing him great emotional pain. At that time, the thought flashed through my husband's mind that he could never have imagined that they would say goodbye like that. And this is the most horrible ending imaginable. Later, the man gathered all his strength and emotions into a fist and turned in the opposite direction and began to walk to the carriage to go home from this place. But many of his assistants remained at their posts around the building, each of them having to monitor the situation and understand whether everything was going according to plan or whether additional measures needed to be taken. In the same world, Ian had just come to Ragnar's room after meeting with the princess, and the latter, studying a document, immediately asked what they had talked about with his sister. The man was very curious to know more details, because he had never noticed that the two had ever communicated at all. The sorcerer played his role perfectly even without the effect of black magic. He said with a blank stare that the young lady had asked why Ian had betrayed the faithful prince. When Ragnar heard this question, he looked up at the sorcerer and asked what he had said. After all, saying something wrong could harm them both. Especially now, when they are not in a very good position. The owner of the tower calmly answered the question, telling the princess that he saw no point in answering. This phrase made his majesty laugh and he began to laugh out loud without restraint. Then he put both hands on his chest and closed his eyes and said that his sister was poor, because he knew she was in love with Ian, and it is even visible to the naked eye when they are together. He went on to say that her father had offered to find her a husband, but she had rejected all the candidates. And it was not clear what she disliked about them so much. And then he emphasized that people like them need marriage only to strengthen their strength. Therefore, he is deceiving himself and does not yet know it. Ian had to listen to the whole speech quietly so as not to give himself away. After all, he still needs to learn a lot of information from this man. And Ragnar continued to think aloud, shifting his gaze from side to side, and said that he was concerned that this was the only chance for her to at least somehow consolidate her position, but for some reason she did not take it. After that, he got to his feet and turned to Ian and said that as soon as the time came, he would find him a good wife and a beautiful wife. When he came to the middle of the room, the man held his hands out and said that very soon he would become a better emperor than his father. He would also be the first emperor to unite three countries. And with this, he will make Green River an ideal place to live. And all of this must happen because he does not even want to consider any other scenario. Then Ragnar went up to the sorcerer and put his hands on his shoulders and told him that he would help him in all this. After all, he now belonged to the prince and would definitely not regret it. But Ian suddenly turned to his majesty with a serious tone and said that he had already seen the greatness of the United Green River Empire under the leadership of the great emperor. This information surprised the prince, and so he decided to clarify how the sorcerer had managed to observe this with his own eyes, when did he manage to do it? The sorcerer gently removed the prince's hands from his shoulders and said that the meaning of his life was to serve him and the empire. Ragnar was a little wary because he realized that something was wrong, and the owner of the tower began to say the phrase that in this life he had found. However, before he could finish, he was interrupted by the other man, who simply could not stand such long pauses between words. The man assumed that black magic didn't work anymore, and he did not understand how, if this was true, how did Ian manage to get rid of it? And then he wondered what he should do now. But the sorcerer continued to say what he had planned. So the man slowly closed his eyes and said that he was very sorry to say this, but he still wanted the prince to know. And he was out of his mind with excitement.
In order to restrain himself somehow, he gritted his teeth tightly so that he wouldn't say something unnecessary at the wrong time. At this point, Ian got down on one knee and said that in the past, present, and future, the person he hated and respected the most was Ragnar, his dear friend and master. Then a veil of orange light began to appear around the sorcerer. He looked up at the prince and asked him to find him in the old tower. It was there that he would wait for him. Ragnar was, to put it mildly, shocked by what was happening now, because he had not expected the magic to stop working so quickly. So he didn't even think about what he would do in this case. And immediately after these words, the sorcerer vanished into thin air, and the prince remained standing in the same place with a surprised expression on his face, because he had not expected such a development. But when he realized what had happened, it made him very angry. He could barely control himself, because you have to make a plan before you act. A few minutes later, one of the aides entered the room and noticed His Majesty's terrible state, so he stopped and asked him if something had happened. Ragnar said loudly that Sir Domphil was coming to see him right now, and then his assistant would give him the order to gather the troops, and in the end, he would find Mr. Avantis. The man immediately set off to fulfill all the tasks that were set before him. At that time, it was also snowing snow on the side of the old tower. It covered everything around. Ian was sitting on the top step, hands folded in his lap, looking intently ahead of him. He was waiting for his guests, who, according to his calculations, would arrive at the designated place soon. Then the sorcerer raised his head up and began to look at the sky. After all, it was during this period of time that they looked especially beautiful. And given the recent events, the man could rarely admire such beauty. Then he assumed that in his past life he had come to this place for a reason. His father was constantly watching him. Even now it seems strange that he didn't realize it. His father saw how his son wandered around the world without any goal and all his hopes and downfalls. And probably because of his invisible support, the man managed to survive such difficult times. And it was probably his father who gave him a second chance to live his life differently. Therefore, this moment should be used here and now, because there may never be another one. Then the man remembered the last message in the dragon language, which he had read in the book the princess had given him. And now the sorcerer understood how he knew this language. And now he understands how to use the power his father left him. Although he hasn't practiced much, he can already use it. Suddenly, all these thoughts were interrupted by what Ian saw in front of him, and he began to look at it carefully, because it was already relevant to the present, which needed to be addressed right now. It turned out that the prince had already arrived at the old woman's house on horseback with his troops. He was moving so confidently that he didn't seem to feel that he might have any problems today. A few meters away from the building, all the arriving guests stopped and looked up to see their opponent who was already waiting for them. When he also saw them, he quickly rose to his feet and held his arms out to greet Ragnar on his arrival. The man seemed so calm and overly confident. The prince got down from his horse and turned to Mr. Avatis and asked if he could kill him. After all, he had been called here to help him. Ivantis looked down and said that all this could have been done much easier. However, in any case, his powers are at the sixth level, so it would not have taken much time, if not for one problem. The prince was surprised and immediately asked what the problem was, and why didn't he know about it before? The assistant said that he could feel the power of the golden dragon and that it was very close by. However, he has not yet decided where exactly this power is located and how dangerous it is. And after these words, the prince and Avantis began to look closely at Ian, who was standing on the highest step and watching his guests. Even though the distance between them was so great, each of the opponents tried to demonstrate his power and strength with his eyes, in order for one of them to become afraid and refuse this action. The prince was looking at the sorcerer with a serious expression on his face, as he wanted to show that he was not afraid of him at all and was ready for any development. When this pause dragged on a bit, Ian took a few steps forward and called Ragnar to come up to him. Otherwise, he came and stood at the entrance, although he behaved differently with the others. However, the prince was confused by something else and said that he did not remember the moment when he allowed Ian to address him by his first name, so even in this situation he had to pay his respects. Ragnar went on to say that the sorcerer had lost. Did he really think that a consistent prince could unite the empire? But at this time, 
The Empire needs a strong prince who can make important decisions, and that idiot has no brains at all. The prince then held his hands out to the side and said that he had thought that his brother would give up, but that his father's love was his support to continue to hold on to the throne. Coming a little closer, the prince began to say that how can Ian not understand that, for the sake of the Empire's well-being, they must remove Hayden. After all, he is their biggest problem so far. Finally, Ragnar opened his eyes and mouth wide and shouted loudly that he would never recognize his brother. For he, not his brother, deserves to be the next emperor. Therefore, it is he who should become the ruler. The owner of the tower simply could not listen to this nonsense anymore, so he closed his eyes and said that black magic prevails over people without exception. And Ragnar completely forgot about common sense. So Ian asked if the man was following his desires. And if he continues like this, there will be no turning back. The prince was not alarmed by this and replied that the sorcerer could say whatever he wanted because today was the last day he could do so at all. Immediately after saying these words, Ragnar turned to Mr. Avantis, who was standing on his right side and waiting for an order to act. And of course, he immediately used magic, which sent dozens of sharp swords straight at Ian, who was standing a few meters away. The owner of the tower, watching so many dangerous weapons moving towards him, still continued to stand in the same place without taking any means of defense. You could see the confidence in his eyes that could shake the plans of his opponents, who did not even realize that he could also show them something cruel. As soon as the swords reached their destinations, the walls of the old tower collapsed and a cloud of dust surrounded them, making it impossible to see anything. All those present waited for the dust to settle to see what had happened to Ian. Avantis, waiting for the consequences of his actions to end, said that they were talking as if Ian were a reasonable person, but in reality, it was not so. For he started it in vain, knowing that he was behind everything that was happening. While he was thinking about all this, the dust slowly settled, and the fact that his opponent saw him in front of him surprised him because he had not expected the consequences to be exactly like this. Evantis saw Ian standing in front of him, unharmed and unharmed, standing calmly in the middle of the ruins. There was not even a single speck of dust or grain of sand on him. However, after what happened, the man's outlook changed a bit. He has become much tougher and more confident. Therefore, those who are now against him may regret treating him so lightly. Evantis was also surprised that his opponent had managed to survive the weapon he had used, and this could be seen in his wide-eyed expression. However, he decided not to give up so easily and in a matter of seconds used the following magic, which contained fire that should destroy or at least severely injure the sorcerer. Ian watched Avantis's actions closely, and again this time he did nothing to save himself. The young man continued to stand in the same position as he had been a few minutes ago. However, his gaze was quite focused on the man standing in front of him. It was as if he was showing that he was not at all afraid of what might happen to him. At this point, Evantis, addressing Ian, emphasized that he was stronger than him, and no matter how great a sorcerer he was, he would always be a draconian who had lived for many centuries training his power. And immediately after saying these words, the man again launched another batch of sharp swords in the direction of the tower owner, who did not even think of running away from them. However, as soon as these swords flew close to the sorcerer, for some reason they did not wound him, but instead stopped for a few minutes and simply hovered in the air, until they were destroyed by Ian and he was able to repel the second attack and everything was going the way he wanted it to but not the way his opponents wanted it to, who were counting on something else. This development made Avantis even angrier. He immediately asked why his attacks did not work on Ian. Why can't he hurt this sorcerer? But that wasn't all, because the attacker immediately sensed the power of the golden dragon nearby. While he was making these assumptions, the tower owner was able to repel another attack, and only then did he look up at his opponent again. And he, in turn, asked another question about why he felt the power of the golden dragon coming from Ian. And in a matter of seconds, he decided to clarify the question a bit and added, Who is this sorcerer, really? What had he been hiding from them all this time? Why didn't he show his true face right away? After a series of such questions, the owner of the tower replied that he was very sorry for the last draconian, because he wanted to get the power of dragons so badly, and for this he killed all his family, 
but in the end, he was left without strength and without loved ones. Then the sorcerer began to remind his opponent what had happened to him in the distant past, namely when he had the opportunity to meet his father face to face. After all, it was he who chose the perfect punishment for a creature like Avantis, namely the emptiness that was so difficult for him to fill after so many years of being confined to himself. And to all this was added hatred, anger, sadness, helplessness, from which it is simply impossible to escape. And it was only getting worse every year. Then Ian added that the man was a good man to survive in such conditions, because not everyone is capable of doing this, because it takes a lot of strength. All these words made Avantis very angry, so he loudly ordered his opponent to shut up, because he would make him experience even more pain, and he would do anything for that. However, these threats did not frighten the owner of the tower. Instead, he smiled sweetly at himself, and he did it on purpose to make his interlocutor even angrier. But this time, the sorcerer decided to show Avantis the power he had once desired, for which he had worked so hard, but still failed to obtain. The opponent looked up at Ian, who began to hover in the air and angrily raised his eyebrows to watch what would happen next. As it turned out, someone woke up in the sorcerer's body and pointed a finger at this voice and said that this last draconian should kill himself in order to alleviate his suffering. And in a matter of seconds, Avantis picked up one spear from the ground and stabbed it sharply and quickly into his heart. Everyone present was shocked by this act. Even Ragnar himself froze in place with his mouth and eyes wide open, for he did not understand why his advisor had done this to himself after hearing one single phrase. After being wounded, the opponent fell to his knees, but finally asked the sorcerer where he had gained this power. How did he manage to find it and apply it to himself? However, Ian decided that he would not answer right away. He would just stand there and watch what would happen to Avantis. At that moment, the tower owner reflected that he remembered the first meeting with Ragnar quite well. Although he does not know whether it was a deliberate move, that event meant a lot to him, and it changed everything. When he was accompanied by the prince's assistant, he emphasized that the prince usually does not make appointments himself, but he invited the boy because he sees great talent in him. The man went on to remind him that a magician should be careful with etiquette and language. Suddenly they stopped and the assistant turned his head slightly to Ian and said that perhaps the young man was about to meet the future emperor of the country. As soon as they arrived at the door, they stopped for a few minutes so that the guest could catch his breath and prepare for the upcoming meeting with his majesty. So, upon entering the room, the assistant turned to the prince and told him that the owner of the ivory tower wanted to talk to him, and the blonde gentleman did not hesitate to agree to the meeting. And upon hearing the agreement, they began to move quickly toward the prince, who was standing on a pedestal with his hands behind his back, watching the two human figures approaching him. When they got closer, his majesty smiled sincerely and greeted the owner of the tower. It was clear from his reaction that he had no idea why these people were here. At that moment, Ian was also frightened by what had come over him. He didn't seem to expect the prince to agree to this meeting. But there was no turning back now. Seeing such confusion in the guest's eyes, the prince decided to take the initiative, so he smilingly said that he had already heard a lot about the magician from Havert. After all, he had surprised everyone at the academy with his talent. The owner of the tower slowly lowered his gaze and head a little and thanked him for the compliment, although he did not know how to accept them properly, especially from such people. After all, he had never heard such a thing before. The prince did not yet understand what caused this reaction, so he gave the guest a few minutes to calm down and get a little control over his emotions, which were already overwhelming him. The prince then put his hands behind his back and said that he had received very bad news that the tower owner's mother had passed away due to illness. He added that he was very sorry for what had happened. After a pause, the man said that he had also lost his mother, so he fully understood how Ian was feeling, and because of this, he would not ask him to do anything difficult and overwhelming now. Then his majesty looked down and said that he knew that a yogi's words would not heal a wound, but the man should know that Ragnar was sincerely sorry for his loss. However, the sorcerer continued to stand with his head low. So the prince had to come down to the guest and ask him to raise his head higher. As soon as the guest complied with the request, the prince said that he would like to hold the meeting not as a prince, 
and the last sentence surprised the sorcerer a bit, because he obviously did not expect to hear this. And after that, the room fell silent again, because everyone in the room had something to think about. However, this silence was broken by Ragnar, who smiled sincerely and added that he hoped they could become good friends. But that's all. That was just a memory. And now we are returning to reality. Namely, to the site of the old tower where Ian and the prince met. The owner of the tower decided that it was time to act, so he began to walk confidently towards his majesty, who was standing there and did not know what to do next without his main assistant. He did not even think of a plan that could somehow save him. And because of this, he made a rather serious decision for himself, although he had been holding back all his life. So the prince closed his eyes tightly and knelt down in front of the sorcerer and said that he would not ask for his life to be spared. But he believes that it is better to kill him here than later on his cloak in front of everyone. Ian stopped a few meters away from his opponent and watched and listened intently. Because even a man like Ragnar needs to be given one last chance to make amends. The owner of the tower did not even expect that the prince would accept his loss so easily and ask for its destruction. This made him think about what to do next. When his majesty saw that the sorcerer was not doing anything, he asked him why he could not do it. After all, the man hates him so much, and here was such a great opportunity. Then the prince looked up at the owner of the tower and did not like what he saw, so he immediately asked why the man was looking at him like that. Does he really feel sorry for him? When Ragnar did not receive any answers to his questions, he became very angry and shouted that he would have been better off destroying the sorcerer earlier, because he was a monster. It was only after these words that Ian looked down and emphasized that this was what his friend had really been thinking about him all along. Then he decided to clarify that he had really scared him that much. But even without waiting for an answer, the sorcerer began to approach the prince in order to show him something in the end. After all, he deserved to see it with his own eyes. When the sorcerer approached Ragnar, he lightly touched his head and added that he would now demonstrate who he really was. And in a matter of seconds, orange light began to appear around him. The prince decided to accept this development and did not resist at all and the memory of their first meeting came to him. At first, everything was quite vague, but over time, the picture became clearer. The next episode was when Ian had already studied to be a sorcerer and constantly accompanied the prince to all events in order to help him at any time. Then a close-up of the prince's face was shown, who was constantly dissatisfied with something and not at all happy with the life he was living. To get some rest from the work he had to do at the estate, Ian would go out to one of the lawns where many birds were constantly gathering. The next episode was about how his majesty was crowned. And at that moment, the owner of the tower was also constantly by his side to support him. Then the events are demonstrated as Ian came to his friend to ask him to let him go because he simply could not stand it anymore. The prince did not like this request very much, and at that moment he was very angry. Although he was always in such a state and it was simply impossible to negotiate with him. That's why on that particular day he ignored his friend's request. It was important for him to fulfill the plans he had long made. It was on that day that the owner of the tower realized that something had to be done about it immediately because if things continued like this, the empire would simply not be saved. The next memory that Ian demonstrated was when his former friend came to visit him and brought him poisoned wine, and in this way he wanted to get rid of his rival. When the sorcerer looked at his majesty's face that day, he saw self-loathing in his eyes, and that he was not at all sorry for what he had done to him. And the last thing the prince said was that the owner of the tower should never forgive him, because friends don't do that no matter what happens in life. And the last picture of the memory was also of a prince standing in shock at a house that was burning, with a poisoned sorcerer inside who would not have gotten out on his own. When the owner of the tower took his hand away from the prince's head, he was still sitting on his knees thinking about what he had seen. He had not expected to see that he was so cruel. Several minutes had passed, and his majesty still could not say a word, because he was ashamed of it all. And even more so, he could not find the right words. Ian realized that he was never going to get any meaningful conclusion, so he swung his right hand to hit the prince, because he had wanted to do that for a long time. And from this blow, his majesty fell to the ground unconscious. And so far, this was the best decision the tower owner could have made at that moment.
For a few seconds, he stood there silently looking at the man who had brought so much grief and suffering into his life. And then he turned around and began to return to the city. He didn't care what happened to the prince. The main thing was that the sorcerer managed to stop him in time. After the deaths of the draconian and the fifth prince, the dragon cult and its members were checked. The first to be executed was the captain of the first imperial knight detachment, Sir Domphil. He was followed by all the comrades of the fifth prince, who tried to make a coup in the empire. Thanks to the princess's care, the emperor, Terry Green River, regained consciousness. A few hours later, the daughter decided to tell her father everything that had happened in his absence. After all, he should know about it, especially since it concerns his sons. The man was shocked by this development. He was also very upset that one of his sons would die. Because no matter how bad he was, he was still his own blood. It took his majesty a whole day to come to his senses and get a little control over his emotions. He had never thought that he would have to mourn his child. And Paul Rance was acquitted of the charge that he wanted the emperor dead. His grave was beautifully cleaned, and there were always fresh flowers on it. He was also buried next to other imperial knights. The use of black magic to prepare for the war was new to the empire. Therefore, it was decided not to disclose the existence of Avantus. Over time, the death of the fifth prince ceased to be discussed in society. Thus, the sorcerer's revenge and the suppression of the uprising, which seemed impossible at first glance, were fully and completely realized. Quite a bit of time has passed since the disaster occurred. Everything has finally calmed down in the estate, and everyone has continued to fulfill their duties. In one large and long corridor, a strong princess sat on a small sofa and thought about something. She was still wearing her black dress as a sign of mourning for her brother. Suddenly, her thoughts were interrupted by the owner of the tower, who asked the young lady if she was really that nervous, as was evident from her posture and expression. The girl turned her head and the person she was talking to and saw the sorcerer with a wide smile. He was the only person in the estate who did not miss the fifth prince. Then the princess turned her gaze in front of her and folded her hands in her lap and said that, to be honest, she was very nervous and that she simply could not control this excitement. Hearing these words, the owner of the tower decided to ask if the young lady regretted her decision. After all, it's not too late to recant it. The princess clutched the dress tightly in her hands and replied that she did not regret it because she no longer wants to keep it a secret. She finally wants to use her abilities freely. She also wants to help other people in her own way. Ian was very pleased with this answer, so he smiled sincerely. Then he knelt down on one knee in front of the princess and looked her in the eye and said that she shouldn't worry because everything would go perfectly. Suddenly, the door to the room was opened by one of the guards, who addressed the princess and the owner of the tower and invited them to go inside, as they were already waiting for them. It turned out to be a courtroom, where all the main people were sitting in their seats and waiting for the next session to begin, and a few dozen ordinary people came to watch this action. When the girl approached the podium, the secretary announced that the trial of Princess Haley Green River, who secretly practiced and used magic, was about to begin. One of the judges was Ian, who was also worried about the young lady. After all, he was not at all indifferent to her. But in this situation, he could not help her in any way. However, he mustered up the courage to close his eyes and say that he would like to say something before the trial began, and everyone present froze in their seats, waiting for the information. Knowing all the rules of behavior in such institutions, the tower owner began to slowly get to his feet, because this is the way to proclaim something. And a second later, he said that he was related to the princess and could not be objective, so he would not participate in the meeting. And that's why he asked Mr. Ronan and Mr. Decode to take his place. People were quite shocked by the information they heard. After all, the owner of the tower refused to make a decision. But on the other hand, they were glad that he admitted his interest. The chief judge did not relate to any of the people. He was furious with this information and asked Ian for an explanation. After all, none of the people present fully understood the meaning of the words. Ian then put his right hand over his heart and with a serious expression explained that he was one of the teachers who helped the princess with her magic. After hearing this, one of the three judges decided to ask for explanations because they needed to know everything in detail in order to make a decision about the princess. The owner of the tower decided that he would not hide anything. 
because right now the empire was beginning to flourish in a new way. So he began to say that about six years ago, he learned about the girl's abilities, and it was an accident, because he saw her practicing secretly in one of the basements of an old abandoned tower. But then he decided to keep quiet about it, because he thought it would be for the best for her. And because he later had to investigate the dragon cult, and this group was actively working with black magic, and one of their goals was to infiltrate the imperial family. A draconian seemed particularly dangerous, and his magical art could destroy an entire empire, so the sorcerer had to be careful. But being a strong sorcerer, he would not have been able to defeat such an opponent on his own. Therefore, he needed help from a person who had power and whom he could trust 100%. All the people present listened attentively to this explanation. Ian then turned his gaze to the young lady standing next to him and said that this was the reason he had made the deal with the princess, because she was the person he could trust. But in return, he had to help them with their studies and keep her secret. In return, she helped him deal with the dragon cult. The girl was very pleased to hear such words in her direction. However, the sorcerer did not stop, but instead continued to say that thanks to the princess, he was able to break the black spell and destroy the draconian. Without her, he would not have succeeded. Then the tower owner said that the rest of the details are described in his report on the last of the fifth prince. That's how he ended his explanation of the situation. And he waited to hear what the judges would say. One of the chief commanders of the court immediately turned to the princess and asked if what they had just heard was true. At that time, the girl had not yet recovered from these words, so there was a short pause in the room. Looking down, the young lady said guiltily that all the words were true, and for some reason she felt guilty even though she had helped the Empire with her actions. Then the judge said that this was the only reason he would allow the princess to defend herself, and she can start her story right now, of course, if she is ready for it. At first, the girl did not understand what she needed to say, and her confusion could be seen in her expression. She began to turn her head around, looking for support, and all the people present sat there waiting for the princess to explain herself. After all, that's why they were all here in broad daylight, and this pause began to put pressure on them all. Then the young lady turned her head to the owner of the tower and looked him in the eye, for she hoped to find the support she so desperately needed at that moment. The sorcerer tilted his head slightly forward and smiled sweetly. With this gesture, he made it clear that there was nothing to be afraid of, and she could tell him everything because he was on her side. And only then did the princess turn her gaze to the judges, and taking a deep breath and exhaling, said that she knew that she was guilty by law, so she was ready for any decision. The young lady then emphasized that she was not asking for special treatment because of her title and so she will accept any punishment in accordance with the rules of the Ivory Tower and the Empire. However, she asked that Mr. Kevin be found not guilty of the maids who knew the truth about her possessing magic. As she spoke, the princess closed her eyes as she was overwhelmed with emotion. The girl went on to say that all these people were just following her orders, because at that moment they could not disobey her orders, therefore they should not be punished. Turning her gaze to the judges, the girl said more confidently that she was asking all the wizards of the ivory tower to punish only her for what had happened. After all, it was all his idea. Suddenly, the door to the courtroom opened, and someone loudly said that the princess was not guilty. Everyone turned their heads back in surprise to see who had said that. When the judges saw this guest, they were shocked. They did not expect to see him there. And so they sat with their eyes and mouths wide open. Other people present had the same reaction. No one could even say a word because this man meant a lot to their empire, and he was absent for a certain period of time. It turns out that the emperor came to the courtroom. He looked very well considering that he was poisoned, and he spent several weeks unconscious. As the gentleman was walking to the podium, the owner of the tower managed to ask him how he was feeling. The man replied that he was feeling pretty good, so it was too early to die. As soon as the emperor was at the podium, he looked at the people who made the decision and said that he was addressing all the wizards of the tower and saying that the princess was not guilty because she had followed his orders. After all, it was he who asked the sorcerer Kevin to watch over his daughter. Then he ordered the man to hide the truth about the girl because he wanted her to remain a princess, not a sorcerer. 
and it turns out that it was because of her father that she was forced to hide her abilities from the other wizards in the tower. And he is very sorry that this is how it happened, because it could have been different. And all because of his immense love for his child. He could never have imagined that his daughter would be summoned to court because she was secretly using magic. So then his majesty began to ask everyone to blame him for what had happened and to let the princess become a real wizard, because she had wanted it for so long. The judges listened carefully and began to look at each other. None of them wanted to make a decision on their own. Instead, they sought support from their colleague. It took them a few minutes to make a decision. After all, they had to discuss all the pros and cons and make the right decision for the ivory tower, the empire, and the princess. At the end of the discussion, the chief judge said that since it was impossible to deny the influence of the tower owner on the situation, they would have to make a decision on their own. Because of this, the man began to say that despite the fact that they should condemn them for the hidden use and practice of magic, the judges understand why the young lady did what she did. The previous owner of the tower was Havert Leon, who was associated with the rebels of Ragnar Green River. Therefore, it is quite understandable why the girl was wary of them. The man then added that they were sure that the princess had not used magic for her own benefit. And because of this, they will not make any accusations. And given that she is a fourth-class sorcerer, they recognize her skills as something the Empire lacks. So the Ivory Tower would like to give Princess Hyla Green River a chance. The judge went on to say that they wanted to commute the sentence to five years of training which she would undergo as a sorcerer in an ivory tower. She will fulfill the tower's goals and receive individualized lessons. After that, the man added that they hoped that these five years would show that their decision was the right one. The girl was happy to hear this sentence. The judge then said loudly that he was declaring that Haley Green River was no longer a princess of the empire, but an ivory tower sorcerer. The young lady folded her hands in front of her and began to smile broadly. The next day, the owner of the tower stood in front of one window in the tower in the morning and looked at something carefully with his hands behind his back. He was also very amused by this development. Suddenly, someone behind him spoke to him, and so he began to slowly turn his head back to see who was speaking to him. It turns out that there was a princess standing in front of Ian, to whom he addressed himself. The girl put her hands in front of her and began to smile sweetly. She had been waiting for this day for several years. As she approached the sorcerer, she reminded him that she was no longer a princess. Therefore, he can address her by her first name, and this will help remove a small formality between them. The owner of the tower smiled broadly in response and agreed to the proposal, and then called her Lady Hillary. Only then did he ask her a question about what it was like to live in an ivory tower. The young lady looked down and replied that at first she was not used to the environment, but she was received very well, so now she feels almost as if she were at home. The girl went on to emphasize that thanks to Ian's support, she was able to fit into the community so easily. And she thanked him for that. The sorcerer said that there was no need to do so because he was only happy to help. After that, the room fell silent as none of them knew how to continue the conversation. After all, they hadn't been able to establish communication about anything other than work and school. But the girl decided to ask if what she had heard was true that Ian was going to resign as the owner of the tower. For some reason, she thought it was because of her. The man looked down and replied that it was not because of her. Then he added that he still had things to do that he couldn't accomplish while still being the owner of the tower so he called the girl to a meeting to return the chest to her. As soon as he opened it, the girl was surprised by what she saw. The sorcerer confirmed that it was indeed Mitchell Green River's cloak, which the emperor had previously given him. This thing was supposed to go to a sorcerer of the imperial family, so he only borrowed it for a while. And in his opinion, the time has come to return it to the person to whom it rightfully belongs. Then the man brought another magic stick, which he also used for his own purposes. The princess listened attentively and calmly to what the tower owner was telling her. Then he handed me this wand and said that it belonged to the great fields. It is made of liquid materials that cannot be found in the empire, and it helps to use magic more effectively. When the princess evaluated this tool, she began to smile broadly. She liked it very much because it was really lightweight and easy to carry around. 
Seeing this reaction from the princess, the owner of the tower asked if she really liked it so much. The young lady smiled broadly and then replied that of course she liked it very much. This answer amused Ian. It was exactly what he had expected. Because after all, she is the one who has to use these things, and she also needs to learn how to use them skillfully. Then the sorcerer closed his eyes and said in a calm tone that he also wanted to ask the young lady to fulfill one request, but first she had to listen to him and only then make a decision. The girl was already very interested in hearing this request, so she quickly decided to clarify what kind of request it would be. And having said that, she waited for the answer with her mouth wide open. Therefore, the owner of the tower did not hesitate to tell the princess that he wanted to leave the capital for several years, and his request is that the young lady look after his family during this time. Lady Hillary gripped her wand tightly and froze in place in amazement. She had never imagined that Mr. Ian would make such an abrupt decision about his stay. Having mastered her emotions and excitement, the girl asked why the sorcerer was going to leave the capital and where he wanted to go and especially why he would do it at such a time. The owner of the tower looked down and said that he could not answer these questions right now, because he himself had not yet decided where he wanted to go. He went on to say that there are still many dangers in this world, and only he can deal with them, because he is the one who has the strength to fight this evil. But he is afraid to leave his family here alone. The princess looked down sadly. She did not know how to react to this statement. After all, she was counting on him to spend all these five years in the ivory tower for her. So the princess also decided to tell the sorcerer that she had found the purpose of her life. She will help the people of the empire who are in trouble. And for this, she is going to open a foundation with her brother. When her father heard the news, he was very happy and said that he would support them in this decision. Because of this, she added that she would also like Ian to be with them at this time. Finally, the girl asked that Mr. Ian did not leave. The man listened carefully and looked down sadly. He did not think she would ask that, so he did not know what to say to this request. And for a few minutes he had to close his eyes to think things through. After all, he did not want to offend the young lady. Gathering all his strength into a fist, the man first apologized for what he had to do. The princess stood with her mouth open and waited for a response from her interlocutor. After meeting with the young lady, Ian went to see the prince of the succession, who had already heard rumors about the sorcerer's intentions. So as soon as he saw him, he immediately asked why the man wanted to leave the capital. The owner of the tower decided to calm the prince down with a calm tone. It was hard for him to explain his intentions, especially since he would have to leave his family behind. When the successive prince came closer to Ian and told him that he had just received a letter where he was resigning from the position of tower owner, but the Lord did not understand why he decided to leave them. After all, everything had just started to get better, and only now the prince realized why Haley was always sad and crying. Because Mr. Ian is quite an important person in her life. Then the blonde man raised his right hand to his face and closed his eyes, saying that he was not comfortable talking about it, but his sister was a very good and cool person. She inherited her beauty from her mother, and she has a good temperament, and in general, she is a strong sorcerer, so the man asked where else Ian could find one, especially since she likes him. The sorcerer, smiling broadly, replied that Lady Haley was really beautiful and he was sure that she would find a worthy man and be happy and loved with him. The prince decided not to continue the conversation on this topic. So he put his right hand to his side and asked what Ian wanted to tell him as soon as he came, because clearly he hadn't come to talk about Haley. The sorcerer looked down and said that Paul had made one request of him before he died, and he would like to fulfill it even though he was no longer present with them. And then the young man asked me to tell the crown prince and Sir Oliver something very important to him, and it was an apology and gratitude for the fact that he had been able to live with them all these years and work in decent conditions. The words were a bit of a shock to the interlocutor. Ian then bowed low and added that this was all he could do. He apologized for everything but everyone in the room still couldn't say anything because they were so surprised. But as soon as His Majesty regained control of his emotions and thoughts, he turned to the sorcerer and said that if it had not been for his help, they would not have been here. Later, he added that without Ian's power, nothing at all would have changed in the Empire, or perhaps it would have disappeared by now or been ruled by another family. 
The prince then put his hand on his heart and promised that he would try not to disappoint those who had placed their hopes in him, and he would try to do even more good. Then the gentleman stretched out his hand to the sorcerer and said that because of this, Ian must promise him to return. Whatever happens, he must see his success with his own eyes. The owner of the tower looked up at his majesty and smiled sweetly and said that he would definitely return, because he was leaving his family here. After these words, the prince's assistant brought something wrapped. The blonde turned to him to take it in his hands and present it to the sorcerer. So as soon as the weapon was in his hands, he began to take the sword out of its sheath. At the same time, he looked at the expression on the face of the sorcerer, who was still standing in front of him. Seeing Ian's reaction, the prince emphasized that he was already good at holding a sword because he had been training hard lately. The sorcerer was surprised and asked what he was going to do. The blonde man said with a sincere smile that he was a regular high-ranking guest and that this gift was for the sorcerer, who was the prince's teacher and close friend. The man went on to add that the Empire would always welcome the archwizard Ian Page. If he needs the help of the Imperial family or the Empire itself, this help will be shown quickly. This oath will be passed down from generation to generation, and all the relatives of the Imperial family will keep it, because thanks to this sorcerer, they can live their lives. Suddenly, the prince broke off from his important speech and said, smiling, that when he was a child, he had seen local lords do this. So he thought it would be a good idea to hold such an initiation now. Finally, he told Ian to come back, because they would always be waiting for him. The wizard liked these words very much, so he smiled back. And then he thanked his majesty for the opportunity to spend several difficult but wonderful years here and for the fact that his family has been well provided for over the years. After talking with the prince, the sorcerer returned to his office in the ivory tower and began to sort through all the papers that had accumulated in that short period of time. Suddenly, someone knocked softly on the door. A few seconds later, a woman's voice addressed Ian and asked if she could come inside. The man turned his gaze to the door and said that of course his mother could come in, but he did not want to have a conversation with her about his decision to leave the capital. As soon as the woman entered the center, her son quickly approached her and asked why she had come all the way here, because she needed more rest and recuperation. While the mother did not answer, the man looked at her and asked if she was okay, because she looked pale and her hands were completely cold. The young lady looked down and stood there silently, not knowing where to begin to speak. She couldn't keep her emotions in check and tears began to flow down her cheeks, but she managed to answer that she was fine. She just couldn't accept the fact that she had to let her son go. Ian was a little frightened to see the woman looking like that, so he asked her to wait a bit while he called Mr. Ledian and the doctor. The lady composed herself a little and said that there was no need to call anyone because she was fine. A few seconds later, she told me that she had come here because she wanted to wish her son a good trip. And then she explained that when she saw him, she realized that she couldn't even do that. Ian was very upset that his decision had affected his mother so much. He knew she would be upset, but he didn't realize it would be to this extent. Then the woman looked down sadly and asked Ian if he had to go, or maybe he could still stay with his family. Then she said that when they returned to the capital, she was told what her son had gone through, and she did not like it very much, because she could not even imagine such a thing. Therefore, she said that at that moment she almost fainted, but still managed to resist. Only tears began to flow uncontrollably. The mother could not understand why her son had to go through such trials, and now she did not understand how he would stand out in this world. And she was afraid that all this could have happened because of her. Ian wanted to reassure his blood, but the woman kept saying that in Mogran province she was so afraid that they would never see each other again. So then the mother looked up at her son and told him that if something happened to him, she would simply not be able to live through it. After all, she never wants to lose her family again, because the disappearance of his father was hard for her to bear. But then she held on because she had a little son in her arms who needed her attention. At first, Ian did not understand what his mother meant, so he plunged into his childhood memories to draw a conclusion. Later, he realized everything and approached the woman, took her hands and said that it would be hard for her to believe, but he had met his father. The young lady froze in her tracks when she heard these words because she could not believe that it could be true. So the mother was surprised to clarify, to which the son replied that he knew it was hard to believe, but he told her that even if he is not visible, 
he is still constantly with him, and he hears his needs at the right moments, and the memory of meeting his father came to mind. Then the sorcerer put his head down and began to tell me that he despised his father, but only with time did he realize that much of what he had was a manifestation of his love. Because of this, he wants to try to follow in his father's footsteps. The man said all these words while continuing to hold his mother's hands to make it clear that there was nothing to worry about. After all, he wants to learn more about what it is like to want to protect others. After these words, there was a pause in the room, because they both needed to think about everything in order to draw conclusions. Then the pause was broken by Ian, who asked his mother for permission to fulfill his father's first and last request. She still could not believe that he had met his father. But you could see from the expression on the sorcerer's face that he was really happy now and he was sure of what he wanted to do in the near future. The young lady still could not accept the fact that they would have to be separated for an indefinite period of time. So she continued to look at her now grown-up child with tears in her eyes. A second later, she was sobbing again, saying that he had grown up so much, but to her he was still a little boy. The sorcerer decided to calm her down and told her not to worry because the young lady would not be here alone. And he told her that he now had a big family that he could rely on, and especially to leave his loved one with them and not worry about her well-being. Then he said that Mr. Ledio was a very good man, and thanks to him, Ian realized what it was like to have a father because he was kind to everyone. But Douglas can always cheer everyone up. He is also a kind and smart boy. Moreover, she has lived with them for so many years so she can know that they are wonderful people. Then the son took his mother by the shoulders and looked her in the eye and said that he sincerely wanted her to be happy. And so she should not dwell on him but live her life. And finally, he added that he would definitely return. Because he will always remember that a very close and dear person is waiting for him in this place. The next day, Ian had to leave for the road, so he was already packing his things on his horse in the morning and Douglas and his father were standing at the front door, unable to muster the courage to go say goodbye. After all, he was also a very close person to them, and it was very difficult for them to let him go alone, especially knowing that he was leaving for an unknown period of time. Suddenly, Ian heard a man's voice coming from behind him, asking if he was really about to set out on his journey. The sorcerer turned his head to look at the man. It turns out that it was an alchemist who nevertheless gathered all his strength and emotions and went out to see Ian before the journey. The sorcerer replied that there was no time to delay the departure. The interlocutor looked down and said that he wanted to ask if the man needed anything for the trip. But as he did so, he remembered how they had left the Lloyd settlement together. Ian stood still for a few minutes because he also wanted to refresh his memory of that moment and then he turned to the alchemist and asked him to take care of his mother. The man smiled sweetly and assured the sorcerer that he need not worry because the alchemist was ready to give his life for Ms. Page. Ian had long noticed that something was wrong between the two. Suddenly, the wizard heard a child's voice addressing him, and he realized that it was Douglas who was approaching him now and simply did not want to let him go on his journey. As it turned out, the young man did not come to dissuade Ian from leaving, but instead brought a small bag, which, as he explained, contains elixir and magic tinctures that he made especially for Ian. And they are much better than those sold on the market. And he suggested that we take them with us just in case. And then he added that the sorcerer could always send a letter to the estate with a request and Douglas would make more. A woman's voice came from the other side, calling Ian by name. It turns out that it was his mother who was in a hurry, carrying a small package of goodies, which she also offered to take with her. After all, it is not known when he will find himself in a new place where he can eat. The woman then looked her son straight in the eye and asked him to remember to take care of his health, and then asked him to send lots of letters. The sorcerer listened carefully and agreed with everything he was told, but he also asked the mother to take care of herself and her health and he emphasized that she needed to get more rest. And only then did he go to his horse and took it by the bridle, looked at his family and said that it was time to go on the road. Then he turned his horse toward the exit and began to walk slowly. He was sad at heart, but he knew why he was doing this. At the gate, the man stopped and looked at the house and said to himself that this was his home, to which he could always return. 
He looked at it for a few seconds to memorize every detail, so that later, when he recalled it, everything would seem natural to him. Then he turned his gaze to the people who came to see him off and said that all these people were his family, who would always be waiting for him here. And waving to everyone, Ian turned around and began to walk faster along the road outside the estate, getting farther and farther away every minute. One day, Douglas sat at his desk and wrote a letter to Ian, emphasizing that it had been eight years since he had left the estate. During this time, the young man had already graduated with honors from the Imperial Academy of Alchemists. He was able to invent a medicine that he had been developing since childhood. He was also recognized and now works as an alchemist at the court. The young man went on to say that his father was also offered the job, but he refused. He explained that it was a big responsibility for him, but he probably just didn't want to leave his mother. The next news that came in the letter was that his father had married Ian's mother, and they now live together. His majesty has not been able to fully recover from the poisoning, so he is preparing to hand over the reign to a successor prince, who has been improving himself in recent years. Douglas emphasized that this young man was definitely ready to become an emperor, because you could see it in him with the naked eye. And this is most of all because of the peace agreement that the prince signed with the Colwoods and the Kingdom of Lo. Now, thanks to the development of trade and technology, things have improved in the empire. Most people have a place to work and provide their families with everything they need. Lady Hiley successfully passed her probationary period of five years and is now working as an arch wizard in the Ivory Tower. And by her appearance, it is clear that she is now in her place. She also realized her dream and opened a foundation for low-income families. And she became the favorite of everyone in the empire, and most likely she will be appointed the owner of the tower. Douglas went on to write that everyone is working very hard to make sure that they live in good conditions, and then he added that they missed Ian very much, because it had been so long since they had last met. After Douglas had written the letter, he began to rub his hands and stretch his back a bit, because they were starting to hurt from the strain. Then he smiled to himself and said that he wished he could see Ian with his own eyes. Then the father called his son downstairs because everything was ready and the young man immediately began to get ready and go down the stairs to meet his family. As soon as he saw his mother, he emphasized that today she looked simply gorgeous. The woman smiled sweetly in response and thanked him for the compliment. But just before leaving, she decided to ask her husband if she could really go with them. He replied that she had to be there because the crown prince himself had sent her an invitation. It was only after this clarification that the young lady realized that she could rest assured. So they all turned their faces toward the exit to go to the estate. At this time, a captain from the Imperial Detachment came to the grave of his comrade. He had died several years earlier, but the man was in pain as if it had happened yesterday. Suddenly, his assistant turned to the captain behind him and said that they had to leave because they might be late for the appointment and it would not look good. The black-haired man slowly got to his feet and finally said to his friend that they had had a very good time together. And he promised that he would definitely come back to him again. But in the ivory tower, one of the students came to Ms. Haley's office and, with a sweet smile, asked her if she was ready to go to the meeting. The former princess was already dressed nicely, so she smiled back and said that she would be down to the carriage in a few minutes. At this time... She turned her gaze to the magic wand that Ian had given her many years ago, and the memories of their meetings came back to her. She was still in love with him. So she walked over to the stick, took it firmly in her right hand, and went out into the corridor and told the student that she could definitely go to her brother's coronation now. A large number of people had been working at the estate for several days to decorate everything for the event and to prepare delicious food for the people who will come to the coronation. On the appointed day, a large number of people who had been invited to the event began to gather, and they were all dressed up for the occasion. Basically, everyone gathered in small groups and discussed the news that had happened in the empire. Someone told what had changed in their lives, and someone just listened to the others in silence. At this time, in the middle of the estate, the emperor descended from his throne and addressed his subjects. Today's event was also very distressing for him. He went on to say that he would now like to convey to them a great honor and burden. Everyone in the room listened attentively to all the words spoken by his majesty. 
and the man continued to say that today he wants to hand over the position of emperor to his son, the successor prince Hayden Green River, which he deserves. After saying this, he said that he knew he had to hold the office until his death, but he decided to pass the reins to the younger generation, and this will be the right decision for the well-being of the empire. And all this is being done so that their empire can look forward to a brighter future. To do this, it needs the fresh perspective of a new emperor. Then from another room, a large wooden door began to open, and through it appeared the prince in succession. He was too serious with excitement. Of course, he had been dreaming about this day almost all his life. But when it came, the man's emotions were overwhelming and he did not know how to behave. However, his posture demonstrated self-confidence and determination to everyone present. As he stood there, all the people present were looking at him closely. Then he took a few steps forward to get closer to his father. He, too, was looking at his son with pride. And he was glad that he could see with his own eyes how his son would take his place. After a short pause, the prince got down on one knee in front of his father and bowed. His majesty paused for a moment and turned to his son and told him that he was very proud of him, and especially for the fact that he was able to reach such a high point. Hayden put his right hand over his heart and said that he would not let his father down, and then he added that he would do everything to make him even more proud. Then two assistants approached them. One of them held the flag of the empire, and the other brought the emperor's crown on a small red pillow. His majesty first took the headdress in his hands and carefully put it on his son's head. The room fell silent again, because this was a very important moment for everyone present. So no one wanted to spoil it. The emperor then announced that from this second on, the Green River Empire had a new emperor named Hayden Green River. By this point, the prince had already gotten to his feet. All those present began to clap their hands in greeting their new emperor. The prince's family smiled broadly, for they were very happy for him. While everyone was expressing their joy, one man who was on the balcony put his hands forward. He was dressed in a brown long coat and put his hands forward. In a few seconds, pink rose petals began to appear from the ceiling, and a bright orange light shone throughout the room. When the prince noticed all this, he did not understand what was happening and who was involved. After all, no one had warned him about it. Everyone began to discuss among themselves where these petals came from, and the princess caught one and realized that they gave off a sense of magic. So she raised her head up and stood there for a couple of minutes, wondering if the person she had been waiting for had returned to the empire, because only he could have done this. And then the din was interrupted by a familiar voice greeting the new emperor. But he still hadn't taken off his hood. He wanted to keep the intrigue going. However, the consistent prince did not need to do this. After all, he already recognized who it was. So he smiled broadly and sincerely, and then welcomed Mr. Ian back. When everyone moved to the ballroom for the coronation ceremony, the new emperor held his hands out to the sides and said to the sorcerer, Have you really come? After all, this was a very joyful event for him. Then his majesty said that he missed his friend very much. That's why he wanted to see him very much. Ian emphasized that the prince had not changed at all, but remained the same. Then the sorcerer put his right hand over his heart and bowed forward a little, congratulating his majesty once again on his coronation. And finally, he smiled sincerely. Suddenly, a loud woman's cry filled the room. It turned out that this was the mother saying Ian's name. She was shocked by the surprise, to say the least. When the sorcerer turned to face her, he realized from her expression that she had missed him very much. And so he responded by saying that he missed her too. Only then did the man manage to greet Douglas and his stepfather, who were standing on either side of his mother. They were smiling broadly. The woman then immediately asked her son if he had done what he wanted to do, and why he left the empire and his family. The sorcerer smilingly said that at this point, he had dealt with all the tasks that had been assigned to him. That is why he returned home. Suddenly, the new emperor coughed. Ian immediately turned his face to him, and the latter began to point his right index finger imperceptibly to the side. At first, the sorcerer did not understand what he wanted from him, but when he turned his head in the direction of the pointed finger, he saw that his majesty's sister was standing nearby silently watching him. When Ian saw her, he smiled broadly because he was so happy to see her. His eyes even seemed to shine differently. 
The young lady folded her arms in front of her and smiled sweetly back. Today, she was wearing the blue cloak that Ian had given her back many years ago. The sorcerer decided to come closer and talk to the girl for a while. As he walked toward her, he said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time, so he wondered how she had been doing all these years. The sorceress looked down and replied in a calm tone that everything was fine, and then she asked the same question to her interlocutor. The man said that the life of a strange man is always full of adventures. Then he added that he had heard her name even in the farthest reaches of their empire. People there say that there is a wonderful lady, the owner of the tower, who looks after orphans in need, and this is something to be respected. The princess was embarrassed and said that she was not really as good as he might think. Suddenly, the girl's mood changed dramatically and tears appeared in her eyes, and so that the sorcerer would not see them. The young lady wished him good night and decided to leave the place. So the sooner she turned in the opposite direction and began to walk quickly toward the exit. Ian was surprised that their conversation ended so quickly, and because of this, he did not know how best to act in such a situation. This was not the kind of meeting he had expected when he arrived in the capital. He really wanted to resume communication with the princess. Then the new emperor approached Ian and asked him why his friend had such a sad expression on his face. The man decided to deny the prince's suspicions, so he replied that he just imagined it. But his majesty could not be fooled, and he decided to tell Ian that his sister Haley was not yet engaged to anyone. And the wizard was delighted with the news. The blonde folded his arms across his chest and added that many men and boys had tried to woo her, but she always said she was waiting for someone else. And to play a little joke on his friend, the new emperor asked her who she could wait like that for eight years. Then the prince came closer to the sorcerer and said that not only Haley was waiting for him, but he was waiting for her as well. Because over the years, they had accumulated a lot of work. But first, his majesty decided to clarify whether Ian would stay with him. The wizard happily replied that he would, of course. While the men were talking about their business, Haile went outside and sat down next to a red rose bush. She was not ready to see someone who was very important to her today, so she did not know how to behave in this situation, and after thinking about it, she blamed herself for not talking to the sorcerer more. Then the memory of their last meeting eight years ago came to mind, and for some reason she assumed that he might not even remember how well they had communicated. Suddenly, her thoughts were interrupted by a familiar male voice, who first apologized for possibly interrupting the young lady from an important matter. It turned out that it was Mr. Ian, who walked closer to the witch and leaned over to greet her. He then smiled broadly, and it was clear that he was in a good mood. Seeing Haley's strange reaction, the man decided to apologize for not wanting to scare her at all. He just saw that she was not far from him and decided to say hello. Rising to her feet, the young lady asked why Ian had come to this place. The man replied that he was meeting the wizards of the ivory tower. And they all told him that the princess was in the garden. Looking around, the sorcerer emphasized that the garden was simply beautiful, and it was not like this when he was in charge of the tower. The young lady looked down and said that when she became the owner of the tower, they began to pay due attention to the garden. After all, she wanted all the wizards to have a place to relax. Upon hearing this information, Ian smiled broadly and said that it was a great decision. Since he arrived in the capital, he has been constantly positive. The sorcerer then asked if the young lady would like to take him on a tour to show him what had changed here. The sorcerer immediately agreed to do so. So immediately they began to walk along the small paths of the garden. At first, neither of them knew how to start a conversation and what to talk about and what not to talk about. The man decided to take the initiative and said that the Randior flower was a very rare plant in the empire, which is why he was surprised that Coldwood treated it like a weed. Then Ian said that he had heard that there was a golden-colored lake in the kingdom of Luo, and he went there without hesitation to see it. When he arrived, he thought it was an ordinary lake at first. And the sorcerer emphasized that he would never forget that beautiful moment in his life. And at this time, a memory came to mind of standing on a birch tree and admiring the color of the lake and the sunset. After listening carefully, Haley said smiling that according to the stories, Ian had a very interesting and exciting trip. At first, this upset her, but she didn't want the other person to notice. So, to distract from this, she smiled broadly and said loudly that she had no idea how beautiful this lake could be. 
and she added that maybe one day she would be able to see it too. Ian didn't really understand this outburst of emotion from his interlocutor, so he was silent for a few minutes to figure out what to say next and whether he should say anything at all. And at that moment, he decided that there was no need to hide his feelings. So he stopped on the spot and turned to face the princess and began to look her in the eye while saying that he would take her anywhere. Of course, if she agreed to take his hand, they would see a golden lake or a forest of spirits, a hot desert or an endless sea. And finally, he added that wherever he was, his thoughts were always about Haley. Then he said that he was very interested in how she would react if she had been to those places. Then the man looked down a little and explained that these thoughts began to overwhelm him, becoming stronger every day. After these words, Ian closed his eyes and said that it was only with the passage of time that he realized what those feelings were. And when he finished with his business, the first thing he thought was that he wanted to go back to Lady Hiley. Immediately after saying these words, Ian slowly knelt down on one knee, stretched his right hand forward and asked the sorceress to become his wife. After a short pause, the man added that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. From the expression on his face, one could tell that all the words he said were truly sincere, and he said what he really felt. The young lady did not expect to hear such a proposal, so she was confused and folded her hands in front of her and remained silent for several minutes, blinking her eyes frequently. Then a small blush began to appear on her cheeks, because at last she was slowly realizing that the man she loved had asked her to marry him. The first question she decided to ask was whether her husband was planning to go somewhere else. Ian listened carefully to this question. He immediately replied that he had already done everything he had planned, and now he could be with the princess all the time. Hearing these words, the girl's cheeks turned red. Then tears began to flow from the young lady's eyes. The sorcerer did not understand why. After all, in his opinion, he hadn't said anything bad or offensive. Instead, the girl explained that she really missed him and had been waiting for him for a very long time. After pausing for a few seconds, Lady Haley controlled her emotions, wiped away her tears and said with a wide smile that she agreed to become Ian's wife. And after that moment, they lived long and happy lives. Each of them got what they deserved, and all these years of separation have done them good.